Catch Twenty Two by Joseph Heller. Read by Jim Weiss. Chapter One, The Texan. It was love at first sight. The first time Yossarian saw the chaplain, he fell madly in love with him. Yossarian was in the hospital with a pain in his liver that fell just short of being jaundice. The doctors were puzzled by the fact that it wasn't quite jaundice. If it became jaundice, they could treat it. If it didn't become jaundice and went away, they could discharge him. But this just being short of jaundice all the time confused them. Each morning they came around, three brisk and serious men with efficient mouths and inefficient eyes, accompanied by brisk and serious Nurse Duckett, one of the ward nurses who didn't like Yossarian. They read the chart at the foot of the bed and asked impatiently about the pain. They seemed irritated when he told them it was exactly the same. Still no movement. The full colonel demanded. The doctors exchanged a look when he shook his head. Give him another pill. Nurse Duckett made a note to give Yossarian another pill, and the four of them moved along to the next bed. None of the nurses liked Yossarian. Actually, the pain in his liver had gone away, but Yossarian didn't say anything, and the doctors never suspected. They just suspected that he had been moving his bowels and not telling anyone. Yossarian had everything he wanted in the hospital. The food wasn't too bad, and his meals were brought to him in bed. There were extra rations of fresh meat, and during the hot part of the afternoon, he and the others were served chilled fruit juice or chilled chocolate milk. Apart from the doctors and the nurses, no one ever disturbed him. For a little while in the morning, he had to censor letters, but he was free after that to spend the rest of each day lying around idly with a clear conscience. He was comfortable in the hospital, and it was easy to stay on because he always ran a temperature of a hundred one. He was even more comfortable than Dunbar, who had to keep falling down on his face in order to get his meals brought to him in bed. After he made up his mind to spend the rest of the war in the hospital, Yossarian wrote letters to everyone he knew, saying that he was in the hospital, but never mentioning why. One day he had a better idea. To everyone he knew, he wrote that he was going on a very dangerous mission. They asked for volunteers. It's very dangerous, but someone has to do it. I'll write you the instant I get back. And he had not written anyone since. All the officer patients in the ward were forced to censor letters written by all the enlisted men patients who were kept in residence in wards of their own. It was a monotonous job, and Yossarian was disappointed to learn that the lives of enlisted men were only slightly more interesting than the lives of officers. After the first day, he had no curiosity at all. To break the monotony, he invented games. Death to all modifiers, he declared one day. And out of every letter that passed through his hands went every adverb and every adjective. The next day he made war on articles. He reached a much higher plane of creativity the following day when he blacked out everything in the letters but a, an, and the. That erected more dynamic intralinear tensions. He felt, and in just about every case left a message far more universal. Soon he was proscribing parts of salutations and signatures and leaving the text untouched. One time he blacked out all but the salutation, "Dear Mary," from a letter, and at the bottom he wrote, "I yearn for you tragically, A. T. Tapman, Chaplain, U.S. Army." A. T. Tapman was the group chaplain's name. When he had exhausted all possibilities in the letters, he began attacking the names and addresses on the envelopes, obliterating whole homes and streets, annihilating entire metropolises with careless flicks of his wrist, as though he were God. Catch Twenty Two required that each censored letter bear the censoring officer's name. Most letters he didn't read at all. On those he didn't read at all, he wrote his own name. On those he did read, he wrote. Washington Irving. When that grew monotonous, he wrote Irving Washington. 
Censoring the envelopes had serious repercussions, produced a ripple of anxiety on some ethereal military echelon that floated a CID man back into the ward, posing as a patient. They all knew he was a CID man because he kept inquiring about an officer named Irving or Washington, and because after his first day there, he wouldn't censor letters. He found them too monotonous. It was a good ward this time, one of the best he and Dunbar had ever enjoyed. With them this time was the twenty-four-year-old fighter pilot captain with the sparse golden mustache who had been shot into the Adriatic Sea in midwinter and had not even caught cold. Now the summer was upon them, the captain had not been shot down, and he said he had the grip. In the bed on Yossarian's right, still lying amorously on his belly, was the startled captain with malaria in his blood and a mosquito bite on his ass. Across the aisle from Yossarian was Dunbar, and next to Dunbar was the artillery captain with whom Yossarian had stopped playing chess. The captain was a good chess player, and the games were always interesting. Yossarian had stopped playing chess with him because the games were so interesting they were foolish. Then there was the educated Texan from Texas, who looked like someone in technicolor and felt, patriotically, that people of means, decent folk, should be given more votes than drifters, whores, criminals, degenerates, atheists, and indecent folk, people without means. Yossarian was unspringing rhythms in the letters the day they brought the Texan in. It was another quiet, hot, untroubled day. The heat pressed heavily on the roof, stifling sound. Dunbar was lying motionless on his back again, with his eyes staring up at the ceiling like a doll's. He was working hard at increasing his lifespan. He did it by cultivating boredom. Dunbar was working so hard at increasing his lifespan that Yossarian thought he was dead. They put the Texan in a bed in the middle of the ward, and it wasn't long before he donated his views. Dunbar sat up like a shot. "'That's it!' he cried excitedly. "'There was something missing. All the time I knew there was something missing, and now I know what it is.' He banged his fist down into his palm. "'No patriotism!' he declared. "'You're right!' Yossarian shouted back. "'You're right, you're right, you're right! The hot dog! The Brooklyn Dodgers! Mom's apple pie! That's what everyone's fighting for! But who's fighting for the decent folk? Who's fighting for more votes for the decent folk? There's no patriotism, that's what it is, and no matriotism either!' The warrant officer on Yossarian's left was unimpressed. "'Who gives a shit?' he asked tiredly, and turned over on his side to go to sleep. The Texan turned out to be good-natured, generous, and likable. In three days, no one could stand him. He sent shudders of annoyance scampering up ticklish spines, and everybody fled from him. Everybody but the soldier in white, who had no choice. The soldier in white was encased from head to toe in plaster and gauze. He had two useless legs and two useless arms. He had been smuggled into the ward during the night, and the men had no idea he was among them until they awoke in the morning and saw the two strange legs hoisted from the hips, the two strange arms anchored up perpendicularly, all four limbs pinioned strangely in air by lead weights, suspended darkly above him, that never moved. Sewn into the bandages over the insides of both elbows were zippered lips, through which he was fed clear fluid from a clear jar. A silent zinc pipe rose from the cement on his groin and was coupled to a slim rubber hose that carried waste from his kidneys and drifted efficiently into a clear stoppered jar on the floor. When the jar on the floor was full, the jar feeding his elbow was empty, and the two were simply switched quickly so that stuff could drip back into him. All they ever really saw of the soldier in white was a frayed black hole over his mouth. The soldier in white had been filed next to the Texan, and the Texan sat sideways on his own bed and talked to him throughout the morning, afternoon, and evening in a pleasant, sympathetic drawl. The Texan never minded that he got no reply. Temperatures were taken twice a day in the ward. 
Early each morning and late each afternoon, Nurse Kramer entered with a jar full of thermometers and worked her way up one side of the ward and down the other, distributing a thermometer to each patient. She managed the soldier in white by inserting a thermometer into the hole over his mouth and leaving it balanced there on the lower rim. When she returned to the man in the first bed, she took his thermometer and recorded his temperature, and then moved down to the next bed and continued around the ward again. One afternoon, when she had completed her first circuit of the ward and came a second time to the soldier in white, she read his temperature and discovered that he was dead. Murderer, Dunbar said quietly. The Texan looked up at him with an uncertain grin. Killer, Yossarian said. What are you talking about? The Texan asked nervously. You murdered him, said Dunbar. You killed him, said Yossarian. The Texan shrank back. You fellas are crazy. I didn't even touch him. You murdered him, said Dunbar. I heard you kill him, said Yossarian. You killed him because he was a nigger, Dunbar said. You fellas are crazy, the Texan cried. They don't allow niggers in here. They got a special place for niggers. The sergeant smuggled him in, Dunbar said. The communist sergeant, said Yossarian. And you knew it. The warrant officer on Yossarian's left was unimpressed by the entire incident of the soldier in white. The warrant officer was unimpressed by everything, and never spoke at all unless it was to show irritation. The day before Yossarian met the chaplain, a stove exploded in the mess hall and set fire to one side of the kitchen. An intense heat flashed through the area. Even in Yossarian's ward, almost three hundred feet away, they could hear the roar of the blaze and the sharp cracks of flaming timber. Smoke sped past the orange-tinted windows. In about fifteen minutes, the crash trucks from the airfield arrived to fight the fire. For a frantic half-hour, it was touch-and-go. Then the firemen began to get the upper hand. Suddenly there was the monotonous old drone of bombers returning from a mission, and the firemen had to roll up their hoses and speed back to the field in case one of the planes crashed and caught fire. The planes landed safely. As soon as the last one was down, the firemen wheeled their trucks around and raced back up the hill to resume their fight with the fire at the hospital. When they got there, the blaze was out. It had died of its own accord expired completely without even an ember to be watered down, and there was nothing for the disappointed firemen to do but drink tepid coffee and hang around trying to screw the nurses. The chaplain arrived the day after the fire. Yossarian was busy expurgating all but romance words from the letters when the chaplain sat down in a chair between the beds and asked him how he was feeling. He had placed himself a bit to one side, and the captain's bars on the tab of his shirt collar were all the insignia Yossarian could see. Yossarian had no idea who he was, and just took it for granted that he was either another doctor or another madman. Oh, pretty good, he answered. I've got a slight pain in my liver, and I haven't been the most regular of fellows, I guess. But all in all, I must admit that I feel pretty good. That's good, said the chaplain. Yes, Yossarian said. Yes, that is good. I meant to come around sooner, the chaplain said, but I really haven't been well. That's too bad, Yossarian said. Just a head cold, the chaplain added quickly. I've got a fever of a hundred and one, Yossarian added just as quickly. That's too bad, said the chaplain. Yes, Yossarian agreed. Yes, that is too bad. The chaplain fidgeted. Is there anything I can do for you? he asked after a while. No, no, Yossarian sighed. The doctors are doing all that's humanly possible, I suppose. No, no, the chaplain colored faintly. I didn't mean anything like that. I meant cigarettes or books or toys. No, no, Yossarian said. Thank you. I have everything I need, I suppose. Everything but good health. That's too bad. Yes, Yossarian said. 
Yes, that is too bad. The chaplain stirred again. He looked from side to side a few times, then gazed up at the ceiling, then down at the floor. He drew a deep breath. The Lieutenant Nately sends his regards, he said. Yossarian was sorry to hear they had a mutual friend. It seemed there was a basis to their conversation after all. You know Lieutenant Nately? he asked regretfully. Yes, I know Lieutenant Nately quite well. He's a bit loony, isn't he? The chaplain's smile was embarrassed. I'm afraid I couldn't say. I, I don't think I know him that well. You can take my word for it, Yossarian said. He's as goofy as they come. The chaplain weighed the next silence heavily, and then shattered it with an abrupt question. You are Captain Yossarian, aren't you? Nately had a bad start. He came from a good family. Please excuse me, the chaplain persisted timorously. I may be committing a very grave error. Are you Captain Yossarian? Yes, Captain Yossarian confessed. I am Captain Yossarian. Of the 256th Squadron? Of the Fighting 256th Squadron, Yossarian replied. I didn't know there were any other Captain Yossarians. As far as I know, I'm the only Captain Yossarian I know, but that's only as far as I know. I see, the chaplain said unhappily. That's two to the fighting eighth power, Yossarian pointed out, if you're thinking of writing a symbolic poem about our squadron. No, mumbled the chaplain. I'm not thinking of writing a symbolic poem about your squadron. Yossarian straightened sharply when he spied the tiny silver cross on the other side of the chaplain's collar. He was thoroughly astonished, for he had never really talked with a chaplain before. "'You're a chaplain!' he exclaimed ecstatically. "'I didn't know you were a chaplain!' "'Why, yes,' the chaplain answered. "'Didn't you know I was a chaplain?' "'Why, no, I, I didn't know you were a chaplain!' Yossarian stared at him with a big, fascinated grin. I've never really seen a chaplain before. The chaplain flushed again and gazed down at his hands. He was a slight man of about thirty-two, with tan hair and brown, diffident eyes. His face was narrow and rather pale. An innocent nest of ancient pimple pricks lay in the basin of each cheek. Yossarian wanted to help him. Can I do anything at all to help you? the chaplain asked. Yossarian shook his head, still grinning. No, I I'm sorry. I have everything I need, and I'm quite comfortable. In fact, I'm not even sick. That's good. As soon as the chaplain said the words, he was sorry, and shoved his knuckles into his mouth with a giggle of alarm. But Yossarian remained silent, and disappointed him. There are other men in the group I must visit, he apologized finally. I'll come to see you again— Probably tomorrow. Please do that, Yossarian said. I'll come only if you want me to, the chaplain said, lowering his head shyly. I've noticed that I make many of the men uncomfortable. Yossarian glowed with affection. I want you to, he said. You won't make me uncomfortable. The chaplain beamed gratefully, and then peered down at a slip of paper he had been concealing in his hand all the while. He counted along the beds in the ward, moving his lips, and then centered his attention dubiously on Dunbar. "'May I inquire,' he whispered softly, "'if that is Lieutenant Dunbar?' "'Yes,' Yossarian answered loudly. "'That is Lieutenant Dunbar!' Thank you, the chaplain whispered. Thank you very much. I must visit with him. I must visit with every member of the group who was in the hospital. Even those in the other wards? Yossarian asked. Even those in the other wards? Be careful in those other wards, father, Yossarian warned. That's where they keep the mental cases. They're filled with lunatics. It isn't necessary to call me father. The chaplain explained. I'm an Anabaptist. 
I'm dead serious about those other wards, Yossarian continued grimly. MPs won't protect you because they're craziest of all. I'd go with you myself, but I'm scared stiff. Insanity is contagious. This is the only sane ward in the whole hospital. Everybody's crazy but us. This is probably the only sane ward in the whole world, for that matter. The chaplain rose quickly and edged away from Eusarian's bed, and then nodded with a conciliating smile and promised to conduct himself with appropriate caution. And now I must visit with Lieutenant Dunbar, he said. Still he lingered remorsefully. Howell is Lieutenant Dunbar, he asked at last. As good as they go, Eusarian assured him. A true prince. One of the finest, least dedicated men in the whole world. I didn't mean that, the chaplain answered, whispering again. Is he very sick? No, he isn't very sick. In fact, he isn't sick at all. That's good. <sighs> the chaplain sighed with relief. Yes, Yossarian said. Yes, that is good. A chaplain, Dunbar said when the chaplain had visited him and gone. Did you see that? A chaplain. Wasn't he sweet? Asked Yossarian. Maybe they should give him three votes. Who's they? Dunbar demanded suspiciously. In a bed in the small private section at the end of the ward, always working ceaselessly behind the green plyboard partition, was the solemn middle-aged colonel who was visited every day by a gentle, sweet-faced woman with curly, ash-blonde hair, who was not a nurse and not a whack and not a Red Cross girl but who nevertheless appeared faithfully at the hospital in Pianosa each afternoon, wearing pretty pastel summer dresses that were very smart, and white leather pumps with heels half-high at the base of nylon seams that were inevitably straight. The colonel was in communications, and he was kept busy day and night transmitting glutinous messages from the interior into square pads of gauze, which he sealed meticulously and delivered to a covered white pail that stood on the night table beside his bed. The colonel was gorgeous. He had a cavernous mouth, cavernous cheeks, cavernous, sad, mildewed eyes. His face was the color of clouded silver. He coughed quietly, gingerly, and dabbed the pad slowly at his lips with a distaste that had become automatic. The colonel dwelt in a vortex of specialists who were still specializing in trying to determine what was troubling him. They hurled lights in his eyes to see if he could see, rammed needles into nerves to hear if he could feel. There was a urologist for his urine, a lymphologist for his lymph, an endocrinologist for his endocrines, a psychologist for his psyche, a dermatologist for his derma. There was a pathologist for his pathos, a cystologist for his cysts, and a bald and pedantic cytologist from the zoology department at Harvard who had been shanghaied ruthlessly into the medical corps by a faulty anode in an IBM machine and spent his sessions with the dying colonel trying to discuss Moby Dick with him. The colonel had really been investigated. There was not an organ of his body that had not been drugged and derogated, dusted and dredged, fingered and photographed, removed, plundered and replaced, neat, slender and erect. The woman touched him often as she sat by his bedside and was the epitome of stately sorrow each time she smiled. The colonel was tall, thin and stooped. When he rose to walk, he bent forward even more, making a deep cavity of his body, and placed his feet down very carefully, moving ahead by inches from the knees down. There were violet pools under his eyes. The woman spoke softly, softer even than the colonel coughed, and none of the men in the ward ever heard her voice. In less than ten days, the Texan cleared the ward. The artillery captain broke first, and after that, the exodus started. Dunbar, Yossarian, and the fighter captain all bolted the same morning. Dunbar stopped having dizzy spells. 
and the fighter captain blew his nose. Yossarian told the doctors that the pain in his liver had gone away. It was as easy as that. Even the warrant officer fled. In less than ten days, the Texan drove everybody in the ward back to duty. Everybody but the CID man, who had caught cold from the fighter captain and come down with pneumonia. Chapter 2 Clevenger In a way, the CID man was pretty lucky, because outside the hospital, the war was still going on. Men went mad and were rewarded with medals. All over the world, boys on every side of the bomb line were laying down their lives for what they had been told was their country, and no one seemed to mind, least of all the boys who were laying down their young lives. There was no end in sight. The only end in sight was Yossarian's own, and he might have remained in the hospital until doomsday had it not been for that patriotic Texan with his infundibuliform jowls and his lumpy, rumple-headed, indestructible smile cracked forever across the front of his face like the brim of a black ten-gallon hat. The Texan wanted everybody in the ward to be happy, but Yossarian and Dunbar. He was really very sick. But Yossarian couldn't be happy, even though the Texan didn't want him to be, because outside the hospital there was still nothing funny going on. The only thing going on was a war, and no one seemed to notice but Yossarian and Dunbar. And when Yossarian tried to remind people, they drew away from him and thought he was crazy. Even Clevenger, who should have known better but didn't, had told him he was crazy the last time they had seen each other which was just before Yossarian had fled into the hospital. Clevenger had stared at him with apoplectic rage and indignation, and clawing the table with both hands had shouted, You're crazy! Clevenger, what do you want from people? Dunbar had replied wearily, above the noises of the officers' club. I'm not joking, Clevenger persisted. They're trying to kill me, Yossarian told him calmly. "'No one's trying to kill you!' Clevenger cried. "'Then why are they shooting at me?' Yossarian asked. "'They're shooting at everyone!' Clevenger answered. "'They're trying to kill everyone!' "'And what difference does that make?' Clevenger was already on the way, half out of his chair with emotion, his eyes moist and his lips quivering and pale. As always occurred when he quarreled over principles in which he believed passionately, he would end up gasping furiously for air and blinking back bitter tears of conviction. But there were many principles in which Clevenger believed passionately. He was crazy. Who's they? he wanted to know. Who specifically do you think is trying to murder you? Every one of them, Yossarian told him. Every one of whom? Every one of whom do you think? I haven't any idea. Then how do you know they aren't? Because... <laughs> Clevenger sputtered and turned speechless with frustration. Clevenger really thought he was right, but Yossarian had proof, because strangers he didn't know shot at him with cannons every time he flew up into the air to drop bombs on them, and it wasn't funny at all. And if that wasn't funny, there were lots of things that weren't even funnier. There was nothing funny about living like a bum in a tent in Pianosa, between fat mountains behind him and a placid blue sea in front that could gulp down a person with a cramp in the twinkling of an eye and ship him back to shore three days later, all charges paid, bloated, blue, and putrescent, water draining out through both cold nostrils. The tent he lived in stood right smack up against the wall of the shallow, dull-colored forest, separating his own squadron from Dunbar's. Immediately alongside was the abandoned railroad ditch that carried the pipe that carried the aviation gasoline down to the fuel trucks at the airfield. Thanks to Orr, his roommate, it was the most luxurious tent in the squadron. Each time Yossarian returned from one of his holidays in the hospital, or rest leaves in Rome, he was surprised by some new comfort Orr had installed in his absence. Running water, wood-burning fireplace, cement floor. Yossarian had chosen the site, and he and Orr had raised the tent together. 
or who was a grinning pygmy with pilot's wings and thick, wavy brown hair parted in the middle, furnished all the knowledge, while Yossarian, who was taller, stronger, broader, and faster, did most of the work. Just the two of them lived there, although the tent was big enough for six. When summer came, Orr rolled up the side flaps to allow a breeze that never blew to flush away the air baking inside. Immediately next door to Yossarian was Havermeyer, who liked peanut brittle, and lived all by himself in the two-man tent, in which he shot tiny field mice every night with huge bullets from the forty-five he had stolen from the dead man in Yossarian's tent. On the other side of Havermeyer stood the tent McWatt, no longer shared with Clevenger, who had still not returned when Yossarian came out of the hospital. McWatt shared his tent now with Nately, who was away in Rome courting the sleepy whore he had fallen so deeply in love with there, who was bored with her work and bored with him, too. McWatt was crazy. He was a pilot and flew his plane as low as he dared over Yossarian's tent as often as he could, just to see how much he could frighten him and loved to go buzzing with a wild, close roar over the wooden raft floating on empty oil drums out past the sandbar at the immaculate white beach where the men went swimming naked. Sharing a tent with a man who was crazy wasn't easy, but Nately didn't care. He was crazy, too, and had gone every free day to work on the officers' club that Yossarian had not helped build. Actually, there were many officers' clubs that Yossarian had not helped build, but he was proudest of the one on Pianosa. It was a sturdy and complex monument to his powers of determination. Yossarian never went there to help until it was finished. Then he went there often, so pleased was he with the large, fine, rambling, shingled building. It was truly a splendid structure, and Yossarian throbbed with a mighty sense of accomplishment each time he gazed at it and reflected that none of the work that had gone into it was his. There were four of them seated together at a table in the officers' club the last time he and Clevenger had called each other crazy. They were seated in back, near the crap table, on which Appleby always managed to win. Appleby was as good at shooting crap as he was at playing ping-pong. And he was as good at playing ping-pong as he was at everything else. Everything Appleby did, he did well. Appleby was a fair-haired boy from Iowa who believed in God, motherhood, and the American way of life, without ever thinking about any of them. And everybody who knew him liked him. I hate that son of a bitch, Yossarian growled. The argument with Clevenger had begun a few minutes earlier when Yossarian had been unable to find a machine gun. It was a busy night. The bar was busy. The crap table was busy. The ping-pong table was busy. The people Yossarian wanted the machine gun were busy at the bar, singing sentimental old favorites that nobody else ever tired of. Instead of machine-gunning them, he brought his heel down hard on the ping-pong ball that came rolling toward him off the paddle of one of the two officers playing. <laughs> that Yossarian! The two officers laughed, shaking their heads, and got another ball from the box on the shelf. That Yossarian! Yossarian answered them. Yossarian! Nately whispered cautioningly. You see what I mean? asked Clevenger. The officers laughed again when they heard Yossarian mimicking them. That Yossarian, they said more loudly. That Yossarian, Yossarian echoed. Yossarian, please, Nately pleaded. You see what I mean, asked Clevenger. He has antisocial aggressions. Oh, shut up, Dunbar told Clevenger. Dunbar liked Clevenger because Clevenger annoyed him and made the time go slow. Appleby isn't even here. Clevenger pointed out triumphantly to Yossarian. Who said anything about Appleby? Yossarian wanted to know. Colonel Cathcart isn't here either. Who said anything about Colonel Cathcart? What son of a bitch do you hate, then? What son of a bitch is here? I'm not going to argue with you, Clevenger decided. You don't know who you hate. Whoever's trying to poison me, Yossarian told him. Nobody's trying to poison you. 
They poisoned my food twice, didn't they? Didn't they put poison in my food during Ferrara and during the great big siege of Bologna? They put poison in everybody's food, Clevenger explained. And what difference does that make? And it wasn't even poison, Clevenger cried heatedly, growing more emphatic as he grew more confused. As far back as Yossarian could recall, he explained to Clevenger with a patient smile, somebody was always hatching a plot to kill him. There were people who cared for him and people who didn't, and those who didn't hated him and were out to get him. They hated him because he was a Syrian, but they couldn't touch him, he told Clevenger, because he had a sound mind in a pure body and was as strong as an ox. They couldn't touch him because he was Tarzan, Mandrake, Flash Gordon. He was Bill Shakespeare. He was Cain, Ulysses, the Flying Dutchman. He was Lot in Sodom, Deirdre of the Sorrows, Sweeney in the Nightingales among trees. He was Miracle Ingredient Z-247. He was crazy, Clevenger interrupted, shrieking. That's what you are, crazy. Immense. I'm a real slam-bang, honest-to-goodness, three-fisted humdinger. I'm a bona fide Superman. Superman? Clevenger cried. Superman? Supra-man, Yossarian corrected. Hey, fellas, cut it out, Nately begged with embarrassment. Everybody's looking at us. You're crazy, Clevenger shouted vehemently, his eyes filling with tears. You've got a Jehovah complex. I think everyone is Nathaniel. Clevenger arrested himself in mid-declamation suspiciously. Who's Nathaniel? Nathaniel who? inquired Yossarian innocently. Clevenger skirted the trap neatly. You think everybody is Jehovah. You're no better than Raskolnikov, who... Yes, Raskolnikov, who... Raskolnikov, who... I mean it, who felt he could justify killing an old woman. No better than... Yes, justify, that's right, with an axe. And I can prove it to you. Gasping furiously for air, Clevenger enumerated Yossarian's symptoms, an unreasonable belief that everybody around him was crazy, a homicidal impulse to machine-gun strangers, retrospective falsification, an unfounded suspicion that people hated him and were conspiring to kill him. But Yossarian knew he was right, because, as he explained to Clevenger, to the best of his knowledge, he had never been wrong. Everywhere he looked was a nut— and it was all a sensible young gentleman like himself could do to maintain his perspective amid so much madness. And it was urgent that he did, for he knew his life was in peril. Yossarian eyed everyone he saw warily when he returned to the squadron from the hospital. Milo was away, too, in Smyrna, for the fig harvest. The mess hall ran smoothly in Milo's absence. Yossarian had responded ravenously to the pungent aroma of spicy lamb while he was still in the cab of the ambulance, bouncing down along the knotted road that lay like a broken suspender between the hospital and the squadron. There was shish kebab for lunch. Huge, savory hunks of spitted meat sizzling like the devil over charcoal after marinating seventy-two hours in a secret mixture Milo had stolen from a crooked trader in the Levant, served with Iranian rice and asparagus tips parmesan, followed by cherries jubilee for dessert, and then steaming cups of fresh coffee with Benedictine and brandy. The meal was served in enormous helpings on damask tablecloths by the skilled Italian waiters Major de Coverley had kidnapped from the mainland and given to Milo. Yossarian gorged himself in the mess hall until he thought he would explode, and then sagged back in a contented stupor, his mouth filmy with a succulent residue. None of the officers in the squadron had ever eaten so well as they ate regularly in Milo's mess hall and Yossarian wondered a while if it wasn't perhaps all worth it. But then he burped and remembered that they were trying to kill him, and he sprinted out of the mess hall wildly and ran looking for Doc Danica to have himself taken off combat duty and sent home. He found Doc Danica in sunlight, sitting on a high stool outside his tent. Fifty missions, Doc Danica told him, shaking his head. 
and the colonel wants fifty missions. But I've only got forty-four. Doc Danica was unmoved. He was a sad, bird-like man with a spatulate face and scrubbed, tapering features of a well-groomed rat. Fifty missions, he repeated, still shaking his head. The colonel wants fifty missions. Chapter 3 Havermeyer Actually, no one was around when Yossarian returned from the hospital but Orr and the dead man in Yossarian's tent. The dead man in Yossarian's tent was a pest, and Yossarian didn't like him, even though he had never seen him. Having him lying around all day annoyed Yossarian so much that he had gone to the orderly room several times to complain to Sergeant Towser, who refused to admit that the dead man even existed, which, of course, he no longer did. It was still more frustrating to try to appeal directly to Major Major, the long and bony squadron commander, who looked a little bit like Henry Fonda in distress, and went jumping out the window of his office each time Yossarian bullied his way past Sergeant Towser to speak to him about it. The dead man in Yossarian's tent was simply not easy to live with. He even disturbed Orr who was not easy to live with either, and who, on the day Yossarian came back, was tinkering with the faucet that fed gasoline into the stove he had started building while Yossarian was in the hospital. "'What are you doing?' Yossarian asked guardedly when he entered the tent, although he saw at once. "'There's a leak here,' Orr said. "'I'm trying to fix it.' "'Please stop it,' said Yossarian. "'You're making me nervous.' When I was a kid, Orr replied, I used to walk around all day with crab apples in my cheeks, one in each cheek. Yossarian put aside the musette bag from which he had begun removing his toilet articles and braced himself suspiciously. A minute passed. Why? he found himself forced to ask finally. Orr tittered triumphantly. Because they're better than horse chestnuts he answered. Orr was kneeling on the floor of the tent. He worked without pause, taking the faucet apart, spreading all the tiny pieces out carefully, counting and then studying each one interminably, as though he had never seen anything remotely similar before, and then reassembling the whole small apparatus over and over and over and over again, with no loss of patience or interest. No sign of fatigue, no indication of ever concluding. Yossarian watched him tinkering and felt certain he would be compelled to murder him in cold blood if he did not stop. His eyes moved toward the hunting knife that had been slung over the mosquito net bar by the dead man the day he arrived. The knife hung beside the dead man's empty leather gun holster, from which Havermeyer had stolen the gun. When I couldn't get crab apples. Orr continued. I used horse chestnuts. Horse chestnuts are about the same size as crab apples and actually have a better shape, although the shape doesn't matter a bit. Why did you walk around with crab apples in your cheeks? Yossarian asked again. That's what I asked. Because they've got a better shape than horse chestnuts, Orr answered. I just told you that. Why? swore Yossarian at him approvingly. You evil-eyed, mechanically aptituted, disaffiliated son of a bitch, did you walk around with anything in your cheeks? I didn't, Orr said. Walk around with anything in my cheeks? I walked around with crab apples in my cheeks. When I couldn't get crab apples, I walked around with horse chestnuts in my cheeks. Orr giggled. Yossarian made up his mind to keep his mouth shut, and did. Or waited. Yossarian waited longer. One in each cheek, Or said. Why? Or pounced. Why what? Yossarian shook his head, smiling, and refused to say. It's a funny thing about this valve, Or mused aloud. What is? Yossarian asked. Because I wanted, Yossarian knew, Jesus Christ, why did you want apple cheeks? Apple cheeks, Yossarian demanded. I wanted apple cheeks, 
or repeated. Even when I was a kid, I wanted apple cheeks someday, and I decided to work at it until I got them, and by God, I did work at it until I got them, and that's how I did it, with crab apples in my cheeks all day long, he giggled again. One in each cheek. Why did you want apple cheeks? I didn't want apple cheeks, Orr said. I wanted big cheeks. I didn't care about the color so much, but I wanted them big. I worked at it just like one of those crazy guys you read about who go around squeezing rubber balls all day long just to strengthen their hands. In fact, I was one of those crazy guys. I used to walk around all day with rubber balls in my hands, too. Why? Why what? Why did you walk around all day with rubber balls in your hands? Because rubber balls, said Orr, are better than crab apples. Orr sniggered as he shook his head. I did it to protect my good reputation in case anyone ever caught me walking around with crab apples in my cheeks. With rubber balls in my hands, I could deny there were crab apples in my cheeks. Every time someone asked me why I was walking around with crab apples in my cheeks, I'd just open my hands and show them it was rubber balls I was walking around with, not crab apples, and that they were in my hands, not my cheeks. It was a good story. But I never knew if it got across or not, since it's pretty tough to make people understand you when you're talking to them with two crab apples in your cheeks. Yossarian found it pretty tough to understand him then, and he wondered once again if Orr wasn't talking to him with the tip of his tongue in one of his apple cheeks. Yossarian decided not to utter another word. It would be futile. He knew Orr, and he knew there was not a chance in hell of finding out from him and then why he had wanted big cheeks. It would do no more good to ask than it had done to ask him why that whore had kept beating him over the head with a shoe that morning in Rome in the cramped vestibule outside the open door of Nate Lee's whore's kid sister's room. She was a tall, strapping girl with long hair and incandescent blue veins converging populously beneath her cocoa-colored skin, where the flesh was most tender, and she kept cursing and shrieking and jumping high up into the air on her bare feet to keep right on hitting him on the top of his head with the spiked heel of her shoe. They were both naked and raising a rumpus that brought everyone in the apartment into the hall to watch, each couple in a bedroom doorway, all of them naked except the aproned and sweatered old woman who clucked reprovingly, and the lecherous, dissipated old man, who cackled aloud hilariously through the whole episode with a kind of avid and superior glee. The girl shrieked, and Orr giggled. Each time she landed with the heel of her shoe, Orr giggled louder, infuriating her still further so that she flew up still higher into the air for another shot at his noodle, her wondrously full breasts soaring all over the place like billowing pennants in a strong wind, and her buttocks and strong thighs shim-sham-shimmying this way and that way like some horrifying bonanza. She shrieked and Orr giggled right up to the time she shrieked and knocked him cold with a good solid crack on the temple that made him stop giggling and sent him off to the hospital in a stretcher with a hole in his head that wasn't very deep and a very mild concussion that kept him out of combat only twelve days. Nobody could find out what had happened, not even the cackling old man and clucking old woman who were in a position to find out everything that happened in that vast and endless brothel, with its multitudinous bedrooms on facing sides of the narrow hallways going off in opposite directions from the spacious sitting-room with its shaded windows and single lamp. Every time she met Orr after that, she'd hoist her skirts up over her tight, white elastic panties and, jeering coarsely, bulge her firm, round belly out at him, cursing him contemptuously and then roaring with husky laughter as she saw him giggle fearfully and take refuge behind Yossarian. Whatever he had done or tried to do or failed to do behind the closed door of Nately's whore's kid sister's room was still a secret. The girl wouldn't tell Nately's whore, or any of the other whores, or Nately, or Yossarian. Or might tell, but Yossarian had decided not to utter another word. Do you want to know why I wanted big cheeks? Or asked. Yossarian kept his mouth shut. Do you remember, 
Orr said. That time in Rome when that girl who can't stand you kept hitting me over the head with the heel of her shoe? Do you want to know why she was hitting me? It was still impossible to imagine what he could have done to make her angry enough to hammer him over the head for fifteen or twenty minutes, yet not angry enough to pick him up by the ankles and dash his brains out. She was certainly tall enough, and Orr was certainly short enough. Orr had buck teeth and bulging eyes to go with his big cheeks, and was even smaller than young Hoople, who lived on the wrong side of the railroad tracks, in the tent in the administration area in which Hungry Joe lay screaming in his sleep every night. The administration area in which Hungry Joe had pitched his tent by mistake lay in the center of the squadron between the ditch, with its rusted railroad tracks, and the tilted black bituminous road. The men could pick up girls along that road if they promised to take them where they wanted to go. Buxom, young, homely, grinning girls with missing teeth, whom they could drive off the road and lie down in the wild grass with. And Yossarian did whenever he could, which was not nearly as often as Hungry Joe, who could get a jeep but couldn't drive, begged him to try. The tents of the enlisted men in the squadron stood on the other side of the road, alongside the open-air movie theater, in which, for the daily amusement of the dying, ignorant armies clashed by night on a collapsible screen— and to which another USO troop came that same afternoon. The USO troops were sent by General P. P. Peckham, who had moved his headquarters up to Rome and had nothing better to do while he schemed against General Dreedle. General Peckham was a general with whom neatness definitely counted. He was a spry, suave, and very precise general, who knew the circumference of the equator and always wrote, Enhanced, when he meant increased. He was a prick, and no one knew this better than General Dreedle, who was incensed by General Peckham's recent directive requiring all tents in the Mediterranean theater of operations to be pitched along parallel lines with entrances facing back proudly toward the Washington Monument. To General Dreedle, who ran a fighting outfit, it seemed a lot of crap. Furthermore, it was none of General Peckham's goddamn business how the tents in General Dreedle's wing were pitched. There then followed a hectic jurisdictional dispute between these overlords that was decided in General Dreedle's favor by XPFC Wintergreen, mail clerk at 27th Air Force Headquarters. Wintergreen determined the outcome by throwing all communications from General Peckham into the wastebasket. He found them too prolix. General Dreedle's views, expressed in less pretentious literary style, pleased ex-PFC Wintergreen, and was sped along by him in zealous observance of regulations. General Dreedle was victorious by default. To regain whatever status he had lost, General Peckham began sending out more USO troops than he had ever sent out before, and assigned to Colonel Cargill himself the responsibility of generating enough enthusiasm for them but there was no enthusiasm in Yossarian's group. In Yossarian's group, there was only a mounting number of enlisted men and officers who found their way solemnly to Sergeant Towser several times a day to ask if the orders sending them home had come in. They were men who had finished their fifty missions. There were more of them now than when Yossarian had gone into the hospital, and they were still waiting. They worried and bit their nails. They were grotesque, like useless young men in a depression. They moved sideways, like crabs. They were waiting for the orders sending them home to safety to return from 27th Air Force Headquarters in Italy. And while they waited, they had nothing to do but worry and bite their nails and find their way solemnly to Sergeant Towser several times a day to ask if the orders sending them home to safety had come. They were in a race and knew it because they knew from bitter experience that Colonel Cathcart might raise the number of missions again at any time. They had nothing better to do than wait. Only Hungry Joe had something better to do each time he finished his missions. He had screaming nightmares and won fistfights with Hoople's cat. He took his camera to the front row of every USO show and tried to shoot pictures up the skirt of the yellow-headed singer with two big ones in a sequined dress that always seemed ready to burst. The pictures never came out. Colonel Cargill, General Peckham's troubleshooter, 
was a forceful, ruddy man. Before the war, he had been an alert, hard-hitting, aggressive marketing executive. He was a very bad marketing executive. Colonel Cargill was so awful a marketing executive that his services were much sought after by firms eager to establish losses for tax purposes. Throughout the civilized world, from Battery Park to Fulton Street, he was known as a dependable man for a fast tax write-off. His prices were high, for failure often did not come easily. He had to start at the top and work his way down, and with sympathetic friends in Washington, losing money was no simple matter. It took months of hard work and careful misplanning. A person misplaced, disorganized, miscalculated, overlooked everything and opened every loophole, and just when he thought he had it made, the government gave him a lake or a forest or an oil field and spoiled everything. Even with such handicaps, Colonel Cargill could be relied on to run the most prosperous enterprise into the ground. He was a self-made man who owed his lack of success to nobody. Men, Colonel Cargill began in Yossarian's squadron, measuring his pauses carefully. Your American officers, the officers of no other army in the world can make that statement. Think about it. Sergeant Knight thought about it, and then politely informed Colonel Cargill that he was addressing the enlisted men, and that the officers were to be found waiting for him on the other side of the squadron. Colonel Cargill thanked him crisply, and glowed with self-satisfaction as he strode across the area. It made him proud to observe that twenty-nine months in the service had not blunted his genius for ineptitude. Men! he began his address to the officers, measuring his pauses carefully. Your American officers! The officers of no other army in the world can make that statement. Think about it. He waited a moment to permit them to think about it. These people are your guests, he shouted suddenly. They've traveled over three thousand miles to entertain you. How are they going to feel if nobody wants to go out and watch them? What's going to happen to their morale? Now, men, it's no skin off my behind. But that girl that wants to play the accordion for you today is old enough to be a mother. How would you feel if your own mother traveled over three thousand miles to play the accordion for some troops that didn't want to watch her? How is that kid whose mother that accordion player is old enough to be going to feel when he grows up and learns about it? We all know the answer to that one. Now, men, don't misunderstand me. This is all voluntary, of course. I'd be the last colonel in the world to order you to go to that USO show and have a good time. But I want every one of you who isn't sick enough to be in a hospital to go to that USO show right now and have a good time. And that's an order. Eusirian did feel almost sick enough to go back into the hospital, and he felt even sicker three combat missions later when Dr. Nika still shook his melancholy head and refused to ground him. You think you've got troubles? Dr. Nika rebuked him grievingly. What about me? I lived on peanuts for eight years while I learned how to be a doctor. After the peanuts... I lived on chicken feet in my own office until I could build up a practice decent enough to even pay expenses. Then just as the shop was finally starting to show a profit, they drafted me. I don't know what you're complaining about. Dr. Nika was Yossarian's friend and would do just about nothing in his power to help him. Yossarian listened very carefully as Dr. Nika told him about Colonel Cathcart at Group who wanted to be a general, about General Dreedle at Wing, and General Dreedle's nurse, and about all the other generals at 27th Air Force Headquarters who insisted on only 40 missions as a completed tour of duty. Why don't you just smile and make the best of it? He advised Yossarian glumly. Be like Havermeyer. Yossarian shuddered at the suggestion. 
Havermeyer was a lead bombardier who never took evasive action going into the target, and thereby increased the danger of all the men who flew in the same formation with him. Havermeyer, why the hell don't you ever take evasive action? They would demand in a rage after the mission. Hey, you men leave Captain Havermeyer alone, Colonel Cathcart would order. He's the best damned bombardier we've got. Havermeyer grinned and nodded and tried to explain how he dum-dumed the bullets with a hunting knife before he fired them at the field mice in his tent every night. Havermeyer was the best damned bombardier they had, but he flew straight and level all the way from the IP to the target, and even far beyond the target, until he saw the falling bombs strike ground and explode in a darting spurt of abrupt orange that flashed beneath the swirling pall of smoke and pulverized debris, geysering up wildly in huge rolling waves of gray and black. Havermeyer held mortal men rigid in six planes, as steady and still as sitting ducks, while he followed the bombs all the way down through the plexiglass nose with deep interest and gave the German gunners below all the time they needed to set their sights and take their aim and pull their triggers or lanyards or switches or whatever the hell they did pull when they wanted to kill people they didn't know. Havermeyer was a lead bombardier who never missed. Yossarian was a lead bombardier who had been demoted because he no longer gave a damn whether he missed or not. He had decided to live forever or die in the attempt, and his only mission each time he went up was to come down alive. The men had loved flying behind Yossarian, who used to come barreling in over the target from all directions and every height, climbing and diving and twisting and turning so steeply and sharply that it was all the pilots of the other five planes could do to stay in formation with him, leveling out only for the two or three seconds it took for the bombs to drop and then zooming off again with an aching howl of engines and wrenching his flight through the air so violently as he wove his way through the filthy barrages of flak that the six planes were soon flung out all over the sky like prayers, each one a pushover for the German fighters, which was just fine with Yossarian, for there were no German fighters any more, and he did not want any exploding planes near his when they exploded. Only when all the Sturm und Drang had been left far behind would he tip his flak helmet back wearily on his sweating head and stop barking directions to McWatt at the controls, who had nothing better to wonder about at a time like that than where the bombs had fallen. Bombay clear, Sergeant Knight in the back would announce. Did we hit the bridge? McWatt would ask. I couldn't see, sir. I kept getting bounced around back here pretty hard, and I couldn't see. Everything's covered with smoke now, and I can't see. Hey, Arfie, did the bombs hit the target? What target? Captain Ardvark, Yossarian's plump, pipe-smoking navigator, would say, from the confusion of maps he had created at Yossarian's side in the nose of the ship. I don't think we're at the target yet, are we? Yes, Arian. Did the bombs hit the target? What bombs? answered Yossarian, whose only concern had been the flak. Oh, well, McWatt would sing. What the hell? Yossarian did not give a damn whether he hit the target or not. Just as long as Havermeyer or one of the other lead bombardiers did, and they never had to go back. Every now and then someone grew angry enough at Havermeyer to throw a punch at him. I said you men leave Captain Havermeyer alone, Colonel Cathcart warned them all angrily. I said he's the best damned bombardier we've got, didn't I? Havermeyer grinned at the colonel's intervention and shoved another piece of peanut brittle inside his face. Havermeyer had grown very proficient at shooting field mice at night with the gun he had stolen from the dead man in Yossarian's tent. His bait was a bar of candy and he would pre-sight in the darkness as he sat waiting for the nibble with the finger of his other hand inside a loop of the line he had run from the frame of his mosquito net to the chain of the unfrosted light bulb overhead. The line was taut as a banjo string, and the merest tug would snap it on and blind the shivering quarry in a blaze of light. 
Havermeyer would chortle exultantly as he watched the tiny mammal freeze and roll its terrified eyes about in frantic search of the intruder. Havermeyer would wait until the eyes fell upon his own, and then he laughed aloud and pulled the trigger at the same time, showering the rank, furry body all over the tent with a reverberating crash and dispatching its timid soul back to his or her creator. Late one night, Havermeyer fired a shot at a mouse that brought Hungry Joe bolting out at him barefoot, ranting at the top of his screechy voice and emptying his own forty-five into Havermeyer's tent as he came charging down one side of the ditch and up the other and vanished all at once inside one of the slit trenches that had appeared like magic beside every tent the morning after Milo Minderbinder had bombed the squadron. It was just before dawn during the great Big Siege of Bologna, when tongueless dead men peopled the night hours like living ghosts, and Hungry Joe was half out of his mind with anxiety because he had finished his missions again and was not scheduled to fly. Hungry Joe was babbling incoherently when they fished him out from the dank bottom of the slit trench, babbling of snakes, rats, and spiders. The others flashed their searchlights down just to make sure. There was nothing inside but a few inches of stagnant rainwater. You see? cried Havermeyer. I told you, I told you he was crazy, didn't I? Chapter 4 Doc Danica Hungry Joe was crazy, and no one knew it better than Yossarian, who did everything he could to help him. Hungry Joe just wouldn't listen to Yossarian. Hungry Joe just wouldn't listen because he thought Yossarian was crazy. Why should he listen to you? Doc Nanika inquired of Yossarian without looking up. Because he's got troubles. Doc Nanika snorted scornfully. He thinks he's got troubles? What about me? Doc Nanika continued slowly with a gloomy sneer. Oh, I'm not complaining. I know there's a war on. I know a lot of people are going to have to suffer for us to win it. But why must I be one of them? Why don't they draft some of these old doctors who keep shooting their kissers off in public about what big sacrifices the medical game stands ready to make? I don't want to make sacrifices. I want to make dough. Dr. Nika was a very neat, clean man whose idea of a good time was to sulk. He had a dark complexion and a small, wise, saturnine face with mournful pouches under both eyes. He brooded over his health continually and went almost daily to the medical tent to have his temperature taken by one of the two enlisted men there who ran things for him practically on their own and ran it so efficiently that he was left with little else to do but sit in the sunlight with his stuffed nose and wonder what other people were so worried about. Their names were Gus and Wes, and they had succeeded in elevating medicine to an exact science. All men reporting on sick call with temperatures above 102 were rushed to the hospital. All those, except Yossarian, reporting on sick call with temperatures below 102 had their gums and toes painted with gentian violet solution and were given a laxative to throw away into the bushes. All those reporting on sick call with temperatures of exactly 102 were asked to return in an hour to have their temperatures taken again. Yossarian with his temperature of 101, could go to the hospital whenever he wanted to because he was not afraid of them. The system worked just fine for everybody, especially for Dr. Nika, who found himself with all the time he needed to watch old Major de Coverley pitching horseshoes in his private horseshoe pitching pit, still wearing the transparent eye patch Dr. Nika had fashioned for him from the strip of celluloid stolen from Major Major's orderly room window months before, when Major de Coverley had returned from Rome with an injured cornea after renting two apartments there for the officers and enlisted men to use on their rest leaves. The only time Dr. Nika ever went to the medical tent was the time he began to feel he was a very sick man each day, and stopped in just to have Gus and Wes look him over. They could never find anything wrong with him. His temperature was always 96.8, which was perfectly all right with them as long as he didn't mind. 
Dr. Nika did mind. He was beginning to lose confidence in Gus and Wes, and was thinking of having them both transferred back to the motor pool and replaced by someone who could find something wrong. Dr. Nika was personally familiar with a number of things that were drastically wrong. In addition to his health, he worried about the Pacific Ocean and flight time. Health was something no one ever could be sure of for a long enough time. The Pacific Ocean was a body of water surrounded on all sides by elephantiasis and other dread diseases to which, if he ever displeased Colonel Cathcart by grounding Usarian, he might suddenly find himself transferred, and flight time was the time he had to spend in airplane flight each month in order to get his flight pay. Doc Danica hated to fly. He felt imprisoned in an airplane. In an airplane there was absolutely no place in the world to go except to another part of the airplane. Dr. Nika had been told that people who enjoyed climbing into an airplane were really giving vent to a subconscious desire to climb back into the womb. He had been told this by Yossarian, who made it possible for Dan Danica to collect his flight pay each month without ever climbing back into the womb. Yossarian would persuade McWatt to enter Dr. Nika's name on his flight log for training missions or trips to Rome. You know how it is, Dr. Nika had wheedled, with a sly, conspiratorial wink. Why take chances when I don't have to? Sure, Yossarian agreed. What difference does it make to anyone if I'm in the plane or not? No difference. Sure, that's what I mean, Dr. Nika said. A little grease is what makes this world go round. One hand washes the other. Know what I mean? You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Yossarian knew what he meant. That's not what I meant, Dr. Nika said as Yossarian began scratching his back. I'm talking about cooperation, favors. You do a favor for me, I'll do one for you. Get it? Do one for me, Yossarian requested. Not a chance, Dr. Nika answered. There was something fearful and minute about Dr. Nika as he sat despondently outside his tent in the sunlight as often as he could, dressed in khaki summer trousers and a short-sleeved summer shirt that was bleached almost to an antiseptic gray by the daily laundering to which he had it subjected. He was like a man who had grown frozen with horror once and had never come completely unthawed. He sat all tucked up into himself his slender shoulders huddled halfway around his head, his sun-tanned hands with their luminous silver fingernails massaging the backs of his bare folded arms gently, as though he were cold. Actually, he was a very warm, compassionate man who never stopped feeling sorry for himself. Why me? was his constant lament, and the question was a good one. Yossarian knew it was a good one because Yossarian was a collector of good questions and had used them to disrupt the educational sessions Clevenger had once conducted two nights a week in Captain Black's intelligence tents with the corporal in eyeglasses who everybody knew was probably a subversive. Captain Black knew he was a subversive because he wore eyeglasses and used words like panacea and utopia and because he disapproved of Adolf Hitler, who had done such a great job of combating un-American activities in Germany. Yossarian attended the education sessions because he wanted to find out why so many people were working so hard to kill him. A handful of other men were also interested, and the questions were many and good when Clevenger and the subversive corporal finished and made the mistake of asking if there were any. Who is Spain? Why is Hitler? When is right? Where was that stooped and mealy-colored old man I used to call Papa when the merry-go-round broke down? How was Trump at Munich? How, how, berry, berry. And balls all rang out in rapid succession. And then there was Yossarian with a question that had no answer. Where are the Snowdens of yesteryear? The question upset them, because Snowden had been killed over Avignon when Dobbs went crazy in mid-air and seized the controls away from Hoople. The corporal played it dumb. What? he asked. Where are the Snowdens of yesteryear? 
I'm afraid I don't understand. Où sont les neiges d'Inde d'antan? Yossarian said to make it easier for him. Parlez en anglais, for Christ's sake, said the corporal. Je ne parle pas français. Neither do I, answered Yossarian, who was ready to pursue him through all the words in the world to wring the knowledge from him if he could. But Clevenger intervened, pale, thin, and laboring for breath, a humid coating of tears already glistening in his undernourished eyes. Group headquarters was alarmed, for there was no telling what people might find out once they felt free to ask whatever questions they wanted to. Colonel Cathcart sent Colonel Corn to stop it, and Colonel Corn succeeded with a rule governing the asking of questions. Colonel Corn's rule was a stroke of genius. Colonel Corn explained in his report to Colonel Cathcart. Under Colonel Corn's rule, the only people permitted to ask questions were those who never did. Soon the only people attending were those who never asked questions, and the sessions were discontinued altogether, since Clevenger, the corporal, and Colonel Corn agreed that it was neither possible nor necessary to educate people who never questioned anything. Colonel Cathcart and Lieutenant Colonel Corn lived and worked in the group headquarters building, as did all the members of the headquarters staff, with the exception of the chaplain. The group headquarters building was an enormous, windy, antiquated structure built of powdery red stone and banging plumbing. Behind the building was the modern skeet-shooting range that had been constructed by Colonel Cathcart for the exclusive recreation of the officers at group, and at which every officer and enlisted man on combat status now, thanks to General Dreedle, had to spend a minimum of eight hours a month. Yossarian shot skeet, but never hit any. Appleby shot skeet and never missed. Yossarian was as bad at shooting skeet as he was at gambling. He could never win money gambling either. Even when he cheated, he couldn't win, because the people he cheated against were always better at cheating, too. These were two disappointments to which he had resigned himself. He would never be a skeet shooter, and he would never make money. "'It takes brains not to make money!' Colonel Cargill wrote in one of the homiletic memoranda he regularly prepared for circulation over General Peckham's signature. Any fool can make money these days, and most of them do. But what about people with talent and brains? Name, for example, one poet who makes money. T.S. Eliot, ex-PFC Wintergreen said in his mail-sorting cubicle at 27th Air Force headquarters and slammed down the telephone without identifying himself. Colonel Cargill, in Rome, was perplexed. "'Who was it?' asked General Peckham. "'I don't know,' Colonel Cargill replied. "'What did he want?' "'I don't know.' "'Well, what did he say?' "'T.S. Eliot,' Colonel Cargill informed him. "'What's that?' "'T.S. Eliot,' Colonel Cargill repeated. "'Just... T.S. Yes, sir, that's all he said, just T.S. Eliot. I wonder what it means, General Peckham reflected. Colonel Cargill wondered, too. T.S. Eliot, General Peckham mused. This book is continued on Disc 2. Disc 2 T. S. Eliot, General Peckham mused. T. S. Eliot, Colonel Cargill echoed, with the same funereal puzzlement. General Peckham roused himself after a moment with an unctuous and benignant smile. His expression was shrewd and sophisticated. His eyes gleamed maliciously. Have someone get me General Dreedle, he requested Colonel Cargill. Don't let him know who's calling. Colonel Cargill handed him the phone. T.S. Eliot, General Peckham said, and hung up. Who was it? asked Colonel Moodis. General Dreedle, in Corsica, did not reply. Colonel Moodis was General Dreedle's son-in-law, and General Dreedle, at the insistence of his wife and against his own better judgment, had taken him into the military business. General Dreedle gazed at Colonel Moodis, with level hatred. He detested the very sight of his son-in-law, who was his aide, 
and therefore in constant attendance upon him. He had opposed his daughter's marriage to Colonel Moodis because he disliked attending weddings. Wearing a menacing and preoccupied scowl, General Dreedle moved to the full-length mirror in his office and stared at his stocky reflection. He had a grizzled, broad-browed head with iron-gray tufts over his eyes and a blunt and belligerent jaw. He brooded in ponderous speculation over the cryptic message he had just received. Slowly, his face softened with an idea, and he curled his lips with wicked pleasure. "'Get Peckham,' he told Colonel Moodis. "'Don't let the bastard know who's calling.' "'Who was it?' asked Colonel Cargill back in Rome. "'That same person,' with a definite trace of alarm. "'Now he's after me.' "'What did he want?' "'I don't know. What did he say?' "'The same thing.' "'T.S. Eliot?' "'Yes. T.S. Eliot. That's all he said.' General Peckham had a hopeful thought. "'Perhaps it's a new code or something, like the colors of the day. "'Why don't you have someone check with communications?' and see if it's a new code or something, or, or the colors of the day. Communications answered that T.S. Eliot was not a new code or the colors of the day. Colonel Cargill had the next idea. Maybe I ought to phone 27th Air Force Headquarters and see if they know anything about it. They have a clerk up there named Wintergreen I'm pretty close to. He's the one who tipped me off that our prose was too prolix. XPFC Wintergreen told Colonel Cargill that there was no record at 27th Air Force Headquarters of a T.S. Eliot. How's our prose these days? Colonel Cargill decided to inquire, while he had XPFC Wintergreen on the phone. It's much better now, isn't it? It's still too prolix, XPFC Wintergreen replied. It wouldn't surprise me if General Dreedle were behind the whole thing. General Peckham confessed at last. Remember what he did to that skeet shooting range? General Dreedle had thrown open Colonel Cathcart's private skeet shooting range to every officer and enlisted man in the group on combat duty. General Dreedle wanted his men to spend as much time out on the skeet shooting range as the facilities and their flight schedule would allow. Shooting skeet eight hours a month was excellent training for them. It trained them to shoot skeet. Dunbar loved shooting skeet, because he hated every minute of it, and the time passed so slowly. He had figured out that a single hour on the skeet shooting range with people like Havermeyer and Appleby could be worth as much as eleven times seventeen years. "'I think you're crazy,' was the way Clevenger had responded to Dunbar's discovery. "'Who wants to know?' Dunbar answered. "'I mean it!' Clevenger insisted. Who cares? Dunbar answered. I really do. I'll even go so far as to concede that life seems longer, is longer, is longer, is longer? All right, is longer if it's filled with periods of boredom and discomfort, but guess how fast? Dunbar said suddenly. Huh? They go, Dunbar explained. Who? Years. Years? Years, said Dunbar. Years, years, years. Clevenger, why don't you let Dunbar alone? Yossarian broke in. Don't you realize the toll this is taking? It's all right, said Dunbar magnanimously. I have some decades to spare. Do you know how long a year takes when it's going away? And you shut up also, Yossarian told Orr, who had begun to snigger. I was just thinking about that girl. Or said, that girl in Sicily, that girl in Sicily with the bald head? You'd better shut up also, Yossarian warned him. It's your fault, Dunbar said to Yossarian. Why don't you let him snigger if he wants to? It's better than having him talking. All right, go ahead and snigger if you want to. Do you know how long a year takes when it's going away? Dunbar repeated to Clevenger. This long. He snapped his fingers. A second ago, you were stepping into college with your lungs full of fresh air. Today, you're an old man. Old? asked Clevenger with surprise. What are you talking about? Old. I'm not old. You're inches away from death every time you go on a mission. 
How much older can you be at your age? A half minute before that, you were stepping into high school, and an unhooked brassiere was as close as you ever hoped to get to paradise. Only a fifth of a second before that, you were a small kid with a ten-week summer vacation that lasted a hundred thousand years and still ended too soon. Zip! They go rocketing by so fast. How the hell else are you ever going to slow time down? Dunbar was almost angry when he finished. Well, maybe it is true. Clevenger conceded unwillingly in a subdued tone. Maybe a long life does have to be filled with many unpleasant conditions if it's to seem long. But in that event, who wants one? I do, Dunbar told him. Why? Clevenger asked. What else is there? Chapter Five, Chief White Half Oat. Doc Danica lived in a splotched gray tent with Chief White Half Oat, whom he feared and despised. I can just picture his liver, Doc Danica grumbled. Picture my liver, Yasarian advised him. There's nothing wrong with your liver. That shows how much you don't know. Yossarian bluffed, and told Dr. Nika about the troublesome pain in his liver that had troubled Nurse Duckett and Nurse Kramer and all the doctors in the hospital because it wouldn't become jaundice and wouldn't go away. Dr. Nika wasn't interested. You think you've got troubles? He wanted to know. What about me? You should have been in my office the day those newlyweds walked in. What newlyweds? Those newlyweds that walked into my office one day. Didn't I ever tell you about them? She was lovely. So was Dr. Nika's office. He had decorated his waiting room with goldfish and one of the finest suites of cheap furniture. Whatever he could, he bought on credit, even the goldfish. For the rest, he obtained money from greedy relatives in exchange for shares of the profits. His office was in Staten Island, in a two-family fire trap just four blocks away from the ferry stop and only one block south of a supermarket, three beauty parlors, and two corrupt druggists. It was a corner location, but nothing helped. Population turnover was small, and people clung through habit to the same physicians they had been doing business with for years. Bills piled up rapidly, and he was soon faced with the loss of his most precious medical instruments. His adding machine was repossessed, and then his typewriter. The goldfish died. Fortunately, just when things were blackest, the war broke out. It was a godsend, Doctor Nika confessed solemnly. Most of the other doctors were soon in the service. And things picked up overnight. The corner location really started paying off, and I soon found myself handling more patients than I could handle competently. I upped my kickback fee with those two drug stores. The beauty parlors were good for two, three abortions a week. Things couldn't have been better. And then look what happened. They had to send a guy from the draft board around to look me over. I was four F. I had examined myself pretty thoroughly and discovered that I was unfit for military service. You'd think my word would be enough, wouldn't you? Since I was a doctor in good standing with my county medical society and with my local Better Business Bureau, but no, it wasn't. And they sent this guy around just to make sure I really did have one leg amputated at the hip and was helplessly bedridden with incurable rheumatoid arthritis. Yossarian. We live in an age of distrust and deteriorating spiritual values. It's a terrible thing, Doctor Nika protested in a voice quavering with strong emotion. It's a terrible thing when even the word of a licensed physician is suspected by the country he loves. Doctor Nika had been drafted and shipped to Pianosa as a flight surgeon, even though he was terrified of flying. I don't have to go looking for trouble in an airplane," he noted, blinking his beady brown, offended eyes myopically. "It comes looking for me, like that virgin I'm telling you about that couldn't have a baby." "What virgin?" Yossarian asked. "I thought you were telling me about some newlyweds." 
That's the virgin I'm telling you about. They were just a couple of young kids, and they'd been married a, a little over a year when they came walking into my office without an appointment. You should have seen her. She was so sweet and young and pretty. She even blushed when I asked about her periods. I don't think I'll ever stop loving that girl. She was built like a dream and wore a chain around her neck with a medal of St. Anthony hanging down inside the most beautiful bosom I never saw. It must be a terrible temptation for St. Anthony, I joked, just to put her at ease, you know. St. Anthony, her husband said, who's St. Anthony? Ask your wife, I told him. She can tell you who St. Anthony is. Who is St. Anthony, he asked her. Who, she wanted to know. St. Anthony, he told her. St. Anthony, she said. Who's St. Anthony? When I got a good look at her inside my examination room, I found she was still a virgin. I spoke to her husband alone while she was pulling her girdle back on and hooking it onto her stockings. Every night, he boasted. A real wise guy, you know. I never miss a night, he boasted. He meant it, too. I've been putting it to her mornings before the breakfast she makes me before we go to work, he boasted. There was only one explanation. When I had them both together again, I gave them a demonstration of intercourse with the rubber models I've got in my office. I've got these rubber models in my office with all the reproductive organs of both sexes that I keep locked up in separate cabinets to avoid a scandal. I mean, I used to have them. I don't have anything any more. Not even a practice. The only thing I have now is this low temperature that I'm really starting to worry about. Those two kids I've got working for me in the medical tent aren't worth a damn as diagnosticians. All they know how to do is complain. They think they've got troubles? What about me? They should have been in my office that day with those two newlyweds looking at me as though I were telling them something nobody had ever heard of before. You never saw anybody so interested. You mean like this? he asked me and worked the models for himself for a while. You know, I can see where a certain type of person might get a big kick out of doing just that. That's it, I told him. Now you go home and try it my way for a few months and see what happens, okay? Okay, they said, and paid me in cash without any argument. Have a good time, I told them, and they thanked me and walked out together. He had his arm around her waist as though he couldn't wait to get her home and put it to her again. A few days later, he came back all by himself and told my nurse he had to see me right away. As soon as we were alone, he punched me in the nose. He did what? He called me a wise guy and punched me in the nose. What are you, a wise guy, he said, and knocked me flat on my ass. Pow, just like that. I'm not kidding. I know you're not kidding, the Assyrian said. But why did he do it? How should I know why he did it? Dr. Nika retorted with annoyance. Maybe that's something to do with St. Anthony. Dr. Nika looked at Yossarian blankly. St. Anthony? He asked with astonishment. Who's St. Anthony? Who should I know? Answered Chief White Half Oat, staggering inside the tent just then with a bottle of whiskey cradled in his arm and sitting himself down pugnaciously between the two of them. Dr. Nika rose without a word and moved his chair outside the tent his back bowed by the compact kit of injustices that was his perpetual burden. He could not bear the company of his roommate. Chief White Half-Oat thought he was crazy. "'I don't know what's the matter with that guy,' he observed reproachfully. "'He's got no brains. That's what's the matter with him. If he had any brains, he'd grab a shovel and start digging. Right here in the tent he'd start digging, right under my cot.' He'd strike oil in no time. Don't he know how that enlisted man struck oil with a shovel back in the States? Didn't he ever hear what happened to that kid? What was the name of that rotten rat bastard pimp of a snot nose back in Colorado? Wintergreen. Wintergreen. He's afraid, Yossarian explained. Oh, no, not Wintergreen. Chief White Halfoat shook his head with undisguised admiration. That stinking little punk wise guy son of a bitch ain't afraid of nobody. Dr. Neek is afraid. That's what's the matter with him. What's he afraid of? He's afraid of you, Yossarian said. He's afraid you're going to die of pneumonia. 
He'd better be afraid, Chief White Half Oat said. A deep, low laugh rumbled through his massive chest. I will, too, the first chance I get. You just wait and see. Chief White Half Oat was a handsome, swarthy Indian from Oklahoma with a heavy, hard boned face and tousled black hair, a half blooded Creek from Enid, who, for occult reasons of his own, had made up his mind to die of pneumonia. He was a glowering, vengeful, disillusioned Indian who hated foreigners with names like Cathcart, Corn, Black, and Havermeyer, and wished they'd all go back to where their lousy ancestors had come from. You wouldn't believe it, Yossarian, he ruminated, raising his voice deliberately to bait Dr. Nika. But this used to be a pretty good country to live in before they loused it up with their goddamn piety. Chief White Halfoat was out to revenge himself upon the white man. He could barely read or write, and had been assigned to Captain Black as assistant intelligence officer. How could I learn to read or write? Chief White Halfoat demanded with simulated belligerence, raising his voice again so that Doc Danica would hear. Every place we pitched our tent... They sank an oil well. Every time they sank a well, they hit oil. And every time they hit oil, they made us pack up our tent and go someplace else. We were human divining rods. Our whole family had a natural affinity for petroleum deposits. And soon every oil company in the world had technicians chasing us around. We were always on the move. There was one hell of a way to bring a child up, I can tell you. I don't think I ever spent more than a week in one place. His earliest memory was of a geologist. Every time another white half-oat was born, he continued, the stock market turned bullish. Soon whole drilling crews were following us around with all their equipment just to get the jump on each other. Companies began to merge just so they could cut down on the number of people they had to assign to us. But the crowd in back of us kept growing. We never got a good night's sleep. When we stopped, they stopped. When we moved, they moved. Chuck wagons, bulldozers, Derrick's generators. We were a walking business boom. And we began to receive invitations from some of the best hotels just for the amount of business we would drag into town with us. Some of those invitations were mighty generous. But we couldn't accept any because we were Indians, and all the best hotels that were inviting us wouldn't accept Indians as guests. Racial prejudice is a terrible thing, Assyrian. It really is. It's a terrible thing to treat a decent, loyal Indian like a nigger, kike, wop, or spick. Chief White Half Oat nodded slowly with conviction. Then, Yossarian, it finally happened the beginning of the end. They began to follow us around from in front. They would try to guess where we were going to stop next and would begin drilling before we even got there, so we couldn't even stop. As soon as we'd begin to unroll our blankets, they would kick us off. They had confidence in us. They wouldn't even wait to strike oil before they kicked us off. We were so tired, we almost didn't care. The day our time ran out. One morning, we found ourselves completely surrounded by oil men waiting for us to come their way so they could kick us off. Everywhere you looked, there was an oil man on a ridge, waiting there like Indians getting ready to attack. It was the end. We couldn't stay where we were because we had just been kicked off, and there was no place left for us to go. Only the army saved me. Luckily, the war broke out just in the nick of time, and a draft board picked me right up out of the middle and put me down safely in Lowry Field, Colorado. I was the only survivor. Yossarian knew he was lying, but did not interrupt as Chief White Halfoat went on to claim that he had never heard from his parents again. That didn't bother him too much, though for he had only their word for it that they were his parents. And since they had lied to him about so many other things, they could just as well have been lying to him about that, too. He was much better acquainted with the fate of a tribe of first cousins who had wandered away north in a diversionary movement and pushed inadvertently into Canada. 
When they tried to return, they were stopped at the border by American immigration authorities who would not let them back into the country. They could not come back in because they were red. It was a horrible joke, but Doc Danica didn't laugh until Yossarian came to him one mission later and pleaded again, without any real expectation of success, to be grounded. Doc Danica snickered once and was soon immersed in problems of his own, which included Chief White Halfoat, who had been challenging him all that morning to Indian wrestle, and Yossarian, who decided right then and there to go crazy. You're wasting your time. Dr. Nika was forced to tell him. Can't you ground someone who's crazy? Well, sure, I have to. There's a rule saying I have to ground anyone who's crazy. Then why don't you ground me? I'm crazy. I ask Clevenger. Clevenger? Where is Clevenger? You find Clevenger and I'll ask him. Then ask any of the others. They'll tell you how crazy I am. They're crazy. Then why don't you ground them? Why do they ask me to ground them? Because they're crazy, that's why. Of course they're crazy, Dr. Nika replied. I just told you they're crazy, didn't I? And you can't let crazy people decide whether you're crazy or not, can you? The Sarian looked at him soberly and tried another approach. Is Orr crazy? He sure is, Dr. Nika said. Can you ground him? I sure can. But first he has to ask me to. That's part of the rule. Then why doesn't he ask you to? Because he's crazy, Dr. Nika said. He has to be crazy to keep flying combat missions after all the close calls he's had. Sure, I can ground or, but first he has to ask me to. That's all he has to do to be grounded? That's all. Let him ask me. And then you can ground him? Yossarian asked. No, then I can't ground him. You mean there's a catch? Sure, there's a catch, Dr. Nika replied. Catch 22. Anyone who wants to get out of combat duty isn't really crazy. There was only one catch, and that was Catch 22, which specified that a concern for one's own safety in the face of dangers that were real and immediate was the process of a rational mind. Or was crazy and could be grounded. All he had to do was ask, and as soon as he did, he would no longer be crazy and would have to fly more missions. Or would be crazy to fly more missions, and sane if he didn't. But if he was sane, he had to fly them. If he flew them, he was crazy and didn't have to, but if he didn't want to, he was sane and had to. Cassarian was moved very deeply by the absolute simplicity of this clause of Catch-22, and let out a respectful whistle. That's some catch, that catch-22, he observed. It's the best there is, Dr. Nika agreed. Yossarian saw it clearly in all its spinning reasonableness. There was an elliptical precision about its perfect pairs of parts that was graceful and shocking, like good modern art. And at times Yossarian wasn't quite sure that he saw it all— just the way he was never quite sure about good modern art, or about the flies Orr saw in Appleby's eyes. He had Orr's word to take for the flies in Appleby's eyes. Oh, they're there all right, Orr had assured him about the flies in Appleby's eyes, after Yossarian's fistfight with Appleby in the officers' club. Although he probably doesn't even know it. That's why he can't see things as they really are. How come he doesn't know it? inquired Yossarian. Because he's got flies in his eyes, or explained with exaggerated patience. How can he see he's got flies in his eyes if he's got flies in his eyes? It made as much sense as anything else. And Yossarian was willing to give Orr the benefit of the doubt, because Orr was from the wilderness outside New York City and knew so much more about wildlife than Yossarian did, and because Orr, Unlike Yossarian's mother, father, sister, brother, aunt, uncle, in-law, teacher, spiritual leader, legislator, neighbor, and newspaper, had never lied to him about anything crucial before. Yossarian had mulled his newfound knowledge about Appleby over in private for a day or two, and then decided as a good deed to pass the word along to Appleby, 
himself. Psst. Appleby, you got flies in your eyes, he whispered helpfully as they passed by each other in the doorway of the parachute tent on the day of the weekly milk run to Parma. What? Appleby responded sharply, thrown into confusion by the fact that Yossarian had spoken to him at all. You've got flies in your eyes, Yossarian repeated. That's probably why you can't see them. Appleby retreated from Yossarian with a look of loathing bewilderment and sulked in silence until he was in the jeep with Havermeyer riding down the long, straight road to the briefing room, where Major Danby, the fidgeting group operations officer, was waiting to conduct the preliminary briefing with all the lead pilots, bombardiers, and navigators. Appleby spoke in a soft voice so that he would not be heard by the driver or by Captain Black, who was stretched out with his eyes closed in the front seat of the jeep. Havermeyer, he asked hesitantly, have I got flies in my eyes? Havermeyer blinked quizzically. Sties? he asked. No, flies, he was told. Havermeyer blinked again. Flies? In my eyes. You must be crazy, Havermeyer said. No, I'm not crazy. Your Sarian's crazy. Just tell me if I've got flies in my eyes or not. Go ahead, I can take it. Havermeyer popped another piece of peanut brittle into his mouth and peered very closely into Appleby's eyes. I don't see any, he announced. Appleby heaved an immense sigh of relief. Havermeyer had tiny bits of peanut brittle adhering to his lips, chin, and cheeks. You've got peanut brittle crumbs on your face, Appleby remarked to him. I'd rather have peanut brittle crumbs on my face than flies in my eyes, Havermeyer retorted. The officers of the other five planes in each flight arrived in trucks for the general briefing that took place thirty minutes later. The three enlisted men in each crew were not briefed at all, but were carried directly out on the airfield to the separate planes in which they were scheduled to fly that day, where they waited around the ground crew until the officers with whom they had been scheduled to fly swung off the rattling tailgates of the trucks, delivering them, and it was time to climb aboard and start up. Engines rolled over disgruntledly on lollipop-shaping hardstands, resisting first, then idling smoothly a while, and then the planes lumbered around and nosed forward lamely over the pebbled ground like sightless, stupid, crippled things, until they taxied into the line at the foot of the landing strip and took off swiftly, one behind the other, in a zooming, rising roar banking slowly into formation over mottled treetops and circling the field at even speed until all the flights of six had been formed, and then setting course over cerulean water on the first leg of the journey to the target in northern Italy or France. The planes gained altitude steadily and were above 9,000 feet by the time they crossed into enemy territory. One of the surprising things always was the sense of calm, and utter silence, broken only by the test rounds fired from the machine guns, by an occasional toneless, terse remark over the intercom, and, at last, by the sobering pronouncement of the bombardier in each plane that they were at the IP and about to turn toward the target. There was always sunshine, always a tiny sticking in the throat from the rarefied air. The B-25s they flew in were stable, dependable, dull green ships with twin rudders and engines and wide wings. The single fault from where Yossarian sat as a bombardier was the tight crawlway separating the bombardier's compartment in the plexiglass nose from the nearest escape hatch. The crawlway was a narrow, square, cold tunnel, hollowed out beneath the flight controls, and a large man like Yossarian could squeeze through only with difficulty. A chubby, moon-faced navigator with little reptilian eyes and a pipe, like Arfie's, had trouble, too. And Yossarian used to chase him back from the nose as they turned toward the target, now minutes away. There was a time of tension, then, a time of waiting with nothing to hear and nothing to see and nothing to do but wait.
as the anti-aircraft guns below took aim and made ready to knock them all sprawling into infinite sleep, if they could. The crawlway was Yossarian's lifeline to outside from a plane about to fall. But Yossarian swore at it with seething antagonism, reviled it as an obstacle put there by Providence as part of the plot that would destroy him. There was room for an additional escape hatch right there in the nose of a B-25, but there was no escape hatch. Instead, there was the crawlway, and since the mess on the mission over Avignon, he had learned to detest every mammoth inch of it, for it slung him seconds and seconds away from his parachute, which was too bulky to be taken up front with him, and seconds and seconds more after that away from the escape hatch on the floor between the rear of the elevated flight deck and the feet of the faceless top turret gunner mounted high above. Yossarian longed to be where Arfi could be, once Yossarian had chased him back from the nose. Yossarian longed to sit on the floor in a huddled ball right on top of the escape hatch inside a sheltering igloo of extra flak suits that he would have been happy to carry along with him, his parachute already hooked to his harness where it belonged, one fist clenching the red-handled ripcord, one fist gripping the emergency hatch release that would spill him earthward into air at the first dreadful squeal of destruction. That was where he wanted to be if he had to be there at all. Instead of hung out there in front like some goddamn cantilevered goldfish in some goddamn cantilevered goldfish bowl, while the goddamn foul black tears of flack were bursting and booming and billowing all around and above and below him in a climbing, cracking, staggered, banging, phantasmagorical, cosmological wickedness that jarred and tossed and shivered, clattered and pierced and threatened to annihilate them all in one splinter of a second in one vast flash of fire. Arfi had been no use to Yossarian as a navigator or as anything else, and Yossarian drove him back from the nose vehemently each time so that they would not clutter up each other's way if they had to scramble suddenly for safety. Once Yossarian had driven him back from the nose, Arfi was free to cower on the floor where Yossarian longed to cower, but he stood bolt upright instead, with his stumpy arms resting comfortably on the backs of the pilots and co-pilot seats, pipe in hand, making affable small talk to McWatt and whoever happened to be co-pilot, and pointing out amusing trivia in the sky to the two men, who were too busy to be interested. McWatt was too busy responding at the controls to Yossarian's strident instructions as Yossarian slipped the plane in on the bomb run and then whipped them all away violently around the ravenous pillars of exploding shells with curt, shrill, obscene commands to McWatt that were much like the anguished and treating nightmare yelpings of hungry Joe in the dark. Arfi would puff reflectively on his pipe, throughout the whole chaotic clash, gazing with unruffled curiosity at the war through McWatt's window, as though it were a remote disturbance that could not affect him. Arthur was a dedicated fraternity man who loved cheerleading and class reunions and did not have brains enough to be afraid. Yossarian did have brains enough and was and the only thing that stopped him from abandoning his post under fire and scurrying back through the crawlway like a yellow-bellied rat was his unwillingness to entrust the evasive action out of the target area to anybody else. There was nobody else in the world he would honor with so great a responsibility. There was nobody else he knew who was as big a coward. Yossarian was the best man in the group at evasive action, but had no idea why. There was no established procedure for evasive action. All you needed was fear, and Yossarian had plenty of that. More fear than Orr or Hungry Joe, more fear even than Dunbar, who had resigned himself submissively to the idea that he must die some day. Yossarian had not resigned himself to that idea, and he bolted for his life wildly on each mission the instant his bombs were away, hollering, 
Hard, you bastard, hard! At McWatt, and hating McWatt viciously all the time, as though McWatt were to blame for their being up there at all to be rubbed out by strangers, and everybody else in the plane kept off the intercom except for the pitiful time of the mess on the mission to Avignon, when Dobbs went crazy in midair and began weeping pathetically for help. Help him! Help him! Dobbs sobbed. Help him! Help him! Help who? Help who? called back Yasarian, once he had plugged his headset back into the intercom system after it had been jerked out when Dobbs wrested the controls away from Hoople and hurled them all down suddenly into the deafening, paralyzing, horrifying dive which had plastered Yasarian helplessly to the ceiling of the plane by the top of his head and from which Hoople had rescued them just in time by seizing the controls back from Dobbs and leveling the ship out almost as suddenly right back in the middle of the buffeting layer of cacophonous flak from from which they had escaped successfully only a moment before. Oh, God! Oh, God! Oh, God! Yossarian had been pleading wordlessly as he dangled from the ceiling of the nose of the ship by the top of his head, unable to move. The bombardier! The bombardier! Dobbs answered in a cry when Yossarian spoke. He doesn't answer! He doesn't answer! Help the bombardier! Help the bombardier! I'm the bombardier! Yossarian cried back at him. I'm the bombardier! I'm all right! I'm all right! Then help him! Help him! Dobbs begged. Help him! Help him! And Snowden lay dying in back. Chapter 6 Hungry Joe Hungry Joe did have fifty missions, but they were no help. He had his bags packed and was waiting again to go home. At night he had eerie, ear-splitting nightmares that kept everyone in the squadron awake but Hoople, the fifteen-year-old pilot who had lied about his age to get into the army and lived with his pet cat in the same tent with Hungry Joe. Hoople was a light sleeper, but claimed he never heard Hungry Joe scream. Hungry Joe was sick. So what? Dr. Nika snarled resentfully. I had it made, I tell you. Fifty grand a year I was knocking down, and almost all of it tax-free, since I made my customers pay me in cash. I had the strongest trade association in the world backing me up, and look what happened. Just when I was all set to really start stashing it away, they had to manufacture fascism and start a war horrible enough to affect even me. Oh, I gotta laugh when I hear someone like Hungry Joe screaming his brains out every night. I really gotta laugh. He's sick? How does he think I feel? Hungry Joe was too firmly embedded in calamities of his own to care how Doc Danica felt. There were the noises for instance. Small ones enraged him, and he hollered himself hoarse at Arfi for the wet, sucking sounds he made puffing on his pipe, at Orr for tinkering, at McWatt for the explosive snap he gave each card he turned over when he dealt at blackjack or poker, at Dobbs for letting his teeth chatter as he went blundering clumsily about, bumping into things. Hungry Joe was a throbbing, ragged mass of modal irritability. The steady ticking of a watch in a quiet room crashed like torture against his unshielded brain. Listen, kid, he explained harshly to Hoople very late one evening. If you want to live in this tent, you got to do like I do. You've got to roll your wristwatch up in a pair of wool socks every night and keep it on the bottom of your footlock or on the other side of the room. Hoople thrust his jaw out defiantly to let Hungry Joe know he couldn't be pushed around, and then did exactly as he had been told. Hungry Joe was a jumpy, emaciated wretch with a fleshless face of dingy skin and bone, and twitching veins squirming subcutaneously in the blackened hollows behind his eyes like severed sections of snake. It was a desolate, cratered face, sooty with care, like an abandoned mining town. Hungry Joe ate voraciously, gnawed incessantly at the tips of his fingers, stammered, choked, itched, sweated, salivated, and sprang from spot to spot fanatically with an intricate black camera with which he was always trying to take pictures of naked girls. They never came out. 
He was always forgetting to put film in the camera, or turn on lights, or remove the cover from the lens opening. It wasn't easy persuading naked girls to pose, but Hungry Joe had the knack. Me big man, he would shout. Me big photographer from Life magazine. Big picture on heap big cover. See, see, see. Hollywood star. Multi denaro. Multi divorces. Multi ficky fick all day long. Few women anywhere could resist such wily cajolery, and prostitutes would spring to their feet eagerly and hurl themselves into whatever fantastic poses he requested of them. Women killed Hungry Joe. His response to them as sexual beings was one of frenzied worship and idolatry. They were lovely, satisfying, maddening manifestations of the miraculous, instruments of pleasure too powerful to be measured, too keen to be endured, and too exquisite to be intended for employment by base, unworthy man. He could interpret their naked presence in his hands only as a cosmic oversight destined to be rectified speedily. And he was driven always to make what carnal use of them he could in the fleeting moment or two he felt he had before someone caught wise and whisked them away. He could never decide whether to fergle them or photograph them, for he had found it impossible to do both simultaneously. In fact, he was finding it almost impossible to do either, so scrambled were his powers of performance by the compulsive need for haste that invariably possessed him. The pictures never came out, and Hungry Joe never got in. The odd thing was that in civilian life, Hungry Joe really had been a photographer for Life magazine. He was a hero now, the biggest hero the Air Force had, Yesarian felt, for he had flown more combat tours of duty than any other hero the Air Force had. He had flown six combat tours of duty. Hungry Joe had finished flying his first combat tour of duty when twenty-five missions were all that were necessary for him to pack his bags, write happy letters home, and begin hounding Sergeant Towser humorously for the arrival of the orders rotating him back to the States. While he waited, he spent each day shuffling rhythmically around the entrance of the operations tent, making boisterous wisecracks to everybody who came by, and jocosely calling Sergeant Towser a lousy son of a bitch every time Sergeant Towser popped out of the orderly room. Hungry Joe had finished flying his first twenty-five missions during the week of the Salerno beachhead, when Yossarian was laid up in the hospital with a burst of clap he had caught on a low-level mission over a whack in bushes on a supply flight to Marrakesh. Yossarian did his best to catch up with Hungry Joe, and almost did, flying six missions in six days. But his twenty-third mission was to Arezzo, where Colonel Nevers was killed, and that was as close as he had ever been able to come to going home. The next day, Colonel Cathcart was there, brimming with tough pride in his new outfit and celebrating his assumption of command by raising the number of missions required from twenty-five to thirty. Hungry Joe unpacked his bags and rewrote the happy letters home. He stopped hounding Sergeant Towser humorously. He began hating Sergeant Towser, focusing all blame upon him venomously, even though he knew Sergeant Towser had nothing to do with the arrival of Colonel Cathcart or the delay in the processing of shipping orders that might have rescued him seven days earlier and five times since. Hungry Joe could no longer stand the strain of waiting for shipping orders and crumbled promptly into ruin every time he finished another tour of duty. Each time he was taken off combat status, he gave a big party for the little circle of friends he had. He broke out the bottles of bourbon he had managed to buy in his four-day weekly circuits with a courier plane, and laughed, sang, shuffled, and shouted in a festival of inebriated ecstasy until he could no longer keep awake and receded peacefully into slumber. As soon as Yossarian, Nately, and Dunbar put him to bed, he began screaming in his sleep. In the morning he stepped from his tent looking haggard, fearful, and guilt-ridden, an eaten shell of a human building rocking perilously on the brink of collapse. The nightmares appeared to Hungry Joe with celestial punctuality every single night he spent in the squadron throughout the whole harrowing ordeal when he was not flying combat missions and was waiting once again for the orders sending him home 
that never came. Impressionable men in the squadron, like Dobbs and Captain Flume, were so deeply disturbed by Hungry Joe's shrieking nightmares that they would begin to have shrieking nightmares of their own, and the piercing obscenities they flung into the air every night from their separate places in the squadron rang against each other in the darkness romantically, like the mating calls of songbirds with filthy minds. Colonel Korn acted decisively to arrest what seemed to him to be the beginning of an unwholesome trend in Major Major's squadron. The solution he provided was to have Hungry Joe fly the courier ship once a week, removing him from the squadron for four nights. And the remedy, like all Colonel Korn's remedies, was successful. Every time Colonel Cathcart increased the number of missions and returned Hungry Joe to combat duty, the nightmare stopped and Hungry Joe settled down into a normal state of terror, with a smile of relief. Yossarian read Hungry Joe's shrunken face like a headline. It was good when Hungry Joe looked bad, and terrible when Hungry Joe looked good. Hungry Joe's inverted set of responses was a curious phenomenon to everyone but Hungry Joe, who denied the whole thing stubbornly. Who dreams? he answered, when Yossarian asked him what he dreamed about. Joe, why don't you go see Dr. Nika? Yossarian advised. Why should I go see Dr. Nika? I'm not sick. What about your nightmares? I don't have nightmares, Hungry Joe lied. Maybe he can do something about them. There's nothing wrong with nightmares, Hungry Joe answered. Everybody has nightmares. Yossarian thought he had him. Every night, he asked. Why not every night, Hungry Joe demanded. And suddenly, it all made sense. Why not every night, indeed? It made sense to cry out in pain every night. It made more sense than Appleby, who was a stickler for regulations, and had ordered Kraft to order Yossarian to take his Atabrine tablets on the flight overseas after Yossarian and Appleby had stopped talking to each other. Hungry Joe made more sense than Kraft, too who was dead, dumped unceremoniously into doom over Ferrara by an exploding engine after Yossarian took his flight of six planes in over the target a second time. The group had missed the bridge at Ferrara again for the seventh straight day, with a bomb site that could put bombs into a pickle barrel at 40,000 feet, and one whole week had already passed since Colonel Cathcart had volunteered to have his men destroy the bridge in 24 hours. Kraft was a skinny, harmless kid from Pennsylvania who wanted only to be liked and was destined to be disappointed in even so humble and degrading an ambition. Instead of being liked, he was dead, a bleeding cinder on the barbarous pile whom nobody had heard in those last precious moments while the plane with one wing plummeted. He had lived innocuously for a little while, and then had gone down in flame over Ferrara on the seventh day, while God was resting. When McWatt turned, and Yossarian guided him in over the target on a second bomb run, because Arfi was confused, and Yossarian had been unable to drop his bombs the first time. I guess we do have to go back again, don't we? McWatt had said somberly over the intercom. I guess we do, said Yossarian. Do we? said McWatt. Yeah. Oh, well, sang McWatt. What the hell? And back they had gone, while the planes in the other flights circled safely off in the distance, and every crashing cannon in the Hermann Goering division below was busy crashing shells, this time only at them. Colonel Cathcart had courage and never hesitated to volunteer his men for any target available. No target was too dangerous for his group to attack, just as no shot was too difficult for Appleby to handle on the ping-pong table. Appleby was a good pilot and a superhuman ping-pong player with flies in his eyes who never lost a point. Twenty-one serves were all it ever took for Appleby to disgrace another opponent. His prowess on the ping-pong table was legendary, and Appleby won every game he started until the night Orr got tipsy on gin and juice and smashed open Appleby's forehead with his paddle after Appleby had smashed back each of Orr's first five serves. 
or leaped on top of the table after hurling his paddle and came sailing off the other end in a running broad jump with both feet planted squarely in Appleby's face. Pandemonium broke loose. It took almost a full minute for Appleby to disentangle himself from Orr's flailing arms and legs and grope his way to his feet, with Orr held off the ground before him by the shirt front in one hand and his other arm drawn back in a fist to smite him dead. And at that moment, Yossarian stepped forward and took Orr away from him. It was a night of surprises for Appleby who was as large as Yossarian and as strong, and who swung at Yossarian as hard as he could with a punch that flooded Chief White Half out with such joyous excitement that he turned and busted Colonel Moodus in the nose with a punch that filled General Dreedle with such mellow gratification that he had Colonel Cathcart throw the chaplain out of the officers' club and ordered Chief White half moved into Dr. Nika's tent, where he could be under a doctor's care twenty-four hours a day and be kept in good enough physical condition to bust Colonel Moodus in the nose again whenever General Dreedle wanted him to. Sometimes General Dreedle made special trips down from wing headquarters with Colonel Moodus and his nurse just to have Chief White half bust his son-in-law in the nose. Chief White half would much rather have remained in the trailer he shared with Captain Flume, the silent, haunted squadron public relations officer who spent most of each evening developing the pictures he took during the day to be sent out with his publicity releases. Captain Flume spent as much of each evening as he could working in his dark room, and then lay down on his cot with his fingers crossed and a rabbit's foot around his neck and tried with all his might to stay awake. He lived in mortal fear of Chief White Half-Oat. Captain Flume was obsessed with the idea that Chief White Half-Oat would tiptoe up to his cot one night when he was sound asleep and slit his throat open for him from ear to ear. Captain Flume had obtained this idea from Chief White Half-Oat himself, who did tiptoe up to his cot one night as he was dozing off to his portentously that one night. When he, Captain Flume, was sound asleep, he, Chief White half was going to slit his throat open for him from ear to ear. Captain Flume turned to ice, his eyes flung open wide, staring directly up into Chief White half glinting drunkenly only inches away. Why? Captain Flume managed to croak finally. Why not? was Chief White half answer. Each night after that, Captain Flume forced himself to keep awake as long as possible. He was aided immeasurably by Hungry Joe's nightmares. Listening so intently to Hungry Joe's maniacal howling night after night, Captain Flume grew to hate him and began wishing that Chief White half would tiptoe up to his cot one night and slit his throat open for him from ear to ear. Actually, Captain Flume slept like a log most nights and merely dreamed he was awake. So convincing were these dreams of lying awake that he awoke from them each morning in complete exhaustion and fell right back to sleep. Chief White Half-Oat had grown almost fond of Captain Flume since his amazing metamorphosis. Captain Flume had entered his bed that night a buoyant extrovert and left it the next morning a brooding introvert. And Chief White half proudly regarded the new Captain Flume as his own creation. He had never intended to slit Captain Flume's throat open for him from ear to ear. Threatening to do so was merely his idea of a joke, like dying of pneumonia, busting Colonel Moodus in the nose, or challenging Dr. Nika to Indian wrestle. All Chief White half Oat wanted to do when he staggered in drunk each night was go right to sleep, and Hungry Joe often made that impossible. Hungry Joe's nightmares gave Chief White half Oat the heebie-jeebies, and he often wished that someone would tiptoe into Hungry Joe's tent, lift Hoople's cat off his face, and slit his throat open for him from ear to ear, so that everybody in the squadron but Captain Flume could get a good night's sleep. Even though Chief White half Oat kept busting Colonel Moodus in the nose for General Dreedle's benefit, he was still outside the pale. Also outside the pale was Major Major, 
the squadron commander, who had found that out the same time he found out that he was squadron commander from Colonel Cathcart, who came blasting into the squadron in his hopped-up jeep the day after Major Duluth was killed over Perugia. Colonel Cathcart slammed to a screeching stop inches short of the railroad ditch, separating the nose of his jeep from the lopsided basketball court on the other side, from which Major Major was eventually driven by the kicks and shoves and stones and punches of the men who had almost become his friends. "'You're the new squadron commander,' Colonel Cathcart had bellowed across the ditch at him. "'But don't think it means anything, because it doesn't. All it means is that you're the new squadron commander.' And Colonel Cathcart had roared away as abruptly as he'd come, whipping the jeep around with a vicious spinning of wheels that sent a spray of fine grit blowing into Major Major's face. Major Major was immobilized by the news. He stood speechless, lanky and gawking, with a scuffed basketball in his long hands as the seeds of rancor sown so swiftly by Colonel Cathcart took root in the soldiers around him who had been playing basketball with him and who had let him come as close to making friends with him as anyone had ever let him come before. The whites of his moony eyes grew large and misty as his mouth struggled yearningly and lost against the familiar, impregnable loneliness drifting in around him again like suffocating fog. Like all the other officers at group headquarters, except Major Danby, Colonel Cathcart was infused with the democratic spirit. He believed that all men were created equal and he therefore spurned all men outside group headquarters with equal fervor. Nevertheless, he believed in his men. As he told them frequently in the briefing room, he believed there were at least ten missions better than any other outfit, and felt that any who did not share this confidence he had placed in them could get the hell out. The only way they could get the hell out, though, as Yossarian learned when he flew to visit XPFC Wintergreen, was by flying the extra ten missions. I still don't get it, Yossarian protested. Is Dr. Nika right, or isn't he? How many did he say? Forty. Danica was telling the truth, XPFC Wintergreen admitted. Forty missions is all you have to fly as far as 27th Air Force Headquarters is concerned. Yossarian was jubilant. Then I can go home, right? I got forty-eight. No, you... Can't go home, XPFC Wintergreen corrected him. Are you crazy or something? Why not? Catch 22. Catch 22? Yossarian was stunned. What the hell has Catch 22 got to do with it? Catch 22, Dr. Nika answered patiently when Hungry Joe had flown Yossarian back to Pianosa. Says you've always got to do what your commanding officer tells you to. But 27th Air Force says I can go home with 40 missions. But they don't say you have to go home. And regulations do say you have to obey every order. That's the catch. Even if the colonel were disobeying a 27th Air Force order by making you fly more missions, you'd still have to fly them or you'd be guilty of disobeying an order of his. And then 27th Air Force Headquarters would really jump on you. Yossarian slumped with disappointment. Then I really do have to fly the 50 missions, don't I? He grieved. The 55? Dr. Nika corrected him. What 55? The 55 missions the Colonel now wants all of you to fly. Hungry Joe heaved a huge sigh of relief when he heard Dr. Nika and broke into a grin. Yossarian grabbed Hungry Joe by the neck and made him fly them both right back to XPFC Wintergreen. What would they do to me? He asked in confidential tones. If I refused to fly them. We'd probably shoot you, XPFC Wintergreen replied. We? Yossarian cried in surprise. What do you mean we? Since when are you on their side? If you're going to be shot... Whose side do you expect me to be on? XPFC Wintergreen retorted. Yossarian winced. Colonel Cathcart had raised him again. Chapter 7 McWatt 
Ordinarily, Osarian's pilot was McWatt, who, shaving in loud, red, clean pajamas outside his tent each morning, was one of the odd, ironic, incomprehensible things surrounding Osarian. McWatt was the craziest combat man of them all, probably, because he was perfectly sane and still did not mind the war. He was a short-legged, wide-shouldered, smiling young soul who whistled bouncy show tunes continuously and turned over cards with sharp snaps when he dealt at blackjack or poker until Hungry Joe disintegrated into quaking despair, finally, beneath their cumulative impact and began ranting at him to stop snapping the cards. "'You son of a bitch! You only do it because it hurts me!' Hungry Joe would yell furiously as Yossarian held him back soothingly with one hand. That's the only reason he does it, because he likes to hear me scream, you goddamn son of a bitch! McWatt crinkled his fine, freckled nose apologetically and vowed not to snap the cards any more, but always forgot. McWatt wore fleecy bedroom slippers with his red pajamas and slept between freshly pressed colored bedsheets like the one Milo had retrieved half of for him from the grinning thief with a sweet tooth in exchange for none of the pitted dates Milo had borrowed from Yossarian. McWatt was deeply impressed with Milo, who, to the amusement of Corporal Snark, his mess sergeant, was already buying eggs for seven cents apiece and selling them for five cents. But McWatt was never as impressed with Milo as Milo had been with a letter Yossarian had obtained for his liver from Doc Danica. What's this? Milo had cried out in alarm when he came upon the enormous corrugated carton filled with packages of dried fruit and cans of fruit juices and desserts that two of the Italian laborers Major de Coverley had kidnapped for his kitchen were about to carry off to Yossarian's tent. This is Captain Yossarian, sir, said Corporal Snark with a superior smirk. Corporal Snark was an intellectual snob who felt he was twenty years ahead of his time and did not enjoy cooking down to the masses. He has a letter from Dr. Nika entitling him to all the fruit and fruit juices he wants. What's this? cried out Yossarian as Milo went white and began to sway. This is Lieutenant Milo Minderbinder, sir, said Corporal Snark with a derisive wink. One of our new pilots. He became mess officer while you were in the hospital this last time. What's this? cried out McWatt late in the afternoon as Milo handed him half his bedsheet. It's half of the bedsheet that was stolen from your tent this morning. Milo explained with nervous self-satisfaction, his rusty mustache twitching rapidly. I'll bet you didn't even know it was stolen. Why would anyone want to steal a bedsheet? Yossarian asked. Milo grew flustered. You don't understand, he protested. And Yossarian also did not understand why Milo needed so desperately to invest in the letter from Doc Danica, which came right to the point. Give Yossarian all the dried fruit and fruit juices he wants, Dr. Nika had written. He says he has a liver condition. A letter like this, Milo mumbled despondently, could ruin any mess officer in the world. Milo had come to Yossarian's tent just to read the letter again, following his carton of lost provisions across the squadron like a mourner. I have to give you as much as you ask for. Why, the letter doesn't even say you have to eat all of it yourself. And it's a good thing it doesn't, Hissarian told him, because I never eat any of it. I have a liver condition. Oh, yes, I forgot, said Milo in a voice lowered deferentially. Is it bad? Just bad enough, Hissarian answered cheerfully. I see, said Milo. What does that mean? It means that it couldn't be better. I don't think I understand. Without being worse. Now do you see? Yes, now I see. But I still don't think I understand. Well, don't let it trouble you. Let it trouble me. You see, I don't really have a liver condition. I've just got the symptoms. I have a garnet Fleischacker syndrome. I see, said Milo. And what is a garnet Fleischacker syndrome? A liver condition. I see, said Milo, 
and began massaging his black eyebrows together wearily with an expression of interior pain, as though waiting for some stinging discomfort he was experiencing to go away. In that case, he continued finally, I suppose you do have to be very careful about what you eat, don't you? Very careful indeed, Yossarian told him. A good garnet flyshaker syndrome isn't easy to come by, and I don't want to ruin mine. That's why I never eat any fruit. Now I do see, said Mila. Fruit is bad for your liver? No, fruit is good for my liver. That's why I never eat any. Then what do you do with it? demanded Milo, plodding along doggedly through his mounting confusion to fling out the question burning on his lips. Do you sell it? I give it away. To who? cried Milo, in a voice cracking with dismay. To anyone who wants it, Yossarian shouted back. Milo let out a long, melancholy wail and staggered back, beads of perspiration popping out suddenly all over his ashen face. He tugged on his unfortunate mustache absently, his whole body trembling. I give a great deal of it to Dunbar, Yossarian went on. Dunbar, Milo echoed numbly. Yes, Dunbar can eat all the fruit he wants, and it won't do him a damn bit of good. I just leave the carton right out there in the open for anyone who wants any to come and help himself. Arfie comes here to get prunes because he says he never gets enough prunes in the mess hall. Uh, you might look into that when you've got some time, because it's no fun having Arfie hanging around here. Whenever the supply runs low, I just have Corporal Snark fill me up again. Nately always takes a whole load of fruit along with him whenever he goes to Rome. He's in love with a whore there who hates me and isn't at all interested in him. She's got a kid sister who never leaves them alone in bed together, and they live in an apartment with an old man and woman and a bunch of other girls with nice, fat thighs who are always kidding around also. And Nately brings them a whole carton full every time he goes. Does he sell it to them? No, he gives it to them. Milo frowned. Well, I suppose that's very generous of him, he remarked with no enthusiasm. Yes, very generous, Yossarian agreed. And I'm sure it's perfectly legal, said Milo, since the food is yours once you get it from me. I suppose that with conditions as hard as they are, these people are very glad to get it. Yes, very glad, Yossarian assured him. The two girls sell it all on the black market and use the money to buy flashy costume jewelry and cheap perfume. Milo perked up. Costume jewelry? he exclaimed. I didn't know that. How much are they paying for cheap perfume? The old man uses his share to buy raw whiskey and dirty pictures. He's a lecher. A lecher? You'd be surprised. Is there much of a market in Rome for dirty pictures? Milo asked. You'd be surprised. Take Arfi, for instance. Knowing him, you'd never suspect, would you? That he's a lecher? No, that he's a navigator. And you know Captain Aardvark, don't you? He's that nice guy who came up to you your first day in the squadron and said, Aardvark's my name and navigation is my game. He wore a pipe in his face and probably asked you what college you went to. Do you know him? Milo was paying no attention. Let me be your partner, he blurted out imploringly. Yossarian turned him down, even though he had no doubt that the truckloads of fruit would be theirs to dispose of any way they saw fit once Yossarian had requisitioned them from the mess hall with Dr. Nika's letter. Milo was crestfallen, but from that moment on he trusted Yossarian with every secret but one, reasoning shrewdly that anybody who would not steal from the country he loved would not steal from anybody. Milo trusted Yossarian with every secret but the location of the holes in the hills in which he began burying his money once he returned from Smyrna with his plain load of figs and learned from Yossarian that a CID man had come to the hospital. To Milo, who had been gullible enough to volunteer for it, the position of mess officer was a sacred trust. I didn't even realize we weren't serving enough prunes. He had admitted that first day. I suppose it's because I'm still so new. 
I'll raise the question with my first chef. Yossarian eyed him sharply. What first chef? he demanded. You don't have a first chef. Corporal Snark, Milo explained, looking away a little guiltily. He's the only chef I have, so he really is my first chef, although I hope to move him over to the administrative side. Corporal Snark tends to be a little too creative, I feel. He thinks being a mess sergeant is some sort of art form and is always complaining about having to prostitute his talents. Nobody is asking him to do any such thing. Incidentally, do you happen to know why he was busted to private and is only a corporal now? Yes, said Yossarian. He poisoned the squadron. Milo went pale again. He did what? He mashed hundreds of cakes of G.I. soap into the sweet potatoes just to show that people have the taste of Philistines and don't know the difference between good and bad. Every man in the squadron was sick. Missions were canceled. Well, Milo exclaimed with thin-lipped disapproval. He certainly found out how wrong he was, didn't he? On the contrary, Yossarian corrected. He found out how right he was. We packed it away by the plateful and clamored for more. We all knew we were sick, but we had no idea we'd been poisoned. Milo sniffed in consternation twice, like a shaggy brown hair. In that case, I certainly do want to get him over to the administrative side. I don't want anything like that happening while I'm in charge. You see, he confided earnestly, what I hope to do is, is give the men in the squadron the best meals in the whole world. That's really something to shoot at, isn't it? If a mess officer aims at anything less, it seems to me, he has no right being mess officer. Don't you agree? Yossarian turned slowly to gaze at Milo with probing distrust. He saw a simple, sincere face that was incapable of subtlety or guile, an honest, frank face with disunited large eyes, rusty hair, black eyebrows, and an unfortunate reddish-brown mustache. Milo had a long, thin nose with sniffing, damp nostrils heading sharply off to the right, always pointing away from where the rest of him was looking. It was the face of a man of hardened integrity, who could no more consciously violate the moral principles on which his virtue rested than he could transform himself into a despicable toad. One of these moral principles was that it was never a sin to charge as much as the traffic would bear. He was capable of mighty paroxysms of righteous indignation, and he was indignant as could be when he learned that a C.I.D. man was in the area looking for him. He's not looking for you, Yossarian said, trying to placate him. He's looking for someone up in the hospital who's been signing Washington Irving's name to the letters he's been censoring. I never signed Washington Irving's name to any letters, Mila declared. Of course not. But that's just a trick to get me to confess I've been making money in the black market. Milo hauled violently at a disheveled hunk of his off-colored mustache. I don't like guys like that, always snooping around people like us. Why doesn't the government get after XPFC Wintergreen if it wants to do some good? He's got no respect for rules and regulations and keeps cutting prices on me. Milo's mustache was unfortunate because the separated halves never matched. They were like Milo's disunited eyes, which never looked at the same thing at the same time. Milo could see more things than most people, but he could see none of them too distinctly. In contrast to his reaction to news of the C.I.D. man, he learned with calm courage from Eusarian that Colonel Cathcart had raised the number of missions to fifty-five. "'We're at war,' he said. And there's no use complaining about the number of missions we have to fly. If the colonel says we have to fly fifty-five missions, we have to fly them. Well, I don't have to fly them, Yossarian vowed. I'll go see Major Major. How can you? Major Major never sees anybody. Then I'll go back into the hospital. You just came out of the hospital ten days ago, Milo reminded him reprovingly. You can't keep running into the hospital every time something happens you don't like. No, the best thing to do is fly the missions. It's our duty. 
Milo had rigid scruples that would not even allow him to borrow a package of pitted dates from the mess hall that day of McWatt's stolen bedsheet, for the food at the mess hall was all still the property of the government. But I can borrow it from you, he explained to Yossarian, since all this fruit is yours once you get it from me with Dr. Danica's letter. You can do whatever you want with it, even sell it at a high profit instead of giving it away free. Wouldn't you want to do that together? No. Milo gave up. Then lend me one package of pitted dates, he requested. I'll give it back to you. I swear I will, and there'll be a little something extra for you. Milo proved good as his word and handed Yossarian a quarter of McWatt's yellow bedsheet when he returned with the unopened package of dates and with the grinning thief with a sweet tooth who had stolen the bedsheet from McWatt's tent. The piece of bedsheet now belonged to Yossarian. He had earned it while napping, although he did not understand how. Neither did McWatt. What's this? cried McWatt, staring in mystification at the ripped half of his bedsheet. It's half of the bedsheet that was stolen from your tent this morning, Milo explained. I'll bet you didn't even know it was stolen. Why should anyone want to steal half a bedsheet? Yossarian asked. Milo grew flustered. You don't understand, he protested. He stole the whole bedsheet, and I got it back with the package of pitted dates you invested. That's why the quarter of the bedsheet is yours. You made a very handsome return on your investment, particularly since you've gotten back every pitted date you gave me. Milo next addressed himself to McWatt. Half the bedsheet is yours because it was all yours to begin with, and I really don't understand what you're complaining about since you wouldn't have any of it if Captain Yossarian and I hadn't intervened in your behalf. Who's complaining? McWatt exclaimed. I'm just trying to figure out what I can do with half a bedsheet. There are lots of things you can do with half a bedsheet, Milo assured him. The remaining quarter of the bedsheet I've set aside for myself as a reward for my enterprise, work, and initiative. It's not for myself, you understand, but for the syndicate. That's something you might do with half the bedsheet. You can leave it in the syndicate and watch it grow. What syndicate? This book is continued on Disc 3. Disc 3 What syndicate? The syndicate I'd like to form someday so that I can give you men the good food you deserve. You want to form a syndicate? Yes, I do. Uh, no, a mart. Do you know what a mart is? It's a place where you buy things, isn't it? And sell things, corrected Milo. And sell things. All my life I've wanted a mart. You can do lots of things if you've got a mart, but you've got to have a mart. You want a mart, and every man will have a share. Yossarian was still puzzled, for it was a business matter, and there was much about business matters that always puzzled him. Let me try to explain it again, Milo offered with growing weariness and exasperation, jerking his thumb toward the thief with the sweet tooth, still grinning beside him. I knew he wanted the dates more than the bedsheet. Since he doesn't understand a word of English, I made it a point to conduct the whole transaction in English. Why didn't you just hit him over the head and take the bedsheet away from him? Yossarian asked. Pressing his lips together with dignity, Milo shook his head. That would have been most unjust, he scolded firmly. Force is wrong, and two wrongs never make a right. It was much better my way. When I held the dates out to him and reached for the bedsheet, he probably thought I was offering to trade. What were you doing? Actually, I was offering to trade. But since he doesn't understand English, I can always deny it. Suppose he gets angry and wants the dates. Why, well, we'll just hit him over the head and take them away from him, Milo answered without hesitation. He looked from Yossarian to McWatt and back again. I really can't see what everyone is complaining about. We're all much better off than before. Everybody is happy but this thief, and there's no sense worrying about him, since he doesn't even speak our language and deserves whatever he gets. Don't you understand? But Yossarian still didn't understand either how Milo could buy eggs in Malta for seven cents apiece and sell them at a profit in Pianosa 
for five cents. Chapter Eight, Lieutenant Shyskop. Not even Clevenger understood how Milo could do that, and Clevenger knew everything. Clevenger knew everything about the war except why Osarian had to die while Corporal Snark was allowed to live, or why Corporal Snark had to die while Osarian was allowed to live. It was a vile and muddy war, and Osarian could have lived without it, lived forever, perhaps. Only a fraction of his countrymen would give up their lives to win it, and it was not his ambition to be among them. To die or not to die—that was the question. And Clevenger grew limp trying to answer it. History did not demand Yossarian's premature demise. Justice could be satisfied without it. Progress did not hinge upon it. Victory did not depend on it. That men would die was a matter of necessity. Which men would die, though, was a matter of circumstance. And Yossarian was willing to be the victim of anything but circumstance. But that was war. Just about all he could find in its favor was that it paid well and liberated children from the pernicious influence of their parents. Clevenger knew so much because Clevenger was a genius with a pounding heart and blanching face. He was a gangling, gawky, feverish, famish-eyed brain. As a Harvard undergraduate, he had won prizes in scholarship for just about everything. And the only reason he had not won prizes in scholarship for everything else was that he was too busy signing petitions, circulating petitions, and challenging petitions, joining discussion groups, and resigning from discussion groups, attending youth congresses, picketing other youth congresses, and organizing student committees in defense of dismissed faculty members. Everyone agreed that Clevenger was certain to go far in the academic world. In short. Clevenger was one of those people with lots of intelligence and no brains, and everyone knew it except those who soon found it out. In short, he was a dope. He often looked to Yossarian like one of those people hanging around modern museums with both eyes together on one side of a face. It was an illusion, of course, generated by Clevenger's predilection for staring fixedly at one side of a question. And never seeing the other side at all, politically he was a humanitarian who did know right from left and was trapped uncomfortably between the two. He was constantly defending his communist friends to his right-wing enemies and his right-wing friends to his communist enemies, and he was thoroughly detested by both groups who never defended him to anyone because they thought he was a dope. He was a very serious, very earnest. And very conscientious dope. It was impossible to go to a movie with him without getting involved afterward in a discussion on empathy, Aristotle, universals, messages, and the obligations of the cinema as an art form in a materialistic society. Girls he took to the theater had to wait until the first intermission to find out from him whether or not they were seeing a good or a bad play, and then found out at once. He was a militant idealist who crusaded against racial bigotry by growing faint in its presence. He knew everything about literature except how to enjoy it. Yossarian tried to help him. Don't be a dope. He had counseled Clevenger when they were both at cadet school in Santa Ana, California. I'm going to tell him. Clevenger insisted. As the two of them sat high in the reviewing stands, looking down on the auxiliary parade ground at Lieutenant Chyskop, raging back and forth like a beardless leer. Why me? Lieutenant Chyskop wailed. Keep still, idiot! Yossarian advised Clevenger avuncularly. You don't know what you're talking about, Clevenger objected. I know enough to keep still, idiot. Lieutenant Shyskop tore his hair and gnashed his teeth. His rubbery cheeks shook with gusts of anguish. His problem was a squadron of aviation cadets with low morale who marched atrociously in the parade competition that took place every Sunday afternoon. Their morale was low because they did not want to march in parades every Sunday afternoon, and. Because Lieutenant Chyskop had appointed cadet officers from their ranks instead of permitting them to elect their own, 
I want someone to tell me, Lieutenant Scheisskopf beseeched them all prayerfully. If any of it is my fault, I want to be told. He wants someone to tell him, Clevenger said. He wants everyone to keep still, idiot, Yossarian answered. Didn't you hear him? Clevenger argued. I heard him, Yossarian replied. I heard him say very loudly and very distinctly that he wants every one of us to keep our mouths shut if we know what's good for us. I won't punish you, Lieutenant Scheisskopf swore. He says he won't punish me, said Clevenger. He'll castrate you, said Yossarian. I swear I won't punish you, said Lieutenant Scheisskopf. I'll be grateful to the man who tells me the truth. He'll hate you, said Yossarian. To his dying day, he'll hate you. Lieutenant Scheisskopf was an ROTC graduate who was rather glad that war had broken out, since it gave him an opportunity to wear an officer's uniform every day and say, Men! in a clipped military voice to the bunches of kids who fell into his clutches every eight weeks on their way to the butcher's block. He was an ambitious and humorless Lieutenant Scheisskopf, who confronted his responsibilities soberly and smiled only when some rival officer at the Santa Ana Army Air Force Base came down with a lingering disease. He had poor eyesight and chronic sinus trouble, which made war especially exciting for him, since he was in no danger of going overseas. The best thing about him was his wife, and the best thing about his wife was a girlfriend named Dory Does, who did, whenever she could, and had a whack uniform that Lieutenant Scheisskopf's wife put on every weekend and took off every weekend for every cadet in her husband's squadron who wanted to creep into her. Dory Does was a lively little tart of copper, green, and gold who loved doing it best in tool sheds, phone booths, field houses, and bus kiosks. There was little she hadn't tried, and less she wouldn't. She was shameless, slim, nineteen, and aggressive. She destroyed egos by the score and made men hate themselves in the morning for the way she found them, used them, and tossed them aside. Yossarian loved her. She was a marvelous piece of ass who found him only fair. He loved the feel of springy muscle beneath her skin everywhere he touched her, the only time she'd let him. Yossarian loved Dory Does so much that he couldn't help flinging himself down passionately on top of Lieutenant Scheisskopf's wife every week to revenge himself upon Lieutenant Scheisskopf for the way Lieutenant Scheisskopf was revenging himself upon Clevenger. Lieutenant Scheisskopf's wife was revenging herself upon Lieutenant Scheisskopf for some unforgettable crime of his she couldn't recall. She was a plump, pink, sluggish girl who read good books and kept urging Yossarian not to be so bourgeois without the R. She was never without a good book close by, not even when she was lying in bed with nothing on her but Yossarian and Dory Does as dog tags. She bored Yossarian, but he was in love with her, too. She was a crazy mathematics major from the Wharton School of Business who could not count to twenty-eight each month without getting into trouble. Darling, we're going to have a baby again, she would say to Yossarian every month. You're out of your goddamn head, he would reply. I mean it, baby, she insisted. So do I. Darling, we're going to have a baby again she would say to her husband. I haven't the time, Lieutenant Scheisskopf would grumble petulantly. Don't you know there's a parade going on? Lieutenant Scheisskopf cared very deeply about winning parades and about bringing Clevenger up on charges before the action board for conspiring to advocate the overthrow of the cadet officers Lieutenant Scheisskopf had appointed. Clevenger was a troublemaker and a wise guy. Lieutenant Scheisskopf knew that Clevenger might cause even more trouble if he wasn't watched. Yesterday it was the cadet officers. Tomorrow it might be the world. Clevenger had a mind. And Lieutenant Scheisskopf had noticed that people with minds tended to get pretty smart at times. 
Such men were dangerous. And even the new cadet officers whom Clevenger had helped into office were eager to give damning testimony against him. The case against Clevenger was open and shut. The only thing missing was something to charge him with. It could not be anything to do with parades, for Clevenger took the parades almost as seriously as Lieutenant Scheisskopf himself. The men fell out for the parades early each Sunday afternoon and groped their way into ranks of twelve outside the barracks. Groaning with hangovers, they limped in step to their station on the main parade ground, where they stood motionless in the heat for an hour or two with the men from the sixty or seventy other cadet squadrons until enough of them had collapsed to call it a day. On the edge of the field stood a row of ambulances and teams of trained stretcher-bearers with walkie-talkies. On the roofs of the ambulances were spotters with binoculars. A tally clerk kept score. Supervising this entire phase of the operation was a medical officer with a flair for accounting who okayed pulses and checked the figures of the tally clerk. As soon as enough unconscious men had been collected in the ambulances, the medical officer signaled the bandmaster to strike up the band and end the parade. One behind the other, the squadrons marched up the field, executed a cumbersome turn around the reviewing stand, and marched down the field and back to their barracks. Each of the parading squadrons was graded as it marched past the reviewing stand, where a bloated colonel with a big fat mustache sat with the other officers. The best squadron in each wing won a yellow pennant on a pole that was utterly worthless. The best squadron on the base won a red pennant on a longer pole that was worth even less, since the pole was heavier and was that much more of a nuisance to lug around all week until some other squadron won it the following Sunday. The Assyrian, the idea of pennants as prizes, was absurd. No money went with them, no class privileges. Like Olympic medals and tennis trophies, all they signified was that the owner had done something of no benefit to anyone more capably than everyone else. The parades themselves seemed equally absurd. The Assyrian hated a parade. Parades were so martial. He hated hearing them hated seeing them, hated being tied up in traffic by them. He hated being made to take part in them. It was bad enough being an aviation cadet without having to act like a soldier in the blistering heat every Sunday afternoon. It was bad enough being an aviation cadet because it was obvious now that the war would not be over before he had finished his training. That was the only reason he had volunteered for cadet training in the first place. As a soldier who had qualified for aviation cadet training, he had weeks and weeks of waiting for assignment to a class, weeks and weeks more to become a bombardier navigator, weeks and weeks more of operational training after that to prepare him for overseas duty. It seemed inconceivable then that the war could last that long, for God was on his side, he had been told, and God, he had also been told, could do whatever he wanted to. But the war was not nearly over, and his training was almost complete. Lieutenant Scheisskopf longed desperately to win parades, and sat up half the night working on it while his wife waited amorously for him in bed, thumbing through Kraft Ebbing to her favorite passages. He read books on marching. He manipulated boxes of chocolate soldiers until they melted in his hands, and then maneuvered in ranks of twelve a set of plastic cowboys he had bought from a mail-order house under an assumed name and kept locked away from everyone's eyes during the day. Leonardo's exercises in anatomy proved indispensable. One evening he felt the need for a live model and directed his wife to march around the room. Naked? she asked hopefully. Lieutenant Scheisskopf smacked his hands over his eyes in exasperation. It was the despair of Lieutenant Scheisskopf's life to be chained to a woman who was incapable of looking beyond her own dirty sexual desires to the titanic struggles for the unattainable in which noble man could become heroically engaged. Why don't you ever whip me? She pouted one night. Because I haven't the time, he snapped at her impatiently. 
I haven't the time. Don't you know there's a parade going on? And he really did not have the time. There it was, Sunday already, with only seven days left in the week to get ready for the next parade. He had no idea where the hours went. Finishing last in three successive parades had given Lieutenant Scheisskopf an unsavory reputation, and he considered every means of improvement, even nailing the twelve men in each rank to a long two-by-four beam of seasoned oak to keep them in line. The plan was not feasible, for making a ninety-degree turn would have been impossible without nickel-alloy swivels inserted in the small of every man's back, and Lieutenant Scheisskopf was not sanguine at all about obtaining that many nickel-alloy swivels from Quartermaster or enlisting the cooperation of the surgeons at the hospital. The week after Lieutenant Scheisskopf followed Clevenger's recommendation and let the men elect their own cadet officers, the squadron won the yellow pennant. Lieutenant Scheisskopf was so elated by this unexpected achievement that he gave his wife a sharp crack over the head with a pole when she tried to drag him into bed to celebrate by showing their contempt for the sexual mores of the lower middle classes in Western civilization. The next week, the squadron won the red flag, and Lieutenant Scheisskopf was beside himself with rapture. And the week after that, his squadron made history by winning the red pennant two weeks in a row. Now Lieutenant Scheisskopf had confidence enough in his powers to spring his big surprise. Lieutenant Scheisskopf had discovered in his extensive research that the hands of marchers, instead of swinging freely, as was then the popular fashion, ought never to be moved more than three inches from the center of the thigh, which meant, in effect, that they were scarcely to be swung at all. Lieutenant Scheisskopf's preparations were elaborate and clandestine. All the cadets in his squadron were sworn to secrecy and rehearsed in the dead of night on the auxiliary parade ground. They marched in darkness that was pitch and bumped into each other blindly, but they did not panic, and they were learning to march without swinging their hands. Lieutenant Scheisskopf's first thought had been to have a friend of his in the sheet metal shop sink pegs of nickel alloy into each man's thigh bones and link them to the wrist by strands of copper wire with exactly three inches of play. But there wasn't time. There was never enough time. And good copper wire was hard to come by in wartime. He remembered also that the men, so hampered, would be unable to fall properly during the impressive fainting ceremony preceding the marching, and that an inability to faint properly might affect the unit's rating as a whole. And all week long he chortled with repressed delight at the officers' club. Speculation grew rampant among his closest friends. "'I wonder what that shithead is up to,' Lieutenant Engel said. Lieutenant Scheisskopf responded with a knowing smile to the queries of his colleagues. "'You'll find out Sunday,' he promised. "'You'll find out!' Lieutenant Scheisskopf unveiled his epical surprise that Sunday with all the aplomb of an experienced impresario. He said nothing while the other squadrons ambled past the reviewing stand crookedly in their customary manner. He gave no sign— even when the first ranks of his own squadron hove into sight with their swingless marching and the first stricken gasps of alarm were hissing from his startled fellow officers. He held back even then, until the bloated colonel with the big fat mustache whirled upon him savagely with a purpling face, and then he offered the explanation that made him immortal. "'Look, colonel,' he announced, "'no hands!' And to an audience... Stilled with awe, he distributed certified photostatic copies of the obscure regulation on which he had built his unforgettable triumph. This was Lieutenant Scheisskopf's finest hour. He won the parade, of course, hands down, obtaining permanent possession of the red pennant and ending the Sunday parades altogether— since good red pennants were as hard to come by in wartime as good copper wire. Lieutenant Scheisskopf was made First Lieutenant Scheisskopf on the spot, and began his rapid rise through the ranks. 
there were few who did not hail him as a true military genius for his important discovery. That Lieutenant Scheisskopf, Lieutenant Travers remarked, he's a military genius. Yes, he really is, Lieutenant Angle agreed. It's a pity the schmuck won't whip his wife. I don't see what that has to do with it, Lieutenant Travers answered coolly. Lieutenant Bemis whips Mrs. Bemis beautifully every time they have sexual intercourse, and he isn't worth a farthing at parades. I'm talking about flagellation, Lieutenant Engel retorted. Who gives a damn about parades? Actually, no one but Lieutenant Scheiskopf really gave a damn about the parades, least of all the bloated colonel with a big, fat mustache who was chairman of the action board and began bellowing at Clevenger the moment Clevenger stepped gingerly into the room to plead innocent to the charges Lieutenant Scheiskopf had lodged against him. The colonel beat his fist down upon the table and hurt his hand, and became so further enraged with Clevenger that he beat his fist down upon the table even harder and hurt his hand some more. Lieutenant Scheiskopf glared at Clevenger with tight lips, mortified by the poor impression Clevenger was making. In sixty days you'll be fighting Billy Petrol, the colonel with the big fat mustache roared. And you think it's a big fat joke? I don't think it's a joke, sir, Clevenger replied. Don't interrupt. Yes, sir. And say sir when you do, ordered Major Metcalf. Yes, sir. Weren't you just ordered not to interrupt? Major Metcalf inquired coldly. But I didn't interrupt, sir, Clevenger protested. No, and you didn't say sir either. Add that to the charges against him. Major Metcalf directed the corporal who could take shorthand. Failure to say sir to superior officers when not interrupting them. Metcalf, said the colonel, you're a goddamn fool. Do you know that? Major Metcalf swallowed with difficulty. Yes, sir. Then keep your goddamn mouth shut. You don't make sense. There were three members of the action board, the bloated colonel with the big fat mustache, Lieutenant Scheisskopf, and Major Metcalf, who was trying to develop a steely gaze. As a member of the action board, Lieutenant Scheisskopf was one of the judges who would weigh the merits of the case against Clevenger, as presented by the prosecutor. Lieutenant Scheisskopf was also the prosecutor. Clevenger had an officer defending him. The officer defending him was Lieutenant Scheisskopf. It was all very confusing to Clevenger, who began vibrating in terror as the colonel surged to his feet like a gigantic belch and threatened to rip his stinking, cowardly body apart limb from limb. One day he had stumbled while marching to class. The next day he was formally charged with breaking ranks while in formation, felonious assault, indiscriminate behavior, mopery, high treason, provoking, being a smart guy, listening to classical music, and so on. In short, they threw the book at him, and there he was, standing in dread before the bloated colonel, who roared once more that in sixty days he would be fighting Billy Petrol, and demanded to know how the hell he would like being washed out and shipped to the Solomon Islands to bury bodies. Clevenger replied with courtesy that he would not like it. He was a dope who would rather be a corpse than bury one. The colonel sat down and settled back, calm and cagey suddenly, and ingratiatingly polite. What did you mean, he inquired slowly, when you said we couldn't punish you? When, sir? I'm asking the questions, you're answering them. Yes, sir, I— Did you think we brought you here to ask questions and for me to answer them? No, sir, I— What did we bring you here for? To answer questions. You're goddamn right, roared the colonel. Now suppose you start answering some before I break your goddamn head. Just what the hell did you mean, you bastard, when you said we couldn't punish you? I don't think I ever made that statement, sir. Will you speak up, please? I couldn't hear you. Yes, sir, I... Will you speak up, please? He couldn't hear you. Yes, sir, I... Metcalf! Sir? Didn't I tell you to keep your stupid mouth shut? Yes, sir. Then keep your stupid mouth shut when I tell you to keep your stupid mouth shut. Do you understand? Will you speak up, please? I couldn't hear you. Yes, sir. I... Metcalf, is that your foot I'm stepping on? 
No, sir, it must be Lieutenant Scheisskopf's foot. It isn't my foot, said Lieutenant Scheisskopf. Then maybe it is my foot after all, said Major Metcalf. Move it! Yes, sir. You'll have to move your foot first, Colonel. It's on top of mine. Are you telling me to move my foot? No, sir. Oh, no, sir. Then move your foot and keep your stupid mouth shut. Will you speak up, please? I still couldn't hear you. Yes, sir. I said that I didn't say that you couldn't punish me. Just what the hell are you talking about? I'm answering your question, sir. What question? Just what the hell did you mean, you bastard, when you said we couldn't punish you? said the corporal, who could take shorthand, reading from his steno pad. All right, said the colonel. Just what the hell did you mean? I didn't say you couldn't punish me, sir. When? asked the colonel. When what, sir? Now you're asking me questions again. I'm sorry, sir. I'm afraid I don't understand your question. When didn't you say we couldn't punish you? Don't you understand my question? No, sir. I, I don't understand. You've just told us that. Now suppose you answer my question. But how can I answer it? That's another question you're asking me. I'm sorry, sir, but I don't know how to answer it. I, I never said you couldn't punish me. Now you're telling us when you did say it. I'm asking you to tell us when you didn't say it. Clevenger took a deep breath. I always didn't say you couldn't punish me, sir. That's much better, Mr. Clevenger, even though it is a bare-faced lie. Last night in the latrine... Didn't you whisper that we couldn't punish you to that other dirty son of a bitch we don't like? What's his name? Yossarian, sir, Lieutenant Scheisskopf said. Yes, Yossarian. That's right. Yossarian. Yossarian. Is that his name? Yossarian. Wait, what the hell kind of a name is Yossarian? Lieutenant Scheisskopf had the facts at his fingertips. It's Yossarian's name, sir, he explained. Yes, I suppose it is. Didn't you whisper to Yossarian that we couldn't punish you? Oh, no, sir. I whispered to him that you couldn't find me guilty. I may be stupid, interrupted the colonel, but the distinction escapes me. I guess I am pretty stupid, because the distinction escapes me. What? You're a windy son of a bitch, aren't you? Nobody asked you for clarification, and you're giving me clarification. I was making a statement not asking for clarification. You are a windy son of a bitch, aren't you? No, sir. No, sir? Are you calling me a goddamn liar? Oh, no, sir. Then you're a windy son of a bitch, aren't you? No, sir. Are you trying to pick a fight with me? No, sir. Are you a windy son of a bitch? No, sir. God damn it, you are trying to pick a fight with me. For two stinking cents, I'd jump over this big fat table and rip your stinking cowardly body apart limb from limb. Do it! Do it! cried Major Metcalf. Metcalf, you stinking son of a bitch! Didn't I tell you to keep your stinking, cowardly, stupid mouth shut? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Then suppose you do it. I was only trying to learn, sir. The only way a person can learn is by trying. Who says so? Everybody says so, sir. Even Lieutenant Scheisskopf says so. Do you say so? Yes, sir, said Lieutenant Scheisskopf. But everybody says so. Well, Metcalf, suppose you try keeping that stupid mouth of yours shut, and maybe that's the way you'll learn how. Now, where were we? Uh, read me back the last line. Read me back the last line, read back the corporal who could take shorthand. Not my last line, stupid, the colonel shouted. Somebody else's. Read me back the last line, read back the corporal. That's my last line again, shrieked the colonel, turning purple with anger. Oh, no, sir, corrected the corporal. That's my last line. I read it to you just a moment ago. Don't you remember, sir? It was only a moment ago. Oh, my God! Read me back his last line, stupid! Say, what the hell's your name, anyway? Poppinjay, sir. Well, you're next, Poppinjay. As soon as this trial ends, your trial begins. Get it? Yes, sir. What will I be charged with? What the hell difference does that make? Did you hear what he asked me? You're going to learn, Poppinjay. The minute we finish with Clevenger, you're going to learn. Cadet Clevenger, what did... You are Cadet Clevenger, aren't you, and not Poppinjay? Yes, sir. Good. What did... I'm Poppinjay, sir. Poppinjay, is your father a millionaire or a member of the Senate? No, sir. Then you're up shit creek, Poppinjay, without a paddle. He's not a general or a high-ranking member of the administration, is he? No, sir. That's good. 
What does your father do? He's dead, sir. That's very good. You really are up the creek, Popinjay. Is Popinjay really your name? J just what the hell kind of a name is Popinjay anyway? I don't like it. It's Popinjay's name, sir, Lieutenant Shyskopf explained. Well, I don't like it, Popinjay. And I just can't wait to rip your stinking cowardly body apart limb from limb. Cadet Clevenger, will you please repeat what the hell it was you did or didn't whisper to your Sarian late last night in the latrine? Yes, sir. I said that you couldn't find me guilty. We'll take it from there. Precisely what did you mean, Cadet Clevenger, when you said we couldn't find you guilty? I didn't say you couldn't find me guilty, sir. When? When what, sir? God damn it! Are you going to start pumping me again? No, sir, I'm sorry, sir. Then answer the question. When didn't you say we couldn't find you guilty? Late last night in the latrine, sir. Is that the only time you didn't say it? No, sir. I always didn't say you couldn't find me guilty, sir. What I did say to you, Sarian, was... Nobody asked you what you did say to you, Sarian. We asked you what you didn't say to him. We're not at all interested in what you did say to you, Sarian. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Then we'll go on. What did you say to you, Sarian? I said to him, sir, that you couldn't find me guilty of the offense with which I am charged and still be faithful to the cause of... Of what? You're mumbling. Stop mumbling. Yes, sir. And mumble, sir, when you do. Metcalf, you bastard! Yes, sir, mumbled Clevenger. Of justice, sir, that you couldn't find justice! The colonel was astounded. What is justice? Justice, sir. That's not what justice is! The colonel jeered and began pounding the table again with his big fat hand. That's what Karl Marx is! I'll tell you what justice is. Justice is a knee in the gut from the floor on the chin at night, sneaky with a knife brought up down in the magazine of a battleship, sandbagged, underhanded in the dark without a word of warning, garroting. That's what justice is when we've all got to be tough enough and rough enough to fight Billy Petrol from the hip. Get it? No, sir. Don't sir me. Yes, sir. And say sir when you don't ordered Major Metcalf. Clevenger was guilty, of course, or he would not have been accused. And since the only way to prove it was to find him guilty, it was their patriotic duty to do so. He was sentenced to walk 57 punishment tours. Poppinjay was locked up to be taught a lesson, and Major Metcalf was shipped to the Solomon Islands to bury bodies. A punishment tour for Clevenger was fifty minutes of a weekend hour spent pacing back and forth before the provost marshal's building with a ton of an unloaded rifle on his shoulder. It was all very confusing to Clevenger. There were many strange things taking place, but the strangest of all to Clevenger was the hatred, the brutal, uncloaked, inexorable hatred of the members of the action board glazing their unforgiving expressions with a hard, vindictive surface, glowing in their narrowed eyes malignantly like inextinguishable coals. Clevenger was stunned to discover it. They would have lynched him if they could. There were three grown men, and he was a boy, and they hated him and wished him dead. They had hated him before he came, hated him while he was there, hated him after he left, carried their hatred for him away malignantly like some pampered treasure after they separated from each other and went to their solitude. Yossarian had done his best to warn him the night before. You haven't got a chance, kid, he had told him glumly. They hate Jews. But I'm not Jewish, answered Clevenger. It will make no difference, Yossarian promised. And Yossarian was right. They're after everybody. Clevenger recoiled from their hatred as though from a blinding light. These three men who hated him spoke his language and wore his uniform, but he saw their loveless faces set immutably into cramped, mean lines of hostility and understood instantly that nowhere in the world, not in all the fascist tanks or planes or submarines,
Not in the bunkers behind the machine guns or mortars or behind the blowing flamethrowers. Not even among all the expert gunners of the crack Hermann Goering Anti-Aircraft Division or among the grisly connivers in all the beer halls in Munich and everywhere else were there men who hated him more. Chapter 9 Major, 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 Major Major, 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 Major had had a difficult time from the start. Like Miniver Cheevy, he had been born too late, exactly thirty-six hours too late for the physical well-being of his mother, a gentle, ailing woman who, after a full day and a half's agony in the rigors of childbirth, was depleted of all resolve to pursue further the argument over the new child's name. In the hospital corridor, her husband moved ahead with the unsmiling determination of someone who knew what he was about. Major Major's father was a towering, gaunt man in heavy shoes and a black woolen suit. He filled out the birth certificate without faltering, betraying no emotion at all as he handed the completed form to the floor nurse. The nurse took it from him without comment and padded out of sight. He watched her go, wondering what she had on underneath. Back in the ward, he found his wife lying vanquished beneath the blankets like a desiccated old vegetable, wrinkled, dry, and white, her enfeebled tissues absolutely still. Her bed was at the very end of the ward, near a cracked window thickened with grime. Rain splashed from a moiling sky, and the day was dreary and cold. In other parts of the hospital, chalky people with aged blue lips were dying on time. The man stood erect beside the bed and gazed down at the woman a long time. "'I have named the boy Caleb,' he announced to her finally in a soft voice, "'in accordance with your wishes.' The woman made no answer, and slowly the man smiled. He had planned it all perfectly, for his wife was asleep, and would never know that he had lied to her as she lay on her sickbed in the poor ward of the county hospital. From this meager beginning had sprung the ineffectual squadron commander, who was now spending the better part of each working day in Pianosa, forging Washington Irving's name to official documents. Major Major forged diligently with his left hand to elude identification, insulated against intrusion by his own undesired authority, and camouflaged in his false mustache and dark glasses as an additional safeguard against detection by anyone chancing to peer in through the dowdy celluloid window from which some thief had carved out a slice. In between these two low points of his birth and his success lay thirty-one dismal years of loneliness and frustration. Major Major had been born too late and too mediocre. Some men are born mediocre, some men achieve mediocrity, and some men have mediocrity thrust upon them. With Major Major it had been all three. Even among men lacking all distinction, he inevitably stood out as a man lacking more distinction than all the rest, and people who met him were always impressed by how unimpressive he was. Major Major had three strikes on him from the beginning, his mother, his father, and Henry Fonda, to whom he bore a sickly resemblance almost from the moment of his birth. Long before he even suspected who Henry Fonda was, he found himself the subject of unflattering comparisons everywhere he went. Total strangers saw fit to deprecate him, with the result that he was stricken early with a guilty fear of people and an obsequious impulse to apologize to society for the fact that he was not Henry Fonda. It was not an easy task for him to go through life looking something like Henry Fonda, but he never once thought of quitting, having inherited his perseverance from his father, a lanky man with a good sense of humor. Major Major's father was a sober, God-fearing man whose idea of a good joke was to lie about his age. 
He was a long-limbed farmer, a God-fearing, freedom-loving, law-abiding, rugged individualist who held that federal aid to anyone but farmers was creeping socialism. He advocated thrift and hard work and disapproved of loose women who turned him down. His specialty was alfalfa, and he made a good thing out of not growing any. The government paid him well for every bushel of alfalfa he did not grow. The more alfalfa he did not grow, the more money the government gave him, and he spent every penny he didn't earn on new land to increase the amount of alfalfa he did not produce. Major Major's father worked without rest at not growing alfalfa. On long winter evenings, he remained indoors and did not mend harness and he sprang out of bed at the crack of noon, every day, just to make certain that the chores would not be done. He invested in land wisely, and soon was not growing more alfalfa than any other man in the county. Neighbors sought him out for advice on all subjects, for he had made much money and was therefore wise. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. He counseled one and all, and everyone said, Amen. Major Major's father was an outspoken champion of economy in government, provided it did not interfere with the sacred duty of government to pay farmers as much as they could get for all the alfalfa they produced that no one else wanted, or for not producing any alfalfa at all. He was a proud and independent man who was opposed to unemployment insurance and never hesitated to whine, whimper, wheedle, and extort for as much as he could get from whomever he could. He was a devout man whose pulpit was everywhere. The Lord gave us good farmers two strong hands so that we could take as much as we could grab with both of them. He preached with ardor on the courthouse steps, or in front of the A&P, as he waited for the bad-tempered, gum-chewing young cashier he was after to step outside and give him a nasty look. If the Lord didn't want us to take as much as we could get, he preached, he wouldn't have given us two good hands to take it with. And the others murmured, Amen. Major Major's father had a Calvinist's faith in predestination and could perceive distinctly how everyone's misfortunes but his own were expressions of God's will. He smoked cigarettes and drank whiskey, and he thrived on good wit and stimulating intellectual conversation, particularly his own, when he was lying about his age or telling that good one about God and his wife's difficulties in delivering Major Major. The good one about God and his wife's difficulties had to do with the fact that it had taken God only six days to produce the whole world, whereas his wife had spent a full day and a half in labor just to produce major, major. A lesser man might have wavered that day in the hospital corridor. A weaker man might have compromised on such excellent substitutes as drum major, minor major, sergeant major, or C-sharp major. But Major Major's father had waited fourteen years for just such an opportunity, and he was not a person to waste it. Major Major's father had a good joke about opportunity. Opportunity only knocks once in this world, he would say. Major Major's father repeated this good joke at every opportunity. Being born with a sickly resemblance to Henry Fonda was the first of a long series of practical jokes, of which destiny was to make Major Major the unhappy victim throughout his joyless life. Being born Major 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 was the second. The fact that he had been born Major 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 was a secret known only to his father. Not until Major Major was enrolling in kindergarten was the discovery of his real name made and then the effects were disastrous. The news killed his mother, who just lost her will to live and wasted away and died, which was just fine with his father, who had decided to marry the bad-tempered girl at the A&P if he had to, and who had not been optimistic about his chances of getting his wife off the land without paying her some money or flogging her. 
On Major Major himself, the consequences were only slightly less severe. It was a harsh and stunning realization that was forced upon him at so tender an age, the realization that he was not, as he had always been led to believe, Caleb Major, but instead was some total stranger named Major Major Major, about whom he knew absolutely nothing and about whom nobody else had ever heard before. What playmates he had withdrew from him and never returned, disposed, as they were, to distrust all strangers, especially one who had already deceived them by pretending to be someone they had known for years. Nobody would have anything to do with him. He began to drop things and to trip. He had a shy and hopeful manner in each new contact, and he was always disappointed. Because he needed a friend so desperately, he never found one. He grew awkwardly into a tall, strange, dreamy boy with fragile eyes and a very delicate mouth, whose tentative, groping smile collapsed instantly into hurt disorder at every fresh rebuff. He was polite to his elders, who disliked him. Whatever his elders told him to do, he did. They told him to look before he leaped, and he always looked before he leaped. They told him never to put off until the next day what he could do the day before, and he never did. He was told to honor his father and his mother, and he honored his father and his mother. He was told that he should not kill, and he did not kill, until he got into the army. Then he was told to kill, and he killed. He turned the other cheek on every occasion, and always did unto others exactly as he would have had others do unto him. When he gave to charity, his left hand never knew what his right hand was doing. He never once took the name of the Lord his God in vain, committed adultery, or coveted his neighbor's ass. In fact, he loved his neighbor and never even bore false witness against him. Major Major's elders disliked him because he was such a flagrant nonconformist. Since he had nothing better to do well in, he did well in school. At the State University, he took his studies so seriously that he was suspected by the homosexuals of being a communist and suspected by the communists of being a homosexual. He majored in English history, which was a mistake. "'English history!' roared the silver Man senior senator from his state indignantly. "'What's the matter with American history? American history is as good as any history in the world!' Major Major switched immediately to American literature, but not before the FBI had opened a file on him. There were six people, and a Scotch terrier, inhabiting the remote farmhouse Major Major called home, and five of them, and the Scotch terrier, turned out to be agents for the FBI. Soon they had enough derogatory information on Major Major to do whatever they wanted to with him. The only thing they could find to do with him, however, was take him into the army as a private and make him a major four days later, so that congressmen with nothing else on their mind could go trotting back and forth through the streets of Washington, D.C., chanting, Who promoted Major Major? Who promoted Major Major? Actually, Major Major had been promoted by an IBM machine with a sense of humor almost as keen as his father's. When war broke out, he was still docile and compliant. They told him to enlist, and he enlisted. They told him to apply for aviation cadet training, and he applied for aviation cadet training, and the very next night found himself standing barefoot in icy mud at three o'clock in the morning before a tough and belligerent sergeant from the southwest who told them he could beat hell out of any man in his outfit and was ready to prove it. The recruits in his squadron had all been shaken roughly awake only minutes before by the sergeant corporals and told to assemble in front of the administration tent. It was still raining on Major Major. They fell into ranks in the civilian clothes they had brought into the army with them three days before. Those who had lingered to put shoes and socks on were sent back to their cold, wet, dark tents to remove them, and they were all barefoot in the mud as the sergeant ran his stony eyes over their faces and told them he could beat hell out of any man in his outfit. No one was inclined to dispute him.
Major Major's unexpected promotion to Major the next day plunged the belligerent sergeant into a bottomless gloom, for he was no longer able to boast that he could beat hell out of any man in his outfit. He brooded for hours in his tent, like Saul, receiving no visitors, while his elite guard of corporals stood discouraged watch outside. At three o'clock in the morning he found his solution, and Major Major and the other recruits were again shaken roughly awake and ordered to assemble barefoot in the drizzly glare at the administration tent, where the sergeant was already waiting, his fists clenched on his hips cockily, so eager to speak that he could hardly wait for them to arrive. "'Me and Major Major,' he boasted in the same tough, clipped tones of the night before, "'can beat hell out of any man in my outfit.' The officers on the base took action on the major-major problem later that same day. How could they cope with a major like major-major? To demean him personally would be to demean all other officers of equal or lesser rank. To treat him with courtesy, on the other hand, was unthinkable. Fortunately, major-major had applied for aviation cadet training. Orders transferring him away were sent to the mimeograph room late in the afternoon, and at three o'clock in the morning, Major Major was again shaken roughly awake, bidden Godspeed by the sergeant, and placed aboard a plane heading west. Lieutenant Scheisskopf turned white as a sheet when Major Major reported to him in California with bare feet and mud-caked toes. Major Major had taken it for granted that he was being shaken roughly awake again to stand barefoot in the mud, and had left his shoes and socks in the tent. The civilian clothing in which he reported for duty to Lieutenant Scheisskopf was rumpled and dirty. Lieutenant Scheisskopf, who had not yet made his reputation as a parader, shuddered violently at the picture Major Major would make marching barefoot in his squadron that coming Sunday. Go to the hospital quickly, he mumbled, when he had recovered sufficiently to speak. And tell them you're sick. Stay there until your allowance for uniforms catches up with you and you have some money to buy some clothes and some shoes. Buy some shoes. Yes, sir. I don't think you have to call me sir, sir, Lieutenant Scheisskopf pointed out. You outrank me. Yes, sir. I may outrank you, sir but you're still my commanding officer. Yes, sir, that's right, Lieutenant Scheisskopf agreed. You may outrank me, sir, but I'm still your commanding officer, so you better do what I tell you, sir, or you'll get into trouble. Go to the hospital and tell them you're sick, sir. Stay there until your uniform allowance catches up with you and you have some money to buy some uniforms. Yes, sir. And some shoes, sir. Buy some shoes the first chance you get, sir. Yes, sir. I will, sir. Thank you, sir. Life in cadet school for Major Major was no different than life had been for him all along. Whoever he was with always wanted him to be with someone else. His instructors gave him preferred treatment at every stage in order to push him along quickly and be rid of him. In almost no time he had his pilot's wings and found himself overseas where things began suddenly to improve. All his life, Major Major had longed for but one thing, to be absorbed. And in Pianosa, for a while, he finally was. Rank meant little to the men on combat duty, and relations between officers and enlisted men were relaxed and informal. Men whose names he didn't even know said hi, and invited him to go swimming or play basketball. His ripest hours were spent in the day-long basketball games no one ever gave a damn about winning. Score was never kept, and the number of players might vary from one to thirty-five. Major Major had never played basketball or any other game before, but his great bobbing height and rapturous enthusiasm helped make up for his innate clumsiness and lack of experience. Major Major found true happiness there on the lopsided basketball court with the officers and enlisted men who were almost his friends. If there were no winners, there were no losers, and Major Major enjoyed every gambling moment right up till the day Colonel Cathcart roared up in his jeep after Major Duluth was killed and made it impossible for him ever to enjoy playing basketball there again. "'You're the new squadron commander!' 
Colonel Cathcart had shouted rudely across the railroad ditch to him. But don't think it means anything, because it doesn't. All it means is that you're the new squadron commander. Colonel Cathcart had nursed an implacable grudge against Major Major for a long time. A superfluous major on his rolls meant an untidy table of organization and gave ammunition to the men at 27th Air Force headquarters who Colonel Cathcart was positive were his enemies and rivals. Colonel Cathcart had been praying for just some stroke of good luck like Major Duluth's death. He had been plagued by one extra major. He now had an opening for one major. He appointed Major Major Squadron Commander and roared away in his jeep as abruptly as he had come. For Major Major, it meant the end of the game. His face flushed with discomfort, and he was rooted to the spot in disbelief as the rain clouds gathered above him again. When he turned to his teammates, he encountered a reef of curious, reflective faces, all gazing at him woodenly with morose and inscrutable animosity. He shivered with shame. When the game resumed... It was not good any longer. When he dribbled, no one tried to stop him. When he called for a pass, whoever had the ball passed it. And when he missed a basket, no one raced him for the rebound. The only voice was his own. The next day was the same, and the day after that, he did not come back. Almost on cue, everyone in the squadron stopped talking to him and started staring at him. He walked through life self-consciously with downcast eyes and burning cheeks, the object of contempt, envy, suspicion, resentment, and malicious innuendo everywhere he went. People who had hardly noticed his resemblance to Henry Fonda before now never ceased discussing it. And there were even those who hinted sinisterly that Major Major had been elevated to squadron commander because he resembled Henry Fonda. Captain Black, who had aspired to the position himself, maintained that Major Major really was Henry Fonda, but was too chicken shit to admit it. Major Major floundered bewilderedly from one embarrassing catastrophe to another. Without consulting him, Sergeant Towser had his belongings moved into the roomy trailer Major Duluth had occupied alone, and when Major Major came rushing breathlessly into the orderly room to report the theft of his things, the young corporal there scared him half out of his wits by leaping to his feet and shouting, Attention! the moment he appeared. Major Major snapped to attention, with all the rest in the orderly room, wondering what important personage had entered behind him. Minutes passed in rigid silence, and the whole lot of them might have stood there at attention till doomsday if Major Danby had not dropped by from group to congratulate Major Major twenty minutes later and put them all at ease. Major Major fared even more lamentably at the mess hall, where Milo, his face fluttery with smiles, was waiting to usher him proudly to a small table he had set up in front and decorated with an embroidered tablecloth and a nosegay of posies in a pink cut-glass vase. Major Major hung back with horror, but he was not bold enough to resist with all the others watching. Even Havermeyer had lifted his head from his plate to gape at him with his heavy, pendulous jaw. Major Major submitted meekly to Milo's tugging and cowered in disgrace at his private table throughout the whole meal. The food was ashes in his mouth, but he swallowed every mouthful rather than risk offending any of the men connected with its preparation. Alone with Milo later, Major Major felt protest stir for the first time and said he would prefer to continue eating with the other officers. Milo told him it wouldn't work. I don't see what there is to work, Major Major argued. Nothing ever happened before. You were never the squadron commander before. Major Duluth was the squadron commander, and he always ate at the same table with the rest of the men. It was different with Major Duluth, sir. In what way was it different with Major Duluth? I wish you wouldn't ask me that, sir, said Milo. Is it? "'Because I look like Henry Fonda?' Major Major mustered the courage to demand. "'Some people say you are Henry Fonda,' Milo answered. "'Well, I'm not Henry Fonda,' 
Major Major exclaimed, in a voice quavering with exasperation. And I don't look the least bit like him. And even if I do look like Henry Fonda, what difference does that make? It doesn't make any difference. That's what I'm trying to tell you, sir. It's just not the same with you as it was with Major Duluth. And it just wasn't the same, for when Major Major, at the next meal, stepped from the food counter to sit with the others at the regular tables, he was frozen in his tracks by the impenetrable wall of antagonism thrown up by their faces, and stood petrified with his tray quivering in his hands, until Milo glided forward wordlessly to rescue him by leading him tamely to his private table. Major Major gave up after that and always ate at his table alone with his back to the others. He was certain they resented him because he seemed too good to eat with them now that he was squadron commander. There was never any conversation in the mess tent when Major Major was present. He was conscious that other officers tried to avoid eating at the same time, and everyone was greatly relieved when he stopped coming there all together and began taking his meals in his trailer. Major Major began forging Washington Irving's name to official documents the day after the first C.I.D. man showed up to interrogate him about somebody at the hospital who had been doing it and gave him the idea. He had been bored and dissatisfied in his new position. He had been made squadron commander, but had no idea what he was supposed to do as squadron commander, unless all he was supposed to do was forge Washington Irving's name to official documents and listen to the isolated clinks and thumps of Major de Coverley's horseshoes falling to the ground outside the window of his small office in the rear of the orderly room tent. He was hounded incessantly by an impression of vital duties left unfulfilled and waited in vain for his responsibilities to overtake him. He seldom went out, unless it was absolutely necessary, for he could not get used to being stared at. Occasionally, the monotony was broken by some officer or enlisted man Sergeant Towser referred to him on some matter that Major Major was unable to cope with, and referred right back to Sergeant Towser for sensible disposition. Whatever he was supposed to get done as squadron commander apparently was getting done without any assistance from him. He grew moody and depressed. At times he thought seriously of going with all his sorrows to see the chaplain, but the chaplain seemed so overburdened with miseries of his own that Major Major shrank from adding to his troubles. Besides, he was not quite sure if chaplains were for squadron commanders. He had never been quite sure about Major de Coverley either, who, when he was not away renting apartments or kidnapping foreign laborers, had nothing more pressing to do than pitch horseshoes. Major Major often paid strict attention to the horseshoes falling softly against the earth or riding down around the small steel pegs in the ground. He peeked out at Major de Coverley for hours and marveled that someone so august had nothing more important to do. He was often tempted to join Major de Coverley, but pitching horseshoes all day long seemed almost as dull as signing Major, Major, Major to official documents, and Major de Coverley's countenance was so forbidding that Major Major was in awe of approaching him. Major Major wondered about his relationship to Major de Coverley and about Major de Coverley's relationship to him. He knew that Major de Coverley was his executive officer, but he did not know what that meant, and he could not decide whether in Major de Coverley he was blessed with a lenient superior or cursed with a delinquent subordinate. He did not want to ask Sergeant Towser, of whom he was secretly afraid, and there was no one else he could ask, least of all Major de Coverley. Few people ever dared approach Major de Coverley about anything, and the only officer foolish enough to pitch one of his horseshoes was stricken the very next day with the worst case of pianos and crud that Gus or Wes or even Dr. Nika had ever seen or even heard about. Everyone was positive the disease had been inflicted upon the poor officer in retribution by Major de Coverley, although no one was sure how. Most of the official documents that came to Major Major's desk 
did not concern him at all. The vast majority consisted of allusions to prior communications, which Major Major had never seen or heard of. There was never any need to look them up, for the instructions were invariably to disregard. In the space of a single productive minute, therefore, he might endorse twenty separate documents, each advising him to pay absolutely no attention to any of the others. From General Peckham's office on the mainland came prolix bulletins, each day headed by such cheery homilies as, Procrastination is the thief of time, and Cleanliness is next to godliness. General Peckham's communications about cleanliness and procrastination made Major Major feel like a filthy procrastinator, and he always got those out of the way as quickly as he could. The only official documents that interested him were those occasional ones pertaining to the unfortunate second lieutenant who had been killed on the mission over Orvieto less than two hours after he arrived on Pianosa and whose partly unpacked belongings were still in Yossarian's tent. Since the unfortunate lieutenant had reported to the operations tent, instead of to the orderly room, Sergeant Towser had decided that it would be safest to report him as never having reported to the squadron at all, and the occasional documents relating to him dealt with the fact that he seemed to have vanished into thin air, which, in one way, was exactly what did happen to him. In the long run, Major Major was grateful for the official documents that came to his desk, for sitting in his office signing them all day long was a lot better than sitting in his office all day long not signing them. They gave him something to do. Inevitably, every document he signed came back with a fresh page added for a new signature by him after intervals of from two to ten days. They were always much thicker than formerly, for in between the sheet bearing his last endorsement and the sheet added for his new endorsement, with the sheets bearing the most recent endorsements of all the other officers in scattered locations who were also occupied in signing their names to that same official document. Major Major grew despondent as he watched simple communications swell prodigiously into huge manuscripts. No matter how many times he signed one, it always came back for still another signature, and he began to despair of ever being free of any of them. One day, it was the day after the CID man's first visit, Major Major signed Washington Irving's name to one of the documents instead of his own, just to see how it would feel. He liked it. He liked it so much that for the rest of that afternoon he did the same with all the official documents. It was an act of impulsive frivolity and rebellion for which he knew afterwards he would be punished severely. The next morning he entered his office in trepidation and waited to see what would happen. Nothing happened. He had sinned, and it was good. For none of the documents to which he had signed Washington Irving's name ever came back. Here, at last, was progress, and Major Major threw himself into his new career with uninhibited gusto. Signing Washington Irving's name to official documents was not much of a career, perhaps, but it was less monotonous than signing Major, Major, Major. When Washington Irving did grow monotonous, he could reverse the order and sign Irving Washington, until that grew monotonous. And he was getting something done, for none of the documents signed with either of these names ever came back to the squadron. What did come back eventually was a second C.I.D. man, masquerading as a pilot. The men knew he was a C.I.D. man because he confided to them he was, and urged each of them not to reveal his true identity to any of the other men to whom he had already confided that he was a C.I.D. man. You're the only one in the squadron who knows I'm a C.I.D. man, he confided to Major Major, and it's absolutely essential that it remain a secret so that my efficiency won't be impaired. Do you understand? Sergeant Towser knows. Yes, I know. I had to tell him in order to get in to see you, but I know he won't tell a soul under any circumstances. He told me said Major Major. He told me there was a C.I.D. man outside to see me. That 
bastard. I'll have to throw a security check on him. I wouldn't leave any top-secret documents lying around here if I were you. At least, not until I make my report. I don't get any top-secret documents, said Major Major. That's the kind I mean. Lock them in your cabinet where Sergeant Towser can't get his hands on them. Sergeant Towser has the only key to the cabinet. I'm afraid we're wasting time, said the second CID man rather stiffly. He was a brisk, pudgy, high-strung person whose movements were swift and certain. He took a number of photostats out of a large red expansion envelope he had been hiding conspicuously beneath a leather flight jacket painted garishly with pictures of airplanes flying through orange bursts of flak and with orderly rows of little bombs signifying fifty-five combat missions flown. Have you ever seen any of these? Major Major looked with a blank expression at copies of personal correspondence from the hospital on which the censoring officer had written Washington Irving or Irving Washington. No. How about these? Major Major gazed next at copies of official documents addressed to him to which he had been signing the same signatures. No. Is the man who signed these names in your squadron? Which one? There are two names here. Either one. We figure that Washington Irving and Irving Washington are one man, and that he's using two names just to throw us off the track. That's done very often, you know. I don't think there's a man with either of those names in my squadron. A look of disappointment crossed the second CID man's face. He's a lot cleverer than we thought, he observed. He's using a third name and posing as someone else. And I think, yes, I think I know what the third name is. With excitement and inspiration, he held another photostat out for Major Major to study. How about this? Major Major bent forward slightly and saw a copy of the piece of V-mail from which Yossarian had blacked out everything but the name Mary and on which he had written, I yearn for you tragically, A.T. Tapman, Chaplain, U.S. Army. Major Major shook his head. I've never seen it before. Do you know who A.T. Tapman is? He's the group chaplain. That... Locks it up, said the second CID man. Washington Irving is the group chaplain. Major Major felt a twinge of alarm. A.T. Tapman is the group chaplain, he corrected. Are you sure? Yes. Why should the group chaplain write this on a letter? Perhaps somebody else wrote it and forged his name. Why would somebody want to forge the group chaplain's name? to escape detection. You may be right, the second CID man decided after an instant's hesitation and smacked his lips crisply. Maybe we're confronted with a gang, with two men working together who just happen to have opposite names. Yes, I'm sure that's it. One of them here in the squadron, one of them up at the hospital, and one of them with the chaplain. That makes three men, doesn't it? Are you absolutely sure you never saw any of these official documents before? I would have signed them if I had. With whose name? Asked the second CID man, cunningly. Yours or Washington Irving's? With my own name, Major Major told him. I don't even know Washington Irving's name. The second CID man broke into a smile. Major... I'm glad you're in the clear. It means we'll be able to work together, and I'm going to need every man I can get. Somewhere in the European theater of operations is a man who's getting his hands on communications addressed to you. Have you any idea who it can be? No. Well, I have a pretty good idea, said the second CID man, and leaned forward to whisper confidentially. That bastard Towser. Why else would he go around shooting his mouth off about me? Now you keep your eyes open and let me know the minute you hear anyone even talking about Washington Irving. 
I'll throw a security check on the chaplain and everyone else around here. The moment he was gone, the first CID man jumped into Major Major's office through the window and wanted to know who the second CID man was. Major Major barely recognized him. He was a CID man, Major Major told him. Like hell he was, said the first CID man. I'm the CID man around here. Major Major barely recognized him because he was wearing a faded maroon corduroy bathrobe with open seams under both arms, linty flannel pajamas, and worn house slippers with one flapping sole. This was regulation hospital dress, Major Major recalled. The man had added about twenty pounds and seemed bursting with good health. I'm really a very sick man, he whined. I caught cold in the hospital from a fighter pilot and came down with a very serious case of pneumonia. I'm very sorry, Major Major said. A lot of good that does me, the CID man sniffled. I don't want your sympathy. I just want you to know what I'm going through. I came down to warn you that Washington Irving seems to have shifted his base of operations from the hospital to your squadron. You haven't heard anyone around here talking about Washington Irving, have you? As a matter of fact, I have, Major Major answered. This book is continued on Disc 4. Disc 4 As a matter of fact, I have, Major Major answered. That man who was just in there, he was talking about Washington Irving. Was he really? The first CID man cried with delight. This might be just what we needed to crack the case wide open. You keep him under surveillance 24 hours a day while I rush back to the hospital and write my superiors for further instructions. The CID man jumped out of Major Major's office through the window and was gone. A minute later, the flap separating Major Major's office from the orderly room flew open, and the second CID man was back, puffing frantically in haste. Gasping for breath, he shouted, I just saw a man in red pajamas come jumping out of your window and go running up the road. Didn't you see him? He was here talking to me, Major Major answered. I thought that looked mighty suspicious, a man jumping out the window in red pajamas. The man paced about the small office in vigorous circles. At first I thought it was you, hightailing it from Mexico. But now I see it wasn't you. He didn't say anything about Washington Irving, did he? As a matter of fact, said Major Major, he did. He did, cried the second CID man. That's fine. This might be just the break we needed to crack the case wide open. Do you know where we can find him? At the hospital. He's really a very sick man. That's great, exclaimed the second CID man. I'll go right up there after him. It would be best if I went incognito. I'll go explain the situation at the medical tent and have them send me there as a patient. They won't send me to the hospital as a patient unless I'm sick, he reported back to Major Major. Actually, I am pretty sick. I've been meaning to turn myself in for a checkup, and this will be a good opportunity. I'll go back to the medical tent and tell them I'm sick, and I'll get sent to the hospital that way. Look what they did to me, he reported back to Major Major with purple gums. His distress was inconsolable. He carried his shoes and socks in his hands, and his toes had been painted with gentian violet solution, too. Whoever heard of a CID man with purple gums? He moaned. He walked away from the orderly room with his head down and tumbled into a slit trench and broke his nose. His temperature was still normal, but Gus and Wes made an exception of him and sent him to the hospital in an ambulance. Major Major had lied, and it was good. He was not really surprised that it was good, for he had observed that people who did lie were, on the whole, more resourceful and ambitious and successful than people who did not lie. Had he told the truth to the second CID man, he would have found himself in trouble. Instead, he had lied, and he was free to continue his work.
he became more circumspect in his work as a result of the visit from the second C.I.D. man. He did all his signing with his left hand, and only while wearing the dark glasses and false mustache he had used unsuccessfully to help him begin playing basketball again. As an additional precaution, he made a happy switch from Washington Irving to John Milton. John Milton was supple and concise. Like Washington Irving, he could be reversed with good effect whenever he grew monotonous. Furthermore, he enabled Major Major to double his output, for John Milton was so much shorter than either his own name or Washington Irving's and took so much less time to write. John Milton proved fruitful in still one more respect. He was versatile, and Major Major soon found himself incorporating the signature in fragments of imaginary dialogues. Thus, typical endorsements on the official documents might read, John, Milton is a sadist, or Have you seen Milton, John? One signature of which he was especially proud read, Is anybody in the John, Milton? John Milton threw open whole new vistas filled with charming, inexhaustible possibilities that promised to ward off monotony forever. Major Major went back to Washington Irving when John Milton grew monotonous. Major Major had bought the dark glasses and false mustache in Rome in a final, futile attempt to save himself from the swampy degradation into which he was steadily sinking. First there had been the awful humiliation of the great loyalty oath crusade, when not one of the thirty or forty people circulating competitive loyalty oaths would even allow him to sign. Then, just when that was blowing over, there was the matter of Clevenger's plane disappearing so mysteriously in thin air with every member of the crew, and blame for the strange mishap centering balefully on him because he had never signed any of the loyalty oaths. The dark glasses had large magenta rims. The false black mustache was a flamboyant organ grinder's, and he wore them both to the basketball game one day when he felt he could endure his loneliness no longer. He affected an air of jaunty familiarity as he sauntered to the court and prayed silently that he would not be recognized. The others pretended not to recognize him, and he began to have fun. Just as he finished congratulating himself on his innocent ruse, he was bumped hard by one of his opponents and knocked to his knees. Soon he was bumped hard again, and it dawned on him that they did recognize him and that they were using his disguise as a license to elbow, trip, and maul him. They did not want him at all. And just as he did realize this, the players on his team fused instinctively with the players on the other team into a single, howling, bloodthirsty mob that descended upon him from all sides with foul curses and swinging fists. They knocked him to the ground, kicked him while he was on the ground, attacked him again after he had struggled blindly to his feet. He covered his face with his hands and could not see. They swarmed all over each other in their frenzied compulsion to bludgeon him, kick him, gouge him, trample him. He was pummeled, spinning to the edge of the ditch, and sent slithering down on his head and shoulders. At the bottom he found his footing, clambered up the other wall, and staggered away beneath the hail of hoots and stones with which they pelted him, until he lurched into shelter around a corner of the orderly room tent. His paramount concern throughout the entire assault was to keep his dark glasses and false mustache in place so that he might continue pretending he was somebody else and be spared the dreaded necessity of having to confront them with his authority. Back in his office, he wept, and when he finished weeping, he washed the blood from his mouth and nose, scrubbed the dirt from the abrasions on his cheek and forehead, and summoned Sergeant Towser. From now on, he said, I don't want anyone to come in to see me while I'm here. Is that clear? Yes, sir, said Sergeant Towser. Does that include me? Yes. I see. Will that be all? Yes. What shall I say to the people who do come to see you while you're here? Tell them I'm in and ask them to wait. Yes, sir. For how long? Until I've left. And then what shall I do with them? I don't care. 
May I send them in to see you after you've left? Yes. But you won't be here then, will you? No. Yes, sir. Will that be all? Yes. Yes, sir. From now on, Major Major said to the middle-aged enlisted man who took care of his trailer, I don't want you to come here while I'm here to ask me if there's anything you can do for me. Is that clear? Yes, sir, said the orderly. When should I come here to find out if there's anything you want me to do for you? When I'm not here. Yes, sir. And what should I do? Whatever I tell you to. But you won't be here to tell me, will you? No. Then what should I do? Whatever has to be done. Yes, sir. That will be all, said Major Major. Yes, sir, said the orderly. Will that be all? No, said Major Major. Don't come in to clean either. Don't come in for anything unless you're sure I'm not here. Yes, sir. But how can I always be sure? If you're not sure, just assume that I am here and go away until you are sure. Is that clear? Yes, sir. I'm sorry to have to talk to you in this way, but I have to. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. And thank you. For everything. Yes, sir. From now on, Major Major said to Milo Minderbinder, I'm not going to come to the mess hall any more. I'll have all my meals brought to me in my trailer. I think that's a good idea, sir, Milo answered. Now I'll be able to serve you special dishes that the others will never know about. I'm sure you'll enjoy them. Colonel Cathcart always does. I don't want any special dishes. I want exactly what you serve all the other officers. Just have whoever brings it knock once on my door and leave the tray on the step. Is that clear? Yes, sir, said Milo. That's very clear. I've got some live Maine lobsters hidden away that I can serve you tonight with an excellent Roquefort salad and two frozen eclairs that were smuggled out of Paris only yesterday together with an important member of the French underground. Will that do for a start? No. Yes, sir. I understand. For dinner that night, Milo served embroiled Maine lobster with excellent Roquefort salad and two frozen eclairs. Major Major was annoyed. If he sent it back, though, it would only go to waste or to somebody else, and Major Major had a weakness for broiled lobster. He ate with a guilty conscience. The next day for lunch there was a terrapin Maryland, with a whole quart of Dom Perignon, 1937, and Major Major gulped it down without a thought. After Milo, there remained only the men in the orderly room, and Major Major avoided them by entering and leaving every time through the dingy celluloid window of his office. The window unbuttoned and was low and large and easy to jump through from either side. He managed the distance between the orderly room and his trailer by darting around the corner of the tent when the coast was clear, leaping down into the railroad ditch, and dashing along with his head bowed until he attained the sanctuary of the forest. Abreast of his trailer, he left the ditch and wove his way speedily toward home through the dense underbrush in which the only person he ever encountered was Captain Flume, who— drawn and ghostly, frightened him half to death one twilight by materializing without warning out of a patch of dewberry bushes to complain that Chief White Half-Oat had threatened to slit his throat open from ear to ear. If you ever frighten me like that again, Major Major told him, I'll slit your throat open from ear to ear. Captain Flume gasped and dissolved right back into the patch of dewberry bushes and Major Major never set eyes on him again. When Major Major looked back on what he had accomplished, he was pleased. In the midst of a few foreign acres, teeming with more than two hundred people, he had succeeded in becoming a recluse. With a little ingenuity and vision, he had made it all but impossible for anyone in the squadron to talk to him, which was just fine with everyone, he noticed since no one wanted to talk to him anyway. No one, it turned out, but that madman Yossarian, who brought him down with a flying tackle one day as he was scooting along the bottom of the ditch to his trailer for lunch. The last person in the squadron Major Major wanted to be brought down with a flying tackle by was Yossarian. 
There was something inherently disreputable about Yossarian, always carrying on so disgracefully about that dead man in his tent who wasn't even there, and then taking off all his clothes after the Avignon mission and going around without them right up to the day General Dreedle stepped up to pin a medal on him for his heroism over Ferrara and found him standing in formation stark naked. No one in the world had the power to remove the dead man's disorganized effects from Yossarian's tent. Major Major had forfeited the authority when he permitted Sergeant Towser to report the lieutenant who had been killed over Orvieto less than two hours after he arrived in the squadron as never having arrived in the squadron at all. The only one with any right to remove his belongings from Yossarian's tent, it seemed to Major Major, was Yossarian himself. And Yossarian, it seemed to Major Major, had no right. Major Major groaned after Yossarian brought him down with a flying tackle and tried to wiggle to his feet. Yossarian wouldn't let him. Captain Yossarian, Yossarian said, requests permission to speak to the Major at once about a matter of life or death. Let me up, please. Major Major bit him in cranky discomfort. I can't return your salute while I'm lying on my arm. Yossarian released him. They stood up slowly. Yossarian saluted again and repeated his request. "'Let's go to my office,' Major Major said. "'I don't think this is the best place to talk.' "'Yes, sir,' answered Yossarian. They smacked the gravel from their clothing and walked in constrained silence to the entrance of the orderly room. "'Give me a minute or two to put some mercurochrome on these cuts. Then have Sergeant Towser send you in.' "'Yes, sir.' Major Major strode with dignity to the rear of the orderly room without glancing at any of the clerks and typists working at the desks and filing cabinets. He let the flap leading to his office fall closed behind him. As soon as he was alone in his office, he raced across the room to the window and jumped outside to dash away. He found Yossarian blocking his path. Yossarian was waiting at attention and saluted again. Captain Yossarian requests permission to speak to the Major at once about a matter of life or death, he repeated determinedly. Permission denied. Major Major snapped. That won't do it. Major Major gave in. All right, he conceded wearily. I'll talk to you. Please jump inside my office. After you. They jumped inside the office. Major Major sat down, and Yossarian moved around in front of his desk and told him that he did not want to fly any more combat missions. What could he do, Major Major asked himself. All he could do was what he had been instructed to do by Colonel Korn and hope for the best. Why not? he asked. I'm afraid. That's nothing to be ashamed of. Major Major counseled him kindly. We're all afraid. I'm not ashamed, Yossarian said. I'm just afraid. You wouldn't be normal if you were never afraid. Even the bravest men experience fear. One of the biggest jobs we all face in combat is to overcome our fear. Oh, come on, Major. Can't we do without that horse shit? Major Major lowered his gaze sheepishly and fiddled with his fingers. What do you want me to tell you? that I've flown enough missions and can go home. How many have you flown? Fifty-one. You've only got four more to fly. He'll raise them. Every time I get close, he raises them. Perhaps he won't this time. He never sends anyone home anyway. He just keeps them around waiting for rotation orders until he doesn't have enough men left for the crews, and then raises the number of missions and throws them all back on combat status. He's been doing that ever since he got here. You mustn't blame Colonel Cathcart for any delay with the orders, Major Major advised. It's 27th Air Force's responsibility to process the orders promptly once they get them from us. He could still ask for replacements and send us home when the orders did come back. Anyway, I've been told the 27th Air Force wants only 40 missions and that it's only his own idea to get us to fly 55. I wouldn't know anything about that, Major Major answered. Colonel Cathcart is our commanding officer and we must obey him. Why don't you fly the four more missions and see what happens? I don't want to. 
What could you do? Major Major asked himself again. What could you do with a man who looked you squarely in the eye and said he would rather die than be killed in combat? A man who was at least as mature and as intelligent as you were and who you had to pretend was not. What could you say to him? Suppose we let you pick your missions and fly milk runs, Major Major said. That way you can fly the four missions and not run any risks. I don't want to fly milk runs. I don't want to be in the war any more. Would you like to see our country lose? Major Major asked. We won't lose. We've got more men, more money, and more material. There are ten million men in uniform who could replace me. Some people are getting killed, and a lot more are making money and having fun. Let somebody else get killed. But suppose everybody on our side felt that way. Then I'd certainly be a damned fool to feel any other way, wouldn't I? What could you possibly say to him, Major Major wondered forlornly. One thing he could not say was that there was nothing he could do. To say there was nothing he could do would suggest he would do something if he could, and imply the existence of an error or injustice in Colonel Korn's policy. Colonel Korn had been most explicit about that. He must never say there was nothing he could do. I'm sorry, he said, but there's nothing I can do. Chapter 10 Wintergreen Clevenger was dead. That was the basic flaw in his philosophy. Eighteen planes had let down through a beaming white cloud off the coast of Elba one afternoon on the way back from the weekly milk run to Parma. Seventeen came out. No trace was ever found of the other, not in the air or on the smooth surface of the jade waters below. There was no debris. Helicopters circled the white cloud till sunset. During the night the cloud blew away, and in the morning there was no more Clevenger. The disappearance was astounding, as astounding certainly as the grand conspiracy of Lowry Field, when all sixty-four men in a single barrack vanished one payday and were never heard of again. Until Clevenger was snatched from existence so adroitly, Yossarian had assumed that the men had simply decided unanimously to go AWOL the same day. In fact, he had been so encouraged by what appeared to be a mass desertion from sacred responsibility that he had gone running outside in elation to carry the exciting news to XPFC Wintergreen. What's so exciting about it? XPFC Wintergreen sneered obnoxiously, resting his filthy G.I. shoe on his spade and lounging back in a surly slouch against the wall of one of the deep, square holes it was his military specialty to dig. XPFC Wintergreen was a snide little punk who enjoyed working at cross purposes. Each time he went AWOL, he was caught and sentenced to dig and fill up holes six feet deep, wide, and long, for a specified length of time. Each time he finished his sentence, he went AWOL again. XPFC Wintergreen accepted his role of digging and filling up holes with all the uncomplaining dedication of a true patriot. It's not a bad life, he would observe philosophically, and I guess somebody has to do it. He had wisdom enough to understand that digging holes in Colorado was not such a bad assignment in wartime. Since the holes were in no great demand, he could dig them and fill them up at a leisurely pace, and he was seldom overworked. On the other hand, he was busted down to buck private each time he was court-martialed. He regretted this loss of rank keenly. It was kind of nice being a PFC, he reminisced yearningly. I had status, you know what I mean? And I used to travel in the best circles. His face darkened with resignation. But that's all behind me now, he guessed. The next time I go over the hill, it will be as a buck private, and I just know it won't be the same. There was no future in digging holes. The job isn't even steady. I lose it each time I finish serving my sentence. Then I have to go over the hill again if I want it back and I can't even keep doing that. There's a catch. 
Catch-22. The next time I go over the hill, it will mean the stockade. I don't know what's going to become of me. I might even wind up overseas if I'm not careful. He did not want to keep digging holes for the rest of his life, although he had no objection to doing it as long as there was a war going on, and it was part of the war effort. It's a matter of duty, he observed, and we each have our own to perform. My duty is to keep digging these holes, and I've been doing such a good job of it that I've just been recommended for the Good Conduct Medal. Your duty is to screw around in cadet school and hope the war ends before you get out. The duty of the men in combat is to win the war, and I just wish they were doing their duty as well as I've been doing mine. It wouldn't be fair if I had to go overseas and do their job, too, would it? One day, XPFC Wintergreen struck open a water pipe while digging in one of his holes and almost drowned to death before he was fished out, nearly unconscious. Word spread that it was oil, and Chief White Halfoat was kicked off the base. Soon, every man who could find a shovel was outside digging frenziedly for oil. Dirt flew everywhere. The scene was almost like the morning in Pianosa, seven months later, after the night Milo bombed the squadron with every plane he had accumulated in his M&M &M syndicate, and the airfield, bomb dump, and repair hangars as well, and all the survivors were outside hacking cavernous shelters into the solid ground and roofing them over with sheets of armor plates stolen from the repair sheds at the field and with tattered squares of waterproof canvas stolen from the side flaps of each other's tents. Chief White Halfoat was transferred out of Colorado at the first rumor of oil, and came to rest finally in Pianosa as a replacement for Lieutenant Coombs, who had gone out on a mission as a guest one day just to see what combat was like, and had died over Ferrara in the plane with Kraft. Yossarian felt guilty each time he remembered Kraft. Guilty because Kraft had been killed on Yossarian's second bomb run, and guilty because Kraft had gotten mixed up innocently also in the splendid Atabrine insurrection that had begun in Puerto Rico on the first leg of their flight overseas and ended in Pianosa ten days later with Appleby striding dutifully into the orderly room the moment he arrived to report Yossarian for refusing to take his Atabrine tablets. The sergeant there invited him to be seated. "'Thank you, sergeant. I think I will,' said Appleby. About how long will I have to wait? I've still got a lot to get done today so that I can be fully prepared bright and early tomorrow morning to go into combat the minute they want me to. Sir? What's that, Sergeant? What was your question? About how long will I have to wait before I can go in to see the Major? Just until he goes out to lunch, Sergeant Towser replied. Then you can go right in. But he won't be there then, will he? No, sir. Major Major won't be back in his office until after lunch. I see, Appleby decided uncertainly. I think I'd better come back after lunch, then. Appleby turned from the orderly room in secret confusion. The moment he stepped outside, he thought he saw a tall, dark officer who looked a little like Henry Fonda come jumping out the window of the orderly room tent and go scooting out of sight around the corner. Appleby halted and squeezed his eyes closed. An anxious doubt assailed him. He wondered if he were suffering from malaria, or worse, from an overdose of atabrine tablets. Appleby had been taking four times as many atabrine tablets as the amount prescribed because he wanted to be four times as good a pilot as everyone else. His eyes were still shut when Sergeant Towser tapped him lightly on the shoulder and told him he could go in now if he wanted to, since Major Major had just gone out. Appleby's confidence returned. Thank you, Sergeant. Will he be back soon? He'll be back right after lunch. Then you'll have to go right out and wait for him in front till he leaves for dinner. Major Major never sees anyone in his office while he's in his office. Sergeant, what did you just say? I said that Major Major never sees anyone in his office while he's in his office. Appleby stared at Sergeant Towser intently and attempted a firm tone. Sergeant, are you trying to make a fool out of me just because I'm new in the squadron and you've been overseas a long time? Oh, no, sir, answered the sergeant deferentially. Those are my orders. You can ask Major Major when you see him. That's just what I intend to do, Sergeant. 
When can I see him? Never. Crimson with humiliation, Appleby wrote down his report about Eucerian and the Adabrine tablets on a pad the sergeant offered him, and left quickly, wondering if perhaps Eucerian were not the only man privileged to wear an officer's uniform who was crazy. By the time Colonel Cathcart had raised the number of missions to fifty-five, Sergeant Towser had begun to suspect that perhaps every man who wore a uniform was crazy. Sergeant Towser was lean and angular and had fine blonde hair, so light it was almost without color, sunken cheeks, and teeth like large white marshmallows. He ran the squadron and was not happy doing it. Men like Hungry Joe glowered at him with blameful hatred, and Appleby subjected him to vindictive discourtesy now that he had established himself as a hot pilot and a ping-pong player who never lost a point. Sergeant Towser ran the squadron because there was no one else in the squadron to run it. He had no interest in war or advancement. He was interested in shards and Heppelwhite furniture. Almost without realizing it, Sergeant Towser had fallen into the habit of thinking of the dead man in Yossarian's tent in Yossarian's own terms, as a dead man in Yossarian's tent. In reality, he was no such thing. He was simply a replacement pilot who had been killed in combat before he had officially reported for duty. He had stopped at the operations tent to inquire the way to the orderly room tent, and had been sent right into action because so many men had completed the thirty-five missions required then that Captain Pilchard and Captain Wren were finding it difficult to assemble the number of crews specified by group. Because he had never officially gotten into the squadron, he could never officially be gotten out. And Sergeant Towser sensed that the multiplying communications relating to the poor man would continue reverberating forever. His name was Mud. To Sergeant Towser, who deplored violence and waste with equal aversion, it seemed like such an abhorrent extravagance to fly mud all the way across the ocean just to have him blown into bits over Orvieto less than two hours after he arrived. No one could recall who he was or what he had looked like, least of all Captain Pilchard and Captain Wren, who remembered only that a new officer had shown up at the operations tent just in time to be killed, and who colored uneasily every time the matter of the dead man in Yossarian's tent was mentioned. The only ones who might have seen Mud, the men in the same plane, had all been blown to bits with him. Yossarian, on the other hand, knew exactly who Mud was. Mud was the unknown soldier who had never had a chance, for that was the only thing anyone ever did know about all the unknown soldiers. They never had a chance. They had to be dead. And this dead one was really unknown, even though his belongings still lay in a tumble on the cot in Yossarian's tent, almost exactly as he had left them three months earlier, the day he never arrived. All contaminated with death, less than two hours later, in the same way that all was contaminated with death the very next week during the great big siege of Bologna, when the moldy odor of mortality hung wet in the air with the sulfurous fog and every man scheduled to fly was already tainted. There was no escaping the mission to Bologna once Colonel Cathcart had volunteered his group for the ammunition dumps there that the heavy bombers on the Italian mainland had been unable to destroy from their higher altitudes. Each day's delay deepened the awareness and deepened the gloom. The clanging, overpowering conviction of death spread steadily with the continuing rainfall, soaking mordantly into each man's ailing countenance like the corrosive blot of some crawling disease. Everyone smelled of formaldehyde. There was nowhere to turn for help, not even to the medical tent, which had been ordered closed by Colonel Korn so that no one could report for sick call, as the men had done on the one clear day, with a mysterious epidemic of diarrhea that had forced still another postponement. With sick call suspended, and the door to the medical tent nailed shut, 
Dr. Nika spent the intervals between rain perched on a high stool, wordlessly absorbing the bleak outbreak of fear with a sorrowing neutrality, roosting like a melancholy buzzard below the ominous, hand-lettered sign tacked up on the closed door of the medical tent by Captain Black as a joke, and left hanging there by Dr. Nika because it was no joke. The sign was boarded in dark crayon and read, Closed Until Further Notice. Death in the family. The fear flowed everywhere, into Dunbar's squadron, where Dunbar poked his head inquiringly through the entrance of the medical tent there one twilight and spoke respectfully to the blurred outline of Dr. Stubbs, who was sitting in the dense shadows inside before a bottle of whiskey and a bell jar filled with purified drinking water. "'Are you all right?' he asked solicitously. "'Terrible.' Dr. Stubbs answered. What are you doing here? Sitting. I thought there was no more sick call. There ain't. Then why are you sitting here? Where else should I sit? At the goddamn officers' club with Colonel Cathcart and Corn? Do you know what I'm doing here? Sitting. In the squadron, I mean, not in the tent. Don't be such a goddamn wise guy. Can you figure out what a doctor is doing here in the squadron? They've got the doors to the medical tents nailed shut in the other squadrons, Dunbar remarked. If anyone sick walks through my door, I'm going to ground him, Dr. Stubbs vowed. I don't give a damn what they say. You can't ground anyone, Dunbar reminded. Don't you know the orders? I'll knock him flat on his ass with an injection and really ground him. Dr. Stubbs laughed with sardonic amusement at the prospect. They think they can order a sick call out of existence. The bastards. Oops, there it goes again. The rain began falling again, first in the trees, then in the mud puddles, then, faintly, like a soothing murmur, on the tent top. Everything's wet, Dr. Stubbs observed with revulsion. Even the latrines and urinals are backing up in protest. The whole goddamned world smells like a charnel house. The silence seemed bottomless when he stopped talking. Night fell. There was a sense of vast isolation. Turn on the light, Dunbar suggested. There is no light. I don't feel like starting my generator. I used to get a big kick out of saving people's lives. Now I wonder what the hell's the point since they all have to die anyway. Oh, there's a point, all right, Dunbar assured him. Is there? What is the point? The point is to keep them from dying for as long as you can. Yeah, but what's the point, since they all have to die anyway? The trick is not to think about that. Never mind the trick. What the hell's the point? Dunbar pondered in silence for a few moments. Who the hell knows? Dunbar didn't know. Bologna should have exalted Dunbar, because the minutes dawdled and the hours dragged like centuries. Instead, it tortured him, because he knew he was going to be killed. Do you really want some more codeine? Dr. Stubbs asked. It's for my friend, Yossarian. He's sure he's going to be killed. Yossarian? Who the hell is Yossarian? What the hell kind of a name is Yossarian, anyway? Isn't he the one who got drunk and started that fight with Colonel Korn at the officer's club the other night? That's right. He's a Syrian. That crazy bastard. He's not so crazy, Dunbar said. He swears he's not going to fly to Bologna. That's just what I mean, Dr. Stubbs answered. That crazy bastard may be the only sane one left. Chapter 11 Captain Black Corporal Kolodny learned about it first in a phone call from Group, and was so shaken by the news that he crossed the intelligence tent on tiptoe to Captain Black, who was resting drowsily with his bladed shins up on the desk, and relayed the information to him in a shocked whisper. Captain Black brightened immediately. Bologna? he exclaimed with delight. Well, I'll be damned. He broke into loud laughter. Bologna, huh? 
He laughed again and shook his head in pleasant amazement. Oh, boy, I can't wait to see those bastards' faces when they find out they're going to Bologna. Ha, ha, ha. It was the first really good laugh Captain Black had enjoyed since the day Major Major outsmarted him and was appointed squadron commander. And he rose with torpid enthusiasm and stationed himself behind the front counter in order to wring the most enjoyment from the occasion when the bombardiers arrived for their map kits. That's right, you bastards. Bologna! He kept repeating to all the bombardiers who inquired incredulously if they were really going to Bologna. Ha, ha, ha! Eat your livers, you bastards! This time you're really in for it! Captain Black followed the last of them outside to observe with relish the effect of the knowledge upon all of the other officers and enlisted men who were assembling with their helmets, parachutes, and flak suits around the four trucks idling in the center of the squadron area. He was a tall, narrow, disconsolate man who moved with a crabby listlessness. He shaved his pinched, pale face every third or fourth day, and most of the time he appeared to be growing a reddish-gold mustache over his skinny upper lip. He was not disappointed in the scene outside. There was consternation darkening every expression, and Captain Black yawned deliciously, rubbed the last lethargy from his eyes, and laughed gloatingly each time he told someone else to eat his liver. Bologna turned out to be the most rewarding event in Captain Black's life since the day Major Duluth was killed over Perugia and he was almost selected to replace him. When word of Major Duluth's death was radioed back to the field, Captain Black responded with a surge of joy. Although he had never really contemplated the possibility before, Captain Black understood at once that he was the logical man to succeed Major Duluth as squadron commander. To begin with, he was the squadron intelligence officer, which meant he was more intelligent than everyone else in the squadron. True, he was not on combat status, as Major Duluth had been, and as all squadron commanders customarily were. But this was really another powerful argument in his favor, since his life was in no danger, and he would be able to fill the post for as long as his country needed him. The more Captain Black thought about it, the more inevitable it seemed. It was merely a matter of dropping the right word in the right place quickly. He hurried back to his office to determine a course of action. Settling back in his swivel chair, his feet up on the desk and his eyes closed, he began imagining how beautiful everything would be once he was squadron commander. While Captain Black was imagining, Colonel Cathcart was acting. And Captain Black was flabbergasted by the speed with which, he concluded, Major Major had outsmarted him. His great dismay at the announcement of Major Major's appointment as squadron commander was tinged with an embittered resentment he made no effort to conceal. When fellow administrative officers expressed astonishment at Colonel Cathcart's choice of Major Major, Captain Black muttered that there was something funny going on. When they speculated on the political value of Major Major's resemblance to Henry Fonda, Captain Black asserted that Major Major really was Henry Fonda. And when they remarked that Major Major was somewhat odd, Captain Black announced that he was a communist. They're taking over everything, he declared rebelliously. Well, you fellows can stand around and let them if you want to, but I'm not going to. I'm going to do something about it. From now on, I'm going to make every son of a bitch who comes to my intelligence tent sign a loyalty oath. And I'm not going to let that bastard Major Major sign one, even if he wants to. Almost overnight, the glorious loyalty oath crusade was in full flower. And Captain Black was enraptured to discover himself spearheading it. He had really hit on something— all the enlisted men and officers on combat duty had to sign a loyalty oath to get their map cases from the intelligence tent, a second loyalty oath to receive their flak suits and parachutes from the parachute tent, a third loyalty oath for Lieutenant Balkington, the motor vehicle officer, to be allowed to ride from the squadron to the airfield in one of the trucks. Every time they turned around, there was another loyalty oath to be signed. 
They signed a loyalty oath to get their pay from the finance officer, to obtain their PX supplies, to have their hair cut by the Italian barbers. To Captain Black, every officer who supported his glorious loyalty oath crusade was a competitor, and he planned and plotted twenty-four hours a day to keep one step ahead. He would stand second to none in his devotion to country. When other officers had followed his urging and introduced loyalty oaths of their own, he went them one better by making every son of a bitch who came to his intelligence tent sign two loyalty oaths, then three, then four. Then he introduced the Pledge of Allegiance, and after that the Star-Spangled Banner, one chorus, two choruses, three choruses, four choruses— each time Captain Black forged ahead of his competitors, he swung upon them scornfully for their failure to follow his example. Each time they followed his example, he retreated with concern and racked his brain for some new stratagem that would enable him to turn upon them scornfully again. Without realizing how it had come about, the combat men in the squadron discovered themselves dominated by the administrators appointed to serve them. They were bullied, insulted, harassed, and shoved about all day long by one after the other. When they voiced objection, Captain Black replied that people who were loyal would not mind signing all the loyalty oaths they had to. To anyone who questioned the effectiveness of the loyalty oaths, he replied that people who really did owe allegiance to their country would be proud to pledge it as often as he forced them to. And to anyone who questioned the morality, he replied that the Star-Spangled Banner was the greatest piece of music ever composed. The more loyalty oaths a person signed, the more loyal he was. To Captain Black, it was as simple as that. And he had Corporal Kolodny sign hundreds with his name each day so that he could always prove he was more loyal than anyone else. The important thing is to keep them pledging, he explained to his cohorts. It doesn't matter whether they mean it or not. That's why they make little kids pledge allegiance, even before they know what pledge and allegiance mean. To Captain Pilchard and Captain Wren, the glorious loyalty oath crusade was a glorious pain in the ass, since it complicated the task of organizing the crews for each combat mission. Men were tied up all over the squadron, signing, pledging, and singing and the missions took hours longer to get underway. Effective emergency action became impossible, but Captain Pilchard and Captain Wren were both too timid to raise any outcry against Captain Black, who scrupulously enforced each day the doctrine of continual reaffirmation that he had originated, a doctrine designed to trap all those men who had become disloyal since the last time they had signed a loyalty oath the day before. It was Captain Black who came with advice to Captain Pilchard and Captain Wren as they pitched about in their bewildering predicament. He came with a delegation and advised them bluntly to make each man sign a loyalty oath before allowing him to fly on a combat mission. Of course, it's up to you, Captain Black pointed out. Nobody's trying to pressure you. But everyone else is making them sign loyalty oaths, and it's going to look mighty funny to the FBI if you two are the only ones who don't care enough about your country to make them sign loyalty oaths, too. If you want to get a bad reputation, that's nobody's business but your own. All we're trying to do is help. Milo was not convinced, and absolutely refused to deprive Major Major of food, even if Major Major was a communist which Milo secretly doubted. Milo was by nature opposed to any innovation that threatened to disrupt the normal course of affairs. Milo took a firm moral stand and absolutely refused to participate in the glorious loyalty oath crusade until Captain Black called upon him with his delegation and requested him to. National defense is everybody's job, Captain Black replied to Milo's objection. And this whole program is voluntary, Milo. Don't forget that. The men don't have to sign Pilchard and Wren's loyalty oath if they don't want to. But we need you to starve them to death if they don't. It's just like Catch-22. Don't you get it? You're not against Catch-22, are you? Doc Danica was adamant. 
What makes you so sure Major Major is a communist? You never heard him denying it until we began accusing him, did you? And you don't see him signing any of our loyalty oaths. You weren't letting him sign any. Of course not, Captain Black explained. That would defeat the whole purpose of our crusade. Look, you don't have to play ball with us if you don't want to. But what's the point of the rest of us working so hard if you're going to give Major Major medical attention the minute Milo begins starving him to death? I just wonder what they're going to think up at group about the man who's undermining our whole security program. They'll probably transfer you to the Pacific. Dr. Nika surrendered swiftly. I'll go tell Gus and West to do whatever you want them to. Up at group, Colonel Cathcart had already begun wondering what was going on. It's that idiot Black off on a patriotism binge, Colonel Korn reported with a smile. I think you'd better play ball with him for a while, since you're the one who promoted Major Major to squadron commander. That was your idea, Colonel Cathcart accused him petulantly. I never should have let you talk me into it. And a very good idea it was, too, retorted Colonel Korn, since it eliminated that superfluous major that's been giving you such an awful black eye as an administrator. Don't worry, this will probably run its course soon. The best thing to do now is send Captain Black a letter of total support and hope he drops dead before he does too much damage. Colonel Korn was struck with a whimsical thought. I wonder. You don't suppose that imbecile will try to turn Major Major out of his trailer, do you? The next thing we've got to do is turn that bastard Major Major out of his trailer, Captain Black decided. I'd like to turn his wife and kids out into the woods, too, but we can't. He has no wife and kids. So we'll just have to make do with what we have and turn him out. Who's in charge of the tents? He is. You see, cried Captain Black, they're taking over everything. Well, I'm not going to stand for it. I'll take this matter right to Major De Coverley himself, if I have to. I'll have Milo speak to him about it the minute he gets back from Rome. Captain Black had boundless faith in the wisdom power, and justice of Major de Coverley, even though he had never spoken to him before and still found himself without the courage to do so. He deputized Milo to speak to Major de Coverley for him and stormed out impatiently as he waited for the tall executive officer to return. Along with everyone else in the squadron, he lived in profound awe and reverence of the majestic, white-haired Major with a craggy face and Jehovian bearing, who came back from Rome finally with an injured eye inside a new celluloid eye patch and smashed his whole glorious crusade to bits with a single stroke. Milo carefully said nothing when Major de Coverley stepped into the mess hall with his fierce and austere dignity the day he returned and found his way blocked by a wall of officers waiting in line to sign loyalty oaths. At the far end of the food counter, a group of men who had arrived earlier were pledging allegiance to the flag, with trays of food balanced in one hand, in order to be allowed to take seats at the table. Already at the tables, a group that had arrived still earlier was singing the Star-Spangled Banner, in order that they might use the salt and pepper and ketchup there. The hubbub began to subside slowly as Major de Coverley paused in the doorway with a frown of puzzled disapproval, as though viewing something bizarre. He started forward in a straight line, and the wall of officers before him parted like the Red Sea. Glancing neither left nor right, he strode indomitably up to the steam counter, and in a clear, full-bodied voice that was gruff with age and resonant with ancient eminence and authority, said, Give me eat. Instead of eat, Corporal Snark gave Major de Coverley a loyalty oath to sign. Major de Coverley swept it away with mighty displeasure the moment he recognized what it was, his good eye flaring up blindingly with fiery disdain and his enormous old corrugated face darkening in mountainous wrath. Give me eat, I said he ordered loudly in harsh tones that rumbled ominously through the silent tent like claps of distant thunder. 
Corporal Snark turned pale and began to tremble. He glanced toward Milo pleadingly for guidance. For several terrible seconds, there was not a sound. Then Milo nodded. Give him eat, he said. Corporal Snark began giving Major de Coverley eat. Major de Coverley turned from the counter with his trayful and came to a stop. His eyes fell on the groups of other officers gazing at him in mute appeal, and with righteous belligerence he roared, Give everybody eat! Give everybody eat! Milo echoed with joyful relief, and the glorious loyalty oath crusade came to an end. Captain Black was deeply disillusioned by this treacherous stab in the back from someone in high place upon whom he had relied so confidently for support. Major de Coverley had let him down. Oh, it doesn't bother me a bit, he responded cheerfully to everyone who came to him with sympathy. We completed our task. Our purpose was to make everyone we don't like afraid and to alert people to the danger of Major Major. And we certainly succeeded at that. Since we weren't going to let him sign loyalty oaths anyway, it doesn't really matter whether we have them or not. Seeing everyone in the squadron he didn't like afraid, once again throughout the appalling, interminable, great big siege of Bologna, reminded Captain Black nostalgically of the good old days of his glorious loyalty oath crusade, when he had been a man of real consequence, and when even big shots like Milo Minderbinder, Dr. Nika, and Pilchard, and Wren had trembled at his approach and groveled at his feet. To prove to newcomers that he really had been a man of consequence once, he still had the letter of commendation he had received from Colonel Cathcart. Chapter 12 Bologna Actually, it was not Captain Black, but Sergeant Knight, who triggered the solemn panic of Bologna, slipping silently off the truck for two extra flak suits as soon as he learned the target, and signaling the start of the grim procession back into the parachute tent that degenerated into a frantic stampede finally before all the extra flak suits were gone. Hey! What's going on? Kid Sampson asked nervously. Bologna can't be that rough, can it? Nately, sitting trance-like on the floor of the truck, held his grave young face in both hands and did not answer him. It was Sergeant Knight and the cruel series of postponements, for just as they were climbing up into their planes that first morning, along came a jeep with the news that it was raining in Bologna and that the mission would be delayed. It was raining in Pianosa, too, by the time they returned to the squadron, and they had the rest of that day to stare woodenly at the bomb line on the map under the awning of the intelligence tent and ruminate hypnotically on the fact that there was no escape. The evidence was there vividly in the narrow red ribbon tacked across the mainland. The ground forces in Italy were pinned down forty-two insurmountable miles south of the target and could not possibly capture the city in time. Nothing could save the men in Pianosa from the mission to Bologna. They were trapped. Their only hope was that it would never stop raining, and they had no hope because they all knew it would. When it did stop raining in Pianosa, it rained in Bologna. When it stopped raining in Bologna... It began again in Pianosa. If there was no rain at all, there were freakish, inexplicable phenomena, like the epidemic of diarrhea or the bomb line that moved. Four times during the first six days they were assembled and briefed and then sent back. Once they took off and were flying in formation when the control tower summoned them down. The more it rained, the worse they suffered. The worse they suffered the more they prayed that it would continue raining. All through the night, men looked at the sky and were saddened by the stars. All through the day, they looked at the bomb line on the big, wobbling easel map of Italy that blew over in the wind and was dragged in under the awning of the intelligence tent every time the rain began. 
The bomb line was a scarlet band of narrow satin ribbon that delineated the forwardmost position of the Allied ground forces in every sector of the Italian mainland. The morning after Hungry Joe's fist fight with Hoople's cat, the rain stopped falling in both places. The landing strip began to dry. It would take a full twenty-four hours to harden, but the sky remained cloudless. The resentments incubating in each man hatched into hatred. First they hated the infantrymen on the mainland because they had failed to capture Bologna. Then they began to hate the bomb line itself. For hours they stared relentlessly at the scarlet ribbon on the map and hated it because it would not move up high enough to encompass the city. When night fell, they congregated in the darkness with flashlights, continuing their macabre vigil at the bomb line in brooding entreaty, as though hoping to move the ribbon up by the collective weight of their sullen prayers. "'I really can't believe it!' Clevenger exclaimed to Yossarian, in a voice rising and falling in protest and wonder. "'It's a complete reversion to primitive superstition. They're confusing cause and effect.' It makes as much sense as knocking on wood or crossing your fingers. They really believed that we wouldn't have to fly that mission tomorrow if someone would only tiptoe up to the map in the middle of the night and move the bomb line over Bologna. Can you imagine? You and I must be the only rational ones left. In the middle of the night, Yossarian knocked on wood, crossed his fingers, and tiptoed out of his tent to move the bomb line up over Bologna. Corporal Kolodny tiptoed stealthily into Captain Black's tent early the next morning, reached inside the mosquito net, and gently shook the moist shoulder blade he found there, until Captain Black opened his eyes. "'What are you waking me up for?' whimpered Captain Black. "'They captured Bologna, sir,' said Corporal Kolodny. "'I thought you'd want to know. Is the mission cancelled?' Captain Black tugged himself erect and began scratching his scrawny long thighs methodically. In a little while he dressed and emerged from his tent, squinting, cross, and unshaven. The sky was clear and warm. He peered without emotion at the map. Sure enough, they had captured Bologna. Inside the intelligence tent, Corporal Kolodny was already removing the maps of Bologna from the navigation kits. Captain Black seated himself with a loud yawn, lifted his feet to the top of his desk, and phoned Colonel Korn. "'What are you waking me up for?' whimpered Colonel Korn. "'They captured Bologna during the night, sir. Is the mission cancelled?' "'What are you talking about, Black?' Colonel Korn growled. "'Why should the mission be cancelled?' "'Because they captured Bologna, sir. Isn't the mission cancelled?' Of course the mission is cancelled. Do you think we're bombing our own troops now? What are you waking me up for? Colonel Cathcart whimpered to Colonel Korn. They captured Bologna, Colonel Korn told him. I thought you'd want to know. Who captured Bologna? We did. Colonel Cathcart was overjoyed, for he was relieved of the embarrassing commitment to bomb Bologna without blemish to the reputation for valor he had earned by volunteering his men to do it. General Dreedel was pleased with the capture of Bologna, too, although he was angry with Colonel Moodis for waking him up to tell him about it. Headquarters was also pleased and decided to award a medal to the officer who had captured the city. There was no officer who had captured the city, so they gave the medal to General Peckham instead, because General Peckham was the only officer with sufficient initiative to ask for it. As soon as General Peckham had received his medal, he began asking for increased responsibility. It was General Peckham's opinion that all combat units in the theater should be placed under the jurisdiction of the Special Service Corps, of which General Peckham himself was the commanding officer. If dropping bombs on the enemy was not a special service, he reflected aloud frequently with a martyred smile of sweet reasonableness that was his loyal confederate in every dispute, then he could not help wondering what in the world was. With amiable regret, he declined the offer of a combat post under General Dreedle. Flying combat missions for General Dreedle is not exactly what I had in mind, he explained indulgently with a smooth laugh. I was thinking more in terms of 
replacing General Dreedle, or perhaps if something above General Dreedle, where I could exercise supervision over a great many other generals, too. You see, my most precious abilities are mainly administrative ones. I have a happy facility for getting different people to agree. He has a happy facility for getting different people to agree what a prick he is. Colonel Cargill confided invidiously to XPFC Wintergreen, in the hope that XPFC Wintergreen would spread the unfavorable report along through 27th Air Force headquarters. If anyone deserves that combat post, I do. It was even my idea that we ask for the medal. You really want to go into combat? XPFC Wintergreen inquired. Combat? Colonel Cargill was aghast. Oh, no, you misunderstand me. Of course, I wouldn't actually mind going into combat, but my best abilities are mainly administrative ones. I, too, have a happy facility for getting different people to agree. He, too, has a happy facility for getting different people to agree what a prick he is, XPFC Wintergreen confided with a laugh to Yossarian, after he had come to Pianosa to learn if it was really true about Milo and the Egyptian cotton. If anyone deserves a promotion, I do. Actually, he had risen already to ex-corporal, having shot through the ranks shortly after his transfer to 27th Air Force Headquarters as a mail clerk, and been busted right down to private for making odious, audible comparisons about the commissioned officers for whom he worked. The heady taste of success had infused him further with morality, and fired him with ambition for loftier attainments. Do you want to buy some Zippo lighters? he asked Yossarian. They were stolen right from Quartermaster. Does Milo know you're selling cigarette lighters? What's it his business? Milo's not carrying cigarette lighters, too, now, is he? He sure is, Yossarian told him. And his aren't stolen. That's what you think, XPFC Wintergreen answered with a laconic snort. I'm selling mine for a buck apiece. What's he getting for his? A dollar and a penny. XPFC Wintergreen snickered triumphantly. I beat him every time, he gloated. Say, what about all that Egyptian cotton he stuck with? How much did he buy? All. Oh, in the whole world? Well, I'll be damned, XPFC Wintergreen crowed with malicious glee. What a dope. You were in Cairo with him. Why'd you let him do it? Me? Yossarian answered with a shrug. I have no influence on him. It was those teletype machines they have in all the good restaurants there. Milo had never seen a stock ticker before, and the quotation for Egyptian cotton happened to be going in just as he asked the head waiter to explain it to him. Egyptian cotton, Milo said with that look of his. How much is Egyptian cotton selling for? The next thing I knew, he had bought the whole goddamn harvest, and now he can't unload any of it. He has no imagination. I can unload plenty of it in the black market if he'll make a deal. Milo knows the black market. There's no demand for cotton. But there is a demand for medical supplies. I can roll the cotton up on wooden toothpicks and peddle them as sterile swabs. Will he sell to me at a good price? He won't sell to you at any price, Yossarian answered. He's pretty sore at you for going into competition with him. In fact, he's pretty sore at everybody for getting diarrhea last weekend and giving his mess hall a bad name. Say, you can help us. Yossarian suddenly seized his arm. Couldn't you forge some official orders on that mimeograph machine of yours and get us out of flying to Bologna? XPFC Wintergreen pulled away slowly with a look of scorn. Sure, I could, he explained with pride. But I would never dream of doing anything like that. Why not? Because it's your job. We all have our jobs to do. My job is to unload these Zippo lighters at a profit, if I can, and pick up some cotton from Milo. Your job is to bomb the ammunition dumps at Bologna. But I'm going to be killed at Bologna, Yossarian pleaded. We're all going to be killed. Then you'll just have to be killed, replied XPFC Wintergreen. Why can't you be a fatalist about it the way I am? If I'm destined to unload these lighters at a profit and pick up some Egyptian cotton cheap from Milo, then that's what I'm going to do. And if you're destined to be killed over Bologna, then you're going to be killed. So you might just as well go out and die like a man. I hate to say this, Yossarian, but you're turning into a chronic complainer. 
Plevenger agreed with XPFC Wintergreen that it was Yossarian's job to get killed over Bologna, and was livid with condemnation when Yossarian confessed that it was he who had moved the bomb line and caused the mission to be canceled. Why the hell not? Yossarian snarled, arguing all the more vehemently because he suspected he was wrong. Am I supposed to get my ass shot off just because the colonel wants to be a general? What about the men on the mainland? Clevenger demanded with just as much emotion. Are they supposed to get their asses shot off just because you don't want to go? Those men are entitled to air support. But not necessarily by me. Look, they don't care who knocks out those ammunition dumps. The only reason we're going is because that bastard Cathcart volunteered us. Oh, I know all that, Clevenger assured him, his gaunt face pale and his agitated brown eyes swimming in sincerity. But the fact remains that those ammunition dumps are still standing. You know very well that I don't approve of Colonel Cathcart any more than you do. Clevenger paused for emphasis, his mouth quivering, and then beat his fist down softly against his sleeping bag. But it's not for us to determine what targets must be destroyed, or who's to destroy them, or, or who gets killed doing it, and why. Yes, even that. We have no right to question. You're insane. No right to question. Do you really mean that it's not my business how or why I get killed, and that it is Colonel Cathcart's? Do you really mean that? Yes, I do. Clevenger insisted, seeming unsure. There are men entrusted with winning the war who are in a much better position than we are to decide what targets have to be bombed. We are talking about... Two different things, Eusarian answered with exaggerated weariness. You are talking about the relationship of the Air Corps to the infantry, and I am talking about the relationship of me to Colonel Cathcart. You are talking about winning the war, and I am talking about winning the war and keeping alive. Exactly, Clevenger snapped smugly. And which do you think is more important? To whom? Eusarian shot back. Open your eyes, Clevenger. It doesn't make a damn bit of difference who wins the war to someone who's dead. Clevenger sat for a moment as though he'd been slapped. Congratulations, he exclaimed bitterly, the thinnest milk-white line enclosing his lips tightly in a bloodless, squeezing ring. I can't think of another attitude that could be depended upon to give greater comfort to the enemy. The enemy? retorted Yossarian with weighted precision. Is anybody who's going to get you killed, no matter which side he's on? And that includes Colonel Cathcart. And don't you forget that, because the longer you remember it, the longer you might live. But Clevenger did forget it, and now he was dead. At the time, Clevenger was so upset by the incident that Yossarian did not dare tell him he had also been responsible for the epidemic of diarrhea that had caused the other unnecessary postponement. Milo was even more upset by the possibility that someone had poisoned his squadron again, and he came bustling fretfully to Yossarian for assistance. Please find out from Corporal Snark if he put laundry soap in the sweet potatoes again, he requested furtively. "'Corporal Snark trusts you and will tell you the truth "'if you give him your word you won't tell anyone else. "'As soon as he tells you, come and tell me.' "'Of course I put laundry soap in the sweet potatoes,' "'Corporal Snark admitted to Yossarian. "'That's what you asked me to do, isn't it? "'Laundry soap is the best way.' "'He swears to God he didn't have a thing to do with it,' "'Yossarian reported back to Milo. "'Milo pouted dubiously. Dunbar says there is no God. There was no hope left. By the middle of the second week, everyone in the squadron began to look like Hungry Joe, who was not scheduled to fly, and screamed horribly in his sleep. He was the only one who could sleep. All night long, men moved through the darkness outside their tents like tongueless wraiths with cigarettes. In the daytime, they stared at the bomb line in futile, drooping clusters, or at the still figure of Dr. Nika sitting in front of the closed door of the medical tent beneath the morbid, hand-lettered sign. They began to invent humorless, glum jokes of their own, and disastrous rumors about the destruction awaiting them at Bologna. 
Yossarian sidled up drunkenly to Colonel Korn at the officers' club one night to kid with him about the new LePage gun that the Germans had moved in. What LePage gun? Colonel Korn inquired with curiosity. The new 344 millimeter LePage glue gun, Yossarian answered. It glues a whole formation of planes together in midair. Colonel Korn jerked his elbow free from Yossarian's clutching fingers in startled affront. Let go of me, you idiot! He cried out furiously, glaring with vindictive approval as Nately leaped upon Yossarian's back and pulled him away. Who is that lunatic, anyway? Colonel Cathcart chortled merrily. That's the man you made me give a medal to after Ferrara. You had me promote him to captain, too, remember? It serves you right. Nately was lighter than Yossarian, and had great difficulty maneuvering Yossarian's lurching bulk across the room to an unoccupied table. "'Are you crazy?' Nately kept hissing with trepidation. "'That was Colonel Korn. Are you crazy?' Yossarian wanted another drink, and promised to leave quietly if Nately brought him one. Then he made Nately bring him two more. When Nately finally coaxed him to the door, Captain Black came stomping in from outside— banging his sloshing shoes down hard on the wood floor and spilling water from his eaves like a high roof. "'Boy, are you bastards in for it!' he announced exuberantly, splashing away from the puddle forming at his feet. "'I just got a call from Colonel Korn. Do you know what they've got waiting for you at Bologna? Ha, ha! They've got the new LePage glue gun. It glues a whole formation of planes together right in mid-air. "'My God, it's true!' Yossarian shrieked and collapsed against Nately in terror. "'There is no God,' answered Dunbar calmly, coming up with a slight stagger. "'Hey, give me a hand with him, will you? I've got to get him back in his tent.' "'Says who?' "'Says me. Gee, look at the rain.' "'We've got to get a car.' "'Steal Captain Black's car,' said Yossarian. "'That's what I always do.' We can't steal anybody's car. Since you began stealing the nearest car every time you wanted one, nobody leaves the ignition on. Hop in, said Chief White Half-Oat, driving up drunk in a covered jeep. He waited until they had crowded inside and then spurted ahead with a suddenness that rolled them all over backward. He roared with laughter at their curses. He drove straight ahead when he left the parking lot and rammed the car into the embankment on the other side of the road. The others piled forward in a helpless heap and began cursing him again. I forgot to turn, he explained. Be careful, will you? Nately cautioned. You'd better put your headlights on. Chief White Half-Oat pulled back in reverse, made his turn, and shot away up the road at top speed. The wheels were sibilant on the whizzing blacktop surface. Not so fast, urged Nately. You'd better take me to your squadron first so I can help you put him to bed. Then you can drive me back to my squadron. Who the hell are you? Dunbar. Hey, put your headlights on, Nately shouted, and watch the road. They are on. Isn't your Sarian in this car? That's the only reason I let the rest of you bastards in. Chief White half -out turned completely around to stare into the back seat. Watch the road! Yossarian? Is Yossarian in here? I'm here, Chief. Let's go home. What makes you so sure you never answered my question? You see, I told you he was here. What question? Whatever it was we were talking about. Was it important? I don't remember if it was import important or not. I wish to God I knew what it was. There is no God. That's what we were talking about, Yossarian cried. What, what makes you so sure? Hey, are you sure your headlights are on? Nately called out. They're on, they're on. What does he want from me? It's all this rain on the windshield that makes it look dark from back there. Beautiful, beautiful rain. I hope it never stops raining. Rain, rain, go away, come again some other day. Little yo-yo wants to play in the meadow in... 
Chief White Halfout missed the next turn in the road and ran the jeep all the way up to the crest of a steep embankment. Rolling back down, the jeep turned over on its side and settled softly in the mud. There was a frightened silence. Is that everyone all right? Chief White Half Oat inquired in a hushed voice. No one was injured, and he heaved a long sigh of relief. You know, that's my trouble, he groaned. I never listened to anybody. Somebody kept telling me to put my headlights on, but I just wouldn't listen. I kept telling you to put your headlights on. This book is continued on Disc 5. Disc 5 I kept telling you to put your headlights on. I know, I know. And I just wouldn't listen, would I? I wish I had a drink. I do have a drink. Look, it's not broken. It's raining in, Nately noticed. I'm getting wet. Chief White Half Oat got the bottle of rye open, drank, and handed it off. Lying tangled up on top of each other, they all drank but Nately, who kept groping ineffectually for the door handle. The bottle fell against his head with a clunk, and whiskey poured down his neck. He began writhing convulsively. Hey, we've got to get out of here, he cried. We'll all drown. Is anybody in there? asked Clevenger with concern, shining a flashlight down from the top. It's Clevenger, they shouted, and tried to pull him in through the window as he reached down to aid them. Look at them, Clevenger exclaimed indignantly to McWatt, who sat grinning at the wheel of the staff car. Lying there like a bunch of drunken animals. You too, Nately. You ought to be ashamed. Come on, help me get them out of there before they all die of pneumonia. You know... That don't sound like such a bad idea, Chief White Half Oat reflected. I think I will die of pneumonia. Why? Why not? answered Chief White Half Oat, and lay back in the mud contentedly with a bottle of rye cuddled in his arms. Oh, now look what he's doing, Clevenger exclaimed with irritation. Will you get up and get into the car so we can all go back to the squadron? We can't all go back. Someone has to stay here and help the chief with this car he signed out of the motor pool. Chief White Half Oat settled back in the staff car with an ebullient, prideful chuckle. That's Captain Black's car, he informed them jubilantly. I stole it from him at the officer's club just now with an extra set of keys he thought he lost this morning. Well, I'll be damned. That calls for a drink. Haven't you had enough to drink? Clevenger began scolding as soon as McWatt started the car. Look at you. You don't care if you drink yourselves to death or drown yourselves to death, do you? Just as long as we don't fly ourselves to death. Hey, open it up. Open it up, Chief White Half Oat urged McWatt. And turn off the headlights. That's the only way to do it. Dr. Nika is right, Clevenger went on. People don't know enough to take care of themselves. I really am disgusted with all of you. Okay, fat mouth, out of the car, Chief White Half Oat ordered. Uh, everybody get out of the car but your Syrian. Where's your Syrian? <laughs> get the hell off me, your Syrian laughed, pushing him away. You're all covered with mud. Clevenger focused on Nately. You're the one who really surprises me. Do you know what you smell like? Instead of trying to get him out of trouble, you get just as drunk as he is. Suppose he got in another fight with Appleby. Clevenger's eyes opened wide with alarm when he heard Yossarian chuckle. He didn't get in another fight with Appleby, did he? Not this time, said Dunbar. N no, not this time. This time I did ev even better. This time we got in a fight with Colonel Corn. He didn't, gasped Clevenger. He did, exclaimed Chief White Halfoat with delight. That calls for a drink. But that's terrible, Clevenger declared with deep apprehension. Why in the world did you have to pick on Colonel Corn? Say, 
What happened to the lights? Why is everything so dark? I turned them off, answered McWatt. You know, Chief White Halfoat is right. It's much better with the headlights off. Are you crazy? Clevenger screamed and lunged forward to snap the headlights on. He whirled around upon Yossarian in near hysteria. You see what you're doing? You've got them all acting like you. Suppose it stops raining and we have to fly to Bologna tomorrow. You'll be in fine physical condition. It won't ever stop raining. No, sir. A rain like this really might go on forever. It has stopped raining, someone said, and the whole car fell silent. You poor bastards, Chief White half -Oat murmured compassionately after a few moments had passed. Did it really s stop raining? Yossarian asked meekly. McWatt switched off the windshield wipers to make certain. The rain had stopped. The sky was starting to clear. The moon was sharp behind a gauzy brown mist. Oh, well, sang McWatt soberly. What the hell? Don't worry, fellas, Chief White half -Oat said. The landing strip is too soft to use tomorrow. Maybe it'll start raining again before the field dries out. You goddamn stinking lousy son of a bitch! Hungry Joe screamed from his tent as they sped into the squadron. Jesus, is he back here tonight? I thought he was still in Rome with the courier ship. Oh! 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 Hungry Joe screamed. Chief White Half Oat shuddered. That guy gives me the willies. He confessed in a grouchy whisper. Hey, whatever happened to Captain Flume? There's a guy that gives me the willies. I saw him in the woods last week eating wild berries. He never sleeps in his trailer anymore. He looked like hell. Hungry Joe's afraid he'll have to replace somebody who goes on sick call, even though there is no sick call. Did you see him the other night when he tried to kill Havermeyer and fell into your Syrian slit trench? Oh! screamed Hungry Joe. Oh! 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 It sure is a pleasure not having Flume around in the mess hall anymore. No more of that. Pass the salt, Walt. Or pass the bread, Fred. Or shoot me a beat, Pete. Keep away! Keep away! Hungry Joe screamed. I said keep away! Keep away, you goddamn stinking lousy son of a bitch! At least we found out what he dreams about, Dunbar observed wryly. He dreams about goddamn stinking lousy sons of bitches. Late that night, Hungry Joe dreamed that Hoople's cat was sleeping on his face, suffocating him. And when he woke up, Hoople's cat was sleeping on his face. His agony was terrifying. The piercing, unearthly howl with which he split the moonlit dock, vibrating in its own impact for seconds afterward like a devastating shock. A numbing silence followed, and then a riotous din rose from inside his tent. Yossarian was among the first ones there. When he burst through the entrance, Hungry Joe had his gun out and was struggling to wrench his arm free from Hoople to shoot the cat who kept spitting and fainting at him ferociously to distract him from shooting Hoople. Both humans were in their G.I. underwear. The unfrosted light bulb overhead was swinging crazily on its loose wire, and the jumbled black shadows kept swirling and bobbing chaotically, so that the entire tent seemed to be reeling. Yossarian reached out instinctively for balance, and then launched himself forward in a prodigious dive that crushed the three combatants to the ground beneath him. He emerged from the melee with a scruff of a neck in each hand. Hungry Joe's neck and the cat's. Hungry Joe and the cat glared at each other savagely. The cat spat viciously at Hungry Joe, and Hungry Joe tried to hit it with a haymaker. A fair fight, Yossarian decreed, and all the others who had come running to the uproar in horror began cheering ecstatically in a tremendous overflow of relief. We'll have a fair fight, he explained officially to Hungry Joe and the cat, after he had carried them both outside, still holding them apart by the scruffs of their necks. Fists, fangs, and claws, but no guns, 
he warned Hungry Joe. And no spitting, he warned the cat sternly. When I turn you both loose, go. Break clean in the clenches and come back fighting. Go! There was a huge, giddy crowd of men who were avid for any diversion. But the cat turned chicken the moment Yossarian released him and fled from Hungry Joe ignominiously like a yellow dog. Hungry Joe was declared the winner. He swaggered away happily with a proud smile of a champion, his shriveled head high and his emaciated chest out. He went back to bed victorious and dreamed again that Hoople's cat was sleeping on his face, suffocating him. Chapter 13 Major de Coverley Moving the bomb line did not fool the Germans. But it did fool Major de Coverley, who packed his musette bag, commandeered an airplane, and, under the impression that Florence, too, had been captured by the Allies, had himself flown to that city to rent two apartments for the officers and the enlisted men in the squadron to use on rest leaves. He had still not returned by the time Yossarian jumped back outside Major Major's office and wondered whom to appeal to next for help. Major de Coverley was a splendid, awe-inspiring, grave old man, with a massive, leonine head and an angry shock of wild white hair that raged like a blizzard around his stern, patriarchal face. His duties as squadron executive officer did consist entirely, as both Doc Danica and Major Major had conjectured, of pitching horseshoes, kidnapping Italian laborers, and renting apartments for the enlisted men and officers to use on rest leaves. And he excelled at all three. Each time the fall of a city like Naples, Rome, or Florence seemed imminent, Major de Coverley would pack his musette bag, commandeer an airplane and a pilot, and have himself flown away, accomplishing all this without uttering a word by the sheer force of his solemn, domineering visage and the peremptory gestures of his wrinkled finger. A day or two after the city fell, he would be back with leases on two large and luxurious apartments there, one for the officers and one for the enlisted men, both already staffed with competent, jolly cooks and maids. A few days after that, newspapers would appear throughout the world with photographs of the first American soldiers bludgeoning their way into the shattered city through rubble and smoke. Inevitably, Major de Coverley was among them, seated straight as a ramrod in a jeep he had obtained from somewhere, glancing neither right nor left as the artillery fire burst about his invincible head and lithe young infantrymen with carbines went loping up along the sidewalks in the shelter of burning buildings or fell dead in doorways. He seemed eternally indestructible as he sat there, surrounded by danger, his features molded firmly into that same fierce, regal, just, and forbidding countenance which was recognized and revered by every man in the squadron. To German intelligence, Major de Coverley was a vexatious enigma. Not one of the hundreds of American prisoners would ever supply any concrete information about the elderly, white-haired officer with a gnarl and menacing brow, and blazing, powerful eyes, who seemed to spearhead every important advance so fearlessly and successfully. To American authorities, his identity was equally perplexing. A whole regiment of crack C.I.D. men had been thrown into the front lines to find out who he was, while a battalion of combat-hardened public relations officers stood on red alert twenty-four hours a day with orders to begin publicizing him the moment he was located. In Rome, Major de Coverley had outdone himself with the apartments. For the officers, who arrived in groups of four or five, there was an immense double room for each in a new white stone building, with three spacious bathrooms with walls of shimmering aquamarine tile and one skinny maid named Michaela, who tittered at everything and kept the apartment in spotless order. On the landing below lived the obsequious owners. On the landing above lived the beautiful, rich, 
black-haired countess and her beautiful, rich, black-haired daughter-in-law, both of whom would put out only for Nately, who was too shy to want them, and for Arfie, who was too stuffy to take them, and tried to dissuade them from ever putting out for anyone but their husbands, who had chosen to remain in the North with the family's business interests. They're really a couple of good kids, Arfi confided earnestly to Yossarian, whose recurring dream it was to have the nude, milk-white female bodies of both these beautiful, rich, black-haired good kids, lying stretched out in bed erotically with him at the same time. The enlisted men descended upon Rome in gangs of twelve or more, with gargantuan appetites and heavy crates filled with canned food for the women to cook and serve to them in the dining room of their own apartment on the sixth floor of a red-brick building with a clinking elevator. There was always more activity at the enlisted men's place. There were always more enlisted men to begin with, and more women to cook and serve and sweep and scrub. And then there were always the gay and silly, sensual young girls that Eusarian had found and brought there, and those that the sleepy enlisted men returning to Pianosa after their exhausting seven-day debauch had brought there on their own and were leaving behind for whoever wanted them next. The girls had shelter and food for as long as they wanted to stay. All they had to do in return was hump any of the men who asked them to, which seemed to make everything just about perfect for them. Every fourth day or so, Hungry Joe came crashing in like a man in torment, hoarse, wild, and frenetic, if he had been unlucky enough to finish his missions again and was flying the courier ship. Most times he slept at the enlisted men's apartment. Nobody was certain how many rooms Major de Coverley had rented, not even the stout, black-bodiced woman in corsets on the first floor from whom he had rented them. They covered the whole top floor, and Yossarian knew they extended down to the fifth floor as well, for it was in Snowden's room on the fifth floor that he had finally found the maid in the lime-colored panties with a dust mop the day after Bologna, after Hungry Joe had discovered him in bed with Luciana at the officer's apartment that same morning and had gone running like a fiend for his camera. The maid in the lime-colored panties was a cheerful, fat, obliging woman in her mid-thirties, with squashy thighs and swaying hams in lime-colored panties, that she was always rolling off for any man who wanted her. She had a plain, broad face, and was the most virtuous woman alive. She laid for everybody, regardless of race, creed, color, or place of national origin, donating herself sociably as an act of hospitality, procrastinating not even for the moment it might take to discard the cloth or broom or dust mop she was clutching at the time she was grabbed. Her allure stemmed from her accessibility. Like Mount Everest, she was there, and the men climbed on top of her each time they felt the urge. Yossarian was in love with the maid in the lime-colored panties because she seemed to be the only woman left he could make love to without falling in love with. Even the bald-headed girl in Sicily still evoked in him strong sensations of pity, tenderness, and regret. Despite the multiple perils to which Major de Coverley exposed himself each time he rented apartments, his only injury had occurred, ironically enough, while he was leading the triumphal procession into the open city of Rome, where he was wounded in the eye by a flower fired at him from close range by a seedy, cackling, intoxicated old man, who, like Satan himself, had then bounded up on Major de Coverley's car with malicious glee, seized him roughly and contemptuously by his venerable white head, and kissed him mockingly on each cheek, with a mouth reeking with sour fumes of wine, cheese, and garlic, before dropping back into the joyous celebrating throngs with a hollow, dry, excoriating laugh. Major de Coverley, a Spartan in adversity, did not flinch once throughout the whole hideous ordeal. And not until he had returned to Pianosa, his business in Rome completed, did he seek medical attention for his wound. He resolved to remain binocular, and specified to Dr. Nika that his eye-patch be transparent, so that he could continue pitching horseshoes, 
kidnapping Italian laborers and renting apartments with unimpaired vision. To the men in the squadron, Major de Coverley was a colossus, although they never dared tell him so. The only one who did ever dare to address him was Milo Minderbinder, who approached the horseshoe-pitching pit with a hard-boiled egg his second week in the squadron and held it aloft for Major de Coverley to see. Major de Coverley straightened with astonishment at Milo's effrontery and concentrated upon him the full fury of his storming countenance, with its rugged overhang of gullied forehead and huge crag of a humpback nose that came charging out of his face wrathfully like a big ten fullback. Milo stood his ground, taking shelter behind the hard-boiled egg raised protectively before his face like a magic charm. In time, the gale began to subside, and the danger passed. What is that? Major de Coverley demanded at last. An egg, Milo answered. What kind of an egg? Major de Coverley demanded. A hard-boiled egg, Milo answered. What kind of a hard-boiled egg? Major de Coverley demanded. A fresh hard-boiled egg, Milo answered. Where did the fresh egg come from? Major de Coverley demanded. From a chicken, Milo answered. Where is the chicken? Major de Coverley demanded. The chicken is in Malta, Milo answered. How many chickens are there in Malta? Enough chickens to lay fresh eggs for every officer in the squadron at five cents apiece from the mess fund, Milo answered. I have a weakness for fresh eggs, Major de Coverley confessed. If someone put a plane at my disposal, I could fly down there once a week in a squadron plane and bring back all the fresh eggs we need, Milo answered. After all, Malta's not so far away. Malta's not so far away, Major de Coverley observed. You could probably fly down there once a week in a squadron plane and bring back all the fresh eggs we need. Yes, Milo agreed. I suppose I could do that, if someone wanted me to, and put a plane at my disposal. I like my fresh eggs fried, Major de Coverley remembered, in fresh butter. I can find all the fresh butter we need in Sicily for twenty-five cents a pound, Milo answered. Twenty-five cents a pound for fresh butter is a good buy. There's enough money in the mess fund for butter, too, and we could probably sell some to the other squadrons at a profit and get back most of what we pay for our own. What's your name, son? asked Major de Coverley. My name is Milo Minderbinder, sir. I am twenty-seven years old. You're a good mess officer, Milo. I'm not the mess officer, sir. You're a good mess officer, Milo. Thank you, sir. I'll do everything in my power to be a good mess officer. Bless you, my boy. Have a horseshoe. Thank you, sir. What should I do with it? Throw it. Away? At that peg there. Then pick it up and throw it at this peg. It's a game, see? You get the horseshoe back. Yes, sir. I see. How much are horseshoes selling for? The smell of a fresh egg snapping exotically in a pool of fresh butter carried a long way on the Mediterranean trade winds and brought General Dreedle racing back with a voracious appetite, accompanied by his nurse who accompanied him everywhere, and his son-in-law, Colonel Moodis. In the beginning, General Dreedle devoured all his meals in Milo's mess hall. 
Then the other three squadrons in Colonel Cathcart's group turned their mess halls over to Milo and gave him an airplane and a pilot each, so that he could buy fresh eggs and fresh butter for them, too. Milo's planes shuttled back and forth seven days a week as every officer in the four squadrons began devouring fresh eggs in an insatiable orgy of fresh egg eating. General Dreedle devoured fresh eggs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Between meals he devoured more fresh eggs until Milo located abundant sources of fresh veal, beef, duck, baby lamb chops, mushroom caps, broccoli, South African rock lobster tails, shrimp, hams, puddings, grapes, ice cream, strawberries, and artichokes. There were three other bomb groups in General Dreedle's combat wing, and they each jealously dispatched their own planes to Malta for fresh eggs, but discovered that fresh eggs were selling there for seven cents apiece. Since they could buy them from Milo for five cents apiece, it made more sense to turn over their mess halls to his syndicate, too, and give him the planes and pilots needed to ferry in all the other good food he promised to supply as well. Everyone was elated with this turn of events, most of all Colonel Cathcart, who was convinced he had won a feather in his cap. He greeted Milo jovially each time they met, and— in an excess of contrite generosity, impulsively recommended Major Major for promotion. The recommendation was rejected at once at 27th Air Force Headquarters by XPFC Wintergreen, who scribbled a brusque, unsigned reminder that the Army had only one Major, 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 and did not intend to lose him by promotion just to please Colonel Cathcart. Colonel Cathcart was stung by the blunt rebuke and skulked guiltily about his room in smarting repudiation. He blamed Major Major for this black eye and decided to bust him down to lieutenant that very same day. They probably won't let you, Colonel Corn remarked with a condescending smile, savoring the situation. For precisely the same reasons that they wouldn't let you promote him. Besides... You'd certainly look foolish trying to bust him down to lieutenant right after you tried to promote him to my rank. Colonel Cathcart felt hemmed in on every side. He had been much more successful in obtaining a medal for Yossarian after the debacle of Ferrara, when the bridge spanning the Po was still standing undamaged seven days after Colonel Cathcart had volunteered to destroy it. Nine missions his men had flown there in six days, and the bridge was not demolished until the tenth mission on the seventh day, when Yossarian killed Kraft and his crew by taking his flight of six planes in over the target a second time. Yossarian came in carefully on a second bomb run, because he was brave then. He buried his head in his bomb site until his bombs were away. When he looked up, Everything inside the ship was suffused in a weird orange glow. At first he thought that his own plane was on fire. Then he spied the plane with the burning engine directly above him and screamed to McWatt through the intercom to turn left, hard. A second later, the wing of Kraft's plane blew off. The flaming wreck dropped. First the fuselage, then the spinning wing, while a shower of tiny metal fragments began tap-dancing on the roof of Yossarian's own plane, and the incessant kachung, kachung, kachung of the flak was still thumping all around him. Back on the ground, every eye watched grimly as he walked in dull dejection up to Captain Black outside the green clobbered briefing room to make his intelligence report and learn that Colonel Cathcart and Colonel Corn were waiting to speak to him inside. Major Danby stood barring the door, waving everyone else away in ashen silence. Yossarian was leaden with fatigue and longed to remove his sticky clothing. He stepped into the briefing room with mixed emotions, uncertain how he was supposed to feel about Kraft and the others, for they had all died in the distance of a mute, and secluded agony, at a moment when he was up to his own ass in the same vile, excruciating dilemma of duty and damnation. Colonel Cathcart, on the other hand, was all broken up by the event. Twice? he asked. I would have missed it the first time, Yossarian replied softly. 
his face lowered. Their voices echoed slightly in the long, narrow bungalow. But twice? Colonel Cathcart repeated, in vivid disbelief. I would have missed it the first time, Yossarian repeated. But Kraft would be alive, and the bridge would still be up. A trained bombardier is supposed to drop his bombs the first time, Colonel Cathcart reminded him. The other five bombardiers dropped their bombs the first time and missed the target, Yossarian said. We'd have had to go back there again. And maybe you would have gotten it the first time then. And maybe I wouldn't have gotten it at all. But maybe there wouldn't have been any losses. And maybe there would have been more losses, with the bridge still left standing. I thought you wanted the bridge destroyed. Don't contradict me, Colonel Cathcart said. We're all in enough trouble. I'm not contradicting you, sir. Yes, you are. Even that's a contradiction. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Colonel Cathcart cracked his knuckles violently. Colonel Korn, a stocky, dark, flaccid man with a shapeless paunch, sat completely relaxed on one of the benches in the front row, his hands clasped comfortably over the top of his bald and swarthy head. His eyes were amused behind his glinting, rimless spectacles. We're trying to be perfectly objective about this, he prompted Colonel Cathcart. We're trying to be perfectly objective about this, Colonel Cathcart said to Yossarian, with the zeal of sudden inspiration. It's not that I'm being sentimental or anything. I don't give a damn about the men or the airplane. It's just that it looks so lousy on the report. How am I going to cover up something like this in the report? Why don't you... Give me a medal, Yossarian suggested timidly. For going around twice? You gave one to Hungry Joe when he cracked up that airplane by mistake. Colonel Cathcart snickered ruefully. <laughs> You'll be lucky if we don't give you a court-martial. But I got the bridge the second time around, Yossarian protested. I thought you wanted the bridge destroyed. Oh, I don't know what I wanted. Colonel Cathcart cried out in exasperation. Look, of course I wanted the bridge destroyed. That bridge has been a source of trouble to me ever since I decided to send you men out to get it. But why couldn't you do it the first time? I didn't have enough time. My navigator wasn't sure we had the right city. The right city? Colonel Cathcart was baffled. Are you trying to blame it all on Arfie now? No, sir. It was my mistake for letting him distract me. All I'm trying to say is that I'm not infallible. Nobody is infallible, Colonel Cathcart said sharply, and then continued vaguely with an afterthought. Nobody is indispensable either. There was no rebuttal. Colonel Korn stretched sluggishly. We've got to reach a decision, he observed casually to Colonel Cathcart. We've got to reach a decision, Colonel Cathcart said to Yossarian. And it's all your fault. Why did you have to go around twice? Why couldn't you drop your bombs the first time like all the others? I would have missed the first time. It seems to me that we're going around twice, Colonel Korn interrupted with a chuckle. But what are we going to do? Colonel Cathcart exclaimed with distress. The others are all waiting outside. Why don't we give him a medal? Colonel Korn proposed. For going around twice? What can we give him a medal for? For going around twice, Colonel Korn answered with a reflective, self-satisfied smile. After all, I suppose it did take a lot of courage to go over that target a second time with no other planes around to divert the anti-aircraft fire, and he did hit the bridge. You know, that might be the answer, to act boastfully about something we ought to be ashamed of. That's a trick that never seems to fail. Do you think it will work? I'm sure it will. And let's promote him to captain, too, just to make certain. Don't you think that's going a bit farther than we have to? No, I don't think so. It's best to play safe, and a captain's not much difference. All right, Colonel Cathcart decided. We'll give him a medal for being brave enough to go around over the target twice, and we'll make him a captain, too. Colonel Korn reached for his hat. 
exit smiling, he joked, and put his arm around Yossarian's shoulders as they stepped outside the door. Chapter 14 Kid Samson by the time of the mission to Bologna, Yossarian was brave enough not to go around over the target even once, and when he found himself aloft finally in the nose of Kid Sampson's plane, he pressed in the button of his throat mic and asked, Well, what's wrong with the plane? Kid Sampson let out a shriek. It's something wrong with the plane? What's the matter? Kid Sampson's cry turned Yossarian to ice. Is something the matter? he yelled in horror. Are we bailing out? I don't know, Kid Sampson shot back in anguish, wailing excitedly. Someone said we're bailing out. Who is this, anyway? Who is this? This is Yossarian in the nose. Yossarian in the nose. I heard you say there was something the matter. Didn't you say there was something the matter? I thought you said there was something wrong. Everything seems okay. Everything is all right. Yossarian's heart sank. Something was terribly wrong, if everything was all right, and they had no excuse for turning back. He hesitated gravely. I can't hear you, he said. I said, everything is all right. The sun was blinding white on the porcelain blue water below and on the flashing edges of the other airplanes. Yossarian took hold of the colored wires leading into the jackbox of the intercom system and tore them loose. I still can't hear you, he said. He heard nothing. Slowly he collected his map case and his three flak suits and crawled back to the main compartment. Nately, sitting stiffly in the co-pilot seat, spied him through the corner of his eye as he stepped up on the flight deck behind Kid Sampson. He smiled at Yossarian wanly, looking frail and exceptionally young and bashful in the bulky dungeon of his earphones, hat, throat mic, flak suit, and parachute. Yossarian bent close to Kid Sampson's ear. "'I still can't hear you!' he shouted above the even drone of the engines. Kid Sampson glanced back at him with surprise. Kid Sampson had an angular, comical face with arched eyebrows and a scrawny, blonde mustache. "'What?' he called out over his shoulder. "'I still can't hear you!' Yossarian repeated. You'll have to talk louder, Kid Sampson said. I still can't hear you. I said I still can't hear you, Yossarian yelled. I can't help it, Kid Sampson yelled back at him. I'm shouting as loud as I can. I couldn't hear you over my intercom, Yossarian bellowed in mounting helplessness. You'll have to turn back. For an intercom, asked Kid Sampson incredulously. Turn back said Yossarian, before I break your head. Kid Samson looked for moral support toward Nately, who stared away from him pointedly. Yossarian outranked them both. Kid Samson resisted doubtfully for another moment, and then capitulated eagerly with a triumphant whoop. That's just fine with me, he announced gladly, and blew out a shrill series of whistles up into his mustache. Yes, sirree, that's just fine with old Kid Sampson. He whistled again and shouted over the intercom, Now hear this, my little chickadees. This is Admiral Kid Sampson talking. This is Admirable Kid Sampson squawking, the pride of the Queen's Marines. Yes, sirree, we're turning back, boys, by cracky. We're turning back. Nately ripped off his hat and earphones in one jubilant sweep and began rocking back and forth happily like a handsome child in a high chair. Sergeant Knight came plummeting down from the top gun turret and began pounding them all on the back with delirious enthusiasm. Kid Sampson turned the plane away from the formation in a wide, graceful arc and headed toward the airfield. When Yossarian plugged his headset into one of the auxiliary jackboxes, the two gunners in the rear section of the plane were both singing La Cucaracha. Back at the field, the party fizzled out abruptly. An uneasy silence replaced it, and Yossarian was sober and self-conscious as he climbed down from the plane and took his place in the jeep that was already waiting for them. None of the men spoke at all on the drive back through the heavy, mesmerizing, quiet, blanketing mountains, sea, and forests. 
The feeling of desolation persisted when they turned off the road at the squadron. Yossarian got out of the car last. After a minute, Yossarian and a gentle, warm wind were the only thing stirring in the haunting tranquility that hung like a drug over the vacated tents. The squadron stood insensate, bereft of everything human but Doc Danica, who roosted dolorously like a shivering turkey buzzard beside the closed door of the medical tent, his stuffed nose jabbing away in thirsting futility at the hazy sunlight streaming down around him. Yossarian knew Doc Danica would not go swimming with him. Doc Danica would never go swimming again. A person could swoon or suffer a mild coronary occlusion in an inch or two of water and drown to death, be carried out to sea by an undertow, or made vulnerable to poliomyelitis or meningococcus infection through chilling or overexertion. The threat of Bologna to others had instilled in Dr. Nika an even more poignant solicitude for his own safety. At night now, he heard burglars. Through the lavender gloom clouding the entrance of the operations tent, Yossarian glimpsed Chief White Half-Oat, diligently embezzling whiskey rations, forging the signatures of non-drinkers, and pouring off the alcohol with which he was poisoning himself into separate bottles rapidly in order to steal as much as he could before Captain Black roused himself with recollection and came hurrying over indolently to steal the rest himself. The jeep started up again softly. Kid Sampson, Nately, and the others wandered apart in a noiseless eddy of motion and were sucked away into the cloying yellow stillness. The jeep vanished with a cough. Yossarian was alone in a ponderous primeval lull in which everything green looked black and everything else was imbued with the color of pus. The breeze rustled leaves in a dry and diaphanous distance. He was restless, scared, and sleepy. The sockets of his eyes felt grimy with exhaustion. Wearily he moved inside the parachute tent with its long table of smoothed wood, a nagging bitch of a doubt burrowing painlessly inside a conscience that felt perfectly clear. He left his flak suit and parachute there and crossed back past the water wagon to the intelligence tent to return his map case to Captain Black, who sat drowsing in his chair with his skinny long legs up in his desk and inquired with indifferent curiosity why Yossarian's plane had turned back. Yossarian ignored him. He set the map down on the counter and walked out. Back in his own tent, he squirmed out of his parachute harness and then out of his clothes. Or was in Rome, due back that same afternoon from the rest leave he had won by ditching his plane in the waters off Genoa. Nately would already be packing to replace him, entranced to find himself still alive, and undoubtedly impatient to resume his wasted and heartbreaking courtship of his prostitute in Rome. When Yossarian was undressed, he sat down on his cot to rest. He felt much better as soon as he was naked. He never felt comfortable in clothes. In a little while he put fresh undershorts back on and set out for the beach in his moccasins, a khaki-colored bath towel draped over his shoulders. The path from the squadron led him around a mysterious gun emplacement in the woods. Two of the three enlisted men stationed there lay sleeping, on the circle of sandbags, and the third sat eating a purple pomegranate, biting off large mouthfuls between his churning jaws and spewing the ground roughage out away from him into the bushes. When he bit, red juice ran out of his mouth. Yossarian padded ahead into the forest again, caressing his bare, tingling belly adoringly from time to time, as though to reassure himself it was all still there. He rolled a piece of lint out of his navel. Along the ground, suddenly, 
On both sides of the path, he saw dozens of new mushrooms the rain had spawned, poking their nodular fingers up through the clammy earth like lifeless stalks of flesh, sprouting in such necrotic profusion everywhere he looked that they seemed to be proliferating right before his eyes. There were thousands of them, swarming as far back into the underbrush as he could see, and they appeared to swell in size and multiply in number as he spied them. He hurried away from them with a shiver of eerie alarm, and did not slacken his pace until the soil crumbled to dry sand beneath his feet, and they had been left behind. He glanced back apprehensively, half expecting to find the limp, white things crawling after him in sightless pursuit, or snaking up through the treetops in a writhing and ungovernable, mutative mass. The beach was deserted. The only sounds were hushed ones, the bloated gurgle of the stream, the respirating hum of the tall grass and shrubs behind him, the apathetic moaning of the dumb, translucent waves. The surf was always small, the water clear and cool. Yossarian left his things on the sand and moved through the knee-high waves until he was completely immersed. On the other side of the sea, a bumpy sliver of dark land lay wrapped in mist, almost invisible. He swam languorously out to the raft, held on a moment, and swam languorously back to where he could stand on the sandbar. He submerged himself head first into the green water several times until he felt clean and wide awake and then stretched himself out face down in the sand, and slept until the plains returning from Bologna were almost overhead, and the great cumulative rumble of their many engines came crashing in through his slumber in an earth-shattering roar. He woke up blinking with a slight pain in his head, and opened his eyes upon a world boiling in chaos, in which everything was in proper order. He gasped in utter amazement at the fantastic sight of the twelve flights of planes, organized calmly into exact formation. The scene was too unexpected to be true. There were no planes spurting ahead with wounded, none lagging behind with damage. No distress flares smoked in the sky. No ship was missing but his own. For an instant he was paralyzed with a sensation of madness. Then he understood, and almost wept at the irony. The explanation was simple. Clouds had covered the target before the planes could bomb it, and the mission to Bologna was still to be flown. He was wrong. There had been no clouds. Bologna had been bombed. Bologna was a milk run. There had been no flack there at all. Chapter 15 Pilchard and Wren Captain Pilchard and Captain Wren, the inoffensive Joint Squadron Operations Officers, were both mild, soft-spoken men of less than middle height, who enjoyed flying combat missions and begged nothing more of life and Colonel Cathcart than the opportunity to continue flying them. They had flown hundreds of combat missions and wanted to fly hundreds more. They assigned themselves to every one. Nothing so wonderful as war had ever happened to them before, and they were afraid it might never happen to them again. They conducted their duties humbly and reticently, with a minimum of fuss, and went to great lengths not to antagonize anyone. They smiled quickly at everyone they passed. When they spoke, they mumbled. They were shifty, cheerful, subservient men, who were comfortable only with each other, and never met anyone else's eye, not even Yossarian's eye at the open-air meeting they called to reprimand him publicly for making Kid Sampson turn back from the mission to Bologna. "'Fellas,' said Captain Pilchard, 
who had thinning dark hair and smiled awkwardly. When you turn back from a mission, try to make sure it's for something important, will you? Not for something unimportant, like a defective intercom, or something like that. Okay? Captain Wren has more he wants to say to you on that subject. Captain Pilchard's right, fellas, said Captain Wren. And that's all I'm going to say to you on that subject. Well, we finally got to Bologna today, and we found out it's a milk run. We were all a little nervous, I guess, and didn't do too much damage. Well, listen to this. Colonel Cathcart got permission for us to go back. And tomorrow we're really going to paste those ammunition dumps. Now what do you think of that? And to prove to Yossarian that they bore him no animosity, they even assigned him to fly lead bombardier with McWatt in the first formation when they went back to Bologna the next day. He came in on the target like a Havermeyer, confidently taking no evasive action at all. And suddenly they were shooting the living shit out of him. Heavy flack was everywhere. He had been lulled, lured, and trapped, and there was nothing he could do but sit there like an idiot and watch the ugly black puffs smashing up to kill him. There was nothing he could do until his bombs dropped, but looked back into the bomb site, where the fine crosshairs in the lens were glued magnetically over the target, exactly where he had placed them, intersecting perfectly deep inside the yard of his block of camouflaged warehouses before the base of the first building. He was trembling steadily as the plane crept ahead. He could hear the hollow boom, 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 boom of the flak pounding all around him in overlapping measures of four, the sharp, piercing crack of a single shell exploding suddenly very close by. His head was busting with a thousand dissonant impulses as he prayed for the bombs to drop. He wanted to sob. The engines droned on monotonously like a fat, lazy fly. At last the indices on the bomb site crossed, tripping away the eight five-hundred-pounders one after the other. The plane lurched upward buoyantly with the lightened load. Yossarian bent away from the bomb site crookedly to watch the indicator on his left. When the pointer touched zero, he closed the bomb bay doors, and over the intercom, at the very top of his voice, shrieked, Turn right hard! McWatt responded instantly. With a grinding howl of engines, he flipped the plane over on one wing and wrung it around remorselessly in a screaming turn away from the twin spires of flak Yossarian had spied stabbing toward them. Then Yossarian had McWatt climb and keep climbing higher and higher until they tore free finally into a calm, diamond blue sky that was sunny and pure everywhere and laced in the distance with long white veils of tenuous fluff. The wind strummed soothingly against the cylindrical panes of his windows, and he relaxed exultantly only until they picked up speed again and then turned McWatt left and plunged him right back down, noticing with a transitory spasm of elation the mushrooming clusters of flak leaping open high above him and back over his shoulder to the right, exactly where he could have been if he had not turned left and dived. He leveled McWatt out with another harsh cry and whipped him upward and around again into a ragged blue patch of unpolluted air, just as the bombs he had dropped began to strike. The first one fell in the yard exactly where he had aimed, and then the rest of the bombs from his own plane and from the other planes in his flight burst open on the ground in a charge of rapid orange flashes across the tops of the buildings, which collapsed instantly in a vast, churning wave of pink and gray and coal-black smoke that went rolling out turbulently in all directions and quaked convulsively in its bowels, as though from great blasts of red and white and golden sheet lightning. Well, will you look at that? Arfi marveled sonorously, right beside Yossarian, his plump, orbicular face sparkling with a look of bright enchantment. There must have been an ammunition dump down there. Yossarian had forgotten about Arfi. Get out! he shouted at him. Get out of the nose!
Arfi smiled politely and pointed down toward the target in a generous invitation for Yossarian to look. Yossarian began slapping at him insistently and signaled wildly toward the entrance of the crawlway. Get back in the ship! he cried frantically. Get back in the ship! Arfi shrugged amiably. I can't hear you, he explained. Yossarian seized him by the straps of his parachute harness and pushed him backward toward the crawlway just as the plane was hit with a jarring concussion that rattled his bones and made his heart stop. He knew at once they were all dead. Climb! he screamed into the intercom at McGuat when he saw he was still alive. Climb, you bastard! Climb, 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 climb! The plane zoomed upward again in a climb that was swift and straining until he leveled it out with another harsh shout at McGuat and wrenched it around once more in a roaring, merciless, 45-degree turn that sucked his insides out in one enervating sniff and left him floating fleshless in midair until he leveled McGuat out again just long enough to hurl him back around toward the right and then down into a screeching dive. Through endless blobs of ghostly black smoke he sped, the hanging smut wafting against the smooth plexiglass nose of the ship like an evil, damp, sooty vapor against his cheeks. His heart was hammering again in aching terror as he hurtled upward and downward through the blind gangs of flak charging murderously into the sky at him, then sagging inertly. Sweat gushed from his neck in torrents and poured down over his chest and waist with a feeling of warm slime. He was vaguely aware for an instant that the planes in his formation were no longer there, and then he was aware of only himself. His throat hurt like a raw slash from the strangling intensity with which he shrieked each command to McWatt. The engines rose to a deafening, agonized, ululating bellow each time McWatt changed direction. And far out in front, the bursts of flak were still swarming into the sky from new batteries of guns, poking around for accurate altitude as they waited sadistically for him to fly into range. The plane was slammed again suddenly with another loud, jarring explosion that almost rocked it over on its back, and the nose filled immediately with sweet clouds of blue smoke. Something was on fire. Yossarian whirled to escape and smacked into Arfi, who had struck a match and was placidly lighting his pipe. Yossarian gaped at his grinning moon-faced navigator in utter shock and confusion. It occurred to him that one of them was mad. "'Jesus Christ!' he screamed at Arfi in tortured amazement. "'Get the hell out of the nose! Are you crazy? Get out!' "'What?' said Arfi. Get out! Yossarian yelled hysterically and began clubbing Arfi backhanded with both fists to drive him away. Get out! I still can't hear you, Arfi called back innocently with an expression of mild and reproving perplexity. You'll have to talk a little louder. Get out of the nose! Yossarian shrieked in frustration. They're trying to kill us! Don't you understand? They're trying to kill us! Which way should I go, goddammit? McWatt shouted furiously over the intercom in a suffering, high-pitched voice. Which way should I go? Turn left! Left, you goddamn dirty son of a bitch! Turn left hard! Arfi crept up close behind Yossarian and jabbed him sharply in the ribs with the stem of his pipe. Yossarian flew up toward the ceiling with a whinnying cry, then jumped completely around on his knees, white as a sheet and quivering with rage. Arfi winked encouragingly and jerked his thumb back toward Mogwat with a humorous mew. "'What's eating him?' he asked with a laugh. Yossarian was struck with a weird sense of distortion. "'Will you get out of here?' he yelped beseechingly and shoved Arfi over with all his strength. "'Are you deaf or something? Get back in the plane!' And to Mogwat he screamed, "'Dive! Dive!' Down they sank once more into the crunching, thudding, voluminous barrage of bursting anti-aircraft shells as Arfi came creeping back behind Yossarian and jabbed him sharply in the ribs again. Yossarian shied upward with another whinnying gasp. I still couldn't hear you, Arfi said. I said get out of here! Yossarian shouted and broke into tears. He began punching Arfi in the body with both hands as hard as he could. Get away from me! Get away! 
Punching Arfi was like sinking his fist into a limp sack of inflated rubber. There was no resistance, no response at all from the soft, insensitive mass, and after a while the Osarian spirit died, and his arms dropped helplessly with exhaustion. He was overcome with a humiliating feeling of impotence, and was ready to weep in self-pity. "'What did you say?' Arfi asked. "'Get away from me!' Yosarian answered, pleading with him now. "'Go back in the plane!' "'I still can't hear you.' "'Never mind!' wailed Yosarian. "'Never mind! Just leave me alone!' "'Never mind what?' Yosarian began hitting himself in the forehead. He seized Arfi by the shirt front and, struggling to his feet for traction, dragged him to the rear of the nose compartment and flung him down like a bloated and unwieldy bag in the entrance of the crawlway. A shell banged open with a stupendous clout right beside his ear as he was scrambling back toward the front, and some undestroyed recess of his intelligence wondered that it did not kill them all. They were climbing again. The engines were howling again as though in pain, and the air inside the plane was acrid with the smell of machinery and fetid with the stench of gasoline. The next thing he knew, it was snowing. Thousands of tiny bits of white paper were falling like snowflakes inside the plane, milling around his head so thickly that they clung to his eyelashes when he blinked in astonishment and fluttered against his nostrils and lips each time he inhaled. When he spun around in bewilderment, Arfi was grinning proudly from ear to ear like something inhuman as he held up a shattered paper map for Yosarian to see. A large chunk of flak had ripped up from the floor through Arfi's colossal jumble of maps and had ripped out through the ceiling inches away from their heads. Arfi's joy was sublime. "'Will you look at this?' he murmured, waggling two of his stubby fingers playfully into Yossarian's face through the hole in one of his maps. "'Will you look at this?' Yossarian was dumbfounded by his state of rapturous contentment. Arfi was like an eerie ogre in a dream, incapable of being bruised or evaded, and Yossarian dreaded him for a complex of reasons he was too petrified to untangle. Wind whistling up through the jagged gash in the floor kept the myriad bits of paper circulating like alabaster particles in a paperweight and contributed to a sensation of lacquered, waterlogged unreality. Everything seemed strange, so tawdry and grotesque. His head was throbbing from a shrill clamor that drilled relentlessly into both ears. It was McWatt, begging for directions in an incoherent frenzy. Yossarian continued staring in tormented fascination at Arfi's spherical countenance, beaming at him so serenely and vacantly through the drifting walls of white paper bits and concluded that he was a raving lunatic, just as eight bursts of flak broke open successively at eye level off to the right. Then eight more, and then eight more. The last group pulled over toward the left, so that they were almost directly in front. "'Turn left hard!' he hollered to McWatt as Arfi kept grinning. And McWatt did turn left hard, but the flak turned left hard with them, catching up fast, and Yossarian hollered, I said hard, 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 you bastard, hard! And McWatt bent the plane around even harder still, and suddenly, miraculously, they were out of range. The flak ended. The guns stopped booming at them and they were alive. Behind him, men were dying, strung out for miles in a stricken, tortuous, squirming line. The other flights of planes were making the same hazardous journey over the target, threading their swift way through the swollen masses of new and old bursts of flak, like rats racing in a pack through their own droppings. One was on fire and flapped lamely off by itself, billowing gigantically like a monstrous blood-red star. As Yossarian watched, the burning plane floated over on its side and began spiraling down slowly in wide, tremulous, narrowing circles, its huge flaming burden blazing orange 
and flaring out in back like a long, swirling cape of fire and smoke. There were parachutes. One, two, three, four. And then the plane gyrated into a spin and fell the rest of the way to the ground, fluttering insensibly inside its vivid pyre like a shred of colored tissue paper. One whole flight of planes from another squadron had been blasted apart. Yossarian sighed barrenly, his day's work done. He was listless and sticky. The engines crooned mellifluously as McWatt throttled back to loiter and allow the rest of the planes in his flight to catch up. The abrupt stillness seemed alien and artificial, a little insidious. Yossarian unsnapped his flak suit and took off his helmet. He sighed again, restlessly, and closed his eyes and tried to relax. Where's Orr? someone asked suddenly over his intercom. Yossarian bounded up with a one-syllable cry that crackled with anxiety and provided the only rational explanation for the whole mysterious phenomenon of the flak at Bologna. Orr. He lunged forward over the bomb site to search downward through the plexiglass for some reassuring sign of Orr, who drew flak like a magnet, and who had undoubtedly attracted the crack batteries of the whole Hermann Goering division of Bologna overnight from wherever the hell they had been stationed the day before when Orr was still in Rome. Arfi launched himself forward an instant later and cracked Yossarian on the bridge of the nose with a sharp rim of his flak helmet. Yossarian cursed him as his eyes flooded with tears. There he is, Arfi orated funereally, pointing down dramatically at a hay wagon and two horses standing before the barn of a gray stone farmhouse. Smashed to bits. I guess their numbers were all up. Yossarian swore at Arfi again and continued searching intently, cold with a compassionate kind of fear now, for the little bouncy and bizarre buck-toothed tent-mate who had smashed Appleby's forehead open with a ping-pong racket and who was scaring the daylights out of Yossarian once again. At last Yossarian spotted the two-engined, twin-ruddered plane as it flew out of the green background of the forests over a field of yellow farmland. One of the propellers was feathered and perfectly still, but the plane was maintaining altitude and holding a proper course. Yossarian muttered an unconscious prayer of thankfulness and then flared up at Orr savagely in a ranting fusion of resentment and relief. That bastard! he began. That goddamn stunted, red-faced, big-cheeked, curly-headed, buck-toothed, rat-bastard son of a bitch! What? said Arfi. That dirty goddamn midget-assed, apple-cheat, goggle-eyed, undersized, buck-toothed, grinning, crazy son of a bitch and bastard, Yossarian sputtered. What? Never mind. I still can't hear you, Arfi answered. Yossarian swung himself around methodically to face Arfi. You prick, he began. Me? You pompous, rotund, neighborly, vacuous, complacent, Arfi was unperturbed. Calmly he struck a wooden match and sucked noisily at his pipe with an eloquent air of benign and magnanimous forgiveness. He smiled sociably and opened his mouth to speak. Yossarian put his hand over Arfi's mouth and pushed him away wearily. He shut his eyes and pretended to sleep all the way back to the field so that he would not have to listen to Arfi or see him. At the briefing room, Yossarian made his intelligence report to Captain Black and then waited in muttering suspense with all the others until Orr chugged into sight overhead finally with his one good engine still keeping him aloft gamely. Nobody breathed. Orr's landing gear would not come down. Yossarian hung around only until Orr had crash-landed safely, and then stole the first jeep he could find with a key in the ignition and raced back to his tent to begin packing feverishly for the emergency rest leave he had decided to take in Rome, where he found Luciana 
and her invisible scar that same night. Chapter 16 Luciana He found Luciana sitting alone at a table in the Allied officer's nightclub, where the drunken Anzac major who had brought her there had been stupid enough to desert her for the ribald company of some singing comrades at the bar. All right, I'll dance with you, she said, before Yossarian could even speak. But I won't let you sleep with me. Who asked you? Yossarian asked her. "'You don't want to sleep with me?' she exclaimed with surprise. "'I don't want to dance with you.' She seized Yossarian's hand and pulled him out on the dance floor. She was a worse dancer than even he was, but she threw herself about to the synthetic jitterbug music with more uninhibited pleasure than he had ever observed, until he felt his legs falling asleep with boredom and yanked her off the dance floor toward the table, at which the girl he should have been screwing was still sitting tipsily with one hand around Arfie's neck, her orange satin blouse still hanging open slovenly below her full white lacy brassiere as she made dirty sex talk, ostentatiously, with Hoople, Orr, Kid Sampson, and Hungry Joe. Just as he reached them, Luciana gave him a forceful, unexpected shove that carried them both well beyond the table, so that they were still alone. She was a tall, earthy, exuberant girl with long hair and a pretty face, a buxom, delightful, flirtatious girl. "'All right,' she said. "'I will let you buy me dinner.' "'But I won't let you sleep with me.' "'Who asked you?' Yossarian asked with surprise. "'You don't want to sleep with me? "'I don't want to buy you dinner.' She pulled him out of the nightclub into the street and down a flight of steps into a black market restaurant filled with lively, chirping, attractive girls who all seemed to know each other and with the self-conscious military officers from different countries who had come there with them. The food was elegant and expensive, and the aisles were overflowing with great streams of flushed and merry proprietors, all stout and balding. The bustling interior radiated with enormous, engulfing waves of fun and warmth. Yossarian got a tremendous kick out of the rude gusto with which Luciana ignored him completely while she shoveled away her whole meal with both hands. She ate like a horse until the last plate was clean, and then she placed her silverware down with an air of conclusion and settled back lazily in her chair with a dreamy and congested look of sated gluttony. She drew a deep, smiling, contented breath and regarded him amorously with a melting gaze. Okay, Joe she purred, her glowing dark eyes drowsy and grateful. Now I will let you sleep with me. My name is Yossarian. Okay, Yossarian, she answered with a soft, repentant laugh. Now I will let you sleep with me. Who asked you? said Yossarian. Luciana was stunned. You don't want to sleep with me? Yossarian nodded emphatically, laughing, and shot his hand up under her dress. The girl came to life with a horrified start. She jerked her legs away from him instantly, whipping her bottom around. Blushing with alarm and embarrassment, she pushed her skirt back down with a number of prim, sidelong glances about the restaurant. "'Now I will let you sleep with me,' she explained cautiously, in a manner of apprehensive indulgence. "'But not... Now, I know, when we get back to my room. The girl shook her head, eyeing him mistrustfully and keeping her knees pressed together. No, now I must go home to my mama, because my mama does not like me to dance with soldiers or let them take me to dinner, and she will be very angry with me if I do not come home now. But I will let you write down for me where you live. And tomorrow morning I will come to your room for Fiki Fik before I go to my work at the French office. Capiche? Bullshit! Yossarian exclaimed with angry disappointment. Course of all, dear bullshit! Luciana inquired with a blank look. Yossarian broke into loud laughter. He answered her finally in a tone of sympathetic good humor. 
It means that I want to escort you now to wherever the hell I have to take you next so that I can rush back to that nightclub before Arfie leaves with that wonderful tomato he's got without giving me a chance to ask about an aunt or friend she must have who's just like her. Come? Subito. Subito. He taunted her tenderly. Mama is waiting, remember? Si, si, mama. Yossarian let the girl drag him through the lovely Roman spring night for almost a mile until they reached a chaotic bus depot honking with horns, blazing with red and yellow lights, and echoing with the snarling vituperations of unshaven bus drivers pouring loathsome, hair-raising curses out at each other, at their passengers, and at the strolling, unconcerned knots of pedestrians clogging their paths, who ignored them until they were bumped by the buses and began shouting curses back. Luciana vanished aboard one of the diminutive green vehicles, and Yossarian hurried as fast as he could all the way back to the cabaret and the bleary-eyed, bleached blonde in the open orange satin blouse. She seemed infatuated with Arfi, but he prayed intensely for her luscious aunt as he ran, or for a luscious girlfriend, sister, cousin, or mother who was just as libidinous and depraved. She would have been perfect for Yossarian, a debauched, coarse, vulgar, amoral, appetizing slattern whom he had longed for and idolized for months. She was a real find. She paid for her own drinks, and she had an automobile, an apartment, and a salmon-colored cameo ring that drove Hungry Joe clean out of his senses with its exquisitely carved figures of a naked boy and girl on a rock. Hungry Joe snorted and pranced and pawed at the floor in salivating lust and groveling need. But the girl would not sell him the ring, even though he offered her all the money in all their pockets and his complicated black camera thrown in. She was not interested in money or cameras. She was interested in fornication. She was gone when Yossarian got there. They were all gone and he walked right out and moved in wistful dejection through the dark, emptying streets. Yossarian was not often lonely when he was by himself, but he was lonely now in his keen envy of Arfi, who he knew was in bed that very moment with a girl who was just right for Yossarian, and who could also make out any time he wanted to, if he ever wanted to, with either or both of the two slender, stunning, aristocratic women who lived in the apartment upstairs and fructified Yossarian sex fantasies whenever he had sex fantasies, the beautiful, rich, black-haired countess with the red, wet, nervous lips, and her beautiful, rich, black-haired daughter-in-law. Yossarian was madly in love with all of them as he made his way back to the officer's apartment. In love with Luciana, with a prurient, intoxicated girl in the unbuttoned satin blouse, and with the beautiful rich countess and her beautiful rich daughter-in-law, both of whom would never let him touch them or even flirt with them. They doted kittenishly on Nately and deferred passively to Arfi, but they thought Yossarian was crazy and recoiled from him with distasteful contempt each time he made an indecent proposal or tried to fondle them when they passed on the stairs. They were both superb creatures, with pulpy, bright, pointed tongues and mouths like round, warm plums, a little sweet and sticky, a little rotten. They had class. The Assyrian was not sure what class was, but he knew that they had it, and he did not, and that they knew it, too. He could picture as he walked the kind of underclothing they wore against their svelte feminine parts, filmy, smooth, clinging garments of deepest black or of opalescent pastel radiance with flowering lace borders, fragrant with the tantalizing fumes of pampered flesh and scented bath salts, rising in a germinating cloud from their blue-white breasts. He wished again that he was where Arfi was, making obscene, brutal, cheerful love with a juicy, drunken tart who didn't give a tinker's damn about him and would never think of him again. 
But Arfie was already back in the apartment when Yossarian arrived, and Yossarian gaped at him with that same sense of persecuted astonishment he had suffered that same morning of a Bologna at his malign and cabalistic and irremovable presence in the nose of the plane. This book is continued on Disc 6. Disc 6 but Arfi was already back in the apartment when Yossarian arrived, and Yossarian gaped at him with that same sense of persecuted astonishment he had suffered that same morning of a Bologna at his malign and cabalistic and irremovable presence in the nose of the plane. "'What are you doing here?' he asked. "'That's right. Ask him!' Hungry Joe exclaimed in a rage. "'Make him tell you what he's doing here!' With a long theatrical moan, Kid Sampson made a pistol of his thumb and forefinger and blew his own brains out. Hoople, chewing away in a bulging wad of bubblegum, drank everything in with a callow, vacant expression on his fifteen-year-old face. Arfie was tapping the bowl of his pipe against his palm leisurely as he paced back and forth in corpulent self-approval, obviously delighted by the stir he was causing. "'Didn't you go home with that girl?' Yossarian demanded. Oh, sure. I went home with her, Arthy replied. You didn't think I was going to let her try to find her way home alone, did you? Wouldn't she let you stay with her? Oh, she wanted me to stay with her, all right, Arthy chuckled. Don't you worry about good old Arthy. But I wasn't going to take advantage of a sweet kid like that just because she'd had a little too much to drink. What kind of a guy do you think I am? Who said anything about taking advantage of her? Yossarian railed at him in amazement. All she wanted to do was get into bed with someone. That's the only thing she kept talking about all night long. That's because she was a little mixed up, Arfi explained. But I gave her a little talking to and really put some sense into her. You bastard! Yossarian exclaimed and sank down tiredly on the divan beside Kid Sampson. Why the hell didn't you give her to one of us if you didn't want her? You see? Hungry Joe asked. There's something wrong with him. Yossarian nodded and looked at Arfi curiously. Arfi, tell me something. Don't you ever screw any of them? Arfi chuckled again with conceited amusement. Oh, sure, I proud them. Don't you worry about me. But never any nice girls. I know what kind of girls to prod and what kind of girls not to prod. And I never prod any nice girls. This one was a sweet kid. You could see her family had money. Why, I even got her to throw that ring of hers away right out the car window. Hungry Joe flew into the air with a screech of intolerable pain. You did what? he screamed. You did what? He began wailing away at Arfie's shoulders and arms with both fists, almost in tears. I had to kill you for what you did, you lousy bastard. He's sinful, that's what he is. He's got a dirty mind, ain't he? Ain't he got a dirty mind? The dirtiest, Yossarian agreed. What are you fellows talking about? Arfie asked with genuine puzzlement, tucking his face away protectively inside the cushioning insulation of his oval shoulders. Ah, come on, Joe, he pleaded with a smile of mild discomfort. Quit punching me, will ya? But Hungry Joe would not quit punching until Yossarian picked him up and pushed him away toward his bedroom. Yossarian moved listlessly into his own room, undressed, and went to sleep. A second later it was morning and someone was shaking him. "'What are you waking me up for?' he whimpered. It was Michaela, the skinny maid with a merry disposition and homely, sallow face, and she was waking him up because he had a visitor waiting just outside the door. Luciana! He could hardly believe it, and she was alone in the room with him after Michaela had departed. Lovely, hale, and statuesque, steaming and rippling with an irrepressible affectionate vitality, even as she remained in one place and frowned at him irately. 
She stood like a youthful female colossus, with her magnificent columnar legs apart on high white shoes with wedged heels, wearing a pretty green dress, and swinging a large, flat, white leather pocketbook, with which she cracked him hard across the face when he leaped out of bed to grab her. Yossarian staggered backward out of range in a daze, clutching his stinging cheek with bewilderment. Pig! she spat out at him viciously, her nostrils flaring in a look of savage disdain. Vive comme un animal! With a fierce, guttural, scornful, disgusted oath, she strode across the room and threw open the three tall casement windows, letting inside an effulgent flood of sunlight and crisp, fresh air that washed through the stuffy room like an invigorating tonic. She placed her pocketbook on a chair and began tidying the room, picking his things up from the floor and off the tops of the furniture, throwing his socks, handkerchief, and underwear into an empty drawer of the dresser, and hanging his shirt and trousers up in the closet. Yossarian ran out of the bedroom into the bathroom and brushed his teeth. He washed his hands and face and combed his hair. When he ran back, the room was in order, and Luciana was almost undressed. Her expression was relaxed. She left her earrings on the dresser and padded barefoot to the bed, wearing just a pink rayon chemise that came down to her hips. She glanced about the room prudently to make certain there was nothing she had overlooked in the way of neatness, and then drew back the coverlet and stretched herself out luxuriously with an expression of feline expectation. She beckoned to him longingly with a husky laugh. Now, she announced in a whisper, holding both arms out to him eagerly. Now I will let you sleep with me. She told him some lies about a single weekend in bed with a slaughtered fiancé in the Italian army, and they all turned out to be true, for she cried, Finito, almost as soon as he started, and wondered why he didn't stop, until he had finitoed too, and explained to her. He lit cigarettes for both of them. She was enchanted by the deep suntan covering his whole body. He wondered about the pink chemise that she would not remove. It was cut like a man's undershirt, with narrow shoulder straps, and concealed the invisible scar on her back that she refused to let him see after he had made her tell him it was there. She grew tense as fine steel when he traced the mutilated contours with his fingertip from a pit in her shoulder blade almost to the base of her spine. He winced at the many tortured nights she had spent in the hospital, drugged or in pain, with the ubiquitous, ineradicable odors of ether, fecal matter, and disinfectant of human flesh mortified and decaying amid the white uniforms, the rubber-soled shoes, and the eerie nightlights glowing dimly until dawn in the corridors. She had been wounded in an air raid. Dove? he asked, and he held his breath in suspense. Napoli. Germans? Americani. His heart cracked, and he fell in love. He wondered if she would marry him. Tu se pazzo, she told him with a pleasant laugh. Why am I crazy? he asked. Perché non posso sposare. Why can't you get married? Because I am not a virgin, she answered. What has that got to do with it? Who will marry me? No one wants a girl who is not a virgin. I will. I'll marry you. Ma non posso sposarti. Why can't you marry me? Perché sei pazzo. Why am I crazy? Perché vuoi sposarmi? Yossarian wrinkled his forehead with quizzical amusement. You won't marry me because I'm crazy, and you say I'm crazy because I want to marry you. Is that right? Si. Tu sei pazzo, he told her loudly. Perche, she shouted back at him indignantly, her unavoidable round breasts rising and falling in a saucy huff beneath the pink chemise as she sat up in bed indignantly. Why am I crazy? Because you won't marry me. Stupido, 
she shouted back at him and smacked him loudly and flamboyantly on the chest with the back of her hand. Non posso sposarti. Non capisci? Non posso sposarti. Oh, sure, I understand. And why can't you marry me? Perché sei pazzo. And why am I crazy? Perché vuoi sposarmi. Because I want to marry you. Carina, ti amo, he explained, and he drew her gently back down to the pillow. Ti amo molto. Tu sei pazzo, she murmured in reply, flattered. Perché? Because you say you love me. How can you love a girl who is not a virgin? Because I can't marry you. She bolted right up again in a threatening rage. Well, why can't you marry me? she demanded, ready to cloud him again if he gave an uncomplimentary reply. Just because I am not a virgin? No, no, darling. Because you're crazy. She stared at him in blank resentment for a moment, and then tossed her head back and roared appreciatively with hearty laughter. She gazed at him with new approval when she stopped. The lush, responsive tissues of her dark face turning darker still and blooming solemnly with a swelling and beautifying infusion of blood. Her eyes grew dim. He crushed out both their cigarettes, and they turned into each other wordlessly in an engrossing kiss. Just as Hungry Joe came meandering into the room without knocking to ask if Eusarian wanted to go out with him to look for girls. Hungry Joe stopped on a dime when he saw them and shot out of the room. Yosarian shot out of the bed even faster and began shouting at Luciana to get dressed. The girl was dumbfounded. He pulled her roughly out of bed by her arm and flung her away toward her clothing, then raced for the door in time to slam it shut as Hungry Joe was running back in with his camera. Hungry Joe had his leg wedged in the door and would not pull it out. Let me in, he begged urgently, wriggling and squirming maniacally. Let me in! He stopped struggling for a moment to gaze up into Yossarian's face through the crack in the door with what he must have supposed was a beguiling smile. Me no hungry Joe, he explained earnestly. Me heap big photographer from Life magazine. Heap big picture on heap big cover. I make you big Hollywood star, Yossarian. multi denaro, multi-divorces, multi ficky fick all day long. See, si, see, si, see. Si. Yossarian slammed the door shut when Hungry Joe stepped back a bit to try to shoot a picture of Luciana dressing. Hungry Joe attacked the stout wooden barrier fanatically, fell back to reorganize his energies, and hurled himself forward fanatically again. Yossarian slithered into his own clothes between assaults. Luciana had a green and white summer dress on and was holding the skirt bunched up above her waist. A wave of misery broke over him as he saw her about to vanish inside her panties forever. He reached out to grasp her and drew her to him by the raised calf of her leg. She hopped forward and molded herself against him. Yossarian kissed her ears and her closed eyes romantically and rubbed the backs of her thighs. She began to hum sensually a moment before Hungry Joe hurled his frail body against the door in still one more desperate attack and almost knocked them both down. Yossarian pushed her away. Vite, Vite, he scolded her. Get your things on. What the hell are you talking about? She wanted to know. Fast, fast. Can't you understand English? Get your clothes on fast. Stupido, she snarled back at him. Vite is French, not Italian. Subito, subito. That's what you mean, subito. See, si, see, si, that's what I mean. Subito, subito. See, si, see. Si. She responded cooperatively and ran for her shoes and earrings. Hungry Joe had paused in his attack to shoot pictures through the closed door. Yossarian could hear the camera shutter clicking. When both he and Luciana were ready, Yossarian waited for Hungry Joe's next charge and yanked the door open on him unexpectedly. Hungry Joe spilled forward into the room like a floundering frog. Yossarian skipped nimbly around him, guiding Luciana along behind him through the apartment and out into the hallway. They bounced down the stairs with a great roistering clatter, laughing out loud breathlessly and knocking their hilarious heads together each time they paused to rest.
Near the bottom they met Nately coming up and stopped laughing. Nately was drawn, dirty, and unhappy. His tie was twisted, and his shirt was rumpled, and he walked with his hands in his pockets. He wore a hangdog, hopeless look. "'What's the matter, kid?' Yossarian inquired compassionately. "'I'm flat broke again,' Nately replied with a lame and distracted smile. "'What am I going to do?' Yossarian didn't know. Nately had spent the last thirty-two hours at twenty dollars an hour with the apathetic whore he adored, and he had nothing left of his pay or of the lucrative allowance he received every month from his wealthy and generous father. That meant he could not spend time with her any more. She would not allow him to walk beside her as she strolled the pavements, soliciting other servicemen, and she was infuriated when she spied him trailing her from a distance. He was free to hang around her apartment if he cared to, but there was no certainty that she would be there, and she would give him nothing unless he could pay. She found sex uninteresting. Nately wanted the assurance that she was not going to bed with anyone unsavory or with someone he knew. Captain Black always made it a point to buy her each time he came to Rome, just so he could torment Nately with the news that he had thrown his sweetheart another hump, and watch Nately eat his liver as he related the atrocious indignities to which he had forced her to submit. Luciana was touched by Nately's forlorn air, but broke loudly into robust laughter again the moment she stepped outside into the sunny street with Yossarian and heard Hungry Joe beseeching them from the window to come back and take their clothes off because he really was a photographer from Life magazine. Luciana fled mirthfully along the sidewalk in her high white wedgies, pulling Assyrian along in tow with the same lusty and ingenuous zeal she had displayed in the dance hall the night before and at every moment since. Assyrian caught up and walked with his arm around her waist until they came to the corner and she stepped away from him. She straightened her hair in a mirror from her pocketbook and put lipstick on. Why don't you ask me to let you write my name and address on a piece of paper so that you will be able to find me again when you come to Rome, she suggested. Why don't you let me write your name and address down on a piece of paper, he agreed. Why, she demanded belligerently, her mouth curling suddenly into a vehement sneer and her eyes flashing with anger. So you can tear it up into little pieces as soon as I leave? Who's going to tear it up? Yossarian protested in confusion. What the hell are you talking about? You will, she insisted. You'll tear it up into little pieces the minute I'm gone and go walking away like a big shot because a tall, young, beautiful girl like me, Luciana, let you sleep with her and did not ask you for money. How much money are you asking me for? He asked her. Stupid, she shouted with emotion. I am not asking you for any money. She stamped her foot and raised her arm in a turbulent gesture that made Yossarian fear she was going to crack him in the face again with her great pocketbook. Instead, she scribbled her name and address on a slip of paper and thrust it at him. Here, she taunted him sardonically, biting on her lip to still a delicate tremor. Don't forget, don't forget to tear it into tiny pieces as soon as I am gone. Then she smiled at him serenely, squeezed his hand, and, with a whispered regretful, Adieu, pressed herself against him for a moment, and then straightened and walked away with unconscious dignity and grace. The minute she was gone, Yossarian tore the slip of paper up and walked away in the other direction, feeling very much like a big shot because a beautiful young girl like Luciana had slept with him and did not ask for money. He was pretty pleased with himself until he looked up in the dining room of the Red Cross building and found himself eating breakfast with dozens and dozens of other servicemen in all kinds of fantastic uniforms. And then all at once he was surrounded by images of Luciana getting out of her clothes and into her clothes and caressing and haranguing him tempestuously in the pink rayon chemise she wore in bed with him and would not take off.
Yossarian choked on his toast and eggs at the enormity of his error in tearing her long, lithe, nude, young, vibrant limbs into tiny pieces of paper so impudently and dumping her down so smugly into the gutter from the curb. He missed her terribly already. There were so many strident, faceless people in uniform in the dining room with him. He felt an urgent desire to be alone with her again soon, and sprang up impetuously from his table and went running outside and back down the street toward the apartment in search of the tiny bits of paper in the gutter, but they had all been flushed away by a street cleaner's hose. He couldn't find her again in the Allied officers' nightclub that evening, or in the sweltering, burnished, hedonistic bedlam of the black market restaurant, with its vast, bobbing wooden trays of elegant food and its chirping flock of bright and lovely girls. He couldn't even find the restaurant. When he went to bed alone, he dodged flack over Bologna again in a dream, with Arfie hanging over his shoulder abominably in the plain with a bloated, sordid leer. In the morning he ran looking for Luciana in all the French offices he could find, but nobody knew what he was talking about. And then he ran in terror, so jumpy, distraught, and disorganized that he just had to keep running in terror somewhere to the enlisted men's apartment for the squat maid in the lime-colored panties, whom he found dusting in Snowden's room on the fifth floor in a drab brown sweater and heavy dark skirt. Snowden was still alive then. And Yossarian could tell it was Snowden's room, from the name stenciled in white on the blue duffel bag he tripped over as he plunged through the doorway at her in a frenzy of creative desperation. The woman caught him by the wrists before he could fall as he came stumbling toward her in need, and pulled him along down on top of her as she flopped over backward onto the bed and enveloped him hospitably in her flaccid and consoling embrace, her dust mop aloft in her hand like a banner as her broad, brutish, congenial face gazed up at him fondly with a smile of unperjured friendship. There was a sharp, elastic snap as she rolled the lime-colored panties off beneath them both without disturbing him. He stuffed money into her hand when they were finished. She hugged him in gratitude. He hugged her. She hugged him back, and then pulled him down on top of her on the bed again. He stuffed more money into her hand when they were finished this time, and ran out of the room before she could begin hugging him in gratitude again. Back at his own apartment, he threw his things together as fast as he could, left finately what money he had, and ran back to Pianosa on a supply plane to apologize to Hungry Joe for shutting him out of the bedroom. The apology was unnecessary, for Hungry Joe was in high spirits when Yossarian found him. Hungry Joe was grinning from ear to ear, and Yossarian turned sick at the sight of him, for he understood instantly what the high spirits meant. Forty missions! Hungry Joe announced readily in a voice lyrical with relief and elation. The colonel raised them again. Yossarian was stunned. But I've got thirty-two, goddammit! Three more and I would have been through. Hungry Joe shrugged indifferently. The colonel wants forty missions, he repeated. Yossarian shoved him out of the way and ran right into the hospital. Chapter 17 The Soldier in White Yossarian ran right into the hospital, determined to remain there forever, rather than fly one mission more than the thirty-two missions he had. Ten days after he changed his mind and came out, the colonel raised the missions to forty-five, and Yossarian ran right back in, determined to remain in the hospital forever, rather than fly one mission more than the six missions more he had just flown. Yossarian could run into the hospital whenever he wanted to, because of his liver and because of his eyes. The doctors couldn't fix his liver condition and couldn't meet his eyes each time he told them he had a liver condition. He could enjoy himself in the hospital just as long as there was no one really very sick in the same ward. His system was sturdy enough to survive a case of someone else's malaria or influenza with scarcely any discomfort at all. 
He could come through other people's tonsillectomies without suffering any post-operative distress, and even endure their hernias and hemorrhoids with only mild nausea and revulsion. But that was just about as much as he could go through without getting sick. After that, he was ready to bolt. He could relax in the hospital, since no one there expected him to do anything. All he was expected to do in the hospital was die or get better. And since he was perfectly all right to begin with, getting better was easy. Being in the hospital was better than being over Bologna or flying over Avignon with Hoopel and Dobbs at the controls and Snowden dying in back. There were usually not nearly as many sick people inside the hospital as Yossarian saw outside the hospital, and there were generally fewer people inside the hospital who were seriously sick. There was a much lower death rate inside the hospital than outside the hospital, and a much healthier death rate. Few people died unnecessarily. People knew a lot more about dying inside the hospital and made a much neater, more orderly job of it. They couldn't dominate death inside the hospital, but they certainly made her behave. They had taught her manners. They couldn't keep death out, but while she was in, she had to act like a lady. People gave up the ghost with delicacy and taste inside the hospital. There was none of that crude, ugly ostentation about dying that was so common outside the hospital. They did not blow up in midair like Kraft or the dead man in Yossarian's tent, or freeze to death in the blazing summertime the way Snowden had frozen to death after spilling his secret to Yossarian in the back of the plane. I'm cold, Snowden had whimpered. I I'm cold. There, there, Yossarian had tried to comfort him. There, there. They didn't take it on the lamb weirdly inside a cloud the way Clevenger had done. They didn't explode into blood and clotted matter. They didn't drown or get struck by lightning, mangled by machinery, or crushed in landslides. They didn't get shot to death in hold-ups, strangled to death in rapes, stabbed to death in saloons, bludgeoned to death with axes by parents or children, or die summarily by some other act of God. Nobody choked to death. People bled to death like gentlemen in an operating room, or expired without comment in an oxygen tent. There was none of that tricky, now you see me, now you don't business, so much in vogue outside the hospital. None of that, now I am and now I ain't. There were no famines or floods. Children didn't suffocate in cradles or ice boxes, or fall under trucks. No one was beaten to death. People didn't stick their heads into ovens with the gas on, jump in front of subway trains, or come plummeting like dead weights out of hotel windows with a whoosh, accelerating at the rate of 32 feet per second to land with a hideous plop on the sidewalk and die disgustingly there in public like an alpaca sack full of hairy strawberry ice cream, bleeding pink toes awry. All things considered... Yossarian often preferred the hospital, even though it had its faults. The help tended to be officious, the rules, if heeded, restrictive, and the management meddlesome. Since sick people were apt to be present, he could not always depend on a lively young crowd in the same ward with him, and the entertainment was not always good. He was forced to admit that the hospitals had altered steadily for the worse as the war continued, and one moved closer to the battlefront, the deterioration in the quality of the guests becoming most marked within the combat zone itself, where the effects of booming wartime conditions were apt to make themselves conspicuous immediately. The people got sicker and sicker the deeper he moved into combat, until finally in the hospital that last time there had been the soldier in white, who could not have been any sicker without being dead and he soon was. The soldier in white was constructed entirely of gauze, plaster, and a thermometer, and the thermometer was merely an adornment left balanced in the empty dark hole in the bandages over his mouth early each morning 
and late each afternoon by Nurse Kramer and Nurse Duckett. Right up to the afternoon, Nurse Kramer read the thermometer and discovered he was dead. Now that Yossarian looked back, it seemed that Nurse Kramer, rather than the talkative Texan, had murdered the soldier in white. If she had not read the thermometer and reported what she had found, the soldier in white might still be lying there alive, exactly as he had been lying there all along, encased from head to toe in plaster and gauze, with both strange, rigid legs elevated from the hips, and both strange arms strung up perpendicularly, all four bulky limbs in casts, all four strange, useless limbs hoisted up in the air by taut wire cables and fantastically long lead weights, suspended darkly above him. Lying there that way might not have been much of a life, but it was all the life he had, and the decision to terminate it, Yossarian felt, should hardly have been Nurse Kramer's. The soldier in white was like an unrolled bandage with a hole in it, or like a broken block of stone in a harbor with a crooked zinc pipe jutting out. The other patients in the ward, all but the Texan, shrank from him with a tender-hearted aversion from the moment they set eyes on him the morning after the night he had been sneaked in. They gathered soberly in the farthest recess of the ward and gossiped about him in malicious, offended undertones, rebelling against his presence as a ghastly imposition and resenting him malevolently for the nauseating truth of which he was a bright reminder. They shared a common dread that he would begin moaning. "'I don't know what I'll do if he does begin moaning,' the dashing young fighter pilot with a golden mustache had grieved forlornly. "'It means he'll moan during the night, too, because he won't be able to tell time.' No sound at all came from the soldier in white all the time he was there. The ragged round hole over his mouth was deep and jet black and showed no sign of lip, teeth, palate, or tongue. The only one who ever came close enough to look was the affable Texan, who came close enough several times a day to chat with him about more votes for the decent folk, opening each conversation with the same unvarying greeting. "'What do you say, fella? How you coming along?' The rest of the men avoided them both in their regulation maroon corduroy bathrobes and unraveling flannel pajamas, wondering gloomily who the soldier in white was, why he was there, and what he was really like inside. "'He's all right, I tell you,' the Texan would report back to them encouragingly after each of his social visits. "'Deep down inside he's really a regular guy.' He's just feeling a little shy and insecure now because he doesn't know anybody here and can't talk. Why don't you all just step right up to him and introduce yourselves? He won't hurt you. What the goddamn hell are you talking about? Dunbar demanded. Does he even know what you're talking about? Sure he knows what I'm talking about. He's not stupid. There ain't nothing wrong with him. Can he hear you? Well... I don't know if he can hear me or not, but I'm sure he knows what I'm talking about. Does that hole over his mouth ever move? Now, what kind of a crazy question is that? The Texan asked uneasily. How can you tell if he's breathing if it never moves? How can you tell it's a he? Does he have pads over his eyes underneath that bandage over his face? Does he ever wiggle his toes or move the tips of his fingers? The Texan backed away in mounting confusion. Now, what kind of a crazy question is that? You fellas must all be crazy or something. Why don't you just walk right up to him and get acquainted? He's a real nice guy, I tell you. The soldier in white was more like a stuffed and sterilized mummy than a real nice guy. Nurse Duckett and Nurse Kramer kept him spick and span. They brushed his bandages often with a whisk broom and scrubbed the plaster casts on his arms, legs, shoulders, chest, and pelvis with soapy water. Working with a round tin of metal polish, they waxed a dim gloss on the dull zinc pipe rising from the cement on his groin. 
with damp dish towels, they wiped the dust several times a day from the slim black rubber tubes leading in and out of him to the two large stopper jars, one of them hanging on a post beside his bed, dripping fluid into his arm constantly through a slit in the bandages, while the other, almost out of sight on the floor, drained the fluid away through the zinc pipe rising from his groin. Both young nurses polished the glass jars unceasingly. They were proud of their housework. The more solicitous of the two was Nurse Kramer, a shapely, pretty, sexless girl with a wholesome, unattractive face. Nurse Kramer had a cute nose and a radiant, blooming complexion dotted with fetching sprays of adorable freckles that Yossarian detested. She was touched very deeply by the soldier in white. Her virtuous, pale blue, saucer-like eyes flooded with leviathan tears on unexpected occasions and made Yossarian mad. How the hell do you know he's even in there? he asked her. Don't you dare talk to me that way, she replied indignantly. Well, how do you? You don't even know if it's really him. Who? Whoever's supposed to be in all those bandages. You might really be weeping for somebody else. How do you know he's even alive? What a terrible thing to say, Nurse Kramer exclaimed. Now you get right into bed and stop making jokes about him. I'm not making jokes. Anybody might be in there. For all we know, it might even be mud. What are you talking about? Nurse Kramer pleaded with him in a quavering voice. Maybe that's where the dead man is. What dead man? I've got a dead man in my tent that nobody can throw out. His name is Mud. Nurse Kramer's face blanched, and she turned to Dunbar desperately for aid. Make him stop saying things like that, she begged. Maybe there's no one inside, Dunbar suggested helpfully. Maybe they just sent the bandages here for a joke. She stepped away from Dunbar in alarm. You're crazy, she cried, glancing about imploring. You're both crazy. Nurse Duckett showed up then and chased them all back to their own beds while Nurse Kramer changed the stopper jars for the soldier in white. Changing the jars for the soldier in white was no trouble at all, since the same clear fluid was dripped back inside him over and over again with no apparent loss. When the jar feeding the inside of his elbow was just about empty, the jar on the floor was just about full, and the two were simply uncoupled from their respective hoses and reversed quickly so that the liquid could be dripped right back into him. Changing the jars was no trouble to anyone but the men who watched them changed every hour or so and were baffled by the procedure. Why can't they hook the two jars up to each other and eliminate the middleman? The artillery captain with whom Yossarian had stopped playing chess inquired. What the hell do they need him for? I wonder what he did to deserve it. The warrant officer with malaria and a mosquito bite on his ass lamented after Nurse Kramer had read her thermometer and discovered that the soldier in white was dead. He went to war, the fighter pilot with a golden mustache surmised. We all went to war, Dunbar countered. That's what I mean, the warrant officer with malaria continued. Why him? There just doesn't seem to be any logic to this system of rewards and punishment. Look what happened to me. If I had gotten syphilis or a dose of clap for my five minutes of passion on the beach— Instead of this damned mosquito bite, I could see some justice. But malaria? Malaria? Who can explain malaria as a consequence of fornication? The warrant officer shook his head in numb astonishment. What about me? Yossarian said. I stepped out of my tent in Marrakesh one night to get a bar of candy and caught your dose of clap when that whack I never even saw before hissed me into the bushes. All I really wanted was a bar of candy. But who could turn it down? That sounds like my dose of clap, all right, the warrant officer agreed. But I've still got somebody else's malaria. Just for once, I'd like to see all these things sort of straightened out, with each person getting exactly what he deserves. It might give me some confidence in this universe. I've got somebody else's $300,000, the dashing young fighter captain with the golden mustache admitted. I've been goofing off since the day I was born. 
I cheated my way through prep school and college, and just about all I've been doing ever since is shacking up with pretty girls who think I'd make a good husband. I've got no ambition at all. The only thing I want to do after the war is marry some girl who's got more money than I have and shack up with lots more pretty girls. The three hundred thousand bucks was left to me before I was born by a grandfather who made a fortune selling hogwash on an international scale. I know I don't deserve it, but I'll be damned if I give it back. I wonder who it really belongs to. Maybe it belongs to my father, Dunbar conjectured. He spent a lifetime at hard work and never could make enough money to even send my sister and me through college. He's dead now, so you might as well keep it. Now, if we can just find out who my malaria belongs to, we'd be all set. It's not that I've got anything against malaria. I just assume gold brick with malaria as with anything else. It's only that I feel an injustice has been committed. Why should I have somebody else's malaria and you have my dose of clap? I've got more than your dose of clap, Eusarian told him. I've got to keep flying combat missions because of that dose of yours until they kill me. That makes it even worse. What's the justice in that? I had a friend named Clevenger two and a half weeks ago who used to see plenty of justice in it. It's the highest kind of justice of all! Clevenger had gloated, clapping his hands with a merry laugh. I can't help thinking of the Hippolytus of Euripides, where the early licentiousness of Theseus is probably responsible for the asceticism of the sun that helps bring about the tragedy that ruins them all. If nothing else, that episode with a whack should teach you the evil of sexual immorality. It teaches me the evil of candy. Can't you see that you're not exactly without blame for the predicament you're in? Clevenger had continued, with undisguised relish. If you hadn't been laid up in the hospital with venereal disease for ten days back there in Africa, you might have finished your twenty-five missions in time to be sent home before Colonel Nevers was killed and Colonel Cathcart came to replace him. And what about you? Yossarian had replied. You never got clap in Marrakech, and you're in the same predicament. I don't know, confessed Clevenger, with a trace of mock. Concern. I guess I must have done something very bad in my time. Do you really believe that? Clevenger laughed. No, of course not. I just like to kid you along a little. There were too many dangers for Yossarian to keep track of. There was Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo, for example, and they were all out to kill him. There was Lieutenant Scheisskopf with his fanaticism for parades. And there was the bloated colonel with his big fat mustache and his fanaticism for retribution. And they wanted to kill him too. There was Appleby, Havermeyer, Black, and Corn. There was Nurse Kramer and Nurse Duckett, who he was almost certain wanted him dead. And there was the Texan and the CID man, about whom he had no doubt. There were bartenders, bricklayers, and bus conductors all over the world who wanted him dead. Landlords and tenants, traitors and patriots, lynchers, leeches, and lackeys, and they were all out to bump him off. That was the secret Snowden had spilled to him on the mission to Avignon. They were out to get him, and Snowden had spilled it all over the back of the plane. There were lymph glands that might do him in. There were kidneys, nerve sheets, and corpuscles. There were tumors of the brain. There was Hodgkin's disease, leukemia, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. There were fertile red meadows of epithelial tissue to catch and coddle a cancer cell. There were diseases of the skin, diseases of the bone, diseases of the lung, diseases of the stomach, diseases of the heart, blood, and arteries. There were diseases of the head, diseases of the neck, diseases of the chest, diseases of the intestines, diseases of the crotch. There even were diseases of the feet. There were billions of conscientious body cells oxidating away day and night like dumb animals at their complicated job of keeping them alive and healthy, 
and every one was a potential traitor and foe. There were so many diseases that it took a truly diseased mind to even think about them as often as he and Hungry Joe did. Hungry Joe collected lists of fatal diseases and arranged them in alphabetical order so that he could put his finger without delay on any one he wanted to worry about. He grew very upset whenever he misplaced some or when he could not add to his list, and he would go rushing in a cold sweat to Dr. Nika for help. Give him Ewing's tumor, Yossarian advised Dr. Nika, who would come to Yossarian for help in handling Hungry Joe. And follow it up with melanoma. Hungry Joe likes lingering diseases, but he likes the fulminating ones even more. Dr. Nika had never heard of either. How do you manage to keep up on so many diseases like that? He inquired with high professional esteem. I learn about them at the hospital when I study the Reader's Digest. Yossarian had so many ailments to be afraid of that he was sometimes tempted to turn himself into the hospital for good and spend the rest of his life stretched out there inside an oxygen tent with a battery of specialists and nurses seated at one side of his bed twenty-four hours a day waiting for something to go wrong and at least one surgeon with a knife poised at the other ready to jump forward and begin cutting away the moment it became necessary. Aneurysms, for instance. How else could they ever defend him in time against an aneurysm of the aorta? Yossarian felt much safer inside the hospital than outside the hospital, even though he loathed the surgeon and his knife as much as he had ever loathed anyone. He could start screaming inside a hospital, and people would at least come running to try to help. Outside the hospital, they would throw him in prison if he ever started screaming about all the things he felt everyone ought to start screaming about. Or they would put him in the hospital. One of the things he wanted to start screaming about was a surgeon's knife that was almost certain to be waiting for him and everyone else who lived long enough to die. He wondered often how he would ever recognize the first chill, flush, twinge, ache, belch, sneeze, stain, lethargy, vocal slip, loss of balance, or lapse of memory that would signal the inevitable beginning of the inevitable end. He was afraid also that Doc Danica would still refuse to help him when he went to him again after jumping out of Major Major's office, and he was right. You think you've got something to be afraid about? Dr. Nika demanded, lifting his delicate, immaculate, dark head up from his chest to gaze at Yossarian irascibly for a moment with lachrymose eyes. What about me? My precious medical skills are rusting away here on this lousy island while other doctors are cleaning up. Do you think I enjoy sitting here day after day refusing to help you? I wouldn't mind it so much if I could refuse to help you back in the States or in some place like Rome. But saying no to you here isn't easy for me, either. Then stop saying no. Ground me. I can't ground you, Dr. Nika mumbled. How many times do you have to be told? Yes, you can. Major Major told me you're the only one in the squadron who can ground me. Dr. Nika was stunned. Major Major told you that? When? When I tackled him in the ditch. Major Major told you that in a ditch? He told me in his office after we left the ditch and jumped inside. He told me not to tell anyone he told me, so don't start shooting your mouth off. Why, well, that dirty, scheming liar, Dr. Nika cried. He wasn't supposed to tell anyone. Did he tell you how I could ground you? just by filling out a little slip of paper saying I'm on the verge of a nervous collapse and sending it to group. Dr. Stubbs grounds men in his squadron all the time, so why can't you? What happens to the men after Stubbs does ground them? Dr. Nika retorted with a sneer. They go right back on combat status, don't they? And he finds himself right up the creek. Sure, I can ground you by filling out a slip saying you're unfit to fly, but there's a catch. Catch, 22? Sure. 
If I take you off combat duty, group has to approve my action. A group isn't going to. They'll put you right back on combat status, and then where will I be? On my way to the Pacific Ocean, probably. No, thank you. I'm not going to take any chances for you. Isn't it worth a try? Yossarian argued. What's so hot about Pianosa? Pianosa is terrible, but it's better than the Pacific Ocean. I wouldn't mind being shipped someplace civilized where I might pick up a buck or two in abortion money every now and then. But all they've got in the Pacific is jungles and monsoons. I'd rot there. You're rotting here. Dr. Nika flared up angrily. Yeah? Well, at least I'm going to come out of this war alive, which is a lot more than you're going to do. That's just what I'm trying to tell you, goddammit. I'm asking you to save my life. It's not my business to save lives, Dr. Nika retorted solemnly. What is your business? I don't know what my business is. All they ever told me was to uphold the ethics of my profession and never give testimony against another physician. Listen, you think you're the only one whose life is in danger? What about me? Those two quacks I've got working for me in the medical tent still can't find out what's wrong with me. Maybe it's Ewing's tumor, Yossarian muttered sarcastically. Do you really think so? Dr. Nika exclaimed with fright. Oh, I don't know. Yossarian answered impatiently. I just know I'm not going to fly any more missions. They wouldn't really shoot me, would they? I've got fifty-one. Why don't you at least finish the fifty-five before you take a stand? Dr. Nika advised. With all your bitching, you've never finished a tour of duty even once. How the hell can I? The colonel keeps raising them every time I get close. You never finish your missions because you keep running into the hospital or going off to Rome. You'd be in a much stronger position if you had your fifty-five finished and then refused to fly. Then maybe I'd see what I could do. Do you promise? I promise. What do you promise? I promise that maybe I'll think about doing something to help you if you finish your fifty-five missions and if you get McGuat to put my name on his flight log again so that I can draw my flight pay without going up in a plane. I'm afraid of airplanes. Did you read about that airplane crash in Idaho three weeks ago? Six people killed. It was terrible. I don't know why they want me to put in four hours flight time every month in order to get my flight pay. Don't I have enough to worry about without worrying about being killed in an airplane crash, too? I worry about airplane crashes also, Yossarian told him. You're not the only one. Yeah. But I'm also pretty worried about that Ewing's tumor, Dr. Nika boasted. Do you think that's why my nose is stuffed all the time? And why I always feel so chilly? Take my pulse. Yossarian also worried about Ewing's tumor and melanoma. Catastrophes were lurking everywhere, too numerous to count. When he contemplated the many diseases and potential accidents threatening him, he was positively astounded that he had managed to survive in good health for as long as he had. It was miraculous. Each day he faced was another dangerous mission against mortality, and he had been surviving them for twenty-eight years. Chapter 18 the Soldier Who Saw Everything Twice Yossarian owed his good health to exercise, fresh air, teamwork, and good sportsmanship. It was to get away from them all that he had first discovered the hospital. When the physical education officer at Lowry Field ordered everyone to fall out for calisthenics one afternoon, Yossarian, the private, reported instead at the dispensary with what he said was a pain in his right side. Beat it, said the doctor on duty there, who was doing a crossword puzzle. We can't tell him to beat it, said a corporal. There's a new directive out about abdominal complaints. We have to keep them under observation five days, because so many of them have been dying after we make them beat it. All right, grumbled the doctor. Keep them under observation for five days. 
and then make him beat it. They took Yasserian's clothes away and put him in a ward, where he was very happy when no one was snoring nearby. In the morning a helpful young English intern popped in to ask him about his liver. I think it's my appendix that's bothering me, Yossarian told him. Your appendix is no good, the Englishman declared with jaunty authority. If your appendix goes wrong, we can take it out and have you back on active duty in almost no time at all. But come to us with a liver complaint and you can fool us for weeks. The liver, you see, is a large, ugly mystery to us. If you've ever eaten liver, you know what I mean. We're pretty sure today that the liver exists, and we have a fairly good idea of what it does whenever it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Beyond that, we're really in the dark. After all, what is a liver? My father, for example, died of cancer of the liver and was never sick a day of his life right up till the moment it killed him. Never felt a twinge of pain. In a way, that was too bad, since I hated my father. Lust for my mother, you know. What's an English medical officer doing on duty here? The Assyrian wanted to know. The officer laughed. I'll tell you all about that when I see you tomorrow morning. And throw that silly ice bag away before you die of pneumonia. Yossarian never saw him again. That was one of the nice things about all the doctors at the hospital. He never saw any of them a second time. They came and went and simply disappeared. In place of the English intern, the next day there arrived a group of doctors he had never seen before to ask him about his appendix. There's nothing wrong with my appendix, Yossarian informed them. The doctor yesterday said it was my liver. Maybe it is his liver, replied the white-haired officer in charge. What does his blood count show? He hasn't had a blood count. Have one taken right away. We can't afford to take chances with a patient in his condition. We've got to keep ourselves covered in case he dies. He made a notation on his clipboard and spoke to Yossarian. In the meantime, keep that ice bag on. It's very important. I don't have an ice bag on. Well, get one. There must be an ice bag around here somewhere. And let someone know if the pain becomes unendurable. At the end of ten days, a new group of doctors came to Yossarian with bad news. He was in perfect health and had to get out. He was rescued in the nick of time by a patient across the aisle who began to see everything twice. Without warning, the patient sat up in bed and shouted, I see everything twice. A nurse screamed, and an orderly fainted. Doctors came running up from every direction with needles, lights, tubes, rubber mallets, and oscillating metal tines. They rolled up complicated instruments on wheels. There was not enough of the patient to go around and specialists pushed forward in line with raw tempers and snapped at their colleagues in front to hurry up and give somebody else a chance. A colonel with a large forehead and horn-rimmed glasses soon arrived at a diagnosis. "'It's meningitis,' he called out emphatically, waving the others back. "'Although Lord knows there's not the slightest reason for thinking so.' "'Then why pick meningitis?' inquired a major with a suave chuckle. Why not, let's say, acute nephritis? Because I'm a meningitis man, that's why, and not an acute nephritis man, retorted the colonel. And I'm not going to give him up to any of your kidney birds without a struggle. I was here first. In the end, the doctors were all in accord. They agreed they had no idea what was wrong with the soldier who saw everything twice and they rolled him away into a room in the corridor and quarantined everyone else in the ward for fourteen days. Thanksgiving Day came and went without any fuss while Yossarian was still in the hospital. The only bad thing about it was the turkey for dinner, and even that was pretty good. It was the most rational Thanksgiving he had ever spent, and he took a sacred oath to spend every future Thanksgiving Day in the cloistered shelter of a hospital.
He broke his sacred oath the very next year when he spent the holiday in a hotel room instead, in intellectual conversation with Lieutenant Scheisskopf's wife, who had Dory Duz's dog tags on for the occasion, and who henpecked Yossarian sententiously for being cynical and callous about Thanksgiving, even though she didn't believe in God just as much as he didn't. "'I'm probably just as good an atheist as you are,' she speculated boastfully. "'But even I feel that we all have a great deal to be thankful for "'and that we shouldn't be ashamed to show it.' "'Name one thing I've got to be thankful for.' "'Yossarian challenged her without interest. "'Well,' Lieutenant Scheiskopf's wife mused "'and paused a moment to ponder dubiously. "'Me?' "'Oh, come on,' he scoffed. "'She arched her eyebrows in surprise. "'Aren't you thankful for me?' she asked. She frowned peevishly, her pride wounded. "'I don't have to shack up with you, you know,' she told him with cold dignity. "'My husband has a whole squadron full of aviation cadets who would be only too happy to shack up with a commanding officer's wife just for the added fillip it would give them.' Yossarian decided to change the subject. "'Now you're changing the subject,' he pointed out diplomatically. I'll bet I can name two things to be miserable about for every one you can name to be thankful for. Be thankful you've got me, she insisted. I am, honey. But I'm also goddamn good and miserable that I can't have Dory does again, too. Or the hundreds of other girls and women I'll see and want in my short lifetime and won't be able to go to bed with even once. Be thankful you're healthy. Be better you're not going to stay that way. Be glad you're even alive. Be furious you're going to die. Things could be much worse, she cried. They could be one hell of a lot better, he answered heatedly. You're naming only one thing, she protested. You said you could name two. And don't tell me God works in mysterious ways, Yossarian continued, hurtling on over her objection. There's nothing so mysterious about it. He's not working at all. He's playing, or else he's forgotten all about us. That's the kind of guy you people talk about. A country bumpkin, a clumsy, bungling, brainless, conceited, uncouth hayseed. Good God, how much reverence can you have for a supreme being who finds it necessary to include such phenomena as phlegm and tooth decay in his divine system of creation? What in the world was running through that warped, evil, scatological mind of his when he robbed old people of the power to control their bowel movements. Why in the world did he ever create pain? Pain? Lieutenant Scheisskopf's wife pounced upon the word victoriously. Pain is a useful symptom. Pain is a warning to us of bodily dangers. And who created the dangers? Yossarian demanded. He laughed caustically. Oh, he was really being charitable to us when he gave us pain. Why couldn't he have used a doorbell instead to notify us? Or one of his celestial choirs? Or a system of blue and red neon tubes right in the middle of each person's forehead? Any jukebox manufacturer worth his salt could have done that. Why couldn't he? People would certainly look silly walking around with red neon tubes in the middle of their foreheads. They certainly look beautiful now, writhing in agony or stupefied with morphine, don't they? What a colossal, immortal blunderer. When you consider the opportunity and power he had to really do a job, and then look at the stupid, ugly little mess he made of it instead, his sheer incompetence is almost staggering. It's obvious he never met a payroll. Why, no self-respecting businessman would hire a bungler like him as even a shipping clerk. Lieutenant Scheisskopf's wife had turned ashen in disbelief and was ogling him with alarm. You'd better not talk that way about him, honey, she warned him reprovingly in a low and hostile voice. He might punish you. Isn't he punishing me enough? Yossarian snorted resentfully. You know, we mustn't let him get away with it. Oh, no, we certainly mustn't let him get away scot-free for all the sorrow he's caused us. Someday I'm going to make him pay. I know when. On the judgment day. Yeah, that's the day I'll be close enough to reach out and grab that little yokel by his neck and stop it. Stop it! 
Lieutenant Scheisskopf's wife screamed suddenly and began beating him ineffectually about the head with both fists. Stop it! Yossarian ducked behind his arm for protection while she slammed away at him in feminine fury for a few seconds, and then he caught her determinedly by the wrists and forced her gently back down on the bed. What the hell are you getting so upset about? he asked her bewilderedly in a tone of contrite amusement. I thought you didn't believe in God. I don't, she sobbed, bursting violently into tears. But the God, I don't believe it. He's a good God, a just God, a merciful God. He's not the mean and stupid God you make him out to be. <laughs> Yossarian laughed and turned her arms loose. Let's have a little more religious freedom between us, he proposed obligingly. You don't believe in the God you want to, and I won't believe in the God I want to. Is that a deal? That was the most illogical Thanksgiving he could ever remember spending, and his thoughts returned wishfully to his halcyon fourteen-day quarantine in the hospital the year before. But even that idol had ended on a tragic note. He was still in good health when the quarantine period was over, and they told him again that he had to get out and go to war. Yossarian sat up in bed when he heard the bad news and shouted, I see everything twice! Pandemonium broke loose in the ward again. The specialists came running up from all directions and ringed him in a circle of scrutiny so confining that he could feel the humid breath from their various noses blowing uncomfortably upon the different sectors of his body. They went snooping into his eyes and ears with tiny beams of light, assaulted his legs and feet with rubber hammers and vibrating forks, drew blood from his veins, held anything handy up for him to see on the periphery of his vision. The leader of this team of doctors was a dignified, solicitous gentleman who held one finger up directly in front of Yossarian and demanded, "'How many fingers do you see?' Two, said Yossarian. "'How many fingers do you see now?' asked the doctor, holding up two. Two, said Yossarian. "'And how many now?' asked the doctor, holding up none. Two, said Yossarian. The doctor's face wreathed with a smile. By Jove, he's right, he declared jubilantly. He does see everything twice. They rolled Yossarian away on a stretcher into the room with the other soldier who saw everything twice and quarantined everyone else in the ward for another fourteen days. I see everything twice, the soldier who saw everything twice shouted when they rolled Yossarian in. I see everything twice, Yossarian shouted back at him just as loudly with a secret wink. The walls! The walls! the other soldier cried. Move back the walls! The walls! The walls! Yossarian cried. Move back the walls! One of the doctors pretended to shove the wall back. Is that far enough? The soldier who saw everything twice nodded weakly and sank back on his bed. Yossarian nodded weakly, too eyeing his talented roommate with great humility and admiration. He knew he was in the presence of a master. His talented roommate was obviously a person to be studied and emulated. During the night, his talented roommate died, and Yossarian decided that he had followed him far enough. I see everything once, he cried quickly. A new group of specialists came pounding up to his bedside with their instruments to find out if it was true. How many fingers do you see? asked the leader, holding up one. One! The doctor held up two fingers. How many fingers do you see now? One! The doctor held up ten fingers. And how many now? One! The doctor turned to the other doctors with amazement. He does see everything once, he exclaimed. We made him all better. And just in time, too, announced the doctor with whom Yossarian next found himself alone, a tall, torpedo-shaped congenial man with an unshaven growth of brown beard and a pack of cigarettes in his shirt pocket that he chain-smoked insouciantly as he leaned against the wall. There are some relatives here to see you. Oh, don't worry, he added with a laugh. Not your relatives. It's the mother, father, and brother of that chap who died. They've traveled all the way from New York to see a dying soldier, and you're the handiest one we've got. 
What are you talking about? Yossarian asked suspiciously. I'm not dying. Of course you're dying. We're all dying. Where the devil else do you think you're heading? They didn't come to see me, Yossarian objected. They came to see their son. They'll have to take what they can get. As far as we're concerned, one dying boy is just as good as any other, or just as bad. To a scientist, all dying boys are equal. I have a proposition for you. You let them come in and look you over for a few minutes, and I won't tell anyone you've been lying about your liver symptoms. Yossarian drew back from him farther. You know about that? Of course I do. Give us some credit. The doctor chuckled amiably and lit another cigarette. How do you expect anyone to believe you have a liver condition if you keep squeezing the nurse's tits every time you get a chance? You're going to have to give up sex if you want to convince people you've got an ailing liver. That's a hell of a price to pay just to keep alive. Why didn't you turn me in if you knew I was faking? Why the devil should I? asked the doctor with a flicker of surprise. We're all in this business of illusion together. I'm always willing to lend a helping hand to a fellow conspirator along the road to survival if he's willing to do the same for me. These people have come a long way, and I'd rather not disappoint them. I'm sentimental about old people. But they came to see their son. They came too late. Maybe they won't even notice the difference. Suppose they start crying. They probably will start crying. That's one of the reasons they came. I'll listen just outside the door and break it up if it starts getting tacky. It all sounds a bit crazy, Yossarian reflected. What do they want to watch their son die for, anyway? I've never been able to figure that one out, the doctor admitted. But they always do. Well, what do you say? All you've got to do is lie there a few minutes and die a little. Is that asking so much? All right. Yossarian gave in. If it's just for a few minutes, and you promise to wait right outside. He warmed to his role. Say, why don't you wrap a bandage around me for effect? That sounds like a splendid idea, applauded the doctor. They wrapped a batch of bandages around Yossarian. A team of medical orderlies installed tan shades on each of the two windows and lowered them to douse the room in depressing shadows. Yossarian suggested flowers, and the doctor sent an orderly out to find two small bunches of fading ones with a strong and sickening smell. When everything was in place, they made Yossarian get back into bed and lie down. Then they admitted the visitors. The visitors entered uncertainly as though they felt they were intruding, tiptoeing in with stares of meek apology. First the grieving mother and father... Then the brother, a glowering, heavy-set sailor with a deep chest. The man and woman stepped into the room stiffly, side by side, as though right out of a familiar, though esoteric, anniversary daguerreotype on a wall. They were both short, sere, and proud. They seemed made of iron and old, dark clothing. The woman had a long, brooding, oval face of burnt umber, with coarse graying black hair parted severely in the middle and combed back austerely behind her neck without curl, wave, or ornamentation. Her mouth was sullen and sad, her lined lips compressed. The father stood very rigid and quaint in a double-breasted suit with padded shoulders that were much too tight for him. He was broad and muscular, on a small scale, and had a magnificently curled silver mustache on his crinkled face. His eyes were creased and roomy, and he appeared tragically ill at ease as he stood awkwardly with the brim of his black felt fedora held in his two brawny laborers' hands out in front of his wide lapels. Poverty and hard work had inflicted iniquitous damage on both. The brother was looking for a fight. His round white cap was cocked in an insolent tilt. His hands were clenched, and he glared at everything in the room with a scowl of injured truculence. The three creaked forward timidly, holding themselves close to each other in a stealthy funereal group, and inching forward almost in step until they arrived at the side of the bed and stood staring down at Yossarian. There was a gruesome 
and excruciating silence that threatened to endure forever. Finally, Yossarian was unable to bear it any longer and cleared his throat. The old man spoke at last. He looks terrible, he said. He's sick, Pa. Giuseppe, said the mother, who had seated herself in a chair with her veiny fingers clasped in her lap. My name is Yossarian, Yossarian said. His name is Yossarian, Ma. Yossarian, don't you recognize me? I'm your brother, John. Don't you know who I am? Sure I do. You're my brother, John. He does recognize me. Pa, he knows who I am. Yossarian, here's Papa. Say hello to Papa. Hello, Papa, said Yossarian. Hello, Giuseppe. His name is Yossarian, Pa. I can't get over how terrible he looks, the father said. He's very sick, Pa. The doctor says he's going to die. I didn't know whether to believe the doctor or not, the father said. You know how crooked those guys are. Giuseppe, the mother said again, in a soft, broken chord of muted anguish. His name is Yossarian, Ma. She don't remember things too good any more. How are they treating you in here, kid? They treating you pretty good? Pretty good, Yossarian told him. That's good. Just don't let anybody in here push you around. You're just as good as anybody else in here, even though you are Italian. You got rights, too. Yossarian winced and closed his eyes so that he would not have to look at his brother John. He began to feel sick. Now see how terrible he looks, the father observed. Giuseppe, the mother said. Ma, his name is Yossarian, the brother interrupted her impatiently. Can't you remember? It's all right, Yossarian interrupted him. She can call me Giuseppe if she wants to. Giuseppe, she said to him. Don't worry, Yossarian, the brother said. Everything is going to be all right. Don't worry, Ma, Yossarian said. Everything is going to be all right. Did you have a priest? The brother wanted to know. Yes. Yossarian lied, wincing again. That's good, the brother decided. Just as long as you're getting everything you've got coming to you. We came all the way from New York. We were afraid we wouldn't get here in time. In time for what? In time to see you before you died. What difference would it make? We didn't want you to die by yourself. What difference would it make? He must be getting delirious, the brother said. He keeps saying the same thing over and over again. That's really very funny, the old man replied. All the time I thought his name was Giuseppe, and now I find out his name is Yossarian. That's really very funny. Ma, make him feel good, the brother urged. Say something to cheer him up. Giuseppe. It's not Giuseppe, Ma. It's Yossarian. What difference does it make? The mother answered in the same mourning tone without looking up. He's dying. Her tumid eyes filled with tears, and she began to cry, rocking back and forth slowly in her chair, with her hands lying in her lap like fallen moths. Yossarian was afraid she would start wailing. The father and brother began crying also. Yossarian remembered suddenly why they were all crying, and he began crying too. A doctor Yossarian had never seen before stepped inside the room and told the visitors courteously that they had to go. The father drew himself up formally to say goodbye. Giuseppe, he began. Yossarian, corrected the son. Yossarian, said the father. Giuseppe, corrected Yossarian. Soon you're going to die. Yossarian began to cry again. The doctor threw him a dirty look from the rear of the room, and Yossarian made himself stop. The father continued solemnly with his head lowered. When you talk to the man upstairs, he said, I want you to tell him something for me. Tell him it ain't right for people to die when they're young. I mean it. Tell him if they got to die at all, they got to die when they're old. I want you to tell him that. I don't think he knows it ain't right, because he's supposed to be good, and it's been going on for a long, long time. Okay? 
And don't let anybody up there push you around, the brother advised. You'll be just as good as anybody else in heaven, even though you are Italian. Dress warm, said the mother, who seemed to know. This book is continued on Disc 7. Disc 7 Chapter 19 Colonel Cathcart Colonel Cathcart was a slick, successful, slipshod, unhappy man of thirty-six, who lumbered when he walked and wanted to be a general. He was dashing and dejected, poised and chagrined. He was complacent and insecure, daring in the administrative stratagems he employed to bring himself to the attention of his superiors, and craven in his concern that his schemes might all backfire. He was handsome and unattractive, a swashbuckling, beefy, conceited man who was putting on fat and was tormented chronically by prolonged seizures of apprehension. Colonel Cathcart was conceited because he was a full colonel with a combat command at the age of only thirty-six. And Colonel Cathcart was dejected because, although he was already thirty-six, he was still only a full colonel. Colonel Cathcart was impervious to absolutes. He could measure his own progress only in relationship to others, and his idea of excellence was to do something at least as well as all the men his own age who were doing the same thing even better. The fact that there were thousands of men his own age and older who had not even attained the rank of major enlivened him with foppish delight in his own remarkable worth. On the other hand, the fact that there were men of his own age and younger who were already generals contaminated him with an agonizing sense of failure and made him gnaw at his fingernails with an unappeasable anxiety that was even more intense than Hungry Joe's. Colonel Cathcart was a very large, pouting, broad-shouldered man with close-cropped curly dark hair that was graying at the tips and an ornate cigarette holder that he purchased the day before he arrived in Pianosa to take command of his group. He displayed the cigarette holder grandly on every occasion and had learned to manipulate it adroitly. Unwittingly, he had discovered deep within himself a fertile aptitude for smoking with a cigarette holder. As far as he could tell, his was the only cigarette holder in the whole Mediterranean theater of operations, and the thought was both flattering and disquieting. He had no doubts at all that someone as debonair and intellectual as General Peckham approved of his smoking with the cigarette holder, even though the two were in each other's presence rather seldom, which in a way was very lucky, Colonel Cathcart recognized with relief since General Peckham might not have approved of his cigarette holder at all. When such misgivings assailed Colonel Cathcart, he choked back a sob and wanted to throw the damn thing away. But he was restrained by his unswerving conviction that the cigarette holder never failed to embellish his masculine martial physique with a high gloss of sophisticated heroism that illuminated him to dazzling advantage among all the other full colonels in the American army with whom he was in competition. Although, how could he be sure? Colonel Cathcart was indefatigable that way, an industrious, intense, dedicated military tactician who calculated day and night in the service of himself. He was his own sarcophagus, a bold and infallible diplomat who was always berating himself disgustedly for all the chances he had missed and kicking himself regretfully for all the errors he had made. He was tense, irritable, bitter, and smug. He was a valorous opportunist who pounced hoggishly upon every opportunity Colonel Corn discovered for him and trembled in damp despair immediately afterward at the possible consequences he might suffer. He collected rumors greedily and treasured gossip. He believed all the news he heard and had faith in none. He was on the alert constantly for every signal, shrewdly sensitive to relationships and situations that did not exist. He was someone in the know, who was always striving pathetically to find out what was going on. He was a blustering, intrepid bully, who brooded inconsolably over the terrible, 
ineradicable impressions he knew he kept making on people of prominence who were scarcely aware that he was even alive. Everybody was persecuting him. Colonel Cathcart lived by his wits in an unstable, arithmetical world of black eyes and feathers in his cap, of overwhelming imaginary triumphs and catastrophic imaginary defeats. He oscillated hourly between anguish and exhilaration, multiplying fantastically the grandeur of his victories and exaggerating tragically the seriousness of his defeats. Nobody ever caught him napping. If word reached him that General Dreedle or General Peckham had been seen smiling, frowning, or doing neither, he could not make himself rest until he had found an acceptable interpretation and grumbled mulishly until Colonel Corn persuaded him to relax and take things easy. Lieutenant Colonel Corn was a loyal, indispensable ally who got on Colonel Cathcart's nerves. Colonel Cathcart pledged eternal gratitude to Colonel Corn for the ingenious moves he devised, and was furious with him afterward when he realized they might not work. Colonel Cathcart was greatly indebted to Colonel Corn, and did not like him at all. The two were very close. Colonel Cathcart was jealous of Colonel Corn's intelligence, and had to remind himself often that Colonel Corn was still only a lieutenant colonel, even though he was almost ten years older than Colonel Cathcart, and that Colonel Corn had obtained his education at a state university. Colonel Cathcart bewailed the miserable fate that had given him for an invaluable assistant someone as common as Colonel Corn. It was degrading to have to depend so thoroughly on a person who had been educated at a state university. If someone did have to become indispensable to him, Colonel Cathcart lamented, it could just as easily have been someone wealthy and well-groomed, someone from a better family, who was more mature than Colonel Corn, and who did not treat Colonel Cathcart's desire to become a general as frivolously as Colonel Cathcart secretly suspected Colonel Corn secretly did. Colonel Cathcart wanted to be a general so desperately he was willing to try anything, even religion and he summoned the chaplain to his office late one morning, the week after he had raised the number of missions to sixty, and pointed abruptly down toward his desk to his copy of The Saturday Evening Post. The colonel wore his khaki shirt collar wide open, exposing a shadow of tough black bristles of beard on his egg-white neck, and had a spongy hanging underlip. He was a person who never tanned, and he kept out of the sun as much as possible to avoid burning. The colonel was more than a head taller than the chaplain, and over twice as broad, and his swollen, overbearing authority made the chaplain feel frail and sickly by contrast. "'Take a look, chaplain,' Colonel Cathcart directed, screwing a cigarette into his holder and seating himself affluently in the swivel chair behind his desk. "'Let me know what you think.' The chaplain looked down at the open magazine compliantly, and saw an editorial spread dealing with an American bomber group in England whose chaplain said prayers in the briefing room before each mission. The chaplain almost wept with happiness when he realized the colonel was not going to holler at him. The two had hardly spoken since the tumultuous evening Colonel Cathcart had thrown him out of the officers' club at General Dreedle's bidding, after Chief White Half-Oat had punched Colonel Moodis in the nose. The chaplain's initial fear had been that the colonel intended reprimanding him for having gone back into the officers' club without permission the evening before. He had gone there with Yossarian and Dunbar, after the two had come unexpectedly to his tent in the clearing in the woods, to ask him to join them. Intimidated as he was by Colonel Cathcart, he nevertheless found it easier to brave his displeasure than to decline the thoughtful invitation of his two new friends, whom he had met on one of his hospital visits just a few weeks before, and who had worked so effectively to insulate him against the myriad social vicissitudes involved in his official duty to live on closest terms of familiarity with more than nine hundred unfamiliar officers and enlisted men who thought him an odd duck. The chaplain glued his eyes to the pages of the magazine. He studied each photograph twice, and read the captions intently as he organized his response to the colonel's question into a grammatically complete sentence that he rehearsed 
and reorganized in his mind a considerable number of times before he was able finally to muster the courage to reply. I think that saying prayers before each mission is a very moral and highly laudatory procedure, sir, he offered timidly, and waited. Yeah, said the colonel, but I want to know if you think they'll work here. Yes, sir, answered the chaplain after a few moments. I should think they would. Then I'd like to give it a try. The colonel's ponderous, farinaceous cheeks were tinted suddenly with glowing patches of enthusiasm. He rose to his feet and began walking around excitedly. Look how much good they've done for these people in England. Here's a picture of a colonel in the Saturday Evening Post whose chaplain conducts prayers before each mission. If the prayers work for him, they should work for us. Maybe if we say prayers, they'll put my picture in the Saturday Evening Post. The colonel sat down again and smiled distantly in lavish contemplation. The chaplain had no hint of what he was expected to say next. With a pensive expression on his oblong, rather pale face, he allowed his gaze to settle on several of the high bushels filled with red plum tomatoes that stood in rows against each of the walls. He pretended to concentrate on a reply. After a while, he realized that he was staring at rows and rows of bushels of red plum tomatoes, and grew so intrigued by the question of what bushels brimming with red plum tomatoes were doing in a group commander's office that he forgot completely about the discussion of prayer meetings until Colonel Cathcart, in a genial digression, inquired, Would you like to buy some, chaplain? They come right off the farm Colonel Corn and I have up in the hills. I can let you have a bushel wholesale. Oh, no, sir, I don't think so. That's quite all right, the colonel assured him liberally. You don't have to. Milo is glad to snap up all we can produce. These were picked only yesterday. Notice how firm and ripe they are, like a young girl's breasts. The chaplain blushed, and the colonel understood at once that he had made a mistake. He lowered his head in shame, his cumbersome face burning. His fingers felt gross and unwieldy. He hated the chaplain venomously for being a chaplain and making a coarse blunder out of an observation that, in any other circumstances he knew, would have been considered witty and urbane. He tried miserably to recall some means of extricating them both from that devastating embarrassment. He recalled instead that the chaplain was only a captain— and he straightened at once with a shocked and outraged gasp. His cheeks grew tight with fury at the thought that he had just been duped into humiliation by a man who was almost the same age as he was and still only a captain, and he swung upon the chaplain avengingly with a look of such murderous antagonism that the chaplain began to tremble. The colonel punished him sadistically with a long glowering, malignant, hateful, silent stare. We were speaking about something else, he reminded the chaplain cuttingly at last. We were not speaking about the firm, ripe breasts of young girls, but about something else entirely. We were speaking about conducting religious services in the briefing room before each mission. Is there any reason why we can't? No, sir. The chaplain mumbled. Then we'll begin with this afternoon's mission. The colonel's hostility softened gradually as he applied himself to details. Now, I want you to give a lot of thought to the kind of prayers we're going to say. I don't want anything heavy or sad. I'd like you to keep it light and snappy, something that will send the boys out feeling pretty good. You know what I mean? I don't want any of this kingdom of God or valley of death stuff. That's all too negative. What are you making such a sour face for? Uh, I'm sorry, sir, the chaplain stammered. I, I happened to be thinking of the 23rd Psalm just as you said that. How does that one go? That's the one you were just referring to, sir. The Lord is my shepherd. I That's the one I was just referring to. It's out. What else have you got? Save me, O oh God, for the waters are coming in under— No waters, the colonel decided, blowing ruggedly into his cigarette holder after flipping the butt down into his combed brass ashtray. Why don't we try something musical? How about the hops on the willows? That has the rivers of Babylon in it, sir, the chaplain reminded. 
There we sat down, yea, we wept, when we remembered Zion. Zion? Let's forget about that one right now. I'd like to know how that one even got in there. Haven't you got anything humorous that stays away from waters and valleys and God? I'd like to keep away from the subject of religion altogether, if we can. The chaplain was apologetic. I'm sorry, sir, but just about all the prayers I know are rather somber in tone and make at least some passing reference to God. Then let's get some new ones. The men are already doing enough bitching about the missions I send them on without our rubbing it in with any sermons about God or death or paradise. Why can't we take a more positive approach? Why can't we all pray for something good, like a tighter bomb pattern, for example? Couldn't we pray for a tighter bomb pattern? Well, yes, sir, I, I suppose so, the chaplain answered hesitantly. You wouldn't even need me if that's all you wanted to do. You could do that yourself. I know I could, the colonel responded tartly. But what do you think you're here for? I could shop for my own food, too, but that's Milo's job, and that's why he's doing it for every group in the area. Your job is to lead us in prayer, and from now on you're going to lead us in a prayer for a tighter bomb pattern before every mission. Is that clear? I think a tighter bomb pattern is something really worth praying for. It will be a feather in all our caps with General Peckham. General Peckham feels it makes a much nicer aerial photograph when the bombs explode close together. General Peckham, sir? That's right, chaplain, the colonel replied, chuckling paternally at the chaplain's look of puzzlement. I wouldn't want this to get around, but it looks like General Dreedel is finally on the way out, and that General Peckham is slated to replace him. Frankly, I'm not going to be sorry to see that happen. General Peckham is a very good man, and I think we'll all be much better off under him. On the other hand, it might never take place, and we'd still remain under General Dreedel. Frankly, I wouldn't be sorry to see that happen either, because General Dreedel is another very good man, and I think we'll all be much better off under him, too. I hope you're going to keep all this under your hat, Chaplain. I wouldn't want either one to get the idea I was throwing my support on the side of the other. Yes, sir. That's good, the colonel exclaimed, and stood up jovially. But all this gossip isn't getting us into the Saturday evening post, eh, chaplain? Let's see what kind of procedure we can evolve. Incidentally, chaplain, not a word about this beforehand to Colonel Corn. Understand? Yes, sir. Colonel Cathcart began tramping back and forth reflectively in the narrow corridors left between his bushels of plum tomatoes and the desk and wooden chairs in the center of the room. I suppose we'll have to keep you waiting outside until the briefing is over, because all that information is classified. We can slip you in while Major Danby is synchronizing the watches. I don't think there's anything secret about the right time. We'll allocate a, about a minute and a half for you in the schedule. Will a minute and a half be enough? Yes, sir. If it doesn't include the time necessary to excuse the atheists from the room and admit the enlisted men. Colonel Cathcart stopped in his tracks. What atheists? he bellowed defensively, his whole manner changing in a flash to one of virtuous and belligerent denial. There are no atheists in my outfit. Atheism is against the law, isn't it? No, sir. It isn't? The colonel was surprised. Then it's un-American, isn't it? I'm not sure, sir, answered the chaplain. Well, I am the colonel declared. I'm not going to disrupt our religious services just to accommodate a bunch of lousy atheists. They're getting no special privileges from me. They can stay right where they are and pray with the rest of us. And what's all this about enlisted men? Just how the hell do they get into this act? The chaplain felt his face flush. I'm sorry, sir. I, I just assumed you would want the enlisted men to be present since they would be going along on the same mission. Well, I don't. They've got a god and a chaplain of their own, haven't they? No, sir. What are you talking about? You mean they, they pray to the same god we do? Yes, sir. And he listens? I think so, sir. Well, I'll be damned, remarked the colonel, and he snorted to himself in quizzical amusement. His spirits drooped suddenly a moment later, and he ran his hand nervously over his short, black, graying curls. You really think it's a good idea to let the enlisted men in? 
he asked with concern. I should think it only proper, sir. I'd like to keep them out, confided the colonel, and began cracking his knuckles savagely as he wandered back and forth. Oh, don't get me wrong, chaplain. It isn't that I think the enlisted men are dirty, common, and inferior. It's that we just don't have enough room. Frankly, though, I just assume the officers and enlisted men didn't fraternize in the briefing room. They see enough of each other during the mission, it seems to me. Some of my very best friends are enlisted men, you understand, but that's about as close as I care to let them come. Honestly, now, chaplain, you wouldn't want your sister to marry an enlisted man, would you? My sister is an enlisted man, sir, the chaplain replied. The colonel stopped in his tracks again, and eyed the chaplain sharply to make certain he was not being ridiculed. Just what do you mean by that remark, chaplain? Are you trying to be funny? Oh, no, sir, the chaplain hastened to explain with a look of excruciating discomfort. She's a master sergeant in the Marines. The colonel had never liked the chaplain, and now he loathed and distrusted him. He experienced a keen premonition of danger, and wondered if the chaplain, too, was plotting against him, if the chaplain's reticent, unimpressive manner was really just a sinister disguise, masking a fiery ambition that, way down deep, was crafty and unscrupulous. There was something funny about the chaplain, and the colonel soon detected what it was. The chaplain was standing stiffly at attention, but the colonel had forgotten to put him at ease. Let him stay that way, the colonel decided vindictively, just to show him who was boss and to safeguard himself against any loss of dignity that might devolve from his acknowledging the omission. Colonel Cathcart was drawn hypnotically toward the window with a massive, dull stare of moody introspection. The enlisted men were always treacherous, he decided. He looked downward in mournful gloom at the skeet-shooting range he had already built for the officers on his headquarters staff, and he recalled the mortifying afternoon General Dreedle had tongue-lashed him ruthlessly in front of Colonel Corn and Major Danby and ordered him to throw open the range to all the enlisted men and officers on combat duty. The skeet-shooting range had been a real black eye for him, Colonel Cathcart was forced to conclude. He was positive that General Dreedle had never forgotten it, even though he was positive that General Dreedle didn't even remember it, which was really very unjust, Colonel Cathcart lamented, since the idea of a skeet-shooting range itself should have been a real feather in his cap, even though it had been such a real black eye. Colonel Cathcart was helpless to assess exactly how much ground he had gained or lost with his goddamn skeet-shooting range, and wished that Colonel Corn were in his office right then to evaluate the entire episode for him still one more time and assuage his fears. It was all very perplexing, all very discouraging. Colonel Cathcart took the cigarette holder out of his mouth, stood it on end inside the pocket of his shirt, and began gnawing on the fingernails of both hands grievously. Everybody was against him, and he was sick to his soul that Colonel Corn was not with him in this moment of crisis to help him decide what to do about the prayer meetings. He had almost no faith at all in the chaplain, who was still only a captain. "'Do you think,' he asked, "'that keeping the enlisted men out might interfere with our chances of getting results?' The chaplain hesitated, feeling himself on unfamiliar ground again, Yes, sir, he replied finally. I think it's conceivable that such an action could interfere with your chances of having the prayers for a tighter bomb pattern answered. I wasn't even thinking about that, cried the colonel, with his eyes blinking and splashing like puddles. You mean that God might even decide to punish me by giving us a looser bomb pattern? Yes, sir, said the chaplain. It's conceivable he might. The hell with it, then! the colonel asserted in a huff of independence. I'm not going to set these damn prayer meetings up just to make things worse than they are. With a scornful snicker, he settled himself behind his desk, replaced the empty cigarette holder in his mouth, and lapsed into parturient silence for a few moments. Now that I think about it, he confessed, as much to himself as to the chaplain, having the men pray to God probably wasn't such a hot idea anyway. 
the editors of the Saturday Evening Post might not have cooperated. The colonel abandoned his project with remorse, for he had conceived it entirely on his own, and had hoped to unveil it as a striking demonstration to everyone that he had no real need for Colonel Corn. Once it was gone, he was glad to be rid of it, for he had been troubled from the start by the danger of instituting the plan without first checking it out with Colonel Corn. He heaved an immense sigh of contentment. He had a much higher opinion of himself now that his idea was abandoned, for he had made a very wise decision, he felt, and, most important, he had made this wise decision without consulting Colonel Corn. "'Will that be all, sir?' asked the chaplain. "'Yeah.' said Colonel Cathcart, unless you've got something else to suggest. No, sir, only— The colonel lifted his eyes as though affronted and studied the chaplain with aloof distrust. Only what, chaplain? Sir, said the chaplain, some of the men are, are very upset since you raised the number of missions to sixty. They've asked me to speak to you about it. The colonel was silent. The chaplain's face reddened to the roots of his sandy hair as he waited. The colonel kept him squirming a long time, with a fixed, uninterested look devoid of all emotion. "'Tell them there's a war going on,' he advised finally, in a flat voice. "'Thank you, sir, I will,' the chaplain replied in a flood of gratitude, because the colonel had finally said something. They were wondering why you couldn't requisition some of the replacement crews that are waiting in Africa to take their places and then let them go home. That's an administrative matter, the colonel said. It's none of their business. He pointed languidly toward the wall. Help yourself to a plum tomato, chaplain. Go ahead, it's on me. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, don't mention it. How do you like living out there in the woods, chaplain? Is everything hunky-dory? Yes, sir. That's good. You get in touch with us if you need anything. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, th thanks for dropping around, chaplain. I've got some work to do now. You'll let me know if you can think of anything for getting our names into the Saturday Evening Post, won't you? Yes, sir. I will. The chaplain braced himself with a prodigious effort of the will and plunged ahead brazenly. I'm particularly concerned about the condition of one of the bombardiers, sir. Yossarian. The colonel glanced up quickly with a start of vague recognition. Who? he asked in alarm. Yossarian, sir. Yossarian? Yes, sir, Yossarian. He's in a very bad way, sir. I'm afraid he won't be able to suffer much longer without doing something desperate. Is that a fact, chaplain? Yes, sir, I'm afraid it is. The colonel thought about it in heavy silence for a few moments. Tell him to trust in God. He advised finally. Thank you, sir, said the chaplain. I will. Chapter 20 Corporal Whitcomb The late August morning sun was hot and steamy, and there was no breeze on the balcony. The chaplain moved slowly. He was downcast and burdened with self-reproach when he stepped without noise from the colonel's office on his rubber-soled and rubber-heeled brown shoes. He hated himself for what he construed to be his own cowardice. He had intended to make a much stronger stand with Colonel Cathcart on the matter of the sixty missions, to speak out with courage, logic, and eloquence on a subject about which he had begun to feel very deeply. Instead, he had failed miserably, had choked up once again in the face of opposition from a stronger personality. It was a familiar, ignominious experience, and his opinion of himself was low. He choked up even more a second later when he spied Colonel Corn's tubbing, monochrome figure trotting up the curved, wide, yellow stone staircase toward him in lackadaisical haste from the great dilapidated lobby below, with its lofty walls of cracked dark marble and circular floor of cracked grimy tile. The chaplain was even more frightened of Colonel Corn than he was of Colonel Cathcart. The swarthy middle-aged lieutenant colonel with the rimless icy glasses and faceted bald dome-like pate that he was always touching sensitively with the tips of his splayed fingers disliked the chaplain and was impolite to him frequently. 
He kept the chaplain in a constant state of terror with his curt, derisive tongue and his knowing, cynical eyes that the chaplain was never brave enough to meet for more than an accidental second. Inevitably, the chaplain's attention, as he cowered meekly before him, focused on Colonel Korn's midriff, with the shirt-tails bunching up from inside his sagging belt and ballooning down over his waist, gave him an appearance of slovenly girth and made him seem inches shorter than his middle height. Colonel Korn was an untidy, disdainful man with an oily skin and deep, hard lines running almost straight down from his nose between his crepuscular jowls and his square, clefted chin. His face was dour, and he glanced at the chaplain without recognition as the two drew close on the staircase and prepared to pass. "'Hiya, father,' he said tonelessly, without looking at the chaplain. "'How's it going?' "'Good morning, sir,' the chaplain replied, discerning wisely that Colonel Corn expected nothing more in the way of a response." Colonel Korn was proceeding up the stairs without slackening his pace, and the chaplain resisted the temptation to remind him again that he was not a Catholic but an Anabaptist, and that it was therefore neither necessary nor correct to address him as father. He was almost certain now that Colonel Korn remembered, and that calling him father with a look of such bland innocence was just another one of Colonel Korn's methods of taunting him because he was only an Anabaptist. Colonel Korn halted without warning when he was almost by and came whirling back down upon the chaplain with a glare of infuriated suspicion. The chaplain was petrified. "'What are you doing with that plum tomato, chaplain?' Colonel Korn demanded roughly. The chaplain looked down his arm with surprise at the plum tomato Colonel Cathcart had invited him to take. "'I got it in Colonel Cathcart's office, sir,' he managed to reply. "'Does the colonel know you took it?' "'Yes, sir.' He gave it to me. Oh, in that case, I guess it's okay, Colonel Korn said, mollified. He smiled without warmth, jabbing the crumpled folds of his shirt back down inside his trousers with his thumbs. His eyes glinted keenly with a private and satisfying mischief. What did Colonel Cathcart want to see you about, father? He asked suddenly. The chaplain was tongue-tied with indecision for a moment. I don't think I ought saying prayers to the editors of the Saturday Evening Post. The chaplain almost smiled. Yes, sir. Colonel Korn was enchanted with his own intuition. He laughed disparagingly. You know, I was afraid he'd begin thinking about something so ridiculous as soon as he saw this week's Saturday Evening Post. I hope you succeeded in showing him what an atrocious idea it is. He has decided against it, sir. That's good. I'm glad you convinced them that the editors of the Saturday Evening Post were not likely to run that same story twice just to give some publicity to some obscure colonel. How are things in the wilderness, Father? Are you able to manage out there? Yes, sir. Everything is working out. That's good. I'm happy to hear you have nothing to complain about. Let us know if you need anything to make you comfortable. We all want you to have a good time out there. Thank you, sir. I will. Noise of a growing stir rose from the lobby below. It was almost lunchtime, and the earliest arrivals were drifting into the headquarters mess halls, the enlisted men and officers separating into different dining halls on facing sides of the archaic rotunda. Colonel Korn stopped smiling. "'You had lunch with us here just a day or so ago, didn't you, father?' he asked meaningfully. "'Yes, sir, the day before yesterday.' "'That's what I thought.' Colonel Korn said, and paused to let his point sink in. Well, take it easy, father. I'll see you around when it's time for you to eat here again. Thank you, sir. The chaplain was not certain at which of the five officers and five enlisted men's mess halls he was scheduled to have lunch that day, for the system of rotation worked out for him by Colonel Korn was complicated, and he had forgotten his records back in his tent. The chaplain was the only officer attached to group headquarters who did not reside in the moldering redstone group headquarters building itself, or in any of the smaller satellite structures that rose about the grounds in disjuncted relationship. The chaplain lived in a clearing in the woods, about four miles away, between the officers' club and the first of the four squadron areas that stretched away from group headquarters in a distant line. 
The chaplain lived alone in a spacious square tent that was also his office. Sounds of revelry traveled to him at night from the officers' club and kept him awake often as he turned and tossed on his cot in passive, half-voluntary exile. He was not able to gauge the effect of the mild pills he took occasionally to help him sleep and felt guilty about for days afterward. The only one who lived with the chaplain in his clearing in the woods was Corporal Whitcomb, his assistant. Corporal Whitcomb, an atheist, was a disgruntled subordinate who felt he could do the chaplain's job much better than the chaplain was doing it and viewed himself, therefore, as an underprivileged victim of social inequity. He lived in a tent of his own, as spacious and square as the chaplain's. He was openly rude and contemptuous to the chaplain once he discovered that the chaplain would let him get away with it. The borders of the two tents in the clearing stood no more than four or five feet apart. It was Colonel Corn who had mapped out this way of life for the chaplain. One good reason for making the chaplain live outside the group headquarters building was Colonel Corn's theory that dwelling in a tent, as most of his parishioners did, would bring him into closer communication with them. Another good reason was the fact that having the chaplain around headquarters all the time made the other officers uncomfortable. It was one thing to maintain liaison with the Lord, and they were all in favor of that. It was something else, though, to have him hanging around twenty-four hours a day. All in all, as Colonel Corn described it to Major Danby, the jittery and goggle-eyed group operations officer, the chaplain had it pretty soft. He had little more to do than listen to the troubles of others, bury the dead, visit the bedridden, and conduct religious services. And there were not so many dead for him to bury any more, Colonel Korn pointed out, since opposition from German fighter planes had virtually ceased, and since close to ninety percent of what fatalities there still were, he estimated, perished behind the enemy lines or disappeared inside clouds. But the chaplain had nothing to do with disposing of the remains. The religious services were certainly no great strain either, since they were conducted only once a week at the group headquarters building and were attended by very few of the men. Actually, the chaplain was learning to love it in his clearing in the woods. Both he and Corporal Whitcomb had been provided with every convenience, so that neither might ever plead discomfort as a basis for seeking permission to return to the headquarters building. The chaplain rotated his breakfasts, lunches, and dinners in separate sets among the eight squadron mess halls, and ate every fifth meal in the enlisted men's mess at group headquarters, and every tenth meal at the officers' mess there. Back home in Wisconsin, the chaplain had been very fond of gardening, and his heart welled with a glorious impression of fertility and fruition each time he contemplated the low, prickly boughs of the stunted trees and the waist-high weeds and thickets by which he was almost walled in. In the spring he had longed to plant begonias and zinnias in a narrow bed around his tent, but he had been deterred by his fear of Corporal Whitcomb's rancor. The chaplain relished the privacy and isolation of his verdant surroundings, and the reveries and meditation that living there fostered. Fewer people came to him with their troubles than formerly, and he allowed himself a measure of gratitude for that, too. The chaplain did not mix freely, and was not comfortable in conversation. He missed his wife and his three small children, and she missed him. What displeased Corporal Whitcomb most about the chaplain— apart from the fact that the chaplain believed in God, was his lack of initiative and aggressiveness. Corporal Whitcomb regarded the low attendance at religious services as a sad reflection of his own status. His mind germinated feverishly with challenging new ideas for sparking the great spiritual revival of which he dreamed himself the architect. Box lunches, church socials, form letters to the families of men killed and injured in combat, censorship. Bingo! But the chaplain blocked him. Corporal Whitcomb bridled with vexation beneath the chaplain's restraint, for he spied room for improvement everywhere. It was people like the chaplain, he concluded, who were responsible for giving religion such a bad name and making pariahs out of them both. Unlike the chaplain, Corporal Whitcomb detested the seclusion of the clearing in the woods, 
One of the first things he intended to do after he deposed the chaplain was move back into the group headquarters building, where he could be right in the thick of things. When the chaplain drove back into the clearing after leaving Colonel Corn, Corporal Whitcomb was outside in the muggy haze, talking in conspiratorial tones to a strange, chubby man in a maroon corduroy bathrobe and gray flannel pajamas. The chaplain recognized the bathrobe and pajamas as official hospital attire. Neither of the two men gave him any sign of recognition. The stranger's gums had been painted purple. His corduroy bathrobe was decorated in back with a picture of a B-25 nosing through orange bursts of flak, and in front with six neat rows of tiny bombs signifying sixty combat missions flown. The chaplain was so struck by the sight that he stopped to stare. Both men broke off their conversation and waited in stony silence for him to go. The chaplain hurried inside his tent. He heard, or imagined he heard them, tittering. Corporal Whitcomb walked in a moment later and demanded, "'What's doing?' "'There isn't anything new,' the chaplain replied with averted eyes. "'Was anyone here to see me?' "'Just that crackpot Yossarian again. He's a real troublemaker, isn't he?' "'I'm not so sure he's a crackpot,' the chaplain observed. "'That's right. Take his part,' said Corporal Whitcomb in an injured tone, and stamped out. The chaplain could not believe that Corporal Whitcomb was offended again, and had really walked out. As soon as he did realize it, Corporal Whitcomb walked back in. "'You always side with other people,' Corporal Whitcomb accused. "'You don't back up your men. That's one of the things that's wrong with you.' "'I didn't intend to side with him,' the chaplain apologized. "'I was just making a statement. "'What did Colonel Cathcart want?' "'It wasn't anything important. "'He just wanted to discuss the possibility of saying prayers in the briefing room before each mission.' "'All right, don't tell me,' Corporal Whitcomb snapped and walked out again. "'The chaplain felt terrible.' No matter how considerate he tried to be, it seemed he always managed to hurt Corporal Whitcomb's feelings. He gazed down remorsefully and saw that the orderly forced upon him by Colonel Corn to keep his tent clean and attend to his belongings had neglected to shine his shoes again. Corporal Whitcomb came back in. "'You never trust me with information,' he whined truculently. "'You don't have confidence in your men. That's another one of the things that's wrong with you.' "'Yes, I do,' the chaplain assured him guiltily. "'I have lots of confidence in you.' "'Then how about those letters?' "'No, not now,' the chaplain pleaded, cringing. "'Not the letters. Please don't bring that up again. "'I'll let you know if I have a change of mind.' "'Corporal Whitcomb looked furious. "'Is that so? "'Well, it's all right for you to just sit there and shake your head "'while I do all the work. "'Didn't you see that guy outside with all those pictures painted on his bathrobe?' "'Is he here to see me?' No, Corporal Whitcomb said, and walked out. It was hot and humid inside the tent, and the chaplain felt himself turning damp. He listened like an unwilling eavesdropper to the muffled, indistinguishable drone of the lowered voices outside. As he sat inertly at the rickety bridge table that served as a desk, his lips were closed, his eyes were blank, and his face, with its pale ochre hue and ancient, confined clusters of minute acne pits, had the color and texture of an uncracked almond shell. He racked his memory for some clue to the origin of Corporal Whitcomb's bitterness toward him. In some way he was unable to fathom, he was convinced he had done him some unforgivable wrong. It seemed incredible that such lasting ire as Corporal Whitcomb's could have stemmed from his rejection of Bingo, or the form letters home to the families of the men killed in combat. The chaplain was despondent, with an acceptance of his own ineptitude. He had intended for some weeks to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Corporal Whitcomb in order to find out what was bothering him, but was already ashamed of what he might find out. Outside the tent, Corporal Whitcomb snickered. The other man chuckled. For a few precarious seconds, the chaplain tingled with a weird, occult sensation of having experienced the identical situation before in some prior time or existence. 
He endeavored to trap and nourish the impression in order to predict and perhaps even control what incident would occur next. But the afflatus melted away unproductively, as he had known beforehand it would. Deja vu, the subtle recurring confusion between illusion and reality that was characteristic of paramnesia fascinated the chaplain, and he knew a number of things about it. He knew, for example, that it was called paramnesia, and he was interested as well in such corollary optical phenomena as jamais vu, never seen, and presque vu, almost seen. There were terrifying sudden moments when objects, concepts, and even people that the chaplain had lived with almost all his life inexplicably took on an unfamiliar and irregular aspect that he had never seen before, and which made them seem totally strange. Jamais vu. And there were other moments when he almost saw absolute truth in brilliant flashes of clarity that almost came to him. Presque vu. The episode of the naked man in the tree at Snowden's funeral mystified him thoroughly. It was not déjà vu, for at the time he'd experienced no sensation of ever having seen a naked man in a tree at Snowden's funeral before. It was not jamais vu, since the apparition was not of someone or something familiar appearing to him in an unfamiliar guise. And it was certainly not presque vu, for the chaplain did see him. A jeep started up with a backfire directly outside and roared away. Had the naked man in the tree at Snowden's funeral been merely a hallucination? Or had it been a true revelation? The chaplain trembled at the mere idea. He wanted desperately to confide in Yossarian, but each time he thought about the occurrence, he decided not to think about it any further, although now that he did think about it, he could not be sure that he ever really had thought about it. Corporal Whitcomb sauntered back in wearing a shiny new smirk and leaned his elbow impertinently against the center pole of the chaplain's tent. Do you know who that guy in the red bathrobe was? he asked boastfully. That was a C.I.D. man with a fractured nose. He came down here from the hospital on official business. He's conducting an investigation. The chaplain raised his eyes quickly in obsequious commiseration. I hope you're not in any trouble. Is there anything I can do? No. I'm not in any trouble, Corporal Whitcomb replied with a grin. You are. They're going to crack down on you for signing Washington Irving's name to all those letters you've been signing Washington Irving's name to. How do you like that? I haven't been signing Washington Irving's name to any letters, said the chaplain. You don't have to lie to me, Corporal Whitcomb answered. I'm not the one you have to convince. But I'm not lying. I don't care whether you're lying or not. They're going to get you for intercepting Major Major's correspondence, too. A lot of that stuff is classified information. What correspondence? asked the chaplain plaintively in rising exasperation. I've never seen any of Major Major's correspondence. You don't have to lie to me, Corporal Whitcomb replied. I'm not the one you have to convince. But I'm not lying, protested the chaplain. I don't see why you have to shout at me, Corporal Whitcomb retorted with an injured look. He came away from the center pole and shook his finger at the chaplain for emphasis. I just did you the biggest favor anybody ever did you in your whole life, and you don't even realize it. Every time he tries to report you to his superiors, somebody up at the hospital censors out the details. He's been going batty for weeks trying to turn you in. I just put a censor's okay on his letter without even reading it. That will make a very good impression for you up at CID headquarters. It will let them know that we're not the least bit afraid to have the whole truth about you come out. The chaplain was reeling with confusion. But you aren't authorized to censor letters, are you? Of course not, Corporal Whitcomb answered. Only officers are ever authorized to do that. I censored it in your name. But I'm not authorized to censor letters either, am I? I took care of that for you, too, Corporal Whitcomb assured him. I signed somebody else's name for you. Isn't that forgery? Oh, don't worry about that either. The only one who might complain in a case of forgery is the person whose name you forged. And I looked out for your interest by picking a dead man. I used Washington Irving's name. 
Corporal Whitcomb scrutinized the chaplain's face closely for some sign of rebellion, and then breezed ahead confidently with concealed irony. That was pretty quick thinking on my part, wasn't it? I don't know. The chaplain wailed softly in a quavering voice, squinting with grotesque contortions of anguish and incomprehension. I don't think I understand all you've been telling me. How will it make a good impression for me if you signed Washington Irving's name instead of my own? Because they're convinced that you are Washington Irving. Don't you see? They'll know it was you. But isn't that the very belief we want to dispel? Won't this help them prove it? If I thought you were going to be so stuffy about it, I wouldn't even have tried to help, Corporal Whitcomb declared indignantly and walked out. A second later, he walked back in. I just did you the biggest favor anybody ever did you in your whole life, and you don't even know it. You don't know how to show your appreciation. That's another one of the things that's wrong with you. I'm sorry, the chaplain apologized contritely. I really am sorry. It's just that I'm so completely stunned by all you're telling me that I don't even realize what I'm saying. I I'm really very grateful to you. Then how about letting me send out those form letters? Corporal Whitcomb demanded immediately. Can I begin working on the first drafts? The chaplain's jaw dropped in astonishment. No, no, he groaned. Not now. Corporal Whitcomb was incensed. I'm the best friend you've got, and you don't even know it, he asserted belligerently and walked out of the chaplain's tent. He walked back in. I'm on your side, and you don't even realize it. Don't you know what serious trouble you're in? That C.I.D. man has gone rushing back to the hospital to write a brand new report on you about that tomato. What tomato? The chaplain asked, blinking. The plum tomato you were hiding in your hand when you first showed up here. There it is, the tomato you're still holding in your hand right this very minute. The chaplain unclenched his fingers with surprise and saw that he was still holding the plum tomato he had obtained in Colonel Cathcart's office. He set it down quickly on the bridge table. I got this tomato from Colonel Cathcart, he said, and was struck by how ludicrous his explanation sounded. He insisted I take it. You don't have to lie to me, Corporal Whitcomb answered. I don't care whether you stole it from him or not. Stole it? the chaplain exclaimed with amazement. Why should I want to steal a plum tomato? That's exactly what had us both stumped, said Corporal Whitcomb. And then the C.I.D. man figured out you might have some important secret papers hidden away inside it. The chaplain sagged limply beneath the mountainous weight of his despair. I don't have any important secret papers hidden away inside it, he stated simply. I didn't even want it to begin with. Here, you can have it. Take it and see for yourself. I don't want it. Please take it away. The chaplain pleaded in a voice that was barely audible. I want to be rid of it. I don't want it, Corporal Whitcomb snapped again, and stalked out with an angry face, suppressing a smile of great jubilation at having forged a powerful new alliance with the C.I.D. man, and at having succeeded again in convincing the chaplain that he was really displeased. Poor Whitcomb, sighed the chaplain, and blamed himself for his assistant's malaise. He sat mutely in a ponderous, stultifying melancholy, waiting expectantly for Corporal Whitcomb to walk back in. He was disappointed as he heard the peremptory crunch of Corporal Whitcomb's footsteps recede into silence. There was nothing he wanted to do next. He decided to pass up lunch for a Milky Way and a Baby Ruth from his footlocker, and a few swallows of lukewarm water from his canteen. He felt himself surrounded by dense, overwhelming fogs of possibilities in which he could perceive no glimmer of light. He dreaded what Colonel Cathcart would think when the news that he was suspected of being Washington Irving was brought to him, then fell to fretting over what Colonel Cathcart was already thinking about him for even having broached the subject of the sixty missions. There was so much unhappiness in the world he reflected, bowing his head dismally beneath the tragic thought, and there was nothing he could do about anybody's, least of all his own. Chapter 21 General Dreidel 
Colonel Cathcart was not thinking anything at all about the chaplain, but was tangled up in a brand new menacing problem of his own. Yosarian. Yosarian, the mere sound of that execrable, ugly name made his blood run cold and his breath come in labored gasps. The chaplain's first mention of the name Yosarian had tolled deep in his memory like a portentous gong. As soon as the latch of the door had clicked shut, the whole humiliating recollection of the naked man in formation came cascading down upon him in a mortifying, choking flood of stinging details. He began to perspire and tremble. There was a sinister and unlikely coincidence exposed that was too diabolical an implication to be anything less than the most hideous of omens. The name of the man who had stood naked in ranks that day to receive his distinguished flying cross from General Dreidel had also been Yosarian. And now it was a man named Yosarian who was threatening to make trouble over the sixty missions he had just ordered the men in his group to fly. Colonel Cathcart wondered gloomily if it was the same Yosarian. He climbed to his feet with an air of intolerable woe and began moving about his office. He felt himself in the presence of the mysterious. The naked man in formation, he conceded cheerlessly, had been a real black eye for him. So had the tampering with the bomb line before the mission to Bologna, and the seven-day delay in destroying the bridge at Ferrara, even though destroying the bridge at Ferrara finally, he remembered with glee, had been a real feather in his cap— Although losing a plane there the second time around, he recalled in dejection, had been another black eye, even though he had won another real feather in his cap by getting a medal approved for the bombardier who had gotten him the real black eye in the first place by going around over the target twice. That bombardier's name, he remembered suddenly, with another stupefying shock, had also been Yosarian. Now there were three! His viscous eyes bulged with astonishment, and he whipped himself around in alarm to see what was taking place behind him. A moment ago there had been no Yosarians in his life. Now they were multiplying like hobgoblins. He tried to make himself grow calm. Yosarian was not a common name. Perhaps there were not really three Yosarians, but only two Yosarians, or maybe even only one Yosarian. But that really made no difference. The colonel was still in grave peril. Intuition warned him that he was drawing close to some immense and inscrutable cosmic climax, and his broad, meaty, towering frame tingled from head to toe at the thought that Yosarian, whoever he would eventually turn out to be, was destined to serve as his nemesis. Colonel Cathcart was not superstitious, but he did believe in omens, and he sat right back down behind his desk and made a cryptic notation on his memorandum pad to look into the whole suspicious business of the Osarians right away. He wrote his reminder to himself in a heavy and decisive hand, amplifying it sharply with a series of coded punctuation marks and underlining the whole message twice, so that it read... Yosarian. The colonel sat back when he had finished, and was extremely pleased with himself for the prompt action he had just taken to meet this sinister crisis. Yosarian. The very sight of the name made him shudder. There were so many S's in it. It just had to be subversive. It was like the word subversive itself. It was like seditious and insidious, too, and like socialist, suspicious, fascist, and communist. It was an odious, alien, distasteful name, a name that just did not inspire confidence. It was not at all like such clean, crisp, honest American names as Cathcart, Peckham, and Dreedle. Colonel Cathcart rose slowly and began drifting about his office again.
Almost unconsciously, he picked up a plum tomato from the top of one of the bushels and took a voracious bite. He made a wry face at once and threw the rest of the plum tomato into his wastebasket. The colonel did not like plum tomatoes, not even when they were his own. And these were not even his own. These had been purchased in different marketplaces all over Pianosa by Colonel Corn under various identities, moved up to the colonel's farmhouse in the hills in the dead of night, and transported down to group headquarters the next morning for sale to Milo, who paid Colonel Cathcart and Colonel Corn premium prices for them. Colonel Cathcart often wondered if what they were doing with the plum tomatoes was legal, but Colonel Corn said it was, and he tried not to brood about it too often. He had no way of knowing whether or not the house in the hills was legal either, since Colonel Corn had made all the arrangements. Colonel Cathcart did not know if he owned the house or rented it, from whom he had acquired it, or how much of anything it was costing. Colonel Corn was the lawyer, and if Colonel Corn assured him that fraud, extortion, currency manipulation, embezzlement, income tax evasion, and black market speculations were legal, Colonel Cathcart was in no position to disagree with him. All Colonel Cathcart knew about his house in the hills was that he had such a house and hated it. He was never so bored as when spending there the two or three days every other week necessary to sustain the illusion that his damp and drafty stone farmhouse in the hills was a golden palace of carnal delights. Officers' clubs everywhere pulsated with blurred but knowing accounts of lavish, hushed-up drinking and sex orgies there, and of secret, intimate nights of ecstasy with the most beautiful, the most tantalizing, the most readily aroused and most easily satisfied Italian courtesans, film actresses, models, and countesses. No such private nights of ecstasy or hushed-up drinking and sex orgies ever occurred. They might have occurred if either General Dreedel or General Peckham had once evinced an interest in taking part in orgies with him, but neither ever did, and the Colonel was certainly not going to waste his time and energy making love to beautiful women unless there was something in it for him. The Colonel dreaded his dank, lonely nights at his farmhouse, and the dull, uneventful days. He had much more fun back at group, browbeating everyone he wasn't afraid of. However, as Colonel Corn kept reminding him, there was not much glamour in having a farmhouse in the hills if he never used it. He drove off to his farmhouse each time in a mood of self-pity. He carried a shotgun in his jeep and spent the monotonous hours there shooting it at birds and at the plum tomatoes that did grow there in untended rows and were too much trouble to harvest. Among those officers of inferior rank, toward whom Colonel Cathcart still deemed it prudent to show respect, he included Major de Coverley, even though he did not want to and was not sure he even had to. Major de Coverley was as great a mystery to him as he was to Major Major, and to everyone else who ever took notice of him. Colonel Cathcart had no idea whether to look up or looked down in his attitude toward Major de Coverley. Major de Coverley was only a major, even though he was ages older than Colonel Cathcart. At the same time, so many other people treated Major de Coverley with such profound and fearful veneration that Colonel Cathcart had a hunch they might all know something. Major de Coverley was an ominous, incomprehensible presence, who kept him constantly on edge, and of whom even Colonel Corn tended to be wary. Everyone was afraid of him, and no one knew why. No one even knew Major de Coverley's first name, because no one had ever had the temerity to ask him. Colonel Cathcart knew that Major de Coverley was away, and he rejoiced in his absence, until it occurred to him that Major de Coverley might be away somewhere conspiring against him, and then he wished that Major de Coverley were back in his squadron where he belonged, so that he could be watched. In a little while, Colonel Cathcart's arches began to ache from pacing back and forth so much. He sat down behind his desk again and resolved to embark upon a mature and systematic evaluation of the entire military situation.
With the business-like air of a man who knows how to get things done, he found a large white pad, drew a straight line down the middle, and crossed it near the top, dividing the page into two blank columns of equal width. He rested a moment in critical rumination. Then he huddled over his desk, and at the head of the left column, in a cramped and finicky hand, he wrote, Black Eyes. At the top of the right column, he wrote, Feathers in my cap. He leaned back once more to inspect his chart admiringly from an objective perspective. After a few seconds of solemn deliberation, he licked the tip of his pencil carefully and wrote under black eyes, after intent intervals, Ferrara. Bologna, bomb line moved on map, Durin. Skeet range. Naked man in formation, after Avignon. Then he added, food poisoning, during Bologna. And... Moaning, epidemic of, during Avignon briefing. Then he added, Chaplain, hanging around officers' club every night. He decided to be charitable about the chaplain, even though he did not like him, and under Feathers in My Cap, he wrote, Chaplain, hanging around officers' club every night. The two chaplain entries, therefore, neutralized each other. Alongside Ferrara and Naked Man in Formation after Avignon, he then wrote Yosarian. Alongside Bologna, bomb line moved on map during, food poisoning during Bologna, and moaning, epidemic of during Avignon briefing, he wrote in a bold, decisive hand, question mark, those entries labeled question mark were the ones he wanted to investigate immediately to determine if Yossarian had played any part in them. Suddenly his arm began to shake, and he was unable to write any more. He rose to his feet in terror, feeling sticky and fat, and rushed to the open window to gulp in fresh air. His gaze fell on the skeet range, and he reeled away with a sharp cry of distress, his wild and feverish eyes scanning the walls of his office frantically as though they were swarming with Yossarians. Nobody loved him. General Dreedel hated him, although General Peckham liked him, although he couldn't be sure since Colonel Cargill, General Peckham's aide, undoubtedly had ambitions of his own and was probably sabotaging him with General Peckham at every opportunity. The only good colonel, he decided, was a dead colonel, uh, except for himself. The only colonel he trusted was Colonel Moodus, and even he had an in with his father-in-law. Milo, of course, had been the big feather in his cap, although having his group bombed by Milo's planes had probably been a terrible black eye for him, even though Milo had ultimately stilled all protest in disclosing the huge net profit the syndicate had realized on the deal with the enemy and convincing everyone that bombing his own men and planes had therefore really been a commendable and very lucrative blow on the side of private enterprise. The colonel was insecure about Milo, because other colonels were trying to lure him away. And Colonel Cathcart still had that lousy, big, chief, white half-ode in his group, who that lousy, lazy Captain Black claimed was the one really responsible for the bomb lines being moved during the Big Siege of Bologna. Colonel Cathcart liked Big Chief White Half-ode because Big Chief White half -Oat kept punching that lousy Colonel Moodus in the nose every time he got drunk, and Colonel Moodus was around. He wished that Big Chief White half -Oat would begin punching Colonel Corn in his fat face, too. Colonel Corn was a lousy smart aleck. Someone at 27th Air Force Headquarters had it in for him and sent back every report he wrote with a blistering rebuke and Colonel Corn had bribed a clever mail clerk there named Wintergreen to try to find out who it was. Losing that plane over Ferrara the second time around had not done him any good, he had to admit, and neither had having that other plane disappear inside that cloud. That was one he hadn't even written down. 
He tried to recall, longingly, if Yossarian had been lost in that plane in the cloud, and realized that Yossarian could not possibly have been lost in that plane in the cloud if he was still around now raising such a big stink about having to fly a lousy five missions more. Maybe sixty missions were too many for the men to fly, Colonel Cathcart reasoned, if Yossarian objected to flying them. But he then remembered that forcing his men to fly more missions than everyone else was the most tangible achievement he had going for him. As Colonel Korn often remarked, the war was crawling with group commanders who were merely doing their duty, and it required just some sort of dramatic gesture, like making his group fly more combat missions than any other bomber group, to spotlight his unique qualities of leadership. Certainly none of the generals seemed to object to what he was doing, although as far as he could detect, they weren't particularly impressed either which made him suspect that perhaps sixty combat missions were not nearly enough, and that he ought to increase the number at once to seventy, eighty, a hundred, or even two hundred, three hundred, or, or six thousand. Certainly, he would be much better off under somebody suave like General Peckham than he was under somebody boorish and insensitive like General Dreedle, because General Peckham had the discernment the intelligence, and the Ivy League background to appreciate and enjoy him at his full value. Although General Peckham had never given the slightest indication that he appreciated or enjoyed him at all, Colonel Cathcart felt perceptive enough to realize that visible signals of recognition were never necessary between sophisticated, self-assured people like himself and General Peckham, who could warm to each other from a distance with innate mutual understanding. It was enough that they were of like kind, and he knew it was only a matter of waiting discreetly for preferment until the right time, although it rotted Colonel Cathcart's self-esteem to observe that General Peckham never deliberately sought him out, and that he labored no harder to impress Colonel Cathcart with his epigrams and erudition than he did to impress anyone else in earshot even enlisted men. Either Colonel Cathcart wasn't getting through to General Peckham, or General Peckham was not the scintillating, discriminating, intellectual, forward-looking personality he pretended to be. And it was really General Dreedle who was sensitive, charming, brilliant, and sophisticated, and under whom he would certainly be much better off. And suddenly Colonel Cathcart had absolutely no conception of how strongly he stood with anyone, and began banging on his buzzer with his fist for Colonel Corn to come running into his office and assure him that everybody loved him, that Yossarian was a figment of his imagination, and that he was making wonderful progress in the splendid and valiant campaign he was waging to become a general. Actually... Colonel Cathcart did not have a chance in hell of becoming a general. For one thing, there was XPFC Wintergreen, who also wanted to be a general, and who always distorted, destroyed, rejected, or misdirected any correspondence by, for, or about Colonel Cathcart that might do him credit. For another, there already was a general, General Dreedle, who knew that General Peckham was after his job, but did not know how to stop him. General Dreedle, the wing commander, was a blunt, chunky, barrel-chested man in his early fifties. His nose was squat and red, and he had lumpy, white, bunched-up eyelids circling his small, gray eyes like halos of bacon fat. He had a nurse and a son-in-law, and he was prone to long, ponderous silences when he had not been drinking too much. General Dreedle had wasted too much of his time in the army doing his job well, and now it was too late. New power alignments had coalesced without him, and he was at a loss to cope with them. At unguarded moments, his hard and sullen face slipped into a somber, preoccupied look of defeat and frustration. General Dreedle drank a great deal. His moods were arbitrary and unpredictable. War is hell, he declared frequently, drunk or sober, and he really meant it, although that did not prevent him from making a good living out of it, or from taking his son-in-law into the business with him, even though the two bickered constantly. That bastard, 
General Dreedle would complain about his son-in-law with a contemptuous grunt to anyone who happened to be standing beside him at the curve of the bar of the officers' club. "'Everything he's got he owes to me. I made him, that lousy son of a bitch. He hasn't got brains enough to get ahead on his own.' "'He thinks he knows everything,' Colonel Moodis would retort in a sulking tone to his own audience at the other end of the bar. "'He can't take criticism, and he won't listen to advice.' "'All he can do is give advice,' General Dreedle would observe with a rasping snort. "'If it wasn't for me, he'd still be a corporal.' General Dreedle was always accompanied by both Colonel Moodis and his nurse, who was as delectable a piece of ass as anyone who saw her had ever laid eyes on. General Dreedle's nurse was chubby, short, and blonde. She had plump, dimpled cheeks, happy blue eyes, and a neat, curly, turned-up hair. She smiled at everyone, and never spoke at all unless she was spoken to. Her bosom was lush, and her complexion clear. She was irresistible, and men edged away from her carefully. She was succulent, sweet, docile, and dumb, and she drove everyone crazy but General Dreedle. "'You should see her naked,' General Dreedle chortled with croupy relish, while his nurse stood smiling proudly right at his shoulder. "'Back at wing, she's got a uniform in my room made of purple silk that's so tight her nipples stand out like Bing cherries. Milo got me the fabric. There isn't even room enough for panties or a brassiere underneath.' I make her wear it some nights when Moodis is around, just to drive him crazy. General Dreedle laughed hoarsely. You should see what goes on inside that blouse of hers every time she shifts her weight. She drives him out of his mind. The first time I catch him putting a hand on her or any other woman, I'll bust the horny bastard right down to private and put him on K.P. for a year. He keeps her around just to drive me crazy. Colonel Moodis accused aggrievedly at the other end of the bar. Back at wing, she's got a uniform made out of purple silk that's so tight her nipples stand out like bing cherries. There isn't even room for panties or a brassiere underneath. You should hear that silk rustle every time she shifts her weight. The first time I make a pass at her or any other girl, he'll bust me right down to private and put me on K.P. for a year. She drives me out of my mind. He hasn't gotten laid since we shipped overseas, confided General Dreedle, and his square, grizzled head bobbed with sadistic laughter at the fiendish idea. That's one of the reasons I never let him out of my sight, just so he can't get to a woman. Can you imagine what that poor son of a bitch is going through? I haven't been to bed with a woman since we shipped overseas. Colonel Moodis whimpered tearfully. Can you imagine what I'm going through? General Dreedle could be as intransigent with anyone else when displeased as he was with Colonel Moodis. He had no taste for sham, tact, or pretension, and his credo as a professional soldier was unified and concise. He believed that the young men who took orders from him should be willing to give up their lives for the ideals aspirations, and idiosyncrasies of the old men he took orders from. The officers and enlisted men in his command had identity for him only as military quantities. All he asked was that they do their work. Beyond that, they were free to do whatever they pleased. They were free, as Colonel Cathcart was free, to force their men to fly sixty missions if they chose. And they were free, as Yossarian had been free, to stand in formation naked if they wanted to. Although General Dreedle's granite jaw swung open at the sight, and he went striding dictatorially right down the line to make certain that there really was a man wearing nothing but moccasins, waiting at attention in ranks to receive a medal from him. General Dreedle was speechless. Colonel Cathcart began to faint when he spied Yossarian, and Colonel Corn stepped up behind him and squeezed his arm in a strong grip. The silence was grotesque. A steady, warm wind flowed in from the beach, 
An old cart filled with dirty straw rumbled into view on the main road, drawn by a black donkey and driven by a farmer in a flopping hat and faded brown work clothes, who paid no attention to the formal military ceremony taking place in the small field on his right. At last, General Dreedle spoke. This book is continued on Disc 8. Disc 8 At last, General Dreedle spoke. Get back in the car! He snapped over his shoulder to his nurse, who had followed him down the line. The nurse toddled away with a smile toward his brown staff car, parked about twenty yards away at the edge of the rectangular clearing. General Dreedle waited in austere silence until the car door slammed, and then demanded, Which one is this? Colonel Moodis checked his roster. This one is Yossarian, Dad. He gets a distinguished flying cross. Well, I'll be damned, mumbled General Dreedle, and his ruddy monolithic face softened with amusement. Why aren't you wearing clothes, Yossarian? I don't want to. What do you mean you don't want to? Why the hell don't you want to? I just don't want to, sir. Why isn't he wearing clothes? General Dreedle demanded over his shoulder of Colonel Cathcart. He's talking to you, Colonel Corn whispered over Colonel Cathcart's shoulder from behind, jabbing his elbow sharply into Colonel Cathcart's back. Why isn't he wearing clothes? Colonel Cathcart demanded of Colonel Corn with a look of acute pain, tenderly nursing the spot where Colonel Corn had just jabbed him. Why isn't he wearing clothes? Colonel Corn demanded of Captain Pilchard and Captain Wren. A man was killed in his plane over Avignon last week and bled all over him, Captain Corn reported directly to General Dreedle. His uniform hasn't come back from the laundry yet. Where are his other uniforms? They're in the laundry, too. What about his underwear? General Dreedle demanded. All his underwear is in the laundry, too, answered Colonel Corn. That sounds like a lot of crap to me, General Dreedle declared. It is a lot of crap, sir. Yossarian said. Don't you worry, sir, Colonel Cathcart promised General Dreedle with a threatening look at Yossarian. You have my personal word for it that this man will be severely punished. What the hell do I care if he's punished or not? General Dreedle replied with surprise and irritation. He's just won a medal. If he wants to receive it without any clothes on, what the hell business is it of yours? Those are my sentiments exactly, sir. Colonel Cathcart echoed with resounding enthusiasm and mopped his brow with a damp, white handkerchief. But would you say that, sir, even in the light of General Peckham's recent memorandum on the subject of appropriate military attire in combat areas? Peckham? General Dreedle's face clouded. Yes, sir, sir, said Colonel Cathcart obsequiously. General Peckham even recommends that we send our men into combat in full-dress uniform so they'll make a good impression on the enemy when they're shot down. Peckham? repeated General Dreedle, still squinting with bewilderment. Just what the hell does Peckham have to do with it? Colonel Corn jabbed Colonel Cathcart sharply again in the back with his elbow. Absolutely nothing, sir! Colonel Cathcart responded sprucely, wincing in extreme pain and gingerly rubbing the spot where Colonel Corn had just jabbed him again. And that's exactly why I decided to take absolutely no action at all until I first had an opportunity to discuss it with you. Shall we ignore it completely, sir? General Dreedle ignored him completely, turning away from him in baleful scorn to hand Yossarian his medal in its case. Get my girl back from the car, he commanded Colonel Moodis crabbily, and waited in one spot with a scowling face down until his nurse had rejoined him. Get word to the office right away to kill that directive I just issued, ordering the men to wear neckties on the combat missions, Colonel Cathcart whispered to Colonel Corn urgently out of the corner of his mouth. I told you not to do it, Colonel Corn snickered, but you just wouldn't listen to me. Shh! Colonel Cathcart cautioned. God damn it, Corn! What did you do to my back? Colonel Corn snickered again. 
General Dreedle's nurse always followed General Dreedle everywhere he went, even into the briefing room just before the mission to Avignon, where she stood with her asinine smile at the side of the platform and bloomed like a fertile oasis at General Dreedle's shoulder in her pink and green uniform. Yossarian looked at her and fell in love desperately. His spirits sank, leaving him empty inside and numb. He sat gazing in clammy want at her full red lips and dimpled cheeks as he listened to Major Danby describe in a monotonous, didactic male drone the heavy concentrations of flack awaiting them at Avignon, and he moaned in deep despair suddenly at the thought that he might never see again this lovely woman to whom he had never spoken a word and whom he now loved so pathetically. He throbbed and ached with sorrow, fear, and desire as he stared at her. She was so beautiful. He worshipped the ground she stood on. He licked his parched, thirsting lips with a sticky tongue and moaned in misery again, loudly enough this time to attract the startled, searching glances of the men sitting around him on the rows of crude wooden benches in their chocolate-colored coveralls and stitched white parachute harnesses. Nately turned to him quickly with alarm. "'What is it?' he whispered. "'What's the matter?' Yossarian did not hear him. He was sick with lust and mesmerized with regret. General Dreedle's nurse was only a little chubby, and his senses were stuffed to congestion with the yellow radiance of her hair and the unfelt pressure of her soft, short fingers, with the rounded, untasted wealth of her nubile breasts in her army pink shirt that was opened wide at the throat, and with the rolling, ripened, triangular confluences of her belly and thighs in a tight, slip, forest-green gabardine officer's pants. He drank her in insatiably, from head to painted toenail. He never wanted to lose her. Oh, he moaned again and this time the whole room rippled at his quavering, drawn-out cry. A wave of startled uneasiness broke over the officers on the dais, and even Major Danby, who had begun synchronizing the watches, was distracted momentarily as he counted out the seconds and almost had to begin again. Nately followed Yossarian's transfixed gaze down the long-frame auditorium until he came to General Dreedle's nurse. He blanched with trepidation when he guessed what was troubling Yossarian. "'Cut it out, will you?' Nately warned in a fierce whisper. "'Oh!' Yossarian moaned a fourth time, this time loudly enough for everyone to hear him distinctly. "'Are you crazy?' Nately hissed vehemently. "'You'll get into trouble!' "'Oh!' Dunbar answered Yossarian from the opposite end of the room. Nately recognized Dunbar's voice. The situation was now out of control, and he turned away with a small moan. Oh, oh, Dunbar moaned back at him. Oh, Nately moaned out loud in exasperation when he realized that he had just moaned. Oh, Dunbar moaned back at him again. Oh! Someone entirely new chimed in from another section of the room, and Nately's hair stood on end. Yossarian and Dunbar both replied while Nately cringed and hunted about futilely for some hole in which to hide and take Yossarian with him. A sprinkling of people were smothering laughter. An elfin impulse possessed Nately, and he moaned intentionally the next time there was a lull. Another new voice answered. The flavor of disobedience was titillating, and Nately moaned deliberately again, the next time he could squeeze one in edgewise. Still another new voice echoed him. The room was boiling irrepressibly into bedlam. An eerie hubbub of voices was rising, feet were scuffled, and things began to drop from people's fingers. 
pencils, computers, map cases, clattering steel flak helmets. A number of men who were not moaning were now giggling openly, and there was no telling how far the unorganized insurrection of moaning might have gone if General Dreedel himself had not come forward to quell it, stepping out determinedly in the center of the platform directly in front of Major Danby, who, with his earnest, persevering head down, was still concentrating on his wristwatch and saying, Twenty-five seconds! Twenty! Fifteen! General Dreedle's great red domineering face was gnarled with perplexity and oaken with awesome resolution. That will be all, men! he ordered tersely, his eyes glaring with disapproval and his square jaw firm. And that's all there was. I run a fighting outfit, he told them sternly, when the room had grown absolutely quiet and the men on the benches were all cowering sheepishly. And there'll be no more moaning in this group as long as I'm in command. Is that clear? It was clear to everybody but Major Danby, who was still concentrating on his wristwatch and counting down the seconds aloud. Four, three, two, one. Time! called out Major Danby, and raised his eyes triumphantly to discover that no one had been listening to him and that he would have to begin all over again. Oh, he moaned in frustration. What was that? roared General Dreedle incredulously, and whirled around in a murderous rage upon Major Danby, who staggered back in terrified confusion and began to quail and perspire. Who is this man? M Major Danby, sir. Colonel Cathcart stammered. My group operations officer. Take him out and shoot him, ordered General Dreedle. Sir? I said take him out and shoot him, can't you hear? Yes, sir, Colonel Cathcart responded smartly, swallowing hard, and turned in a brisk manner to his chauffeur and his meteorologist. Take Major Danby out and shoot him. S sir? His chauffeur and his meteorologist stammered. I said... Take Major Danby out and shoot him, Colonel Cathcart snapped. Can't you hear? The two young lieutenants nodded lumpishly and gaped at each other in stunned and flaccid reluctance, each waiting for the other to initiate the procedure of taking Major Danby outside and shooting him. Neither had ever taken Major Danby outside and shot him before. They inched their way dubiously toward Major Danby from opposite sides. Major Danby was white with fear. His legs collapsed suddenly, and he began to fall, and the two young lieutenants sprang forward and seized him under both arms to save him from slumping to the floor. Now that they had Major Danby, the rest seemed easy. But there were no guns. Major Danby began to cry. Colonel Cathcart wanted to rush to his side and comfort him, but did not want to look like a sissy in front of General Dreedle. He remembered that Appleby and Havermeyer always brought their forty-five automatics on the missions, and he began to scan the rows of men in search of them. As soon as Major Danby began to cry, Colonel Moodis, who had been vacillating wretchedly on the sidelines, could restrain himself no longer, and stepped out diffidently toward General Dreedle with a sickly air of self-sacrifice. "'I think you'd better wait a minute, Dad,' he suggested hesitantly. I don't think you can shoot him. General Dreedel was infuriated by his intervention. Who the hell says I can't? He thundered pugnaciously in a voice loud enough to rattle the whole building. Colonel Moodis, his face flushing with embarrassment, bent close to whisper into his ear. Why the hell can't I? General Dreedel bellowed. Colonel Moodis whispered some more. You mean I can't shoot anyone I want to? General Dreedle demanded with uncompromising indignation. He pricked up his ears with interest as Colonel Moodis continued whispering. "'Is that a fact?' he inquired, his rage tamed by curiosity. "'Yes, Dad, I'm afraid it is.' "'I guess you think you're pretty goddamn smart, don't you?' General Dreedle lashed out at Colonel Moodis suddenly. Colonel Moodis turned crimson again. "'No, Dad, it isn't all right. Let the insubordinate son of a bitch go.' General Dreedel snarled, turning bitterly away from his son-in-law and barking peevishly at Colonel Cathcart's chauffeur and Colonel Cathcart's meteorologist. But get him out of this building and keep him out. And let's continue this goddamn briefing before the war ends. I've never seen so much incompetence. 
Colonel Cathcart nodded lamely at General Dreedle and signaled his men hurriedly to push Major Danby outside the building. As soon as Major Danby had been pushed outside, though, there was no one to continue the briefing. Everyone gawked at everyone else in oafish surprise. General Dreedle turned purple with rage as nothing happened. Colonel Cathcart had no idea what to do. He was about to begin moaning aloud when Colonel Corn came to the rescue by stepping forward and taking control. Colonel Cathcart sighed with enormous, tearful relief, almost overwhelmed with gratitude. Now, men, we're going to synchronize our watches, Colonel Corn began promptly, in a sharp, commanding manner, rolling his eyes flirtatiously in General Dreedle's direction. We're going to synchronize our watches one time and one time only. And if it doesn't come off in that one time, General Dreedle and I are going to want to know why. Is that clear? He fluttered his eyes toward General Dreedle again to make sure his plug had registered. Now, set your watches for 918. Colonel Corn synchronized their watches without a single hitch and moved ahead with confidence. He gave the men the colors of the day and reviewed the weather conditions with an agile, flashy versatility, casting sidelong, simpering looks at General Dreedle every few seconds to draw increased encouragement from the excellent impression he saw he was making, preening and pruning himself effulgently and strutting vaingloriously about the platform as he picked up momentum. He gave the men the colors of the day again, and shifted nimbly into a rousing pep-talk on the importance of the bridge at Avignon to the war effort and the obligation of each man on the mission to place love of country above love of life. When his inspiring dissertation was finished, he gave the men the colors of the day still one more time, stressed the angle of approach, and reviewed the weather conditions again. Colonel Corn felt himself at the full height of his powers. He belonged in the spotlight. Comprehension dawned slowly on Colonel Cathcart. When it came, he was struck dumb. His face grew longer and longer as he enviously watched Colonel Corn's treachery continue, and he was almost afraid to listen when General Dreedle moved up beside him and, in a whisper blustery enough to be heard throughout the room, demanded, Who is that man? Colonel Cathcart answered with wan foreboding and General Dreedle then cupped his hand over his mouth and whispered something that made Colonel Cathcart's face glow with immense joy. Colonel Corn saw and quivered with uncontainable rapture. Had he just been promoted in the field by General Dreedle to full colonel? He could not endure the suspense. With a masterful flourish, he brought the briefing to a close and turned expectantly to receive ardent congratulations from General Dreedle, who was already striding out of the building without a glance backward, trailing his nurse and Colonel Moodis behind him. Colonel Corn was stunned by this disappointing sight, but only for an instant. His eyes found Colonel Cathcart, who was still standing erect in a grinning trance, and he rushed over jubilantly and began pulling on his arm. "'What did he say about me?' he demanded excitedly in a fervor of proud and blissful anticipation. "'What did General Dreedle say?' "'He wanted to know who you were.' "'I know that, I know that, but what did he say about me? What did he say?' "'You make him sick. Chapter 22 Milo the Mayor That was the mission on which Yossarian lost his nerve. Yossarian lost his nerve on the mission to Avignon because Snowden lost his guts, 
and Snowden lost his guts because their pilot that day was Hoople, who was only fifteen years old, and their co-pilot was Dobbs, who was even worse, and who wanted Yossarian to join with him in a plot to murder Colonel Cathcart. Hoople was a good pilot, Yossarian knew, but he was only a kid, and Dobbs had no confidence in him either, and wrested the controls away without warning after they had dropped their bombs, going berserk in mid-air and tipping the plane over into that heart-stopping, ear-splitting, indescribably petrifying fatal dive that tore Yossarian's earphones free from their connection and hung him helplessly to the roof of the nose by the top of his head. Oh, God! Yossarian had shrieked soundlessly as he felt them all falling. Oh, God! Oh, God! Oh, God! Oh, God! He had shrieked beseechingly through lips that could not open as the plane fell and he dangled without weight by the top of his head until Hoople managed to seize the controls back and leveled the plane out down inside the crazy, craggy, patchwork canyon of crashing anti-aircraft fire from which they had climbed away and from which they would now have to escape again. Almost at once there was a thud and a hole the size of a big fist in the plexiglass. Yossarian's cheeks were stinging with shimmering splinters. There was no blood. "'What happened? What happened?' he cried, and trembled violently when he could not hear his own voice in his ears. He was cowed by the empty silence on the intercom, and almost too horrified to move as he crouched like a trapped mouse on his hands and knees, and waited without daring to breathe, until he finally spied the gleaming cylindrical jack-plug of his headset swinging back and forth in front of his eyes, and jammed it back into its receptacle with fingers that rattled. "'Oh, God!' he kept shrieking with no abatement of terror as the flak thumped and mushroomed all about him. "'Oh, God!' God! Dobbs was weeping when Yossarian jammed his jack plug back into the intercom system and was able to hear again. Help him! Help him! Dobbs was sobbing. Help him! Help him! Help who? Help who? Yossarian called back. Help who? The bombardier! The bombardier! Dobbs cried. He doesn't answer! Help the bombardier! Help the bombardier! I'm the bombardier! Yossarian cried back at him. I'm the bombardier! I'm all right! I'm all right! Then help him! Help him! Dobbs wept. Help him! Help him! Help who? Help who? The radio gunner! Dobbs begged. Help the radio gunner! I'm cold. Snowden whimpered feebly over the intercom system then, in a bleat of plaintive agony. Please help me. I'm cold. And Yossarian crept out through the crawlway and climbed up over the bomb bay and down into the rear section of the plane, where Snowden lay on the floor, wounded and freezing to death, in the yellow splash of sunlight near the new tail gunner lying stretched out on the floor beside him in a dead faint. Dobbs was the worst pilot in the world and knew it, a shattered wreck of a virile young man who was continually striving to convince his superiors that he was no longer fit to pilot a plane. None of his superiors would listen, and it was the day the number of missions was raised to sixty that Dobbs stole into Yossarian's tent while Orr was out looking for gaskets and disclosed the plot he had formulated to murder Colonel Cathcart. He needed Yossarian's assistance. "'You want us to kill him in cold blood?' Yossarian objected. "'That's right.' Dobbs agreed with an optimistic smile, encouraged by Yossarian's ready grasp of the situation. We'll shoot him to death with a luger I brought back from Sicily that nobody knows I've got. I don't think I could do it, Yossarian concluded, after weighing the idea in silence a while. Dobbs was astonished. Why not? Look, nothing would please me more than to have the son of a bitch break his neck or get killed in a crash or— to find out that someone else had shot him to death. But I don't think I could kill him. He'd do it to you, Dobbs argued. In fact, you're the one who told me he is doing it to us by keeping us in combat so long. But I don't think I could do it to him. He's got a right to live, too, I guess. Not as long as he's trying to rob you and me of our right to live. What's the matter with you? Dobbs was flabbergasted. I used to listen to you arguing that same thing with Clevenger, and look what happened to him. Right inside that cloud. Stop shouting, will you? Yossarian shushed him. 
I'm not shouting, Dobbs shouted louder, his face red with revolutionary fervor. His eyes and nostrils were running, and his palpitating crimson lower lip was splattered with a foamy dew. There must have been close to a hundred men in the group who had finished their fifty-five missions when he raised the number to sixty. There must have been at least another hundred like you with just a couple more to fly. He's going to kill us all if we let him go on forever. We've got to kill him first. Yossarian nodded expressionlessly, without committing himself. Do you think we could get away with it? I've got it all worked out. I Stop shouting, for Christ's sake. I'm not shouting. I've got it. Will you stop shouting? I've got it all worked out, Dobbs whispered, gripping the side of Orr's cot with white-knuckled hands to constrain them from waving. Thursday morning, when he's due back from that goddamn farmhouse of his in the hills, I'll sneak up to the woods to that hairpin turn in the road and hide in the bushes. He has to slow down there, and I can watch the road in both directions to make sure there's no one else around. When I see him coming, I'll shove a big log out into the road to make him stop his jeep. Then I'll step out of the bushes with my luger and shoot him in the head until he's dead. I'll bury the gun, come back down to the woods to the squadron, and go about my business just like everybody else. What could possibly go wrong? Yossarian had followed each step attentively. Where do I come in? he asked in puzzlement. I couldn't do it without you, Dobbs explained. I need you to tell me to go ahead. Yossarian found it hard to believe him. Is that all you want me to do? Just tell you to go ahead? That's all I need from you, Dobbs answered. Just tell me to go ahead and I'll blow his brains out all by myself the day after tomorrow. His voice was accelerating with emotion and rising again. I'd like to shoot Colonel Corn in the head, too, while we're at it, although I'd like to spare Major Danby, if that's all right with you. Then I'd like to murder Appleby and Havermeyer also, and after we finish murdering Appleby and Havermeyer, I'd like to murder McWatt. McWatt? cried Yossarian, almost jumping up in horror. McWatt's a friend of mine. What do you want from McWatt? I don't know, Dobbs confessed with an air of floundering embarrassment. I just thought that as long as we were murdering Appleby and Havermeyer, we might as well murder McWatt, too. Don't you want to murder McWatt? Yossarian took a firm stand. Look, I might keep interested in this if you stop shouting it all over the island, and if you stick to killing Colonel Cathcart. But if you're going to turn this into a bloodbath, you can forget about me. All right, all right. Dobbs sought to placate him. Just Colonel Cathcart. Should I do it? Tell me to go ahead. Yossarian shook his head. I don't think I could tell you to go ahead. Dobbs was frantic. I'm willing to compromise, he pleaded vehemently. You don't have to tell me to go ahead. Just tell me it's a good idea, okay? Is it a good idea? Yossarian still shook his head. It would have been a great idea if you had gone ahead and done it without even speaking to me. Now it's too late. I don't think I can tell you anything. Give me some more time. I might change my mind. Then it will be too late. Yossarian kept shaking his head. Dobbs was disappointed. He sat for a moment with a hangdog look, then spurted to his feet suddenly and stamped away to have another impetuous crack at persuading Dr. Nika to ground him, knocking over Yossarian's washstand with his hip when he lurched around and tripping over the fuel line of the stove, or was still constructing. Dr. Nika withstood Dobbs' blustering and gesticulating attack with a series of impatient nods and sent him to the medical tent to describe his symptoms to Gus and Wes, who painted his gums purple with gentian violet solution the moment he started to talk. They painted his toes purple, too, and forced a laxative down his throat when he opened his mouth again to complain, and then they sent him away. Dobbs was in even worse shape than Hungry Joe, who could at least fly missions— when he was not having nightmares. Dobbs was almost as bad as Orr, who seemed happy as an undersized grinning lark with his deranged and galvanic giggle and shivering, warped buck teeth, and who was sent along for a rest leave with Milo and Yossarian on the trip to Cairo for eggs when Milo bought cotton instead and took off at dawn for Istanbul with his plane packed to the gun turrets with exotic spiders and unripened red bananas. 
or was one of the homeliest freaks Yossarian had ever encountered, and one of the most attractive. He had a raw, bulgy face, with hazel eyes squeezing from their sockets like matching brown halves of marbles, and thick, wavy, party-colored hair sloping up to a peak on the top of his head like a pomaded pup tent. Or was knocked down into the water, or had an engine shot out almost every time he went up. And he began jerking on Yossarian's arm like a wild man after they had taken off for Naples and come down in Sicily to find the scheming, cigar-smoking, ten-year-old pimp with the two twelve-year-old virgin sisters waiting for them in town in front of the hotel in which there was room for only Milo. Yossarian pulled back from Orr adamantly, gazing with some concern and bewilderment at Mount Etna instead of Mount Vesuvius, and wondering what they were doing in Sicily instead of Naples as Orr kept entreating him in a tittering, stuttering, concupiscent turmoil to go along with him behind the scheming ten-year-old pimp to his two twelve-year-old virgin sisters who were not really virgins and not really sisters and who were really only twenty-eight. "'Go with him,' Milo instructed Yossarian laconically. Remember your mission. All right, Yossarian yielded with a sigh, remembering his mission. But at least let me try to find a hotel room first so I can get a good night's sleep afterward. You'll get a good night's sleep with the girls, Milo replied with the same air of intrigue. Remember your mission. But they got no sleep at all, for Yossarian and Orr found themselves jammed into the same double bed with the two twelve-year-old, twenty-eight-year-old prostitutes, who turned out to be oily and obese, and who kept waking them up all night long to ask them to switch partners. Yossarian's perceptions were soon so fuzzy that he paid no notice to the beige turban the fat one crowding into him kept wearing until late the next morning when the scheming ten-year-old pimp with the Cuban panatella snatched it off in public in a bestial caprice that exposed in the brilliant Sicilian daylight her shocking, misshapen, and denudate skull. Vengeful neighbors had shaved her hair to the gleaming bone because she had slept with Germans. The girls screeched in feminine outrage and waddled comically after the scheming ten-year-old pimp, her grisly, bleak, violated scalp slithering up and down ludicrously around the queer, darkened wart of her face, like something bleached and obscene. Yossarian had never laid eyes on anything so bare before. The pimp spun the turban high on his finger like a trophy and kept himself skipping inches ahead of her fingertips as he led her in a tantalizing circle around the square congested with people who were howling with laughter and pointing to Yossarian with derision when Milo strode up with a grim look of haste and puckered his lips reprovingly at the unseemly spectacle of so much vice and frivolity. Milo insisted on leaving at once for Malta. We're sleepy, Orr whined. That's your own fault, Milo censured them both self-righteously. If you had spent the night in your hotel room instead of with these immoral girls, you'd both feel as good as I do today. You told us to go with them, Yossarian retorted accusingly. And we didn't have a hotel room. You were the only one who could get a hotel room. That wasn't my fault either, Milo explained haughtily. How was I supposed to know all the buyers would be in town for the chickpea harvest? You knew it, Yossarian charged. That explains why we're here in Sicily instead of Naples. You've probably got the whole damn plane filled with chickpeas already. Shh, Milo cautioned sternly with a meaningful glance toward Orr. Remember your mission. The bomb bay, the rear and tail sections of the plane, and most of the top turret gunner section were all filled with bushels of chickpeas when they arrived at the airfield to take off for Malta. Yossarian's mission on the trip was to distract Orr from observing where Milo bought his eggs, even though Orr was a member of Milo's syndicate and, like every other member of Milo's syndicate, owned a share. His mission was silly, Yossarian felt, since it was common knowledge that Milo bought his eggs in Malta for seven cents apiece and sold them to the mess halls in his syndicate for five cents apiece. I just don't trust him, Milo brooded in the plane, with a backward nod toward Orr, who was curled up like a tangled rope on the low bushels of chickpeas 
trying torturedly to sleep. And I'd just as soon buy my eggs when he's not around to learn my business secrets. What else don't you understand? Yossarian was riding beside him in the co-pilot seat. I don't understand why you buy eggs for seven cents apiece in Malta and sell them for five cents. I do it to make a profit. But how can you make a profit? You lose two cents an egg. But I make a profit of three and a quarter cents an egg by selling them for four and a quarter cents an egg to the people in Malta I buy them from for seven cents an egg. Of course, I don't make the profit. The syndicate makes the profit. And everybody has a share. Yossarian felt he was beginning to understand. And the people you sell the eggs to at four and a quarter cents apiece make a profit of two and three quarter cents apiece when they sell them back to you at seven cents apiece. Is that right? Why don't you sell the eggs directly to you and eliminate the people you buy them from? Because I'm the people I buy them from, Milo explained. I make a profit of three and a quarter cents apiece when I sell them to me, and a profit of two and three quarter cents apiece when I buy them back from me. That's a total profit of six cents an egg. I lose only two cents an egg when I sell them to the mess halls at five cents apiece, and that's how I can make a profit buying eggs for seven cents apiece and selling them for five cents apiece. I pay only one cent apiece at the hen when I buy them in Sicily. In Malta, Yossarian corrected. You buy your eggs in Malta, not Sicily. Milo chortled proudly. I don't buy eggs in Malta he confessed, with an air of slight and clandestine amusement that was the only departure from industrious sobriety Osarian had ever seen him make. I buy them in Sicily for one cent apiece and transfer them to Malta secretly at four and a half cents apiece in order to get the price of eggs up to seven cents apiece when people come to Malta looking for them. Why do people come to Malta for eggs when they're so expensive there? Because they've always done it that way. Why don't they look for eggs in Sicily? Because they've never done it that way. No, I really don't understand. Why don't you sell your mess halls the eggs for seven cents apiece instead of for five cents apiece? Because my mess halls would have no need for me then. Anyone can buy seven cents apiece eggs for seven cents apiece. Why don't they bypass you and buy the eggs directly from you in Malta at four and a quarter cents apiece? because I wouldn't sell it to them. Why wouldn't you sell it to them? Because then there wouldn't be as much room for a profit. At least this way I can make a bit for myself as a middleman. Then you do make a profit for yourself, Yossarian declared. Of course I do. But it all goes to the syndicate, and everybody has a share. Don't you understand? It's exactly what happens with those plum tomatoes I sell to Colonel Cathcart. Buy! Yossarian corrected him. You don't sell plum tomatoes to Colonel Cathcart and Colonel Corn. You buy plum tomatoes from them. No, sell, Milo corrected Yossarian. I distribute my plum tomatoes in markets all over Pianosa under an assumed name so that Colonel Cathcart and Colonel Corn can buy them up from me under their assumed names at four cents apiece and sell them back to me the next day for the syndicate at five cents apiece. They make a profit of one cent apiece. I make a profit of three and a half cents apiece, and everybody comes out ahead. Everybody but the syndicate, said Yossarian with a snort. The syndicate is paying five cents apiece for plum tomatoes that cost you only half a cent apiece. How does the syndicate benefit? The syndicate benefits when I benefit, Milo explained, because everybody has a share. "'and the syndicate gets Colonel Cathcart's and Colonel Corn's support "'so that they'll let me go out on trips like this one. "'You'll see how much profit that can mean in about fifteen minutes "'when we land in Palermo.' "'Malta,' Yossarian corrected him. "'We're flying to Malta now, not Palermo.' "'No, we're flying to Palermo,' Milo answered. "'There's an endive exporter in Palermo. "'I have to see for a minute about a shipment of mushrooms to burn "'that were damaged by mold.' "'Milo!' How do you do it? Yossarian inquired with laughing amazement and admiration. You fill out a flight plan for one place, and then you go to another. Don't the people in the control towers ever raise hell? They all belong to the syndicate, Milo said. And they know that what's good for the syndicate is good for the country, because that's what makes Sammy run. 
The men in the control towers have a share, too, and that's why they always have to do whatever they can to help the syndicate. Do I have a share? Everybody has a share. Does Orr have a share? Everybody has a share. And Hungry Joe, he has a share, too? Everybody has a share. Well, I'll be damned, mused Yossarian, deeply impressed with the idea of a share for the very first time. Milo turned toward him with a faint glimmer of mischief. I have a surefire plan for cheating the federal government out of six thousand dollars. We can make three thousand dollars apiece without any risk to either of us. Are you interested? No. Milo looked at Yossarian with profound emotion. That's what I like about you, he exclaimed. You're honest. You're the only one I know that I can really trust. That's why I wish you'd try to be of more help to me. I really was disappointed when you ran off with those two tramps in Catania yesterday. Yossarian stared at Milo in quizzical disbelief. Milo, you told me to go with them, don't you remember? That wasn't my fault, Milo answered with dignity. I had to get rid of Orr some way once we reach town. It will be a lot different in Palermo. When we land in Palermo, I want you and Orr to leave with the girls right from the airport. With what girls? I radioed ahead and made arrangements with a four-year-old pimp to supply you and Orr with two eight-year-old virgins that were half Spanish. He'll be waiting at the airport in a limousine. Go right in as soon as you step out of the plane. Nothing doing, said Yossarian, shaking his head. The only place I'm going is to sleep. Milo turned livid with indignation, his slim, long nose flickering spasmodically between his black eyebrows and his unbalanced orange-brown mustache, like the pale, thin flame of a single candle. Yossarian, remember your mission, he reminded reverently. To hell with my mission, Yossarian responded indifferently. And to hell with the syndicate, too, even though I do have a share. I don't want any eight-year-old virgins, even if they are half Spanish. I don't blame you. But these eight-year-old virgins are really only thirty-two, and they're not really half Spanish, but only one-third Estonian. I don't care for any virgins. And they're not even virgins, Milo continued persuasively. The one I picked out for you was married for a short time to an elderly schoolteacher who slept with her only on Sundays, so she's really almost as good as new. But Orr was sleepy, too, and Yossarian and Orr were both at Milo's side when they rode into the city of Palermo from the airport and discovered that there was no room for the two of them at the hotel there either, and, more important, that Milo was mayor. The weird, implausible reception for Milo began at the airfield, where civilian laborers who recognized him halted in their duties respectfully to gaze at him with full expressions of controlled exuberance and adulation. News of his arrival preceded him into the city, and the outskirts were already crowded with cheering citizens as they sped by in their small, uncovered truck. Yossarian and Orr were mystified and mute, and pressed close against Milo for security. Inside the city, the welcome for Milo grew louder as the truck slowed and eased deeper toward the middle of town. Small boys and girls had been released from school and were lining the sidewalks in new clothes, waving tiny flags. Yossarian and Orr were absolutely speechless now. The streets were jammed with joyous throngs, and strung overhead were huge banners bearing Milo's picture. Milo had posed for these pictures in a drab peasant's blouse with a high round collar, and his scrupulous paternal countenance was tolerant, wise, critical, and strong, as he stared out at the populace omnisciently with his undisciplined mustache and disunited eyes. Sinking invalids blew kisses to him from windows. Apron shopkeepers cheered ecstatically from the narrow doorways of their shops. Tubas crumped. Here and there a person fell and was trampled to death. Sobbing old women swarmed through each other frantically around the slow-moving truck to touch Milo's shoulder or press his hand. Milo bore the tumultuous celebration with benevolent grace.
He waved back to everyone in elegant reciprocation and showered generous handfuls of foil-covered Hershey kisses to the rejoicing multitudes. Lines of lusty young boys and girls skipped along behind him with their arms linked, chanting in hoarse and glassy-eyed adoration, Milo! 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 Now that his secret was out, Milo relaxed with the Assyrian and Orr, and inflated opulently with a vast, shy pride. His cheeks turned flesh-colored. Milo had been elected mayor of Palermo, and of nearby Carini, Montreal, Bagheria, Termini Imerice, Cefalu, Mistretta, and Nicosia as well, because he had brought scotch to Sicily. Yossarian was amazed. The people here like to drink scotch that much? They don't drink any of the scotch, Milo explained. Scotch is very expensive, and these people here are very poor. Then why do you import it to Sicily if nobody drinks any? To build up a price. I moved the scotch here from Malta to make more room for profit when I sell it back to me for somebody else. I created a whole new industry here. Today, Sicily is the third largest exporter of scotch in the world, and that's why they elected me mayor. How about us getting a hotel room if you're such a hot shot? Or grumbled impertinently in a voice slurred with fatigue. Milo responded contritely. That's just what I'm going to do, he promised. I'm really sorry about forgetting to radio ahead for hotel rooms for you two. Come along to my office and I'll speak to my deputy mayor about it right now. Milo's office was a barber shop, and his deputy mayor was a pudgy barber, from whose obsequious lips cordial greetings foamed as effusively as the lather he began whipping up in Milo's shaving cup. Well, Vittorio, said Milo, settling back lazily in one of Vittorio's barber chairs. How were things in my absence this time? Very sad, Signor Milo, very sad. But now that you are back, the people are all happy again. I was wondering about the size of the crowds. How come all the hotels are full? Because so many people from other cities are here to see you, Signor Milo. "'and because we have all the buyers who have come into town for the artichoke auction.' "'Milo's hand soared up perpendicularly like an eagle and arrested Vittorio's shaving brush. "'What's artichoke?' he inquired. "'Artichoke, Signor Milo. "'An artichoke is a very tasty vegetable that is popular everywhere. "'You must try some artichokes while you are here, Signor Milo. "'We grow the best in the world.' "'Really?' said Milo. How much are artichokes selling for this year? It looks like a very good year for artichokes. The crops were very bad. Is that a fact? mused Milo, and was gone, sliding from his chair so swiftly that his striped barber's apron retained his shape for a second or two after he had gone before it collapsed. Milo had vanished from sight by the time Yossarian and Orr rushed after him to the doorway. Next, barked Milo's deputy mayor officiously. Who's the next? Yossarian and Orr walked from the barber shop in dejection. Deserted by Milo, they trudged homelessly through the reveling masses in futile search of a place to sleep. Yossarian was exhausted. His head throbbed with a dull, debilitating pain and he was irritable with Orr, who had found two crab apples somewhere and walked with them in his cheeks until Yossarian spied them there and made him take them out. Then Orr found two horse chestnuts somewhere and slipped those in until Yossarian detected them and snapped at him again to take the crab apples out of his mouth. Orr grinned and replied that they were not crab apples but horse chestnuts and that they were not in his mouth but in his hands, but Yossarian was not able to understand a single word he said because of the horse chestnuts in his mouth and made him take them out anyway. A sly light twinkled in Orr's eyes. He rubbed his forehead harshly with his knuckles like a man in an alcoholic stupor and snickered lewdly. Do you remember that girl? <laughs> 
he broke off to snicker lewdly again. "'Do you remember that girl who was hitting me over the head with that shoe in that apartment in Rome when we were both naked?' he asked with a look of cunning expectation. He waited until Yossarian nodded cautiously. "'If you let me put the chestnuts back in my mouth, I'll tell you why she was hitting me. Is that a deal?' Yossarian nodded, and Orr told him the whole fantastic story of why the naked girl in Nate Lee's whore's apartment was hitting him over the head with her shoe. But Yossarian was not able to understand a single word because the horse chestnuts were back in his mouth. Yossarian roared with exasperated laughter at the trick. But in the end there was nothing for them to do when night fell but eat a damp dinner in a dirty restaurant and hitch a ride back to the airfield, where they slept on the chill metal floor of the plane and turned and tossed in groaning torment until the truck drivers blasted up less than two hours later with their crates of artichokes and chased them out onto the ground while they filled up the plane. A heavy rain began falling. Yossarian and Orr were dripping wet by the time the trucks drove away and had no choice but to squeeze themselves back into the plane and roll themselves up like shivering anchovies between the jolting corners of the crates of artichokes that Milo flew up to Naples at dawn and exchanged for the cinnamon sticks, cloves, vanilla beans, and pepper pods that he rushed right back down south with that same day to Malta, where, it turned out, he was assistant governor general. There was no room for Yossarian and Orr in Malta, either. Milo was Major Sir Milo Minderbinder in Malta, and had a gigantic office in the Governor General's building. His mahogany desk was immense. In a panel of the oak wall, between crossed British flags, hung a dramatic, arresting photograph of Major Sir Milo Minderbinder, in the dress uniform of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. His moustache in the photograph was clipped and narrow, his chin was chiseled, and his eyes were sharp as thorns. Milo had been knighted, commissioned a major in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, and named Assistant Governor General of Malta, because he had brought the egg trade there. He gave Yossarian and Orr generous permission to spend the night on the thick carpet in his office. But shortly after he left, a sentry in battle dress appeared and drove them from the building at the tip of his bayonet, and they rode out exhaustedly to the airport with a surly cab driver who overcharged them and went to sleep inside the plane again which was filled now with leaking gunny sacks of cocoa and freshly ground coffee, and reeking with an odor so rich that they were both outside retching violently against the landing gear when Milo was chauffeured up the first thing the next morning, looking fit as a fiddle, and took right off for Oran, where there was again no room at the hotel for Yossarian and Orr, and where Milo was vice Shah. Milo had at his disposal sumptuous quarters inside a salmon-pink palace, but Yossarian and Orr were not allowed to accompany him inside because they were Christian infidels. They were stopped at the gates by gargantuan Berber guards with scimitars and chased away. Orr was snuffling and sneezing with a crippling head cold. Yossarian's broad back was bent and aching. He was ready to break Milo's neck. But Milo was vice Shah of Oran, and his person was sacred. Milo was not only the vice Shah of Oran, as it turned out, but also the Caliph of Baghdad, the Imam of Damascus, and the Sheikh of Araby. Milo was the corn god, the rain god, and the rice god in backward regions where such crude gods were still worshipped by ignorant and superstitious people. And deep inside the jungles of Africa, he intimated with becoming modesty, large, graven images of his mustached face could be found overlooking primitive stone altars, red with human blood. Everywhere they touched he was acclaimed with honor, and it was one triumphal ovation after another for him, in city after city until they finally doubled back through the Middle East and reached Cairo, where Milo cornered the market on cotton that no one else in the world wanted and brought himself promptly to the brink of ruin.
In Cairo there was at last room at the hotel for Yossarian and Orr. There were soft beds for them, with fat, fluffed-up pillows, and clean, crisp sheets. There were closets with hangers for their clothes. There was water to wash with. Yossarian and Orr soaked their rancid, unfriendly bodies pink in a steaming hot tub, and then went from the hotel with Milo to eat shrimp cocktails and filet mignon in a very fine restaurant with a stock ticker in the lobby that happened to be clicking out the latest quotation for Egyptian cotton when Milo inquired of the captain of waiters what kind of machine it was. Milo had never imagined a machine so beautiful as a stock ticker before. Really? he exclaimed when the captain of waiters had finished his explanation. And how much is Egyptian cotton selling for? The captain of waiters told him, and Milo bought the whole crop. But Yossarian was not nearly so frightened by the Egyptian cotton Milo bought as he was by the bunches of green-red bananas Milo had spotted in the native marketplace as they drove into the city, and his fears proved justified, for Milo shook him awake out of a deep sleep just after twelve and shoved a partly peeled banana toward him. Yossarian choked back a sob. "'Taste it!' Milo urged, following Yossarian's writhing face around with a banana insistently. "'Milo, you bastard!' moaned Yossarian. "'I've got to get some sleep. Eat it and tell me if it's good!' Milo persevered. "'Don't tell Orr I gave it to you. I charged him two piastres for his.' Yossarian ate the banana submissively and closed his eyes after telling Milo it was good. But Milo shook him awake again and instructed him to get dressed as quickly as he could because they were leaving at once for Pianosa. "'You and Orr have to load the bananas into the plane right away,' he explained. "'The man said to watch out for spiders while you're handling the bunches.' "'Milo, can't we wait until morning?' Yossarian pleaded. "'I've got to get some sleep. They're ripening very quickly.' answered Milo, and we don't have a minute to lose. Just think how happy the men back of the squadrons will be when they get these bananas. But the men back of the squadron never even saw any of the bananas, for it was a seller's market for bananas in Istanbul and a buyer's market in Beirut for the caraway seeds Milo rushed with to Benghazi after selling the bananas. And when they raced back into Pianosa breathlessly six days later at the conclusion of Orr's rest leave, it was with a load of best white eggs from Sicily that Milo said were from Egypt and sold to his mess halls for only four cents apiece so that all the commanding officers in his syndicate would implore him to speed right back to Cairo for more bunches of green-red bananas to sell in Turkey for the caraway seeds in demand in Benghazi. And everybody had a share. Chapter 23 Nately's Old Man the only one back in the squadron who did see any of Milo's red bananas was Arfie, who picked up two from an influential fraternity brother of his in the quartermaster corps when the bananas ripened and began streaming into Italy through normal black market channels, and who was in the officer's apartment with Yossarian the evening Nately finally found his whore again after so many fruitless weeks of mournful searching and lured her back to the apartment with two girlfriends by promising them thirty dollars each. Thirty dollars each, remarked Arfi slowly, poking and patting each of the three strapping girls skeptically with the air of a grudging connoisseur. Thirty dollars is a lot of money for pieces like these. Besides, I never paid for it in my life. I'm not asking you to pay for it, Nately assured him quickly. I'll pay for them all. I just want you guys to take the other two. Won't you help me out? Arfi smirked complacently and shook his soft, round head. "'Nobody has to pay for it for good old Arfi. I can get all I want any time I want it. I'm just not in the mood right now. Why don't you just pay all three and send the other two away?' Yossarian suggested. 
"'because then mine will be angry with me for making her work for her money.' "'Nately replied with an anxious look at his girl, "'who was glowering at him restlessly and starting to mutter. "'She says that if I really liked her, "'I'd send her away and go to bed with one of the others.' "'I have a better idea,' boasted Arfie. "'Why don't we keep the three of them here until after the curfew, "'and then threaten to push them out into the street to be arrested "'unless they give us all their money? "'We can even threaten to push them out the window.' Arfie! Nately was aghast. I was only trying to help, said Arfie sheepishly. Arfie was always trying to help Nately, because Nately's father was rich and prominent and in an excellent position to help Arfie after the war. Gee whiz, he defended himself querulously. Back in school, we were always doing things like that. I remember one day we tricked these two dumb high school girls from town into the fraternity house and made them put out for all the fellas there who wanted them by threatening to call up their parents and say they were putting out for us. We kept them trapped in bed there for more than ten hours. We even smacked their faces a little when they started to complain. Then we took away their nickels and dimes and chewing gum and threw them out. Boy, we used to have fun in that fraternity house, he recalled peacefully, his corpulent cheeks aglow with the jovial, rubicund warmth of nostalgic recollection. We used to ostracize everyone, even each other. But Arfie was no help to Nately now as the girl Nately had fallen so deeply in love with began swearing at him sullenly with rising, menacing resentment. Luckily, Hungry Joe burst in just then, and everything was all right again, except that Dunbar staggered in drunk a minute later and began embracing one of the other giggling girls at once. Now there were four men and three girls, and the seven of them left Arfie in the apartment and climbed into a horse-drawn cab, which remained at the curb at a dead halt while the girls demanded their money in advance. Nately gave them ninety dollars with a gallant flourish, after borrowing twenty dollars from Yossarian, thirty-five dollars from Dunbar, and seventeen dollars from Hungry Joe. The girls grew friendlier then, and called an address to the driver, who drove them at a clopping pace halfway across the city into a section they had never visited before, and stopped in front of an old, tall building on a dark street. The girls led them up four steep, very long flights of creaking wooden stairs, and guided them through a doorway into their own wonderful and resplendent tenement apartment which burgeoned miraculously with an infinite and proliferating flow of supple young naked girls and contained the evil and debauched ugly old man who irritated nately constantly with his caustic laughter and the clucking proper old woman in the ash-gray woolen sweater who disapproved of everything immoral that occurred there and tried her best to tidy up the amazing place was a fertile, seething cornucopia of female nipples and navels. At first there were just their own three girls in the dimly lit, drab brown sitting room that stood at the juncture of three murky hallways leading in separate directions to the distant recesses of the strange and marvelous bordello. The girls disrobed at once, pausing in different stages to point proudly to their garish underthings, and bantering all the while with the gaunt and dissipated old man with the shabby long white hair and slovenly white unbuttoned shirt, who sat cackling lasciviously in a musty blue armchair almost in the exact center of the room, and bade Nately and his companions welcome with a mirthful and sardonic formality. Then the old woman trudged out to get a girl for Hungry Joe dipping her captious head sadly, and returned with two big-bosomed beauties, one already undressed and the other in only a transparent pink half-slip that she wiggled out of while sitting down. Three more naked girls sauntered in from a different direction and remained to chat, then two others. Four more girls passed through the room in an indolent group engrossed in conversation. Three were barefoot, and one wobbled perilously on a pair of unbuckled silver dancing shoes that did not seem to be her own. 
One more girl appeared wearing only panties and sat down, bringing the total congregating there in just a few minutes to eleven, all but one of them completely unclothed. There was bare flesh lounging everywhere, most of it plump, and Hungry Joe began to die. He stood stock still in rigid, cataleptic astonishment, while the girls ambled in and made themselves comfortable. Then he let out a piercing shriek suddenly and bolted toward the door in a headlong dash back toward the enlisted men's apartment for his camera, only to be halted in his tracks with another frantic shriek by the dreadful freezing premonition that this whole lovely, lurid, rich, and colorful pagan paradise would be snatched away from him irredeemably if he were to let it out of his sight for even an instant. He stopped in the doorway and sputtered, the wiry veins and tendons in his face and neck pulsating violently. The old man watched him with victorious merriment, sitting in his musty blue armchair like some satanic and hedonistic deity on a throne, a stolen U.S. Army blanket wrapped around his spindly legs to ward off a chill. He laughed quietly, his sunken, shrewd eyes sparkling perceptibly with a cynical and wanton enjoyment. He had been drinking, neatly reacted on sight with bristling enmity to this wicked, depraved, and unpatriotic old man who was old enough to remind him of his father and who made disparaging jokes about America. America, he said. We'll lose the war, and Italy will win it. America is the strongest and most prosperous nation on earth, Nately informed him with lofty fervor and dignity. And the American fighting man is second to none. Exactly, agreed the old man pleasantly, with a hint of taunting amusement. Italy, on the other hand, is one of the least prosperous nations on earth, and the Italian fighting man is probably second to all. And that's exactly why my country is doing so well in this war, while your country is doing so poorly. Nately guffawed with surprise, then blushed apologetically for his impoliteness. I'm sorry I laughed at you. He said sincerely, and he continued in a tone of respectful condescension. But Italy was occupied by the Germans and is now being occupied by us. You don't call that doing very well, do you? But of course I do, exclaimed the old man cheerfully. And the Germans are being driven out. And we are still here. In a few years you will be gone too. And we will still be here. You see, Italy is really a very poor and weak country. And that's what makes us so strong. Italian soldiers are not dying anymore. But American and German soldiers are. I call that doing extremely well. Yes. I am quite certain that Italy will survive this war and still be in existence long after your own country has been destroyed. Nately could scarcely believe his ears. He had never heard such shocking blasphemies before, and he wondered with instinctive logic why G-men did not appear to lock the traitorous old man up. "'America is not going to be destroyed!' he shouted passionately. "'Never?' prodded the old man softly. "'Well,' Nately faltered. The old man laughed indulgently, holding in check a deeper, more explosive delight. His goading remained gentle. "'Rome was it destroyed. A Greece was it destroyed. A Persia was destroyed. A Spain was destroyed. All great countries are destroyed. Why not yours? How much longer do you really think your own country will last? 
forever? Uh, keep in mind that the Earth itself is uh, destined to be destroyed by the sun in twenty-five million years or so. Nately squirmed uncomfortably. Well, forever is a long time, I guess. A million years? persisted the jeering old man with keen, sadistic zest. A half a million? The frog is almost five hundred million years old. Could you really say with much certainty that America, with all its strength and prosperity, with its fighting man that is second to none, and with its standard of living that is the highest in the world, will last as long as... The frog? Nately wanted to smash his leering face. He looked about imploring for help in defending his country's future against the obnoxious calumnies of this sly and sinful assailant. He was disappointed. Yossarian and Dunbar were busy in a far corner, pawing orgiastically at four or five frolicsome girls and six bottles of red wine. And Hungry Joe had long since tramped away down one of the mystic hallways, propelling before him like a ravening despot as many of the broadest-hipped young prostitutes as he could contain in his frail, windmilling arms and cram into one double bed. Nately felt himself at an embarrassing loss. His own girl sat sprawled out gracelessly on an overstuffed sofa with an expression of ocious boredom. Nately was unnerved by her torpid indifference to him, by the same sleepy and inert pose that he remembered so vividly, so sweetly, and so miserably, from the first time she had seen him and ignored him at the packed penny ante blackjack game in the living room of the enlisted men's apartment. Her lax mouth hung open in a perfect O, and God alone knew at what her glazed and smoky eyes were staring in such brute apathy. The old man waited tranquilly, watching him with a discerning smile that was both scornful and sympathetic. A lissom, blonde, sinuous girl, with lovely legs and honey-colored skin, laid herself out contentedly on the arm of the old man's chair, and began molesting his angular, pale, dissolute face, languidly and coquettishly. Nately stiffened with resentment and hostility at the sight of such lechery in a man so old. He turned away with a sinking heart and wondered why he simply did not take his own girl and go to bed. This sordid, vulturous, diabolical old man reminded Nately of his father because the two were nothing at all alike. Nately's father was a courtly, white-haired gentleman who dressed impeccably. This old man was an uncouth bum. Nately's father was a sober, philosophical, and responsible man. This old man was fickle and licentious. Nately's father was discreet and cultured. This old man was a boor. Nately's father believed in honor and knew the answer to everything. This old man believed in nothing and had only questions. Nately's father had a distinguished white mustache. This old man had no mustache at all. Nately's father, and everyone else's father Nately had ever met, was dignified, wise, and venerable. This old man was utterly repellent, and Nately plunged back into debate with him, determined to repudiate his vile logic and insinuations with an ambitious vengeance that would capture the attention of the bored, phlegmatic girl he had fallen so intensely in love with and win her admiration forever. Well, frankly, I don't know how long America is going to last, he proceeded dauntlessly. I suppose we can't last forever if the world itself is going to be destroyed some day, but I do know that we're going to survive and triumph for a long, long time. For how long? mocked the profane old man with a gleam of malicious elation. Not even as long as the frog? 
much longer than you or me, Nately blurted out lamely. Oh, is that all? That won't be very much longer, then, considering that you're so gullible and brave, and that I am already such an old, old man. How old are you? Nately asked, growing intrigued and charmed with the old man in spite of himself. A hundred and the seven. The old man chuckled heartily at Nately's look of chagrin. I see you don't believe that, either. I don't believe anything you tell me, Nately replied with a bashful, mitigating smile. The only thing I do believe is that America is going to win the war. You put so much stock in the winning wars. The grubby, iniquitous old man scoffed. The real trick lies in losing wars, in knowing which wars can be lost. Italy has been losing wars for centuries, and just to see how splendidly we've done nonetheless. France wins wars, and is in a continual state of crisis. Germany loses and prospers. Look at that, our own recent history. Italy won a war in Ethiopia, and the prompt stumbled into serious trouble. Victory gave us such insane delusions of grandeur that we helped start a world war we hadn't the chance of winning. But now that we are losing again, everything has taken a turn for the better. And we will certainly come out on top again if we succeed in being defeated. Nately gaped at him in undisguised befuddlement. Now I really don't understand what you're saying. You talk like a madman. But I live like a sane one. <laughs> I was a fascist when Mussolini was on top. And I am an anti-fascist now that he has been deposed. I was fanatically pro-German when the Germans were here to protect us against the Americans. And now that the Americans are here to protect us against the Germans, I am fanatically pro-American. I can assure you, my outraged young friend. The old man's knowing, disdainful eyes shone even more effervescently as Nately's stuttering dismay increased. That the you and your country will have no more loyal partisan in Italy than me. But only as long as you remain in Italy. But, Nately cried out in disbelief, you're a turncoat! A time server, a shameful, unscrupulous opportunist. I am a hundred and seven years old, the old man reminded him suavely. Don't you have any principles? Of course not. No morality? Oh, I am a very moral man. The villainous old man assured him with satiric seriousness, stroking the bare hip of a buxom, black-haired girl with pretty dimples who had stretched herself out seductively on the other arm of his chair. He grinned at Nately sarcastically as he sat between both naked girls in smug and threadbare splendor with a sovereign hand on each. I can't believe it. Nately remarked grudgingly, trying stubbornly not to watch him in relationship to the girls. This book is continued on Disc 9.